It's a busy weekend for the British Racing and Sports Car Club. Welcome, though, to a rather damp and soggy Alton Park for a one-day event. There are two-day meetings, for example, at Brands Hatch this weekend, but one day here with the opening round of the Fun Cup taking centre stage. Four hours to look forward to a proper endurance race at the end of the day, before which we have got three different categories with two races each. We're going to start uh, with the BRSEC Super Classic uh, pre-99 Formula 4 Championship that's already been in action at Silverstone uh, this season. Uh, then we have the Nankang Tire BMW Compact Cup and the modified Ford Series, which has got a mega entry. Uh, and on a greasy circuit in qualifying, there were some uh, rather in uh, intriguing lines and also uh, engine notes as people struggle for grip. Then there's a the lunch break and then we do it all over again up until 20 past two when the Fun Cup cars venture out onto the circuit. Uh, David Addison trackside. Scott Woodwiss will be talking to our race winners in Park Ferme post-race. Jamie Peters Ennis will join us for Fun Cup coverage and racing here on this 2.6 mile full international circuit with its 12 turns uh, is going to get underway very shortly because the cars for the Super Classic pre-99 Formula Ford Championship are heading out onto the circuit uh, and you can see what the weather has in store. Bit of rain at lunchtime and then hopefully the road is going to dry out but yesterday glorious sunshine and warm temperatures but not today. Uh, it's uh, a bit chilly, it's damp, we've had a bit of rain this morning, uh, but it's going to be a challenge for the drivers as ever. There's been a lot of rain in the region as well over the last couple of weeks, and uh, that means that if you get your wheels onto the soggy grass, you are in real strife. Formula Ford, coming up first. Split into four classes then. Super Classic A for the cars from 1990 to 1998. You've got Class B, Super Classic B for the 82 to 89 chassis. Super Classic C, getting a bit more historic now, 1972 to 1981. And Super Classic D uh, in the regulations, cars built before 1972. They've already been in action once this year at Silverstone, where Alex Ames, who's missing today, was the dominant driver. He took both race wins and the driver that is currently second in the championship after those two Silverstone races, uh, Richard Frey, he is the man that starts on pole position. Uh, the cars head from the assembly area round to the grid. The countdown is in the assembly area, so the lap to the grid is effectively the, the formation lap, uh, and then we're going to be in business once the final few cars have spotted into place. There'll be the countdown on the grid and then into the race itself. So to have a look at the grid, it is going to be Richard Frey on uh, pole position with the 1992 Van Diemen and Tom Hawkins uh, lining up with him at the front of the grid. It's going to be a one-by-one -one staggered grid formation. Uh, then lining up third is going to be Jake Short. Now, I'm hesitating because that grid graphic is not what TSL produced earlier, so whether or not a penalty has been thrown into the mix. Uh, we will see. It would have been Richard Frey and Tom Hawkins at the front, and Jake Shortland and then Paul Mason. Chris Stone's qualified fifth ahead of Oliver Button, and Peter Daly uh, starting seventh fastest after the qualifying session. As I say, there's a question mark now over Tom Hawkins' swift. Uh, next on the grid is, is going to be Paul Britton ahead of Ray Smith. Sam Rory is twice a Paul Festival winner. Next coming is Jay and then Neil Hunt with the Charles and Stuart Joe and Chris Lindley to round out the top dozen. Next up is uh, going to be Paula Nicholas, which is QT's safety car driver ahead of Trevor Morgan, then Simon Fraser and uh, Roman Ben at the back of the grid. So Tom Hawkins, as I say, is the one with question mark over it having qualified second fastest it could have been that a mechanical problem has caused a withdrawal but in a sense that's going to make life a little bit easier for Richard Frey then with Jake Shortland third fastest in qualifying with the Lola uh, T440 now becoming potentially the main opposition so the drivers heading to the grid you can see that it's a, a slippery surface if not uh, a wet one but it's going to be a challenge for the drivers certainly over the first couple of laps as they try to get a little bit of temperature into tyres and uh, Richard Frey, who was second in the championship last year and also champion of Alton last year, the man on pole position, uh, he's going to be rather hard to beat, I would have thought, as the cars do come to the grid. Tom Hawkins is indeed missing from the outside of the front row. Everybody does move up, so that grid graphic was correct. Uh, and we'll try and unravel what's happened to Tom uh, post-race. There's the lunch break before the cars have raced two, based on the results of this first race. So Richard Frey then uh, coming into place 
for pole position. Jake Shortland with the uh, Lola slotting into place now on the outside of this one by one staggered grid. That 1977 built car. Uh, so it's giving away quite a lot in terms of years, but class points on what he's after. And then Paul Mason with the black Swift, the black Van Diemen is next to Chris Stones. The last car is in place. The green flag is shown at the back. That means that now the drivers uh, can concentrate efforts on the lighting gantry. We've had the five second board. And so to get racing underway at Alton Park today for the BRSEC, lights go out and a good getaway is made then by Richard Frey who blasts away from pole position as they go side by side for third look with on the outside line there Chris Stones in the uh, number 49 black uh, Van Diemen trying to find a way round. It doesn't quite work for him as they turn through the corner then out of Old Hall for the first time and Richard Frey uh, trying to make good his escape as they drop down towards Cascades for the first time. Not a set number of laps, it is a timed race. 15 minutes, the flag goes out the first time the leader crosses the line once those 15 minutes have elapsed and right now Richard Frey is trying to get away from the rest of them as they come out of Cascades for the first time. Others in a big, big hurry, including Peter Daly and also a little bit further back. You can see there Oliver Buckton with the blue Eldon uh, another of the cars uh, running in the uh, Super Classic D for the pre-72 cars. Out of Island Bend, then up towards Shell for the first time. Uh, one of the beauties of a championship like this is it brings lots of different manufacturers together, many of which sadly have dropped by the wayside in Formula Ford terms. Uh, but it does recreate halcyon days of the category with the likes of Van Dieten taking on Swift, taking on Reynard, uh, bouncing their way over the... Britain chicane curbs for the first time they come through over hilltop then down towards his lops and up front then uh, Richard Frey trying to make good his escape and succeeding in so doing at the moment as they come down with the battle on for second place now uh, because you've got Jake Shortland under attack from Paul Mason the Swift up behind the Lola lots of task wheel, lots of late braking as one or two drivers try to remind themselves what it's like diving into his lops at the end of a first lap on cold rubber but Richard Frey clearing the lead comes through Druids then, battle on the second place. Now Paul Mason in the Swift looking to try to get past uh, an inspired Jake Short as the memorable Lola hanging for the second place and actually gapping Paul Mason as they coming out of Druids then down towards the bottom corner they come for the first time. In fourth place Chris Stones and he's falling back a little bit and then the redoubtable Peter Daly, BRSCC chairman, race director for British GT and uh, GT World Challenge Asia next in the queue. Good pass on the inside by Vincent J. He gains a place as he comes into Lodge. Leaders go through and a change is imminent, incidentally, for second place because heading into Old Hall Corner there, look, on the inside line, uh, Paul Mason goes through. He's been teeing that up against Jake Shortland and he's now through, but he's got over three seconds to try to make up on Richard Frey, which was the gap at the end of the opening lap. Down towards Cascades, they come for the second time of asking and Paul Mason having hit second place, will try to get away. That, in turn, is not looking all that easy, is it? Because Jake Shortland is staying with him as they run along Lakeside Straight. Chris Stone's fourth, Peter Daly fifth, uh, looking to make up a second and a half or so. It is uh, Ryman Fenn at the back of the grid. And Colin Williams, in number 34, who didn't get a time in in qualifying, uh, he's also making a little bit of progress from the very back up into 16th place now. So the race leaders come up through Britons for the second time of asking and as they turn into the chicane you can see that at certain parts of the circuit so uh, Jake Shortland does drop back a little bit that now gives the advantage to Paul Mason to try to get clear uh, we'll see what the Swift can do then about the race leader now that he's got himself ahead of traffic now that he has a clear road on which to concentrate his efforts let's see whether or not he's going to be able to do anything about the race leader Richard Frey out qualified him admittedly but as the cars come out of his lops and into Nickerbrook corner, now maybe Paul Mason is able to do something about the race leader. Up Clay Hill, there is Richard Frey, and the advantage he had at the end of the effort, that was over three seconds, uh, two seconds the gap. Mason runs second, Jake Shortland in third, gap back to Bruce Stone's fall, and he's a day more, he's a little bit nearer to him in fifth place now. So the chairman is a position for Richard Rand out of the top six, and the Bucks and then uh, Vincent J. Race, but Stuart Jones, how he's called the Ford racer, he rounds out the top 10. Leader has just gone over the line. You're looking at this battle pack coming down towards Lodge, and one or two discovering that there's still not a huge amount of traction to be found. The gap has gone up then between the race leaders from over three seconds to over five now, as Richard Frey continues to make this look pretty easy up front. Paul Mason threw in second place ahead of Jake Shortland, and if anything, uh, possibly now Vincent Jay on the back of Oliver Buckton is the battle to look for for seventh and eighth places. Ray Smith goes through, also Stuart Jones goes through there. The gap coming down between Chris Stones and Peter Daly now. So fourth and fifth is a fight, and seventh and eighth is a fight as well. Along Lakeside Straight then comes 
the Stones Daily fight. At the very back of the order, Simon Fraser has just gone across the line somewhat delayed. And you can see that Paul Mason is not getting away from Jake Shortland, despite the fact that one might have expected that the newer car would have cleared the older one, the Swift with the Lola behind it, is still being given a hard time. Jake Shortland is a class leader, so is Chris Stones, so is Oliver Buxton. Richard Frey is the outright leader, comfortably clear in his class as the leaders then wriggle their way out of Britain's once more. This is lap number three as they come now uh, over hilltop. The battle also for fourth, you can just see it in the background, Chris Stones ahead of Peter Daly, that also uh, is for a class lead, so that's worth keeping an eye to. We've done one third distance, the first five minutes gone. Richard Frey well clear in the race lead as the fight rages on for second and third places. Mason versus Shortland, Happy Clay Hill they go. But the race leader then, the world champion, Richard Frey with his 1992 built and even clearing the lead. Second and third go out of Druids and fifth with this gap leader that will be masticated. Chris Dodes. Another mark record over the years. Peter Daly came out of the star of Mallory in the halcyon days of many one circuit from the four championships in fact in fairness to peter prior to that he was in the silverstone uh, racing school event for Formula Ford cars, that's where he started. So the best lap of the race claimed by the dominant race leader Richard Frey. Battle is still on for second place. Look, Mason versus Shortland, and now Stones and Daly have got themselves together for fourth and almost side by side going down towards Old Hall Corner. That for a class lead battle as well. Don't forget who's going to come out ahead. We'll find in a moment. It is for uh, class B leadership. And do we see Chris Stones? Do we see Peter Daly? It's still Chris Stones, but only just Peter Daly behind him then. So the Itigo Sports 1988 Van Diemen of Peter Daly chasing after Chris Stones with his similar Van Diemen, similar vintage, and the cars now uh, run up towards Island Bend, out of which towards Shell comes Paul Mason, who still can't shake off Jake Shortland, goes a little bit wider there, comes out of the corner, pulls the trigger to try to accelerate the car off that bank right. Behind Peter Daly, you've got Paul Britton, and then Oliver Buxton chasing after him. A curb hopping Paul Mason though uh, swings now out of the Britain chicane that looked ever so slightly away from the ideal line, which might just throw a lifeline back to Jake Shortland as they come now down towards his lops. Chris Stones has got away from Peter Daly ever so slightly. Uh, the other half of Daly Sport, as it were, his partner Lorna Vickers, 13th overall, chasing after Chris Lindley. So up Clay Hill for the fourth time go the race leaders. So he didn't get a time in qualifying uh, and has not done much of the race before needing to come to the pit lane. Second and third then down towards Lodge. Paul Mason turns in as the leader has just gone across the line to give you an idea of the gap and very, very wide indeed there, Jake Shortland. What's going on for fourth and fifth? Look back to see whether it's still Chris Stones ahead of Peter Daly. Uh, and the answer is that yes, it is. Two black cars, with drivers with white crash helmets, oh so helpful. Daily in the wheel tracks as they head towards Old Hall. We're getting a driving standards flag as well, which is going the way of the hard-charging Oliver Buckton. That potentially is for track limit abuses out of Old Hall, where there's this new gravel trap on the outside of the road. And a big, big spin there. Is that Vincent Jay who has gone around, potentially? Coming out of Old Hall, he's gone to the inside onto the wet grass and hopefully can recover from there, although the yellow flags wave to warn everybody behind. that There's a drama ahead going into Old Hall. Peter Daly trying to get a toe as they go along Lakeside Straight, inching up onto the back of Chris Stone's Van Diemen then, go left at Island Bend, the lead has come up through Shell, well second and third come up through Shell because the leader is long gone, Richard Frey is making life look very, very easy indeed right now, and Jake Shortland uh, sort of driving in a, a, a style and with speed that belies the age of that car, dating back to 19. 77 the Lola over the curb there for fourth place bounces Chris Stones behind him you've got Peter Daly and as they head towards Hilltop just six more minutes of the race remain not only is Chris Stones under attack from Daly but I would offer you that Paul Britton behind is lapping a little bit faster his last lap was a tenth better than Peter's was so that gap's coming down Paul Britton uh, in number 42 in the PRS 81F or RHO1 if you prefer, two type numbers going on, but the PRS, another car that is, uh, is of an age, charging along. And it's always one of the needs to form the boards, that older cars could always take on new machinery. Now the Druids then, 
uh, comes the fight for fourth. The race leader has gone across the line and has already got into the traffic. So he's put that lap on Raymond Fenn that I was pondering about. A little bit deep into Lodge, there goes Chris Stones, but Peter Daly still not quite close enough to take advantage. Second is Mason and third is Shortland, to as ever thus. And now Peter Daly lines up to have another go, this time on the outside line, down towards Old Hall Corner. There might just be a little bit more traction on the outside, but equally it's the longer line. So Chris Stones is able to command the place as he comes out of the corner, and Daly tries again to the inside, coming towards Denton's then, and down towards Cascades, but once more, Chris Stones, good racecraft, forces Peter Daly to the outside line, the slower line, and to no avail. Uh, Vincent Jay, by the way, after his spin, has gone tumbling down the order to 13th place, promoting Lorna Vickers and Chris Lindley and Neil Hunt and Stuart Jones and others that were behind him instantly. Uh, right, out then of the left of Ireland comes the Stones' daily fight. It was only a tenth of a second between them when they came across the line last time. Paul Mason, in the meantime, hangs on to his second place, despite the good efforts of Jake Shortland. So uh, Richard Frey, Jake Shortland, Chris Stones, Oliver Buckton at the moment are your class leaders. And now, coming towards Britons, Chris Stones comes across Ryman Fenn, who slows right down, trying to get out of the way, but that slightly impeded Chris Stones. It's given Peter Daly a chance to challenge. Look on the inside line, coming down towards his lops. And this time, Peter should be on to gain the place. Breaks as late as he possibly can as they come down towards his lops. Bit of a squeal of tyres, but Daly has done it, goes through. Can he make the corner? The answer is yes. So Peter Daly, experienced Formula Ford racer, goes through. That puts him up into fourth and it puts him up into the lead of Class B, the Super Classic B category for the 82 to 89 car. So it's a, a very worthwhile pass, not only overall, but more significantly for a class win. And Peter now getting away from Chris Stones, pushing him back into the clutches of Paul Britton. As they come out of Druids with just under four minutes on the clock, the race leader has gone through. And Richard Frey has just done yet another fastest lap of the race, as you see, a 1 minute 50.1 in qualifying. He did a 1 minute 50.4, so even with a bit of morning rain, uh, quicker in race trim. Second and third, Paul Mason from Jake Shortland go through. And then fourth now, Peter Daly leading Class B from Chris Stones. Paul Britton is next. Uh, Paul Britton goes through. He was lapping quicker than those ahead last time. He's just done a 53.4, and Stones having... Uh, lost the best part of a second on that lap, is possibly going to come under attack before the end of the race now, which is three minutes and change away. Down through Cascades, they turn once again. There you can see Chris Stones, who is now in fifth place overall, and Paul Britton behind, being a sort of urged on, if you like, by number 60 Oliver Buckton in the Eldon Mark 810. So, again, older cars, but running nicely. The PRS just ahead of the Eldon. Uh, there you've got then Peter Daly back under attack. Chris Stones out of nowhere, launches up the inside line, goes through. And Peter thinks, where did that all come from? So, one up and one back for Peter Daly. Through once again. And now, as they come towards Britons, wriggling their way through the chicane. Again, Chris Stones a little bit more sideways there, but he's come out of the corner ahead down towards the Hislops chicane. This is where Peter Daly made his move a lap ago. This time, no move on the cards. Uh, and it is all rather because now he's coming under renewed attack uh, from the traffic behind with Paul Britton and Oliver Buckton not that far adrift. So that battle pack that was a pair early on has now, with two minutes to go, become a quartet uh, and Daly trying to attack and defend at the same time. But they'll be furious about losing that plate to Chris Stone. So the only attack but mindful of where Paul Britton is as the cars then now uh, work their way out of Druids and down towards the right-hander of Lodge Corner once again. Peter Daly to the inside looks at this part of the circuit much more greasy. But there's also battle on for second place because Jake Shortland is having another go at the race leader. Now, a flying lap at the moment is a 1.49. That's the new best lap of the race done by Richard Frey. Question mark now as to whether he can squeeze one more lap out of the race or whether this is going to be the last one. It's going to be touch and go as they're for fourth and fifth. Daly versus Stones. Stones ahead of Daly. And this, remember, is for the lead of the class. Class B. Richard Frey, uh, overall race leader, is leading his class, Class A, for the later cars. So this is where a lap ago, Chris Stones was able to get the run on Peter Daly. Can Daly do it to him this time? For second place, Paul Mason comes out of Shell Oil's corner, keeping Jake Shortland at bay. And the Lola, perhaps to line up for a go at his lops. You've got to be really brave to have a go into Britain's because it's a bit narrow there. But you can see under attack, Paul Mason, then the Swift getting a little bit crossed up as he accelerates out of the corner. 
heading up towards the line, the 1994 built Swift SC 94K stays ahead, but only just. We've got 43 seconds then before the chequered flag. Richard Frey could back off and take the flag this time, such is the size of his lead. As you can see, it's over 12 seconds. Paul Mason, I don't think, really wants another lap because he's under huge pressure from Jake Shortland. Up towards Druids they come then, past the water tower, and then towards the double apex right as you look at the lap car of Sid Fraser, the 1985 Van Diemen. Right, 20 seconds on the clock. Race leader is coming up towards Dear Lee, but he's probably going to squeeze another lap out of this unless the chequered flag is fluttered early because as he goes through now, 10 seconds on the clock as he crossed the line, uh, Richard Frey gets another lap out of it. That's really bad news for Paul Mason. It's another lap he's got to defend for. Good news for Jake Shortland because he might be able to fight back then as they go over the timing line together. And then behind them in the background, you might just catch a glimpse of the lapped car of Simon Sid Fraser. Very wide all over the grass and all sideways goes Jake Shortland and he just about hangs on to it. Behind that, Daly and Stones are side by side going into Old Hall. That's the battle for second place done and dusted. Paul Mason now with enough of a gap to preserve that. Look in the background. Do we see Peter Daly or do we see Chris Stones emerging from Old Hall corner as the leader? Well, they're kind of joint leaders of class, but Peter Daly has gone back ahead them. So great battle these two have enjoyed. Peter Daly is ahead, right on his tail, Chris Stones. But we know that Chris is good on this part of the circuit. He's done it before and made a lunge up towards Shell. He's going to try to do it again then. The no gap on the inside at Island Bend. But it's Shell where he made the move a couple of laps ago. He's making the move again. And a big, big spin for the race leader coming out of the Britain's chicane. So Richard Frey has had a spin but has preserved the race lead. And lucky to get going without losing a huge amount of time. Paul Mason thinks, oh, that car's a bit larger. I can see it finally. But he's not close enough to be able to make a move. So Richard Frey has got some explaining to do post-race. But spin and win, he's still on target. Uh, now, we also need to go back to this battle between Stones and Daly to see what was going on there. Because it looked as though uh, when we cut away to the spinning leader, Chris Stones was about to make a lunge. However, calm down, Richard Frey gets his heart rate back to normal, he still leads, their second is Paul Mason, third after a wild last lap, Jake Shortland, uh, and behind them, we'll wait and see which of the two Black Van Demons comes through for fourth and honours in Class B, but Richard Frey, whose face might match the colour of the car after that spin on the last lap, comes up then to take the chequered flag and to win the first race of the day for the BRSCC Super Classic Pre-99 Formula 4 Championship, the third round of the championship this year. Paul Mason survives for second and Jake Shortland is going to be third. Right, what about honours then uh, within Class B? Because coming up towards the line next, it is going to be Chris Stones who went back ahead then and retook the place from Peter Daly. So a great battle between the two. Chris Stones takes fourth, Peter Daly fifth. Paul Britton over the line for sixth and he wins his class. Chris Stones winning his and Richard Frey. Likewise, the overall uh, winner, Oliver Buckton, seventh. He's a class winner. And then for eighth place, it is just Ray Smith ahead of Stuart Jones. The two of them there crossing the line absolutely nose to tail with just a couple of attempts between them as Stuart Jones had to dart out to one side of the road. Well, right, so Richard Frey comes through victorious. The winning margin, 5.9 seconds, but it doesn't really tell you the story of the race, that, because although he was dominant early on, that spin did not... Uh, helped the heart rate particularly, but he uh, made it through and uh, takes the race win nonetheless. So we will hopefully be able to hear from our race winners. Scott Woodward will head to the Park Ferme area. They will do, of course, their full lap to pit in. And uh, after that, we'll turn our attention to more racing. But... Tin tops next because we've got BMWs and Fords to enjoy before the uh, lunch break. So Richard Frey race winner by just under six seconds in the end from Paul Mason. Jake Shortland coming through for third place and then taking fourth. Chris Stones with it, a class win ahead of Peter Daly and then Paul Britton. Uh, next, Oliver Buckton, who like Paul Britton won a class. Ray Smith finishing in eighth place, just ahead of Stuart Jones. And then Neil Hunt rounding out the top ten. Chris Lindley, 11th from Lorna Vickers. Vincent Jay after a spin next. And then Trevor Morgan coming home in 14th spot. 15th, Simon Fraser. 
uh, Raymond Fenn was also a lap down, and Colin Williams was one that we lost early into the pit lane with a problem. So with Alex Ames absent, that helps Richard Frey not only in terms of points in the starting this weekend at Champion of Alton Series, but also in the overall championship because uh, he comes to Alton second after good results uh, in the two races at Silverstone uh, in mid-March. And so uh, good start to the day, despite the spin. As I say, he might be a little bit red-faced about all that, but uh, even so, he has survived. And... Uh, Richard Frey will start race two from pole position. Fingers crossed that he can get away without a scare in that one. Uh, next on track will be the Nankang Tar BMW Compact Cup, the uh, entry for which I can see out of the window spread across the paddock as they head towards the assembly area. And then the modified Ford series will be the final race before lunch. The stream will remain at lunchtime and we'll have uh, some interviews with the Fun Cup drivers uh, in readiness for their four-hour enduro at the end of the day but uh, Richard Frey from the moment celebrating uh, a very good victory he got a, a third uh, in fact two thirds at Silverstone uh, behind Alex Ames and Richard Tarling absent this weekend but uh, they were the two drivers that uh, took the points there Richard second in the championship last year came out on top in champion of autumn and uh, will be certainly hard to stop I think in race two on the evidence of what we've just seen so there's not too much clearing up for marshals to do but uh, they will make sure the track is good ready for uh, our BMWs right let's hear from a delighted no doubt Richard Frey he's with Scott Woodward Yeah, thanks, David. Morning, everybody. Welcome down here to the Park Fermi era for the first Super Classic race. And someone who kind of ran away with it this morning, Richard Frey. Um, excellent victory. Looked like a very casual Sunday, uh, Saturday morning drive, wasn't it? Uh, it was really positive, yeah. I had a spin in the last lap, uh, over-egged it a little bit into Britons, if I'm honest with you. But testing yesterday went really well, so I felt fairly strong coming into today, to be honest. You were quite enthusiastic about the couple of class wins that you got, or the performance that you put in at Silverstone. So you seem really happy with how the Van Diemen's looking at the moment. Yeah, fantastic. I mean, I've always said this. It's a massive team effort. Dave Bailey, Tom McCarthy and myself working really well as a unit. Testing yesterday went really well. Uh, we were able to make some changes and then look at the data afterwards. So we've come out, I think, on a good result. And yeah, today's gone well. Another race left yet, mind. I don't think as much to tweak on the car for race two, is there, with a the performance like that? No, I, th I think, you know, touch wood, I think we'll sort of keep it as it is. Um, the spin was obviously completely my error, so need to just maybe a bit of a look at that. But no, fingers crossed all being well for race two. I think you can blame the conditions a tiny bit. <laughs> well, yeah, OK, fair enough. <laughs> stuff. Excellent drive, well done. Just we'll see for race two. Excellent stuff. Right, there was a great battle for second place, which was second and third overall, and also in their respective classes. So let's have a quick chat first of all with Paul Mason. Paul, these um, older cars and pedal right, they give you some trouble, don't they? They certainly do. He was a, he's a quick pedaler. Um, I managed to keep him at bay just. Um, he was much quicker than me through through Cascades, and then luckily near the end, I think he made a mistake went on the grass at Old Hall and gave me a bit of a breather. <laughs> But in terms of the battle that you had out there, it was excellent to see, and that just shows that in this championship, it doesn't matter the age of the car, it's a long set up and the driver's good, the racing's just a competitive. Yeah, yeah, you could put a really good uh, driver in a really old car and then they'd be quick, somebody like a Joey Foster or somebody, and uh, they'd be right on the front. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, of course, got the victory on that one. You've got to try and catch Richard a bit in race two. Any tweaks tweet you can make to try and chase him down? Um, the biggest tweak would get a new set of tyres, but we haven't got them. <laughs> We're saving them for when it really rains. <laughs> um, but he's, he's come on leaps and bounds last year, and now he's, he's, re he's really quick. But I went a, quick, a second, I think, quicker in that race than I did in qualifying, so we did no testing yesterday, so I'm quite happy with that. Front row for race two, so just try and get him off a start and hold him off. That's it, yeah. <laughs> Great job, Paul. Well done. We'll see you for race two. Let's also bring in Jake Shorten for third place. You had a great job. job. Um, I have to say, Jake, you performed pretty well at Silverson, again here at Dawson Park, and this uh, this load is pretty bit, pretty decent, isn't it? Yeah, it's not too bad. It's um, We've done quite a lot of work with it and not really been out much with it, but, you know, it's, it's starting to we're starting to get some good results with it, and, um, yeah, I'm starting to enjoy it more, so it's... Yeah. yeah, it's good. So, Richard, what made you choose the low that made you choose got a more historic Formula Ford race? And was it kind of the natural kind of development on car feel and mechanical grip that it gives you? Or was there another particular reason on the championship and, and the car? Um, it's sort of sort of like the historic side of it ties well with what I do for work. So it's um, it's just sort of it came about as got good money and needed a bit of work, and we've uh, spent a bit of time with it, and yeah, just 
just, just having a bit of fun with it now. It's yeah. And the great thing it proves as well is it doesn't matter the age of the car is that as I said to Paul. As long as it's got a good driver in it and the car's well set up, you can give some of the, the newer cars in this championship or, or younger cars a bit of a runaround. Yeah, you can. Yeah, it's you know you, there's there's little bits you you are quicker through the fast corners, um, but then down the straights they've just got that little bit. It's a bit more aerodynamic. But other than that, th th yeah, there's not much difference between them, and it's that's why it makes it a good race, especially in this championship. Yeah, excellent. Well, excellent performance. Hope we'll see in race number two. Hopefully it goes well. Thank excellent stuff. Um, we're hoping obviously they've all gone through his part family, but uh, fourth and fifth was a great battle course to be saw between Chris Stone to be today they're just down in part by over there just having a chat with the rest of the cars and it's great excellent turnout for these super classic formula fords it's a great range of cars that you get anywhere between 1998 and 1967 all can enter formula fords so from formula fords we go to bmw's now for their first race of the season it's time to head across back to david to give you the grid for the first race of the year for the nankang tire bmw compact cup here at Alton park Scott Hanks, the car's out on track, similar principle to the Formula Fords, round from the assembly area, uh, and then we will go racing. It is an amended grid because a couple of cars fail scrutineering, uh, trying to unravel quite why, but it means that Tim Seaford and Thorben Astin are going to start not only at the back of the grid, but also because it's a exclusion uh, with a 10 second delayed start. So it is going to be um, a familiar motor racing, national racing name on pole position because Joe Doble is going to start on pole. It's a two by two uh, ordinary standing start grid, if you like, for this, with Connor Grady lining up with him at the front. Uh, then Doble Senior, Joe and touring car racer Mikey's father, Mike Doble, uh, starting third ahead of Matt Flowers. Fourth, Rod Langham will go from fifth ahead of Richard Sutherland with Gordon McMillan and Peter Smith rounding out the top eight on the grid. Ninth uh, is the reigning champion, a long way back, Gareth Clayton, a man to watch. And then Ross Stoner in number 22 is starting 10th. 11th is Alex Reed. Alongside him is Max Noble, then Alistair Smith and uh, Mark Brady. Starting on the eighth row in 334, Barney Lower and uh, Alex Corkwell. The company Xavier Ross is next, and then Adam Wright with Daniel Mountford on the tenth row of the grid. And that kind of rounds out the, the proper grid, if you like, the conventional grid, because then with a 10 second delayed start, Tim Seaford and Thorben Astin. It's going to be interesting to see what progress they can make from there. Were there to be a safety car or any sort of interruption that would throw a lifeline uh, the BMW contact compact cup launched in 2012 joined the BRSEC in 2016 a uh, very cost-effective way of racing a BMW and uh, we've had quite a number of people come out of this and go on to race successfully in other things like Steve Roberts for example who went through Jordan Ginetta's and, uh, race winner back to the championship runner up in Porsche Sprint Challenge James Gornall having already been the GT champion came into this with a bit of fun and then back into uh, main racing, uh, racing like touring cars, for example. Uh, Stephen Daly, five times. Mikey Doble uh, won this and Ginetta GT5 the year before he went into touring car racing. Uh, Dan Kirby, the late Dan Kirby, Jordan Still, also uh, previous champions. They're going through in number 41 is then Tim Seaford, one of those two penalised drivers starting at the back with that 10 second delayed start now. And at the front, Joe Doble making his way up to the grid. Uh, over his shoulder is going to be his dad, uh, Mike Doble, who uh, they have a, a motorcycle business, but uh, Mike a long time ago raced in the Formula Forward Championship. And uh, then after a few years away, came back into racing uh, and sons followed suit. So the Doble motorcycles liveried cars it's sort of nascar style when you see them during the race you see what i mean but they've got the huge numbers on the roof uh, and uh, this is joe doble on pole position dad behind him splitting the two is the white car of connor grady who's come from junior fiestas and uh, Ginetta juniors that is alex corkwell in the ma racing with edf motorsports entry one of a number of drivers with the novice cross on the back of the car Another one is Xavier Ross, you can see. Another one with an obvious cross is Adam Wright. Good to see newcomers to the sport every season. And so the last handful of cars slot into place, including uh, Daniel Mountford. The grid is complete as we give it, uh, gave it to you. I don't think there are any gaps upon that. So it's going to be uh, once more a 15-minute race. The uh, driver slot into position. And the Alton Park circuit, uh, which is always a challenge, 
a real driver's circuit uh, in these still quite greasy conditions uh, is going to be lively for sure. The two penalised cars then with that 10 second delayed start are in place. The green flag is shown at the back to say that everybody's where they need to be after the formation lap. And that now means that the drivers look towards the lights, which go red when the lights go out. We go racing with a good getaway by Joe Dober and a really good start also by Gordon McMillan uh, in the grey and uh, bright yellow car. And one or two get squeezed towards the barrier there as he blasts his way through the traffic. But that was elbows out stuff and Gordon McMillan taking no prisoners. Uh, he started on the fourth row and he's up into what third place already as they come out of Old Hall Corner then. Down towards Denton's then Cascades for the first time. But Joe Dobel, the race leader, now, Dad didn't make the best of starts, did he? He's fallen back into the queue by the look of it and is only, I will offer you six as they come through Cascades for the first time. So Joe Dobel leads Conor Grady in second place, making the run along Lakeside Straight then for the first time with a challenge being made there. You can see on the inside, places traded on the inside towards Island Bend. Dobel leading then all over him in second place, Conor Grady, and then from seventh to third, excellent start, Gordon McMillan. Might have been a bit brutal for some, but it worked for him, and he's got sharp elbows, says Gordon McMillan. You tangle with him at your peril as the rest come then uh, out of shell, that bank right-hander, number 16, going a little bit wider than others, but surviving that line, accelerating towards the uh, end of the lap, Mark Grady. Big, big curb bounce there, you could see, uh, from Gordon McMillan's car, and he's not the only one to do it as well. Uh, riding the kerb is all well and good, but some of the kerbs can be very, very high, and you can see how it really does launch the car. Number one, the reigning champion then, Gareth Clayden, uh, with work to do. There's a big, big lock up there, and I think that was possibly from Conor Grady coming down towards his locks as he survived it. He has. There's an awful lot of task wheel here, putting a lot of abuse through these Nankang tyres as the leading three pretty much as one go up Clay Hill for the first time. Mike Doble then with work to do after that pock start as we await the cars coming now up towards Druids and they turn through the corner and it is going to be Joe Doble leading with Conor Grady under attack. Gordon McMillan right there behind him uh, looking for a way through as Gareth Claydon now gets up on the inside of number 31 of Peter Smith and he comes out of Druids ahead so a place gained uh, after only qualifying ninth. Gareth Claydon with work to do but he's starting to rebuild the race if you like here piecing it all together uh, perhaps also looking towards where he can start for race two and then work further progress in that race leaders come out of dear leap and joe doble is getting away then as he goes across the line he's a second to the good from conor grady then it's gordon mcmillan in third place ross stoner is fourth mike doble fifth then and in sixth place correction because matt flowers whose transponder is not playing ball he's in fourth place uh, Gareth Clayton is eight, one or two, getting all sideways as they come out of Old Hall, but they more or less hang on in there. So Doble leads the way. Conor Grady second, Gordon McMillan in third place. And uh, with a couple of cars not having transponders that are working, that's why you'll see that timing tower just shuffle occasionally uh, as the timekeeping force downstairs at TSL have to do it manually. Now, other battles to keep an eye on, Matt Flowers versus Ross Stoner, and there, another one, Gareth Clayton makes his move on the inside and goes diving through on the inside to move himself up past Richard Sutherland. So the champion now looking a little bit more at home. He struggled in qualifying, but Gareth Clayton now is on a mission, isn't he? And he goes straight away to the inside line, trying to make a move there up against Mike Doble. And that looks easy. Comes diving through. So Gareth Clayton picking up a couple of places. That puts him into the top six now. It's almost as though whatever was going on in qualifying um, was one completely separate problem. And now the car is almost a different one completely because it looks a lot faster than it did this morning. Uh, and it's a lot more confidence giving to Gareth seemingly because he's now able to take the battle to those around him but he's got to get through the traffic Ross Stoner's orange car being next before the leader gets away and Joe Doble is now starting to break away uh, from that pack behind so up through Druids will come Joe Doble now behind him you can see 25 Connor Grady uh, and Gordon McMillan after that amazing start he's kind of plateaued now he's got himself a bit stuck in that third spot because he's not making any further progress. Matt Flowers for fourth, but Gareth Clayton remains the man to watch then as they come for the end of uh, the first flying lap, lap two of the race, down towards Lodge. So the Doble family, uh, if Joe is half as quick as his brother has been, he was a pole position winner in touring cars last year, he's going to be another man to watch for the future. Joe leads from Conor Grady, 1.8 seconds, the margin between them. Gordon McMillan still hanging on in there in third place, but not getting any closer, really, to be able to think about making a move as they come uh, through Old Hall Corner once more. So the leaders go on to the avenue, down towards Cascades. Clock ticks on down. 
And why are the two drivers from the back of the grid getting on? Tim Seaford was one penalised driver, Thorburn Aston another. And Thorburn up into 19th place. Of course, the first thing is you've got to try and do the catching, then you need to try and do the overtaking. So from that delayed start, always going to be difficult. Matt Flowers then in the white, yellow and blue car just ahead of Ross Stoner and he in turn has got Gareth Claydon behind him so fourth fifth sixth then running as one big lock up by Stoner Claydon to the outside and he gets a face full of Stoner wherever he goes so he's a bit trapped as they come off the corner Ross Stoner goes through and he's in this invidious position now trying to attack and defend at the same time he thinks he's a little bit quicker than Matt Flowers but he's got to defend from Gareth Claydon who's way up onto two wheels as he bounces over the curb coming through his lock so, sorry coming through Britain's down towards his locks the old Fulston chicane, renamed after uh, John Britton, one of the MSV investors when Motorsport Vision took over Alton Park. What now, 20 years or so ago. Down towards his locks then, 4th, 5th, 6th. Flowers, Stone at Claydon remains the battle. So Gareth Claydon and Gordon McMillan, two of the big winners, if you like, from where they qualified to where they run now, and head up Clay Hill once again. Then nose to tail, 4th, 5th and 6th. The problem Matt Flowers has got now, though, is that by having to defend, he's falling away, and his pace is not as quick as uh, Gordon McMillan ahead of him. So he's a bit stuck at best in 4th. Claydon to the inside for 5th place, though. Can't do it at Druid, had a good look. But Ross Stoner's orange car just able to swing across in time. So the nose chopped off Gareth Claydon's car for the moment, and he's got to think about where, again, he might be able to make that move. Possibly coming down towards Lodge Corner. Into the braking zone then. Turn right. So that's your reigning champion, the master mixed concrete livery car of Gareth Claydon, but he's a bit stuck in the traffic as Joe Doble is making this look very easy indeed up front. He's just done, as you can see, the fastest lap. 2 minutes 5.4, that's two seconds quicker than he went in qualifying, give or take a hundredth. So it's a big, big margin, in illustrating perhaps how much drier the road is getting. Also maybe how much more confidence drivers are getting with every lap around the Alton Park International Circuit. Second is still Conor Grady, Gordon McMillan third, and a challenge there, look, again, that was Gareth Claydon looking for a way through on the inside. Uh, Ross Stoner has a wide car, and he's able to repel yet another advance. So Gareth Claydon still stuck. Interesting, isn't it, how people could do the hard yards early on and then get themselves a little bit uh, stuck in the traffic. Big slide seemingly through Island Bend for both Stoner and Claydon, and Gareth is the one that comes off worse because as the car starts to just move around a little bit more, that costs him a length, and you can see he's dropped off the back of the queue now. So Matt Flowers comes under attack as they head towards Britain's, and Ross Stoner thinks, good, right, I've got rid of that pesky Claydon chap. I can concentrate all my energies now on trying to find a way past Matt Flowers. Trouble is, Matt equally drives a wide car, bouncing, hopping over the curb. Out of Britain as they come, over the brow. Down now towards the Hislop chicane once more. Three seconds, the lead gap, and Ross Stoner lines up for a go on the inside, left it late, and is there going to be contact? No, thankfully. He just about got into the corner without having to lean on Matt Flowers, but he did leave that rather late before he had a big look up the inside. You can see what's going on up the road, which is that Conor Grady second is getting away a little bit more from Gordon McMillan now, and that is the rather dominant race leader. So Joe Doble goes through, pole, fastest lap, potentially the win as well. It's all stacking up nicely to start the season for him. They're going through, four, fifth, sixth, Flowers from Stoner and then Gareth Claydon. A little bit of a gap back to Mike Doble, whose race has unravelled a bit, hasn't it? Not a great start from third on the grid, uh, and he's never really looked like me to regain the places. Another look from Gareth Claydon on the inside, a lock-up from Matt Flowers, four, fifth, sixth, turn into Lodge Corner absolutely together, and as they head up towards the line, they come out of the corner in the same order as well, but as they come past the pits now then, uh, can Ross Stoner make a move to the inside of Old Hall Corner? It's not for the want of trying he's not got past Matt Flowers, nor that Gareth Claydon hasn't got past Ross Stone. A great fight between the three of them. Run wide, over the kerb, and there is a time penalty of 10 seconds, according to the uh, lighting gantry on the start line, being given to Gordon McMillan. Now, we'll wait for confirmation as to why. I fear it's going to be for track limits, but a time penalty of 10 seconds to car number 20 as Ross Stoner moves himself up past Matt Flowers and now Gareth Clayton tries to buy into this as well. Look, there's half a gap on the inside. A big, big gap now. Big hip and shoulder and that forces Matt Flowers off the road. Is he going to be able to get back on in his new lightweight model with the front balance ripped off the car? The grass here is so wet and boggy he's got to try and hook first gear but Gareth Clayton hmm, might have a case to answer there. That was robust at best. Uh, there was a bit of a gap, but he kind of sl slid through the corner, clattered into the side of Matt Flowers, and...
Matt Flower's car, hopefully, is going to be able to rejoin. Otherwise, uh, Flowers will take root in the grass on the outside of Ireland Band. And there he is, he's absolutely stuck. So, yes. Flowers and grass together, but Matt Flowers on the edge of the road, absolutely furious and understandably so, because slams the door shut. That was not his fault. He was, as you saw, given a decidedly severe lead. Uh, and uh, he's out of the race as a consequence. It shuffles the order, and so also will this penalty for Gordon McMillan shuffle the order. So he's uh, got his penalty, as I say, presumably for track limits. And so on the road, with now four and a half minutes to go, it's going to be a rather different order from how the results are going to dictate. But the one constant is this rather metronomic number 11 car in the lead of Joe Doval. He's already gone through. In second place is Conor Grady, and third on the road is Gordon McMillan. Now, fourth on the road, Ross Stoner. Fifth on the road is Gareth Clayton, and sixth is Mike Doble. But you put the penalty of 10 seconds onto Gordon McMillan, and he's going to fall down to eighth place. That's Conor Grady coming down through Cascades. Four more minutes of the race remain then as the race leaders accelerate along Lakeside Straight once more. We're on lap number six. Matt Flowers' car still presumably stuck on the edge of the circuit. Hopefully, everybody's going to respond to the yellow flags and therefore reduce their pace accordingly. Nice little battle developing a bit further back here, as you can see. Uh, Rob Langham in the traffic and up through Island Bend. The cars do slide, in fairness, to uh, Gareth Clayton from the lap ago. But there is Alex Reid, number 148, and it's Max Noble behind him, who is therefore up ahead of Rod Langham. So you've had a change for 10th place on the road. 23, Max Noble has gained the spot, and he has his sights on doing the same again, doesn't he, before the end of the race to Alex Reid as they wriggle their way through Britons. Three more laps to run. BMWs, of course, popular race cars, a number of championships, but this one uh, being a really good competitive and low-cost way of coming into the series, the BMW 3 Series Compact, and a red flag is being shown in the background. Race stop. I was going to say, these cars, of course, not as young as they were, so they're in uh, harder supply, but with a red flag shown presumably because of Matt Flower's car in a, a dangerous place over on the outside of... Uh, Island Bend, but the red flag shown race stop, and with just under three minutes to go, I can't see that being restarted. That would be a result. So we will await confirmation, but uh, red flag, race stop, and the result will be confirmed, presumably, uh, with the dominant race leader, Joe Doble, as a winner, and Connor Grady second, but then it gets a bit more messy with this penalty to be applied to Gordon McMillan. Shame that the red flag had to be shown really because that was uh, a, a lively race the good news is there's uh, another one for the bmws to come a little bit later on in the day uh, so just to remind you we've got one more race to come before the lunch break the huge grid of modified fords uh, will take to the circuit next and then there'll be the lunch break uh, then we'll do the three categories once more and then the fun cup endurance race to uh, round out the afternoon so that is what we have next to look forward to. But the winning drivers making their way in towards Park Ferme. And grumpy drivers making their way back to their cars. Matt Flowers then uh, to uh, go and try and get the mud off the car and have a look at the lack of front. That car might look somewhat different when we see it again. You can see why, though, it uh, was felt perhaps by race control that the race needed to be interrupted. Uh, a safety car would have taken them to the end, so there was no real point. But uh, if anybody else had have gone off, they'd have found that car and uh, a very disappointed Matt Flowers. Uh, as we saw, Gareth Clayton was the man that made that big dive on the inside. Contact between the two. Matt Flowers, the one that came off worst. So, might be a little bit of clearing up to be done, but uh, the recovery crew is at the end of the pit lane ready to be released modified Fords next Alton Park a little less wet than it was for the British GT Easter uh, Easter Monday races but uh, more rain forecast sadly and it seems to be remarkably wet in the northwest these last couple of weeks so uh, as you saw from Matt Flowers escapade get onto that grass it's not only uh, very slippery but it's also very boggy and that's why he couldn't get the traction to come off the uh, other end. 
Let's have a look at the provisional race result then, uh, based on who got to the line and penalties taken into account as well. Joe Doble, race winner from Conor Grady and Ross Stoner third. Gareth Claydon, possibly with a question mark over his uh, pointy elbows fourth. Mike Doble fifth and Richard Sutherland sixth ahead of Peter Smith. The penalised Gordon McMillan third on the road drops to eighth ahead of Alex Reid. Rod Langham 10th because although Max Noble was ahead, he wasn't ahead at the end of the lap the result is taken from. Uh, 12th Adam Wright, Mark Grady 13th and Xavier Ross in 14th place. Alistair Smith 15th ahead of Thor Van Aston up from his 10 second delayed start. Barney Lower next, then Daniel Mountford from Alex Corkwell uh, and Tim Seaford 20th with Matt Flowers, the driver not running at the time of the red flag, therefore taken out of the results. So over in the distance at uh, Shell Oil's corner, the uh, officials swiftly trying to get Matt Flower's car and have done so off the grass. Probably can be driven back from there, uh, but it looks a bit dog-eared. The uh, driver's briefing this morning talked about people taking home their cars in as good a state as they brought them. Matt won't, but not through any fault of his own. There's the local car wash open, I wonder, down the road. So uh, you can dash down the road and make it uh, less muddy. Mud swept off the circuit, and uh, Matt can now fire it up and bring the car round to the pit lane. But he's got a lot of work to do in the second race because he's going to be at the back of the grid, and uh, more mud drops from the car as he sets off. Trying to put the car offline so that any mud that does drop from it won't go onto the racing line, and uh, Matt Flowers will bring the car back. Possibly can have a word with Gareth Clayton to say, uh, what the? see the dent in the door I think the car's okay it's just got a slightly uh, crinkled door on that left hand side recovery vehicle in pursuit marshals on the grid getting ready for modified Fords which will be our next action on track for this uh, first BRSCC event of the season and uh, with a little bit of rain forecast in about 35 minutes' time. Might well be that the drivers in the second round of races uh, have uh, a rather damp track to contend with. Uh, we'll turn our attention in a moment to the modified Ford series, uh, which is uh, sort of having a, a second lease of life in a way. Go back into the 1990s, there was the Fast Ford Championship. Uh, that faded away, but has, has come back with this great assortment of cars and uh, we'll have a huge field of them, something like 29, taking to the circuit in a few minutes time. Prior to that, let us go back into the fresh air. Scott Woodwiss has found our winning BMW drivers, Scott. Well, we never like to see things end under a red flag, but I think regardless of how we took it, it's a, a congratulations for a first winning Compact Cup for Joe Doble. Another winner for the Doble Dynasty in BMW Compact Cup. From pole, fastest lap, led every single race. How's that feel? Now, that's the perfect race, apart from the uh, red flag. Um, I managed to get the gap at the start, pull that gap, and then just try and maintain it for the foot last quarter of the race. Um, but no, it's a good start to the season. It seems like you've been taking a bit of tuition from your dad and your, your brother who's in touring cars. Is that, have they been giving you some tips over the winter just to get a bit faster or have you found some pace yourself? No, I think doing a lot of sim racing has helped me build my own, um, you know, my own pace and obviously it helps to have a touring car driver as your coach. <laughs> um, but uh, it's all come together. I mean, cars look brilliant, um, feel brilliant and it's, you know, it's going well. You got the first one off your back. Now it's a difficult second album. You've got to kind of try and do it again later on this afternoon. Are you confident? Anything to tweak on the car, or you think it's in the sweet spot? No, I think it's it's in the sweet spot at the moment. Um, all I can do is try and do the same again. So first win, Thank first of many, much. hopefully. Well done, congratulations. Definitely. Right, let's bring over Conor Grady in second place. Because I have to say provisionally, because of course it's down to the results and stuff. But anyway, second place for Conor Grady. Conor, well that's not bad. First time out in compact cup and a first podium. Yeah, I was um, getting used to the car. Every time I'm going out, I'm getting better. So hopefully. We'll be all, all right getting, getting on to the start of the season, really. So what brought you to the Compact Cup? Because you've done quite a few things. You've been a former Fiesta Junior briefly, Ginettas, you've done Clears, quite a few things. What was it that brought you to Compact Cup? Um, Mikey Doble told me it's a, I should 
have a go. And then I just, I, me and my dad said, oh, he wanted to have a go, so I thought I'll have a go with him. So he yeah, been, been getting on all the, all the time. He, hopefully he's, he's been getting better, so it's all, all good. Yeah, it's a recommendation for Mikey, because you two went to Will to Will in Jeunesse uh, a couple of years ago as well. Yeah, me and Mikey used to be teammates, so uh, that's why it, it, he told me to get, come and have a go, so yeah. I did. Enjoyed it so far? Yeah, really did. Getting, getting on the fun car to drive, to be fair. Quite hard to drive, but getting, just getting used to it. Yeah. Great stuff. Well done on the podium. Fingers crossed for race two. Thank we'll you. see you later on. Uh, and third place, I'm going to double check. Pardon me. I think last time I saw it, it was Ross Stoner. Give me a second. I should really have this primed up being more professional, but uh, screenshots it was. Yes, Ross Stoner. Ross is bringing you in. Hello. So, uh, Ross, uh, obviously, I think there, obviously we've got to double check the results, but given that Matt wasn't running, so you were the next one behind him in the order on the results, so you're third on that one. Um, good result for you. Yeah, I mean, you know, my, uh, my dad who's over there that's just wandered off. All right, Dad? No, he's taking no notice. Uh, my mechanic, uh, Carl, did a mega job. We were, you know, going pretty well in testing yesterday, and then the rain came, and I basically turned into a wet lettuce yeah. uh, in qualifying. But uh, my daughter's watching, who's 11, Daisy Stoner. She said, I've got to give her a mention. So uh, there you go, Daisy Duda. At least we've got, I think, a cap and a trophy to take back, because that's the Masters and the third place, I think. So had worse days. Yeah, so race two now. Anything, any thoughts start from the second row? Well, if it rains, I'll probably be close to dead last, so... Uh, um, we'll just take one result today, to be honest. I have some confidence in yourself. No, not in the rain. I got too old. <laughs> I've lost my bottle. But in the dry, I think I'm still just as good, and I was pleased with the start. Um, obviously, I've got to mention my wife, hey, Debs. Um, yeah, so they're at home watching, and, uh, yeah, if they can do a sun dance, that would be mega. Well done. Congratulations. We'll see you for race number two in that stuff. So. Right, time for our next race as the rain starts to fall. So whilst David stays nice and dry the comments box, I'm going to come and join him. Next race coming up is for the modified Fords. Great, very grid. It's aging back to David for the grid as I try and find a bit of shelter and a towel at this rate. Back to you, David. Uh, Scott, thank you. Uh, yes, perhaps the weather gods um, are cynics after all because of all the cars you could put a wet track in front of, uh, these are the least ideal. Big, big, powerful turbocharged engines in many cases or big, big, brutal V8 engines in others. Uh, that said, you've got some rather uh, handier front-wheel drive cars to take on the big bangers. So this is going to be an enthralling race, the modified Ford Series, uh, race one of two. Uh, the uh, cars were in action at uh, the end of last year with huge grids. They started at Silverstone with Dave Cockell's Ford Escort Cosworth taking two wins. And it is uh, local man Piers Grange who is going to be on pole position in the silver Ford Escort Mark II with Jim Hutchison's Mark 1 uh, lining up with him at the front. Josh Payton uh, on the second row of the grid and Tom Ovenden, uh, rally crosser, starting next. So let's look at that grid then. Piers Grange and Jim Hutchison row 1. It's a rolling start, by the way, ahead of Josh Payton and Tom Ovenden. Uh, David Matias, the leak-based driver, very experienced campaigner with Paul Neville for company. Uh, then you've got Todd Gardner and uh, Alex Bohm starting on the fourth row of the grid. Row 5 is where you find Mike Manning, another former rally crosser uh, with the Sierra Cosworth, and it is Oliver Bullion alongside him. Then Robert Lewis and Sam Shimwell lining up ahead of James Allen and Mike Furley. Chris Baker and Jay Hinton uh, will come next ahead of Alan Breck and uh, Darren Owen. Deadly Daz, former Bangor racer and classic hot rod racer. Uh, Scott Matthias is ahead of Matt McCarthy. Then it's Luke Bennett and Piers Warwick with Dave Barrett and Mick Head on the 12th row of the grid. The 13th row, Malcolm Wise, who seems to have been around racing Fords almost since the Model T. He's been uh, such a sore racer. Colin Claxton, who's another Alton Park Northwest Sports Saloon regular, uh, 26th on the grid, ahead of Kevin Hadfield and then Sean Hadfield. Wayne Crabtree has a question mark over his very pretty Gulf Winter Grid Mark 1 Escort because that had problems in qualifying and retired before the end of the session. But as long as it's there, uh, it should be a car to watch making some progress. Uh, one or two, as you can see, fabulous retro liveries, including not only Zach Speed Castrol, but also Jägermeister colours on a couple of cars, uh, including the uh, Eurocar V8 that runs for Luke Bennett and Alan Brex uh, for Capri V8. Uh, Martini colours, more familiar with rally Fords than racing Fords, but uh, and another uh, Zach Speed delivery you can see. And the Gulf Escort of Wayne Crabtree has made it out, which is good news. Uh, it will start at the back of the grid behind Sean Hadfield's uh, for humour. Escorts, Fiestas, Capris, um, 
Cosworth Sierras. Uh, it was a sapphire Cosworth I spotted, uh, plus the uh, Ford shaped Eurocar V8. Uh, there are one or two Fiestas in the mix as well. Uh, and Josh Payton deserves a word for his much modified uh, Mark II Cortina, which is going to be third on the grid. So cars slotting into place down on the uh, grid. The Sapphire Cosworth I was talking about is the uh, car of uh, David uh, Matthias that is on the third row. A little bit further back you'll find Mike Manning's Sierra running in the pseudo Eggenberger colours of 1987's World Touring Car Championship 1988's European and occasional British races, the Texaco colours in other words, uh, but will no doubt come to that car in the course of the race. Mike Manning with his Rallycross experience uh, will be a man to watch in these greasy conditions I think, but find something that's not got too much horsepower and is nimble uh, and might make progress during the course of the race. That will be a, a potential winner because for the moment the rain is still falling and you can see wipers on the Escort Mark II and the Escort Mark I at the front of the grid. Piers Grange in the silver Escort uh, behind the pace car in the uh, British Racing green and gold colours is Jim Hutchison. The second row, the red Cortina hidden for the moment is Josh Payton and then another uh, driver with off-road experience, Tom Avenden uh, in the family's familiar red and yellow colours starting fourth. Fifth is the white Sierra David Matar. Sixth is Paul Neville's uh, white and blue, very forward liveried escort. Right, rapidly through the countdown. Uh, safety car, pace cars it is, moves off. And so now the race cars follow suit. Opportunity to get a bit of warmth into tyres and discover where the traction may or may not be. The Fiestas and the Focuses, I think, are going to be worth keeping an eye on in the course of the race because, as I say, they're a little bit more nimble. Uh, in fairness to the Matthias family, they're both in the Sapphire shape, Sierra Sapphire Cosworth, which when they came along uh, in their heyday were absolutely demon to win Group N and uh, production saloon spec races. Uh, but uh, never so successful in the two-litre British touring car era. Down through a, a wet cascades then comes Piers Grange, the uh, trailer manufacturer. One or two other drivers that uh, are worth keeping an eye on. A little bit further back, Darren Owen with his Ford Escort, the Chase Metal Recycling backed car at Dowsey's company. Uh, he was one of the stars in the 1990s of the Inca Race Midland Bangor racing scene. Uh, and then stop racing while his son took up the competition cudgels instead and then Daz came back to racing in classic hot rods and has spread his wings to circuit racing. He's always been a great fan of Fords, whether it was with an escort in classic hot rods or I suppose in his manual racing days, like pretty much everybody else around him, it always used to be a Granada, which was the Vogue car of the time. Uh, but uh, Daz will be one to watch. Uh, I mentioned already uh, the... Uh, Sierra of Mike Manning, but throw into the mix as well Malcolm Wise, who's been racing Fords for a long, long time. And so on the track surface as we have it now, it's going to be interesting to see who the survivors are, who the clever drivers are that uh, don't use all of the horsepower when they can't, and uh, therefore risk going off the road. Number 29 is the Mike Furley uh, Ford Escort Mark 1 backed by Derek Hale's new homes in Norfolk. Uh, Derek himself, former racer on the circuits and ovals. Big slide to get warmth into the rubber from Josh Payton's Cortina you saw coming out of the chicane. There's Mike Manning's Texaco liveried Sierra. The Jägermeister for Capri in the background with its V8 engine is uh, Alan Breck, the ABC house and extension calculations backed car. So. It is a very slow pace lap, you've got to say this, one of the reasons for having a warming up lap is to get warmth into the tyres, but the pace car driver is being rather timid on a wet road, perhaps understandably, but it's certainly not helping the race cars, and a problem by the look of it for 87, because peeling onto the cut through at his lops is David Matthias, that by the look of it is the end of his Sierra, and I wonder whether that's going to delay the start, because he's going to park presumably at the escape road, Hopefully that is out of the way, and is he going to have to park it and retire, or can he do a sort of control-alt-delete reset and get going again? Car is still moving, but as everybody will have gone past him, 
Uh, so he's going to have to start from the back of the grid. If he doesn't, then he'll get a penalty. Uh, so 87, David Mataz gets going. With the touring car stickers on the side of the car. And Scott Mataz, his son, is also back right off possibly to see what's wrong with dad so those two now are going to find themselves uh, right at the rear of the grid as they work their way uh, up towards Druid so Scott Matars goes to the back as well and the race will be getting underway shortly after this very very slow formation lap behind the pace car which seems to be taking forever they crawl their way uh, out of Druid's So the uh, lights are out on top of the safety car. Everybody now should get themselves in that two by two Noah's Ark formation uh, ready for the start. Tiptoeing down towards Lodge Corner. The pace car as it is will head for the pit lane, finally. And then the race will be underway with Piers Grange rather quicker on his toes than Jim Hutchison behind him, who's uh, fallen quite a long way back now. It's up to the front row drivers to control the pace, which Piers Grange seems to have done a rather better job of. The lights go out. We go racing in a big, big slide. Paul Neville has lost it coming over the line, and he's in the barriers already on the pit straight. He just lost traction. There he is up against the barrier coming out of Deer Leap. So the race is on, but there's already a car, as you can see, up against the barriers. So uh, the cars go down towards Old Hall Corner. Paul Neville is going to get himself going. Jim Hutchison comes through on the inside line and takes the lead from Piers Grange. Those two escorts have made a good getaway. Paul Neville's car is trying to rejoin as everybody else battles out of Cascades. In third place, looks like being uh, Tom Avenden. In fourth place, I would offer you is the Cortina Mark II of Josh Payton. And then the Fiestas are going to be next in the queue. Yellow flag on the start straight as Paul Neville has got going again. So he's somewhat delayed, but the road is clear at any rate as the leaders come out of Shell Oil's corner. Again, 15 minutes of racing and the drivers hoping that the road dries out enough for them to be able to apply all of the power and get some grip and it might just do so late race but Jim Hutchison then who didn't look all that keen on the end of the formation lap is the race leader with the tail wagging as he comes out of his lot out of uh, Britain's over hilltop great noise that the car makes immaculately presented uh, and a proper kind of throwback to the special saloons era with a big rear wing on the car in second place is Piers Grange look at the gap these three have pulled already uh, over everybody else battle on amongst the fiestas though there look at 77 James Allen goes charging through on the outside line in fact battle on amongst the focuses I should say that's a fiesta in strife though that's 44 Oliver Bullion and goes across the grass the focus of James Allen back on track so at the moment, it's just finding traction. It's surviving that's key to all of this. Down through his locks, they turn. And so up Clay Hill, lap one is going to be completed imminently by Jim Hutchison and Piers Grange. They are building the gap quite nicely over the opposition. Alan uh, Brett goes through with the Jägermeister coloured Capri. And towards the end of lap one of 15 minutes of racing will come the leaders in a moment. 503 uh, goes through. That's Jay Hinton's forward focus. But the leaders have already gone by. Jim Hutchison is ahead of a very sideways Piers Granger has lost it, going into Old Hall Corner out of second place. And looking out of the window, just to tell you, because it's important, it's the second place car, it's in the gravel bed. There he is. Piers Grange is in the gravel in Old Hall Corner. And that was all the amount of power on the pit straight. The car had a massive fishtail. We've got one or two others. Odea overtaking under a yellow flag there. Look, the white Fiesta shouldn't have done that. That was, I rather fear, uh, Oliver Bullion so hopefully he will redress that and back off but coming out of the corner it is going to be Tom Avenden up into second place and yes Oliver Bullion has seen the error of his ways and he's not just let Josh Payton through but also James Allen's uh, focus so the yellows wave now this new gravel trap at Old Hall Corner that has ensnared uh, Piers Grange new for this year that going past Josh Payton is James Allen. That focus is absolutely flying. Uh, but the concern would be that the car needs to be removed from the gravel bed and a red flag might have to be shown. So I'm keeping an eye on the gantry just to see what happens next. We are going to have the safety car. That's what we're going to do. So the safety car is going to be deployed. The race neutralised to remove Piers Grange and his car from the gravel. 
Nobody touched him, I promise you. Although we didn't see it, I was watching it out of the window, and it was just the amount of power as the turbo kicked in. The back started to wag, and there was just nothing Piers could do to hold it. Around it went, uh, and it looped its way into the gravel. Uh, he's out of the race. There's another car that has just come down the pit lane. It's Paul Neville's rather battered uh, escort after its calamity at the start of the race. So not a good... Uh, Start to the race for Mark to escorts, I'm afraid to say. Safety car then on track. Gives us a chance to have a look at one or two of the others, including Alex Bohm's Mark 6 Fiesta there. Mike Manning behind, masquerading as Klaus Ludwig or Steve Soper or Klaus Niedwitz or Pierre Giudone, who were the uh, Eggenberger drivers those seasons. And the safety car awaits the leaders. It will scoop them all up uh, once the leader comes over the line and Jim Hutchinson has just done so there he is that's the race leader second place now will be Tom Ovenden there moving up from junior rallycross and having a dabble in circuit racing at this level after uh, being uh, the token package for the last couple of years and then it's going to be a long long wait I think before we have anybody to third and I would suggest it's going to be James Allen's Ford Focus that's third, it is. Fourth now, Josh Payton. Fifth, Oliver Bullion. And then another big gap before Alex Bohm will be sixth. Mike Manning, seventh in the Sierra Cosworth. And in eighth place now, it's going to be Todd Garner. Ninth uh, will be Robert Lewis and then Jay Hinton to round out the top ten. Get the feeling, though, this is going to be a long safety car period because... As yet, there is no recovery vehicle on hand to drag Piers Grange's car out of the gravel bed. And a 15-minute race doesn't offer you many laps anyway on a long circuit. Nine minutes done already. Sorry, nine minutes to go already, I should say. So we've had the first third of the race. So safety car slows everybody down. Once, presumably, they're all in a line, then the instruction can be given for the recovery crews to go to work. There you can see second placed Tom Uppenden trying to find a bit of traction on the outside where sometimes there's a little bit more grip. They're going through number 49, almost uh, ICS livery, that Piers Warwick's uh, escort, the Mark 1, crossways garage of Bromley entered car. It's got Jaeger Meister all around him uh, with uh, Alan Beck ahead and Luke Bennett behind. Very smart Castrol livery escort. It's Mike Furley's car. Another former oval racer. Uh, Luke Bennett's Eurocar V8. Number one, eight six, Colin Claxton. And the Ford Pumas, a little bit further back. Right, there is seemingly um, movement at Old Hall so trying to sweep all the gravel away from the front of Piers Grange's car and we've lost another one because the Fiesta of their Sam Shimwell the Boomerang racing car has stopped I want to say that's down sort of near Island Bend that end of the circuit but uh, that car trying to be pushed to a place of safety now hopefully once Piers Grange's escort is out of the gravel it can be taken to the pit lane fairly swiftly this is the heart in mouth moment where the driver hopes no more damage is done because obviously with a big, big pull, it puts a load through the front of the car. But I think the operation is complete. The rope can be uh, detached. And so now a bit of gravel swept out of the front. Piers Grange hopefully can fire the car up. No, he can't. And then he's got to get himself off the wet grass. Why they couldn't have put the car on the grass is a bit of a, uh, on the tarmac and off the grass. I don't know. Uh, out of the race there is then Sam Shimwell's Fiesta it was down at Island Bend so that goes to the cut through hides itself in a place of safety now I'm afraid Piers Grange's car won't fire so it can't drive off the grass because it won't fire up so it's going to be a further delay
and it still doesn't want to fire. So now we're going to have to get the rope attached again. Pace car, safety car up towards the line. Now the marshal, I can see, are heading back to the silver escort at Old Hall. So whether that's to give it a shove to try and start the engine, or whether it's to push it off the grass or both, we shall see in a moment. Race order remaining the same, of course. No overtaking permissible under the safety car procedure like this. And Jim Hutchison's big lead has all but evaporated. He'll hopefully be able to buy that back, of course, once the uh, race goes live, although there won't be much of it left because we're already into the last six minutes. Marshall's there ready to hopefully give Piers Grange's car a shove. So the rope returns to the escort. And the Matthias family with their Sapphire Cosworths, which started at the back, have now headed into the pit lane and rather look like they're going to the paddock as well. So uh, frustration all round there. So yet another lap under the safety car. Big frustration for drivers that want to go racing. And uh, this has taken at least two laps, I think. Here's Grange's car, I think, is finally out of the gravel and off the grass. Now it just needs to be towed somewhere safe. Because clearly it doesn't want to fire up on its own. But on track, the Mark 1 Escorts, much modified, continue at the head of the pack with Jim Hutchison leading the way. The modified Ford series, not a championship, but a series of races. And uh, the class structure based on engine size and also uh, whether or not the cars are multi valve or have eco boost engines or the V6 or the V8. The whole idea really is to uh, attract in as many different cars as possible. Of varying levels of modification. Uh, there were something like 39 of them at Silverstone, uh, 29 of them here, so it's still a very healthy grid, and with the drivers making their way down towards Britain's, the clock has got three and three quarter minutes on it. I think the road is clear. Uh, there'll be a bit of gravel on the outside of Old Hall Corner, but this could end up with just one more racing lap, and uh, currently, we're only on lap four. So that rain shower has made it spectacular, but it's not really helped, from the driver's point of view, their ability to go racing. So as the cars come, again, very slowly behind the pace car, the safety car as it is this time, out of his lops, uh, they're eager to get on with it and of course the problem is when you go so slowly that any warmth you've got in your tyres just disappears completely anyway so the restart becomes even more larry. The lights are out which is good news and Jim Hutchison then, although the rain has stopped, it's still a greasy road, we've got Tom Avenden behind him, James Allen third, now he's made really good progress from 13th on the grid, admittedly he's been helped by one or two people throwing themselves at the scenery but he's also been a, a bold overtaker, that was kind of what I was looking for before the race started, a car that was going to be quick but didn't have so much power that it became unusable in these conditions and actually James Allen might not be done yet if he's really on his toes uh, and Tom Avenden or Jim Hutchison get a bit sideways ahead of him he might be able to gain another place before the end of the race so one more lap hopefully two we can squeeze in before the chequered flag uh, the drivers then make their way up towards the line the green flag is shown the lights go back to green we're back racing and a very, very determined start coming from the little Fiesta further back in the queue, uh, number 620, which absolutely blasts through the traffic of Todd Garner on the inside line. He was on his toes, certainly. I would suggest he did a bit of overtaking before the timing line, not after it, but even so, he's gained places, and the leaders go down through Denton's in towards Cascades then uh, with hopefully one more lap to squeeze in before the very end. 39 there, Josh Payton, he got mugged off the line. Mike Manning's understeering himself straight on. The rally crosser is off-road. Go on, Mike, keep your boot in. He does so, slides the car to tarmac, to grass. Uh, everybody finds a way past him. Mike Manning will be able to rejoin us there. Look, 
through the traffic goes Daz Owens, very smart red Mark 1 escort. Up towards Island Bend, he's got the Ford Focus is squabbling behind him as well now, Daz is on the mission. He's put himself up past Jay Hinton in 5.03, and at this rate, place in the top six might beckon for Deadly Daz. Comes out of Shell Oil's corner. So Daz Owen in the red escort, getting himself on the back of the Fiesta and Focus traffic to try to wriggle through. You can see, though, his much more modified escort with a little bit of a wag of the tail as the power kicks in. Comes then now down towards his lops. And also looking brave still, Todd Garner round the outside. Number 620, Darren Owen just gets the car turned into the corner, uh, moves himself up past 24, Alex Bohm's uh, Mark 6 Fiesta in the process as they come then now up towards the approach to Clay Hill. So the two, the engine escort of Daz Owen, looking to try to gain a place. Now 24 seconds or so on the clock. Where is the race leader? He's coming down towards Lodge. There in second place uh, is Tom Avender, James Allen, third, Josh Payton, fourth. This is the fight for fifth then. Oliver Bullion ahead of now Daz Owen in sixth. Though he has put himself into the top six. But the question is whether they can squeeze another lap out of it. Thankfully the answer is yes. Jim Hutchison goes through pulling away again from Tom Avenden, so they're on to the last lap of the race. James Allen third, that's where he's going to plateau. In fourth place is Oliver Bullion, and in fifth, oops, it's going to be Josh Payton. Sixth now for Ale uh, Todd Garner, and seventh is Daz Owen, but he's about to make a move on the inside, going down towards Old Hall Corner. The Mark 1 Escort then looks for the inside. Daz Owen shows his nose, but the uh, Fiesta chops him off for the moment. And now they make that run down towards Cascades. So the clock has hit zero. There are one or two others being able to gain ground a little bit further back now that the road starts to dry. Jim Hutchison through in 181, race leader. And that's your second place car of Tom Avenden. So the Mark 1 escorts, first and second. And seventh, because don't forget Daz Owen's car also is knocking on the door of that top six. Jim Hutchison, though, looking as though a race win beckons for him. He's also going to hope that things are a little bit drier this afternoon. Uh, racing is going to restart in just over 45 minutes' time. That's Daz Owen going around the outside then of Todd Garner for sixth place. So he's put himself into the top six. And can he do anything about Josh Payton's Mark II Cortina before the end? Because he's getting much, much closer. Look as they bounce their way over the kerb. The back flicks out on both the Escort and then the Cortina ahead. Over hilltop they come, down towards his lops. Daz Owen is certainly closing, he's certainly got the pace. Breaks for the corner, breaks for the chicane. Is he going to be able to dive up the inside? The answer there is no. Goes through the right, through the left, then right again, out of Nickerbrook corner. And then the run up the hill. So this, I think, is his moment to make the pass, isn't it? Because he was just heading to the inside line, though, as they went up towards Druid. But Jim Hutchinson is set for a race win in the first of our two modified Ford Series races of the day. Uh, this time, as he comes up out of Deer Leap, there's going to be a checkered flag at the ready. And Jim Hutchinson wins the first modified Ford Series race of the day. Second across the line is going to be uh, Tom Avenden. There he is. And for third place, it's going to be the Ford focus of James Allen in fourth the little fiesta of Oliver Bullion one of the drives of the race that but underlining how sometimes too much power is a handicap uh, in fifth place it is going to be Daz Owen because he did go through on the run to Druids and a change on the line for sixth because you had Todd Garner go through ahead of Josh Payton so we've one or two transponders not working that's why the uh, race classification is still shuffling. Everybody else comes over the line, including Mike Manning there, who got himself back on track after his gravelly moment, and also Wayne Crabtree after his travails earlier on in the qualifying session. The Ford Pumas chasing home the escort Cosworth of uh, Malcolm Wise. So Jim Hutchinson, the race winner. And considering he only had two laps after the safety car to win by 8.3 seconds, it's pretty impressive stuff, I would have thought. Uh, James Allen then third. Jim Hutchinson, James Allen, Oliver Bullion, Todd Garner, class winners. 
so also Piers Warwick a little bit further back with his Mark 1 Escort so we'll see the Fords out again uh, later on after lunch the order is going to be the same Formula Fords from the BMW and then the uh, Fords before we get to the Fun Cup race and then four hours for the Fun Cup Endurance uh, season opener so Jim Hutchinson's win 8.3 seconds might not have qualified uh, at the top but uh, even so a remarkable job done and uh, it remains to be seen whether Piers Grange and Paul Neville and indeed the Matthias Izzies can get their cars ready for race two because if they are having to come up from the rear of the grid that'd be well worth watching so let's have a look at the provisional result then Jim Hutchinson the winner of our modified Ford Series race ahead of Tom Avonson uh, with James Allen a class winning third a class winning fourth Oliver Bullion Darren Owen uh, fifth in the end ahead of Todd Garner who took sixth on the line from Josh Payton Robert Lewis was eighth from Alex Bow. Mike Thurley with his very smart uh, escort Mark 1. Tenth, Alan Breck next. And Wayne Crabtree started 29th and got himself up to 12. A mega effort ahead of uh, Mike Manning and Matt McCarthy's Fiesta in 14th. 15th, Piers Warwick ahead of Colin Claxton's Zack Speed Escort Recreation. Luke Bennett's Eurocar was ahead of Dave Barrett's Fiesta. Malcolm Wise fended off the Hadfields and then Nick Head with Jay Hinton, Chris Baker behind. We lost Piers Grange, we lost Scott and David Matthias as well. And we lost Sam Shimwell, and we lost Paul Neville after his uh, dramas off the rolling start. So there's uh, not that much time for the four teams to do work, but there is work to be done, and hopefully uh, we'll have a good complement of cars for our second race for them, uh, which will come up a little bit later on in the afternoon. So as I say, there's a short break from race action. We'll hear from our winning four drivers, though, and uh, then... Uh, we'll have a, a chance to catch up on Fun Cup news. Jennifer Zanis will be controlling the pits in the race, but also before it, uh, we'll work with some of the drivers and teams before we get into our four hour endurance race. That's going to come during the uh, race break. But the stream, as I say, will continue. Uh, and uh, then we'll be back to a full afternoon of racing with these three. Uh, categories that have delivered action it's a shame that we've had the uh, interruption to the Fords but uh, and the red flag in the BMWs but some good racing this morning more to come uh, the rest of the field you can see making its way around to the Park Ferme area Nick Heads Escort Coswell from the Martini colour scheme uh, makes its way towards the pit lane uh, next race then Formula Ford in about 40 minutes uh, and uh, see whether or not well, Richard Frey right. can do the double uh, after the way that he went earlier on. Yeah. Don't yeah. bet against and him, I think he's going to be the <laughs> message <laughs> to the opposition. <laughs> and then we'll look forward yeah. to uh, BMW and Ford action with Fun Cup. Four hours. And it's a good entry. I know I keep saying this about uh, proper endurance race, but got some good names in there, whether it's uh, experienced all-rounders like Jason Minshaw, whether it's uh, previous champions like... Uh, Neil Plimmer or uh, last year's champions from the Team Olympian GRD squad uh, or the uh, very, very experienced Johnny Nolan with, what, 10, if not more now, the mole starts to his name. Uh, so there's a lot to look forward to in Fun Cup. Should be a really intriguing race, especially given the way the pit window works. And Scott Woodwiss will join me up here for that, but we've sent him back out into the rain to go and uh, find our Ford drivers and uh, we'll hear from them in a few moments time so there's an opportunity for teams to do a bit of running repairs to cars cars to be retrieved around the circuit as well by uh, the uh, recovery team and then we'll be back in business with the super classic formula fords race two uh, coming up after lunch richard frey looking to do the double from pole position as he did earlier despite his spin but uh, he'll be hard to beat right uh, Jim Hutchinson dominates our modified Ford Series race one. He's with Scott. Well, slightly eventful first modified Ford Series race, to say the least, but we have got a top three here, uh, and we'll be able to have a chat to Mr. Second. Let's ha have a chat first with Jim Hutchinson, who's our race winner, of course, in this uh, really like, beautiful green and gold Mark 1 Escort. Um, looks like you were quite enjoying the sort of slightly damp, slightly wet conditions. Aye, the, the car is actually very good. We're just 
there's a new engine in it for the start of this year. It has had no testing. I didn't have time to test it back home in Northern Ireland. So it was a test day for the car and for myself because I haven't raced in maybe five or six years myself. So it was a test day for both of us. So it's paid off. Yeah. It's not a bad test day to win a race, is it? No, it's nice. You'll, you have to take them in the combat. Yeah, it was good. It was good. Looks like you had some initial fun with Tom and the other RSR over there. These um, these Mark 1 RSRs have got quite some quite some poke in a straight line, haven't they? Oh, they're class. I just love them. I have two of them. I have one to back home again. And it's the same as that one, only it's road legal. So, oh, they're they're magnificent yoke, definitely. Yeah. And you're part of a magnificent grid of cars with all sorts of different forms of shapes and sizes, so it fits in nicely. Well, that's why back home in the north of Ireland, we don't have grids like anywhere near this. Plus, with no caliber racing like this as well. So, yeah, uh, this is my first time over racing with the Ford guys, and it definitely won't be my last. Yeah, I hope you're first of many, and uh, you got to do the double now later on. Oh, don't put the pressure on. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> yeah. Listen, you drove superbly. Well done. We'll Thank see you for race two. Much. Congrats. Springs uh, Tom over, over in second place. Apologies. He was seeking to give him a push, but it had to be the marshal to give him a push. <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, um, great to see. You. Also, we should say, point out to Sim Motorsport as well. Of course, you're one of their uh, sports, sports and graduate, one of the BRACC partners as well. Shout out to them. Uh, but Tom, what car to drive in, uh, apart from the small little hiccup at the end there um amazing performance for second how was it yeah it's um, always very very special to drive this car with our family story the cars come from it's always very special to do and it's an awesome awesome machine just a slight electrical issue we're on a bit of a countdown with the battery and it is just i timed it absolutely perfectly yeah. conking out as soon as i come back <laughs> in the pits so we'll get it sorted for race two but no i really enjoyed that the car has actually had more grip than i thought in those tricky conditions on the slicks um so yeah it was really good i'm mean, good time to be in the opening moments you had uh, you were keeping jim honest in the other rsr so that must have been fun both of you going back and forth a little bit yeah it was good on the last lap, lost, lost the power steering and a couple of other bits of electrical things. So I was like, okay, well, we've got a big gap, we'll settle. But I don't think I was catching anyway, he was on rails. So we know these cars are so, so fun to drive. Real drive distance to what I'm used to, but it's really good fun. So yeah, I'm really enjoying it. So apart from fixing a little electric glitch, it's just put yourself on the front row of the grid and maybe try and beat him down to turn one next time. That's the plan. I have to make sure my right foot's buried on the whole of the start. <laughs> hope it's not too damp out there next time. Yeah, hopefully it's nice and dry. We're we'll quickly dry. So that's if it's nice and dry, it's much more simple. So we would much prefer that. Well done, Tom. Congratulations, excellent work, good stuff. Well, that's been James in third place. Uh, how are you? Um, right, third place, good to see you back on the podium. You said to be the focus of running well this morning. Uh, it's in tip top shape, and third place seems to be pretty on the point there. Yeah, um, we had a few issues in qualifying, um, just didn't really fall to us. But the race, we started 13th, and we, I just, my idea was just to get ahead as quickly as I could, and we, we picked away a few. I think a few fell off, didn't they? The first few turns there was, a, there was a, a handful shall we say yeah which helped um yeah i just struggled with rear tire temps so the back end's just like well, a bit like the rear wheel drive boys it's just sliding around um and it's don't really do well for your confidence um safety car helped maybe i caught up but again they just they, they got away I just one of those limp it to the end then and um we suffered the briefly, because first time I spoke to you on camera since the start of the season, you've got a new aero package on the back of the car. If you want to quickly spin on and have a look at it, it's a slightly different, slightly taller rear wing than you had last year. Just talk us through the, the change on that. Um, so we was forever being told um, by people who know better than us, um, it's a parachute, take it off. So I, I basically said, I'm not taking it off until I've got an alternative. Yeah. And it's basically the current generation touring car wing um, that we've put a little bit further out than what they're allowed to do, but within our regs. And uh, yeah, it's made a big difference, certainly on the straights. Excellent. Well, it seemed to make a difference as well to get you up to third, so uh, all working well, and fingers crossed the race too. Brilliant. Thank Good you to see you, mate. Excellent Cheers. stuff. Well done. Right, so that's now going into the lunch break now, and whilst we do that, I believe we're going to hand over to our esteemed colleague, Jamie Peters Dennis, who we'll bring in here to have a quick chat about, because he's ever chat to a few of the teams down in pit lane ahead of today's uh, opening round of the 2024 Fun Cup of Duets Championship. And I think, Jamie, the smile on your face says it that, uh, same as me and everyone else, you're quite excited for this, aren't you? It's only been 170 days since we were last here in October. Um, not, not that you're counting? No, not at all. And um, it'd be nice if the weather was a bit nicer. Um, but yeah, really, really excited. There's been huge um, social media stuff and promotion on the Fun Cup this year. We've got 24 teams, uh, new partners with Gala Performance, obviously GT carrying on with the, with the tyre supplier. So yeah, really looking forward to going down the pit lane. I have 
warned a few of the teams to look out for me, so they'll probably all go run and hide like they normally do. But yeah, hopefully um, you, David, and I will, will have a great time this afternoon. And just for context, five former champion teams, including the defending champions, different colour scheme for them this year because they've got a slightly different driver lineup, and the likes of Johnny Mola and Scott Mansell on the grid. This promises on paper to be quite a mega four hours in store. It's going to be a mega season, I think. I think it's going to be one of the most open seasons in a long time, and we, we understand there's more cars coming out throughout the year as well. Um, yeah, going back into this race, as you say, a stellar lineup, and great to see Scott Mansell out there with his dad, um, and great to see the kids coming in as well. We saw it here last year at October. Mikey Porter and Ted Bradbury, they really laid down the gauntlet, and um, Mikey's back this weekend deputising for Neil Burrows, who sadly can't be here, and what we saw, what he did a couple of weeks ago, they'll, they'll be right up at the sharp end as well. Excellent. We're going to hand over to you now so you can have a chat. But for those who want to find out more information on the championship, head to funcup.co.uk. You can watch all the action on the website from the front page. You can also head to see what cars are for sale, info about the teams, about the season ahead and so. So it's going to be quite mega. But Jamie's going to be your eyes and ears down in pit lane for a while. So we're going to go into the lunch break and I'm going to go and converse with David and see how the afternoon looks. But we'll hand you the capable hands of Jamie Peter Zenis. He's going to take you through the, the uh, pit lane walk before we get into our afternoon action here at Alton Park. So I shall hand the microphone over and we'll see you in a few minutes' time. So while Jamie relocates from uh, the Park Ferme area to the pit lane and our camera crews scurry with him, uh, let's just reflect on a busy morning of racing. Richard Frey taking honours in the uh, Super Classic uh, Formula 4 Championship and helping himself, therefore, I know it's early days, but uh, benefiting from the absent uh, state of Alex Ames to really help his championship hopes. Uh, we've had a good win for Joe Doble in the uh, BMW Compact Cup and uh, a great drive first time here first time in the series by northern irish driver jim hutchinson in the modified ford series the uh, officials as you can perhaps see going towards britain's recovering cars the track workers on the start and finish line looking at barrier damage after uh, paul neville's car clanged the armco so uh, although it is a break in quotes uh, there's still a little activity for people to need to worry about before we go racing, uh, which will be in about half an hour's time, 12.40, we're being told, is going to be the uh, start of the Formula Ford race. Again, they'll come from the assembly area around onto the grid. Uh, the Super Classic Championship that has morphed through different uh, iterations, but uh, it, it go back years and years and years, was the sort of pre-90 uh, Formula Ford series. The champion of Alton, uh, which runs within it at the Alton Park events, as you see the barrier repair work going on on the... Uh, pit straight uh, goes back to the very early 80s when uh, MCD ran uh, Alton Park and Franz Hatch and Snetterton and uh, came with these one circuit Formula Ford ideas that were then copied and they were hugely successful and then one or two drivers said wouldn't it be nice to go to a, a second circuit and Champion of Alton became the North West series but uh, uh, go back to its early days and the likes of Richard Peacock was a champion and uh, Richard Street in North Wales the uh, Booths John Booth John Butcher Booth that went on to, of course, run a Formula One team. John Brolly Booth, another early champion. Uh, and then for a number of seasons, champion of Alton Formula Ford Racing, always enlivened by the Ecclestons, Roger and then Peter Eccleston, that came along, took on, in 1986, it was Roger versus Scott Stringfellow, which was a great season of racing. Uh, and then Peter Kay came along and dominated uh, with Mike Waite. Graham Riley had his uh, very successful spell, and on and on and on it went. Uh, but uh, Formula Ford Racing, even though the cars can trace their origins back to the 1960s uh, still produce decent grids good competitive racing it's a, perhaps a surprise that we haven't got a few more of them out uh, this weekend but the quality of racing no doubt as we saw with some good fights in that earlier race will be mirrored once more uh, in the second race of the day the BMWs which continue to entertain of course uh, after giving good racing uh, in the greasy conditions earlier on in the day a good low-cost way of getting into motorsport and although the compact itself isn't perhaps as common on the road uh, maybe a, a second class might uh, be under consideration for the one series just to safeguard the future of low-cost bmw racing because there's certainly no shortage of parts and no shortage of enthusiasm to go racing uh, and then the modified fords well there's a rather sorry looking escort being retrieved having pulled off down at the uh, island bend part of the circuit that hopefully can be made good for race two and uh, the Fords themselves which have been delivering plenty of drama uh, and gave good racing at Silverstone as well uh, I think I said at the time it's the 
worst track surface that you could have had for those cars uh, with that downpour of rain just before they uh, came out onto the circuit. So, as far as the afternoon is concerned, the forecast is that the rain should have passed through and hopefully, you can see a break in the cloud, uh, the road should get a little bit drier. It's still not a patch on how wet it was for the British GT Easter Monday uh, activity, in which the BRSCC had a big hand, of course, as permit holders for British GT and Ginetta Racing. Uh, barrier repairs on the pit straight completed, so that's all good, that's all done. You've also seen just how slippery it is, not only on the road, but getting onto that wet, friction-free grass as well. Matt Flowers' BMW was the real casualty uh, from the races earlier on in the day. Uh, but uh, hopefully that car is going to be able to take its place on the rear of the grid for the second of the BMW races uh, a little bit later on. So the Formula Fords, in about half an hour's time, will go to the assembly area and uh, Fun Cup drivers also preparing themselves. It's, we've been hearing it's an intriguing entry with uh, some drivers new to Fun Cup, some very experienced all-rounders. So lots to look forward to when we get to the uh, final race of the day, as it will be, the four hours. Hopefully um, there'll be no dramas in earlier races that have a knock-on effect. One of the reasons, I think, why the club is keen to crack on is to make sure that, that four-hour race fits in because it's got to be chequered flag at 628 and engines off by 630 for local bylaws come what may so uh, what they don't want is for a four hour race to become a three hours and 50 minute race they want everyone in that to have their uh, full allocation of track time the uh, driving order has already been decided by the team so we've got a rough idea of who's going to be uh, in the car when and that's going to be fascinating again because you're going to have quicker drivers against slower cars pace will ebb and flow during the course of the race and uh, the fun cup grid although they do have a qualifying session of course is based not on that but on a, a balloted grid uh, with the last race winner or as it is the first round last year's champions uh, starting at the back so that is the way the grid's going to line up when we get to the fun cup race a little bit later on in the day and hopefully by then it will be on a, a dry road. Uh, the Alton Park Circuit, which again plays host not only to uh, club racing most weekends, but has had an international visit to GT, GB3, GB4 already, has its uh, familiar historic weekend, the Alton Park Gold Cup later on in the season as well. And uh, not just the BRSCC here during the course of the season, but many of the leading clubs all... Uh, busy with their race calendars through the year. The pit lane lies quiet for the moment, but it's going to get very busy uh, during the course of the afternoon, especially in the Fun Cup, because with uh, five pit windows, uh, it's going to be pretty frantic down there with the cars refueling, driver changes, uh, lots for the teams to do. So uh, as the teams get themselves sorted you for this afternoon. Huh? You in bed? No, I was on the sofa. Ah, nice. Okay. I just heard the last box go. Cascades <laughs> is uh, still a bit damp and greasy offline, but getting drier and uh, will play host to Formula Fords in due course. Richard Frey starting our second Formula Ford race from pole position. Paul Mason's going to be with him at the front of the grid after that good battle that he had with Jake Shortland early on in the day. And then uh, Chris Stones and Peter Daly, I think, also set to continue their battle that uh, was spectacular earlier on. Paul Britton, Oliver Buckton, Ray Smith, all further back on that grid, but those drivers uh, looking as though they're going to be uh, in the mix as well. Because not only do we have the overall battles, but there's the class situation to look for as well. So with uh, the Fun Cup drivers and teams sort of getting themselves ready for them, it's a, a calm before the storm really. They have their qualifying session, then there's quite a break, and then they have uh, the pressure on of their race. But I I think I can see Jamie in the pit lane now, so he's getting closer, I think, to being able to talk to one or two of the drivers. And uh, 
he can shepherd them out of their garages into the fresh air, then we'll be laughing. The uh, Fun Cup that began, what, 2002, back at Rockingham. Graham Butterworth, who was the man initially behind the concept, uh, is here, was due to be driving, but I noticed that he has uh, withdrawn from any driving stints, so uh, he was limping a bit this morning. But uh, whether or not that's uh, impacted on why he's not driving, we'll try and elicit. But it's going to be his son Craig with Ian Wood as the uh, two drivers in that car, alternating stints. And uh, it was his efforts with Unioil as the original sponsor that uh, got Funk Up off the ground. Uh, and one of the drivers that we have, Neil Plimmer, I think I'm right in saying, has done pretty much every Fun Cup race, uh, driver and uh, team owner. Uh, Jeff Fawcett was his initial co-driver. They came out of the Star of Mallory and thought we'd like some more track time. Where can we go? And Fun Cup was absolutely the right place for them. So uh, the car that's PLR racing, uh, Ben Pitch joining Neil Plimmer. And uh, that's a, a, a stalwart team. Jason Minshaw parachuted in to join Mark Burton. He'll be another uh, driver to watch. And uh, Julian Thomas as well, coming uh, back into Fun Cup from uh, Historic Racing. Back for a, a proper crack at the season, I think, this year. See if he can take the title. He's going to be a man to watch as well. We've got Jack Constable, Russell Joyce, experienced saloon racers, Harry Mailer out of Ginessas. Uh, many of these names we'll get to in more detail as the uh, race unfolds. But uh, it's going to be interesting, that's for sure, especially, as I say, when you've got drivers of different pace sort of uh, ebbing or flowing cars uh, relative fortunes accordingly so with activity in the pit lane to come with drivers getting themselves set for the afternoon and with teams also looking across into the paddock being quite uh, <coughs> industrious trying to repair cars for later on the uh, BRSCC's Alton Park race day enjoying its lunch break uh, spectators still arriving they had a busy morning they've still got some rating to look forward to this afternoon uh, and uh, although four hours feels like a long race I suspect it's going to fly by because with so many pit stops so many different drivers it's going to be busy which is one of the beauties of endurance racing and uh, Jamie you know that will confirm that once we get into the meat of it all but uh, for now he's busy I think trying to round up drivers uh, who are being reluctant to get out into the rain so uh, we're nearly there with them Jim Hutchinson's four, just reflecting on that uh, modified Ford Series race, uh, could eat your dinner off. Absolutely immaculately presented car. Uh, racing here for the first time, Jim from Northern Ireland, new to the series. And as he was saying to Scott Woodward, he's certainly uh, not going to be the last time he comes over. It's not easy, of course. It's an expensive trip from Northern Ireland. It's perhaps easier to come here or Anglesey than it would be to go to Snetterton, say, or Brands. But if the commitment is there, it's just a shame that his 15 minutes of racing was somewhat interrupted by that long safety car period. But uh, at least he got the win. And uh, hopefully on a dry road, it'll be uh, another good fight when we get to race two coming up a little bit later on in the day. Here at the background on the camera, how blustery it is. It's still quite a chilly day at Alton Park. And uh, hopefully if the rain stops, that blustery wind will help to drive the track fairly rapidly but uh, drivers are still going to have to be pretty careful of offline even when we get to the afternoon racing. Right, let us finally head to the pit lane. Jamie I think is sorted, he's found some drivers and we can look forward to the Fun Cup season in the company of Jamie Peters Ennis. Hello everybody and welcome to our opening round of the 2024 Fun Cup Endurance Championship season and our first live pit walk of the year and what a way to start with our reigning champions Olympian uh, GRD racing. We've got Chris Devell and Riley Phillips here. Chris, the car's looking a little bit different uh, but it's nice to have the number one back on the car isn't it? It is very nice to have the number one um, and you're right it's um, somewhat changed its clothing um, we're no longer that green machine but uh, I think the new livery looks very good and uh, we've got some new sponsors and a new driver with us this year yeah you got Simon Rudd on board um, 
how did that all come about? Because you were watching how they were, how he was performing last year, and we knew Christian Rose was going to take a, a step back this year from from driving. Uh, when obviously Simon coming on board, it's a, it's a great addition. It is a fantastic addition, and as soon as Simon uh, made made it clear that he was available, we we snapped him up. He did some fantastic races at the end of last year, some fantastic times, and we're really pleased to have him on board. Oh, here he is. I think he's just... He was, um, was, was someone having lunch? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Other Chris brands are available. Um, Riley, as we say, the, car, the car's still green on the inside. Um, you want to keep that number one for this year and obviously gain some extra as well. And great start with good, decent grid draw as well because you're starting last, but... As, as you know, anything can happen in this championship. Yeah, obviously, uh, you know, starting at the back because we uh, champions of last year. Um, it's not all a bad thing, you know. We could avoid the chaos of uh, the first lap. Um, Austin, obviously, notorious for its its safety cars during the first couple of hours. Um, yeah, the car, car looks fantastic, um, and it'd be amazing to hold the number one again uh, for another consecutive year. So, yeah, hopefully, uh, all goes well today. And Simon, new boy in in the team. How, how are you settling in? I think, yeah, it's been all right. I, I hope so, anyway. Yeah, like, these guys have been, uh, yeah, they've looked after me yesterday, like getting used to the new car. It's completely different. Uh, the inside's completely different. All the controls are different. Pit stops are different. Everything. Um, so, yeah, but it was, it was a good learning curve yesterday. And your thoughts for the race, as we say, you've got to start 24th, but as we know in Fun Cup, anything can happen, Chris. First race of the new season, uh, it always seems to happen at Alton and even more so today, particularly with uh, a bit of a damp track to maybe start with. I think uh, there's going to be a lot of frills and spills. Well, good luck. Thank Enjoy you. the rest. We'll let you go and have some lunch now. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, guys. Right, we'll have a little bit of a walk down. Um, next up, we've got the, the 200 car, which is the Red River Sport. That will have Johnny Molan, Bonamy Grimes and Gareth Williams uh, driving. They've got a, a full campaign for this year. And next door, we've got the Signature RV. That's the uh, Steve Ruston, John Whitehouse and Harry Mailer jumping in for this weekend. We'll also see Marcus Clutton uh, in, that, in that car. Um, if you pan around here, Tom, next door, they've got the door shut which is the Fueled Up Racing team. That will have uh, Paul and Wendy Ellis-Smith, Jamie Price and Paul Taylor uh, in the car this year. They're in the 210 car. Then next to Garage 5, we've got uh, PLR Racing, which is the veteran Neil Plimmer, who's done all every season sorry since its inception from 2002 so he's done over a hundred fun cup races and he still absolutely loves it he's got uh, ben pitch with him and then the uvo hoffman's motorsport team which has the wonderful fabulous randaccio with uh, farkini in in the 225 car four-time champions and of course they're going to want the number one spot back for uh, next up is one of our So, yeah, having a great weekend. Excellent stuff. Thanks a lot, Scott. We'll catch up later on in the race. Uh, next up, we've got one of the other... Uh, Okay, uh, sorry about that. Uh, we've got next up is one of the uh, other JPR uh, for hire cars. That's got uh, Dave Scrappy Clark and Andy Posty Bicknell, who's also returning to the championship uh, after a few seasons away. Uh, then we've got a, 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 cup, a couple more teams, uh, which are further down um, the pit lane. Uh, we've got, as you say, 24 teams. Uh, throughout the year. We're going to grab some, some drivers who are, are currently uh, in the garages. Uh, we're just trying to find some, some drivers now. It is the middle of the lunch break, so we're just uh, seeing if we can find any drivers. So we're just uh, waiting for, for some drivers now. Mike is just... 
quickly grabbing some some drivers. Uh, I can see if I can grab some. Ah, right. He's found Scott Jess from from NJ Tech, who. Uh, always up for a chat. He's going to be driving the 249 car. Um, he'll be partnering Will Abraham. <laughs> Good to see you. Um, thank you for popping up. It's okay. How's it all been going so far? Um, no, it's been a really good weekend so far. We've uh, worked on the car quite a lot over the winter and we think it's paid off. Um, we felt pretty quick yesterday, but it's hard to tell because there's no time in. And I think we were over a second quickest in quali. I know it is sort of, the quality session doesn't give you uh, the standard because everyone's doing different things, but it's always nice to be at the top. So we're kind of quite confident going into the race. And last year, you know, the, the results were, were there, weren't they? You were up sort of at the sharp end pretty much every race. So a couple of unfortunate incidents along the way, but that's motorsport, isn't it? It, it, it happens, and we know how, how tough this championship is. And this year, I mean, the lineup is getting stronger and stronger, isn't it? And we reckon it's probably going to be one of our toughest ever years. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. There's a lot of uh, new drivers, a lot of good drivers coming back, um, a lot of nice liveries, actually. And that's the thing, you've got to keep stepping your game up every year, or you're just going to get left behind. Um, but I think, yeah, I think that's what we need to do really is just keep going, keep going. Oh, you're just going to get swamped. Um, but yeah, it's a long four hour race, and I think, I think it's our fourth season now. So maybe some of the new teams might just fall a bit short, or maybe some of the pit stops, some of the small little tactics you gain over doing four seasons. Um, so yeah, I think I think it's gonna be a really exciting race. I just hope to stay out of trouble really, so we can enjoy it rather than being all stressed. And you got Will Abraham with you. Um, we understand he's with you for pretty much the whole year this time. We did some guest appearances last year. He's he's come on very quickly. Obviously, having a former champion as his dad helps, doesn't it? Yeah, I think Will Will's a really good driver. He's not done a, like a, a massive amount uh, in karting or in cars, but he seems to have some natural talent there, which is is pulling him through. And he's always straight on the pace. You know, if I had done as much as him, I'd be pretty useless but luckily I've done quite a lot so I can you know as a, as a, as a duo I think we'll make a really strong team all right excellent thanks a lot Scott that's uh, Scott Jess from MJ Tech let's bring um, Vlad Vasiliev Simon Coles and Adam Cunnington from the EDF crew in uh, we thought we'd make you walk up, up this end for a change um, 246 car slightly different lineup for this one Vlad um, Matt's become team manager yeah and to follow in the footsteps yeah. of Christian Horner <laughs> So we decided to encourage him and uh, support him all the way. And you got Simon with you. He's with the 212 car uh, last year. How's that partnership been coming on so far? Really good. We're having a good time. We're really pushing each other in all the testing that we've done. And uh, we have a very similar driving style. So we think it's going to suit us really well. And how are you finding the 246 car? Have you driven all of them now in the EDF fleets? I have actually. We've actually <laughs> driven together for a good couple of years. But yeah. 246, I've only done, well, I did two laps in practice just for one reason or another and driving out this morning. I think we have some good performance in the car. I think so. Fingers crossed for the race. So they were starting quite a long way back. So we've got a time, chance to come through, hopefully. Yeah, the, um, the grid draw curse has striked again, hasn't it? Absolutely. But it, it makes us better drivers in the end. We've got to do a bit more work. So, yeah. <laughs> and, and Adam, welcome back. Um, um, it's a selected campaign this year, isn't it? Because we know you've got other, other, other commitments. Um, but happy to be back. Yeah, great. Look forward to it. Uh, always enjoy getting out in the Fun Cup, partnering with Victor in 104. So, uh, yeah, it should be fun. Um, I think we've got a draw at the back of the grid, but uh, uh, hopefully we'll avoid some of the mayhem and come through. All right. Well, thanks a lot, guys. That's uh, uh, Vlad Vasiliev, Simon Coles and Adam Cunnington from the EDF Motorsport team. Right. Dave Postins, where is he? Here he is from Team 3 uh, Motorsport. Mr. Bennett's done a runner, hasn't he? That's um, uh, not ideal, is it? Um, how's it all been going? Car looks great, doesn't oh, it? Good. Yeah, new graphics this year, which is quite nice. New livery uh, and same old blue. But, um, yeah, car's going really well. Really happy with it. Setup's good. Engine's good. So, yeah, just, you know, we'll run where we run. We're sort of middle order, hopefully. And, uh, yeah, just try and bring it home. That's the main thing, isn't it? And it's your second full season with the team. It's starting to sort of gel quite nicely now, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, we have a lot of fun with it. We, we kind of rub off each other in, you know, we, in just we It's a good friendly team. We're all mates, really. And yeah, it's just it is good fun. And is, come on, uh, here's my other one. He's a bit camera shy, is Andy. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we, it's. I'm looking forward to this season, really. Yeah, try and get a full one in again and see how we go. Yeah, yeah. 
And Andy, is a, as we said, second full season for you guys. Um, you learned a hell of a lot last year. Now it's just to keep that momentum going forward and get sort of toward the pointy end of the grid. Yeah, I think there's uh, some really quick people on there at the moment. Um, if we can get sort of middle of the road today, we'll be really happy, I think. I think the top boys will be battling against each other pretty hard. So, you know, they might have a bit of a mad, uh, you know, mad sessions and, and they might, they might uh, take each other off and give us an opportunity, really. But I think if we can finish top 10, we'll be really happy with that. So, yeah. yeah. All right, fantastic. Thanks a lot, guys. That's um, Andy Bennett and David Postins from Team 3 Motorsport. Morning, Ted. How are we doing? It's Ted Bradbury from Morpheus Racing. Um, Mikey is somewhere, isn't he? I think he's somewhere. gone off to um, to do something. Um, yeah, you've, you've borrowed Mr. Porter for this weekend because um, Sparky Neil Burrows uh, couldn't be here. But um, final round, final weekend last last year, you uh, you just laid down the gauntlet and showed you're um, you're not here to do anything apart from winning, are you? Yeah, we're definitely here to win, but uh, we've got a really good team besides us. Uh, Morpheus, they're absolutely brilliant, and um, I'd just like to say a big thank you in advance to all of the all of the mechanics and um, me and Mikey. Yeah, teamed up like we did in the last round. Good friend of mine, he's a really good driver, and I'm looking forward to this race coming up. And this year, it's the entry is so strong, isn't it? I mean, we've got lots of former champions coming back. You know, more cars out there. 24 car grid. We understand more coming out for Croft. You're not going to have it all your own way, are you? But you're still going to fight and fight right to the very end, aren't you? Yeah, we're, like I said, we're here to win. And um, yeah, it's a really competitive grid, but I believe we can do it and I believe we have the pace to do it. So yeah, um, big thank you to all my family, all the people that support me and yeah, in advance. Thank you to you guys as well for putting on a brilliant show. And the old man's done all right on the rap job, hasn't he? Uh, he's done brilliant <laughs> uh, as a few cars. But yeah, it's easy, he's done mint. So yeah, again, big thank you to my dad. Okay, well, while we're here, we've got these GT tyres. Um, they're an all-weather tyre, aren't they? So, and for those that don't know, the four-hour race that we do, we don't actually change tyres, do we, Ted? So, um, what's it like out there? I mean, it's been a little bit greasy this morning. I mean, I, when I drove one of these cars in the pouring rain, they were so grippy. It was um, quite surprising. They're, they're a great tyre, aren't they? Well, I think they're absolutely brilliant because in both conditions, dry and wet, they are really fun to race on and they are extremely grippy, like you said. Mm. So, so um, I, at all time, I feel like I can push the car to its limit with these tyres on. Um, and I think they're a perfect suit with this car and probably many, many more as well. And for anyone looking to come into the championship, because you, you did some other things last year as well, but you saw this and thought, this is where I want to be. It's it's a fantastic place to come, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. It's good atmosphere and the racing is just absolutely brilliant. Like the, the tow, everything just makes the racing so exciting. It's a fight all the way till the finish line. Like we saw at the last round, so many cars close together coming across the finish line. And that's what you want to see in an endurance race. You want to see a fight till the end. And I think as well we saw a bit of a changing of the guard didn't we i mean the average age of ted's team when he won at alton park sorry the combined age was 49 years old across you reva and, and mikey i mean that just shows for kids that want to go into endurance racing you can come from karting into this can't you yeah exactly it's a it's a brilliant starting point to your car career but also there is so many more experienced drivers in here so you can learn off them and learn your craft in this as well so i think it's amazing all right well thanks a lot ted wish you all the best you, for for the race we'll catch up during the course of the race there we go there's a, a selection of our drivers that are competing uh, this weekend at alton park for the round one of the fun cup endurance championship the race will be starting at approximately 20 past two for an epic four-hour thriller where david addison and scott woodwiss will be your commentators and i'll be down here in the pit lane but from now from down here on our first grid walk of the year it's goodbye from now and we'll see you in a couple of hours So thanks to Jamie Peters Ernest. We'll hear from Jamie again during the Fun Cup Enduro later on. And with perfect timing, cars leave the assembly area uh, for our second uh, Formula Ford race of the day. Then this the second 15-minute race for the BRSCC Super Classic Pre-99 Formula Ford Championship. The first race won, nay, dominated, despite a spin on the last lap by Richard Frey. Uh, and uh, second went the way of Paul Mason, Jake Shortland third. Uh, with a good battle for fourth place 
being resolved in favour of Chris Stones from Peter Daly. They were trading places throughout the race. Uh, and uh, ultimately, it was Chris that got back ahead. Peter passed him on the last lap. Chris was ahead when they got to the chequered flag. So it was a, a lively race, even if it's perhaps not the biggest of Formula Ford grids. The cars have had their countdown in the assembly area, which means that when they get to the grid itself, you'll be uh, straight ready for the start of the race. There's no extra formation lap, so we'll be racing pretty swiftly. Let's have a look at how that grid is going to line up based on the results of race one. It means that on pole position is going to be uh, Richard Frey, and with him at the front of the grid is Paul Mason. Running up third, Jake Shortland with the Lola T440. And starting fourth, uh, Chris Stones in the black Van Diemen. Similar car, Peter Daly's car fifth on the grid, ahead of Paul Britton with the PRS. Oliver Buckton with the Blue Eldon is going to start seventh, ahead of Ray Smith. Uh, Stuart Jones is ninth on the grid, and Neil Hunt with uh, his traditional Mondial chassis, 10th. 11th is Chris Lindley, ahead of Lorna Vickers, the British GT safety car driver. Vincent J goes from 13th after a spin in race one. Uh, Trevor Morgan next on the grid, ahead of Simon or Sid Fraser. Uh, Ryman Fine with the Lotus 61, a very venerable car, 16th on the grid. And a question mark over Colin Williams, who didn't do a lap in qualifying, did venture out into race one, but only did a couple of laps, so hopefully that car is going to be at the back, and hopefully he's going to be a bit healthier than it was earlier on in the day. So there you've got the cars slowly making their way down through his locks. They will grid up, and then we will be in business for uh, 15 minutes of racing. This championship began a couple of weeks or so, no, probably more than that, four weeks or so ago at uh, Silverstone, where the wins went the way of Alex Ames and two second places went the way of Richard Tarling. They are absent this weekend, so it leaves the door clear uh, for uh, Richard Frey to come through, who was the runner-up in this championship last season and also was the uh, winner of the Champion of Alton element. This year, the series uh, having a bit more perhaps of a, a national feel, as I say, Silverstone they've already been to, uh, but you've got other venues uh, on the uh, calendar to attract further drivers like a visit to Brands Hatch, Donington, Mallory, and Alton Park, and then you've got that Champion of Alton series within a series, really. Uh, the class structure is based on the age of the car, so four classes with the more modern cars being in Super Classic A, cars from 1990 to 1998, they've all got to be before 1999 as the name suggests. Class B is for the 82 to 89 cars, class C 72 to 81, and class D uh, for cars built before 1972. That's the kind of HSCC, Historic Formula Ford uh, era of car. But uh, depending on the nature of the circuit, uh, might attract drivers into different classes, either for the whole season or just for a, a, a one-off. Looking down at the back of the grid, there is 34. That's the car of Colin Williams then that's had a pretty mixed day thus far. But fingers crossed it's going to be making some progress in this second race of the Day after retiring in race one. Richard Frey then, pole position, win, spin, fastest lap, got the complete set in race one. And he's going to take some stopping this time around, I would have thought, as the cars now make their way up onto the grid. With Jake Shortland having been one of the Formula Ford stars thus far, uh, because that Lola T440 is not exactly the youngest of cars on the grid, but it goes uh, very, very effectively in his hands. It dates back to 1977. And the PRS. Uh, which is driven by Paul Britton, is sixth on the grid. That's a 1981 car. So, uh, as ever in Formula Ford racing, you don't necessarily need the absolute up-to-date machinery to still be able to be competitive. Green flag shown at the back then, so everybody's where they need to be. The five-second board will be shown. The lights go red, and our second race of the day for the Super Classic pre-99 Formula Ford Championship is underway with a good getaway being made by Richard Frey and a good start also uh, by Chris Stones, who tries to get up on the outside then of Jake Shortland as they go down towards Old Hall Corner for the first time. Look on the outside line, number 49, the black Van Diemen of Chris Stones. Peter Daly goes through behind. And now they battle their way uh, down towards Cascades for the first time with already Richard Frey having checked out. Demon starts. He's got Paul Mason running behind him in the Swift. A slightly younger car by a couple of years. Uh, and then the 1977 Lola in third place in the hands of Jake Shortland, belying its age uh, as the cars then accelerate their way along Lakeside Straight for the first time. Peter Daly has dropped back, I think, also behind Paul Britton. But as the cars now wriggle their way up towards the right-hander of Shell Oils for the first time, 
race leader is Richard Frey and actually being caught a little under braking there. That was Paul Mason being very, very brave on the brakes. Chris Stones runs third, fourth is Shortland, fifth is Daly in fairness. Uh, Paul Britton next in the queue as the field uh, comes up towards the uh, Britton chicane for the first time. Have a look further back into the queue as well and you'll see the uh, blue Eldon. Oliver Buxton at the wheel of it as the cars now bounce their way down towards his lops. That number six is Peter Daly's Van Diemen. Uh, Peter used to specialise in Reynards, but Van Diemen's more recently. Now, Richard Frey is not getting away this time. Does that mean everybody else has found some pace, or is Richard uh, being very careful driving within himself here? We didn't see that much of him in race one, so dominant was he. But he gets a good run out of Nickerbrook Corner, makes the climb up the hill, and that means that that margin increases then as the cars uh, now run up towards Druid and off the road was that Colin Williams from the back of the grid. Certainly one car understeering out wide as they came through Nickerbrook. Big, big challenge on the inside there. Look as they get up towards the rise of Druids. Challenged by Oliver Buxton on the inside. Didn't come to anything, but he's certainly in racy mood as they come down towards the end of the opening lap. And this rather elasticated gap up front. Richard Frey being pegged back a little bit by Paul Mason. Third as they come up towards the end of the lap, Chris Stone. So Peter Daly fifth trying to find a way past Jake Shortland and keep Paul Britton's PRS at bay as they go over the timing line then down towards Old Hall you can see on the outside line there is the BRSCC chairman Peter Daly he's done it he's got past the Lola so Shortland drops a place that puts Daly fourth Shortland fifth and the race leader only by his standards four tenths of a second to the good at the end of that one so not really escaping uh, Richard Frey pace that he had in race one though suggests that if he does need to turn up the wick he can do it now there Peter Daly coming under renewed attack look Jake Shortland behind him as they go down towards Island Ben Peter wants to shake him off and then go after Chris Stones because they had that great battle for class honours earlier on in the day break for Shell turn into the right hander back onto the power drag the cars out the other side and Jake Shortland being chased by Paul Britton Lola versus PRS and that's also uh, for a class lead. So Richard Frey, Paul Mason, uh, Class A. Uh, Chris Stones, Peter Daly, the next pair, their Class B, and then Class C, uh, Jake Shortland and Paul Britton. So the three leading pairs, all with a class lead to argue over as well, and it's class points. There you can see Richard Frey really is under attack now from Paul Mason. This is a completely different type of feel to the race than we had in race one, where Richard just disappeared up the road. But now, being kept honest as the cars come down through Nickerbrook. He was brave here a lap ago and stretched the margin and has done so again, look. Uh, but it was at Druids where Paul Mason was able to bring back the, the, the lost time. I just wonder whether Richard's playing with him to a degree. So dominant was he early on in the day. You can't expect the same performance. Third and fourth, though, Class B honours. They're getting themselves together because Chris Stones is under attack again from Peter Daly, as he was for pretty much all of uh, race one. Daly on the inside, number six on the outside line. Chris Stones, number 49. Peter slots back in behind with Jake Shortland in fifth and Paul Britton sixth in the PRS. Not too far adrift either. So leaders come through and the leading five almost in a line now because Richard Frey still isn't escaping. The margin just under four tenths of a second as they go into Old Hall. Touch of understeer as he tries to find some traction out of the corner, which he does. Paul Mason Swift, though, looking really good in a straight line. And then for third, Stones versus Daly through Denton's, down now towards the left-hander of Cascades, loops you onto Lakeside Straight, and Jake Shortland in the Lola is coming back at Peter Daly, look, the white Lola right on the tail now of the 1988 built Van Diemen, uh, and Peter on the inside of Chris Stone, so it's all happening, third, fourth, fifth, Peter thinks better of it, backs out of that, Jake Shortland tries to go around the outside as Ireland, no you don't, what about the inside line at Shell, which is the next corner, no way through there either, so turn into the right-hander, and Peter Daly being distracted here in his quest to get himself up past Chris Stones by having to go on the defensive. Busy few days this for Peter, he's off to Sepang on Tuesday because that's the start of GT World Challenge Asia for which he's also the race director to add to British GT. But at least he can go there saying in the driver's briefing I know what it's all about because he's a racing driver himself. Problems in the background by the look of it for Paul Britton letting Oliver Buckton go. So the PRS has got a problem look because we've had a change and the white PRS, the uh, 81F, slowing. There it is going through shot but uh, Paul Britton knowing he had a problem getting out of the way, letting quicker cars go which is uh, absolutely the right thing to do but it's a shame that he's got that problem. There are the leaders with again Paul Mason sort of fainting to the inside at Druids. 
but Chafray still very much in command, you get the feeling. And were he to really start to feel the pressure, might be able to turn up the wick. Paul Mason behind him. And then Chris Stones under attack from Peter Daly. Can Peter make a move to the inside? No. Peter's argument here, of course, will be that as the chairman of the club, he's letting the customers have the glory and uh, not wanting to ruin their results, which is as good a cop-out as anybody can offer you. Over the timing line they go once again. Nothing to do with not being quick enough. Uh, through goes Richard Frey then, and the margin he's got is 0.369 of a second over Chris Stones. Uh, a bit of a slide from Daly, which brings back onto his tail Jake Shortland. So it's game on for fourth as they drop downhill. And Oliver Buckton, in sixth place, remarkably enough, has now done the fastest lap of the race. So the uh, Elder that he drives, one of the oldest cars in the race, is also the fastest right now. So it's a completely different feel, like I say, uh, compared to what we had earlier on in the day. I wonder whether Richard Frey's car is on a wetter setup and the road is that bit drier all of a sudden. He is leading and he is edging away a little bit now as they come up towards Shell Oil's corner. Still the Stones' daily battle that was there early on in the day continues. Paul Mason, look, dropping away now from the race leader. And whoops, very, very wide goes Peter Daly all over the grass and loses a place to Jake Shortland. Um, Peter, track limits, a case to answer now. Uh, he's back on the black bit, but he's lost a place in the process there. So down towards his lops, uh, Chris Stones coming under attack from Jake Shortland. They're closing up a little bit onto the back of Paul Mason. And at this part of the circuit, they always look nearer to the race leader. Uh, we're nudging towards halfway. And at this part of the circuit, Richard Frey always seems to be being attacked. Then he stretches the margin going up Clay Hill. And then the like of Mason or Chris Stones always appear that bit nearer when they get to the timing line. Out of Druids again, slightly tighter line in there, employed by Paul Mason. That's the recovering Peter Daly, then now uh, fending off Oliver Buckton, but he's fallen back as a consequence into fifth place. And not only that, but has lost quite a lot of real estate to Jake Shortland, who's back on his toes, look, trying to get him on the inside line there against Chris Stones, coming down towards Lodge Corner. Over the line once more, and Richard Frey is still no more than half a second to the good. 0.492 of a second now, that margin. Oliver Buckton to the inside line, goes through. That was a brave send. Had a look, couldn't quite do it. But up the inside, just lost a little bit of traction maybe on the inside line. But the uh, Eldon looking for a way past the Van Diemen. Jake Shortland in the meantime, there you can see the second of these two drivers, has done the fastest lap of the race now in that Lola. Dating back to 1977. Now he makes the move against Chris Stones, gets a toe coming out of Cascades along Lakeside Straight, lines up for the inside line. But Chris Stones, who has done many a lap around here, knows exactly where to put the car and hangs on ahead as they come up towards Shell Oils. As Shortland closes on Stones, he in turn is closing on Mason. But that little battle might just start to relieve Richard Frey of the pressure as they bounce over the kerb once again out of the chicane at Britain's. And you can see the margin of stretch just a touch between first and second once more. Down they come towards his lops. This now approaching the last third of the race is exactly what Richard Frey needed, but second, third and fourth are together and fifth and sixth are together as well. So Jake Shortland on the back of Chris Stones, who's getting a little bit nearer to Paul Mason there in the Swift, the distinctive rather more bulbous front of the Swift chassis from 1994, by which stage Formula Ford Racing had split itself into the 1800cc Z-Tech and the 1600 Kent eras. And uh, Swift was still building cars converted to Z-Tech shapes for Kent customers. Out of the right of Druids then comes the third-placed pair, and Jake Shortland lines up for a go on the inside, but then thinks better of it. To do the overtaking, you've still got to go offline, where it's still quite greasy, so he decides discretion is the better part of valour. Five minutes to go, Richard Frey escaping now as they go through over the timing line, and yes, finally, he's cracked the magic second. 11 tenths to the good then as they go through. In second place, Paul Mason, which was ever thus. And then for third and fourth, uh, Chris Stone's ahead of Jake Shortland, Peter Daly, fifth, sixth, Oliver Buckton. And Paul Britton is still circulating in seventh place, despite waving traffic through earlier on. So whatever problem he felt he had, he's persevering with it, and the car certainly has some pace, even if not outright pace. Jake Shortland, despite that big wobble at Cascades, is still on the money and makes a look now along Lakeside Straight to try to close back up onto the tail of Chris Stones, who in turn uh, is trying to close back up onto the tail of Paul Mason. Last time through, though, Richard Frey, fastest lap of the race, almost suggesting 
playtime's over. I'm off now, chaps. I gave you a chance. We had a bit of a fight early on. Now I'm off to have another win. Uh, he's stretching the margin, but third place is very definitely up for grabs. Chris Stones, we saw in the first race against Peter Daly, knows how to really race, whether it's attack, whether it's defend. Now he's got to do a lot of defending against Jake Shortland as they come up over Hilltop. Find a wet patch just to take some of the heat out of the tyres for a moment and then down towards his lops, into the right, then the left, and then into Nickerbrook Corner. Still some tyre squeal as the drivers hustle right and left, and then right again, flick up the hill. So Frey with just over three and a half minutes to go, still being pursued vigorously by there, Paul Mason. Gap back to third place where Chris Stones is hanging on to the place, although Peter Daly look, is coming back at the pair of them. So Stones versus Shortland there for third, Daly fifth. Tighter line at Druid, Jake Shortland looking quick, and again he gets out of the draft, has a look coming down towards Lodge Corner. This time, no, doesn't quite commit. I thought he was going to have a proper go, but realising that by the time he just about get level, it would be time to break and turn in, and that's not going to happen. The leaders are into traffic now as well. Raymond Fenn's Lotus goes a lap down. Uh, now Peter Daly does the fastest lap of the race. Don't get to say that very often. Peter Daly does the fastest lap of the race. Through on the inside line goes Jake Shortland to finally get third away uh, from Chris Stones. And Daly is caught back up as well. Don't get to say that too often. Uh, so out of Denton's they go. Traffic ahead. So Jake Shortland up into the top three. And Chris Stones fourth. Peter Daly fifth. It's been a good catch-up operation, this, in fairness, after his grassy moment. So maybe benefiting from the squabbles going on ahead. And now Daly goes to the inside line, heading up towards Island Bend. They're all concertinaing as well as they get to the left-hander there. Jake Shortland, uh, for the moment at least, stays ahead. Chris Stones in fourth place. Peter Daly fifth. And there's going to be time for one more lap at the end of this. The best lap of the race now, a 1.53, courtesy of Peter Daly. Uh, so there's going to be time for one more when they come across the line. And therefore, third, fourth, fifth, still up for grabs. Jake Shortland then, ahead of Chris Stones, ahead of Peter Daly, and Oliver Buckton in the remarkable Eldon is right there with them as well. So third, fourth, fifth, sixth, all in a line, down towards his lops. Jake Shortland, having taken that third place, has done a really commendable job. And as they come out of his lops towards Nicker Brook, the clock ticks for one final lap of the race. Richard Frey, in the meantime, escaping. He's got Paul Mason behind him margin just over a second and that is Colin Williams still struggling on uh, crawling up towards Druids the leaders are going to negotiate him as they're a big big dive look from Oliver Buxton on the inside line in the Eldon can't quite dislodge Peter Daly but not for the one of trying uh, blue light on to say to Colin Williams much quicker cars coming past get out of the way which he duly does good chap uh, doesn't get in the way of the leaders that car I fear is heading back towards the pit lane as up towards the start of his last lap still on to the double is Richard Frey but he can't afford a last lap spin in this race because that would completely lose him the race lead look how much closer Paul Mason has got and Frey there goes a little bit wide towards Old Hall but then flicks the car in catches it on the throttle powers out the other side Shortland third stones fourth daily fifth and in sixth place Oliver Buxton but Richard Frey is either making more of a race of it this time around or genuinely looks like the car isn't as well set up for these drier conditions as it was for the, the damp circuit this morning because it's been a tougher race all round for him. He still leads, he's still on target for the win, but unless he can pull something out of the bag in the last lap, the fastest lap will not be his. Up towards Shell Oil's corner they go. So the chequered flag this time, and it remains Frey from Mason and then get back to Jake Shortland in third place. Chris Stone still fourth from Peter Daly, fifth from Oliver Buckton in sixth as they now squirm their way out of Britain's. And Buckton looks the man most likely to do anything, doesn't he, with the sinister dark visor on the dark crash helmet sticking out of the top of the Eldon, the blue Eldon, coming now down towards his lops. Uh, Peter Daly not quite close enough to attack Chris Stones, but he's also got to think about trying to defend here, look, as they come now through the corner into his lops once again. And now the run up the hill, heading towards the right-hander of Druids. It does look, though, as though it is going to be a race win. The second of the day for Richard Frey. Comes up towards the exit of Druids. He's got enough in hand now over Paul Mason. In the background, Jake Shortland has really made good his escape from Chris Stone. So it's going to be uh, a class-winning third for Jake and a class-winning fourth for Chris Stone. The chequered flag is at the ready. And it's going to be two from two in the BRSCC Super Classic Pre-99 Formula 4 Championship for Richard Frey. He wins race two.
from Paul Mason, the second second of the day. And Jake Shortland coming through for third, fourth. Just going the way of Chris Stones, Peter Daly taking fifth. And as he needed to, Richard Frey does pull something out of the bag on the last lap and get the fastest lap of the race. So he's got the set, two poles, two wins and two fastest laps. Oliver Buxton taking sixth ahead of Paul Britton in seventh. Vincent J should be through for eighth. There he is. He had a spin in race one, but survives in race two. Uh, ninth place will go the way of Stuart Jones, who's a bit lonely this time. And then the top ten is going to be rounded out by Ray Smith in the ex-Vincenzo uh, Sospiri festival winning car. And if it's the same chassis that Vincenzo used all year, and I've no reason to think it won't be, it will therefore be the car with which Vincenzo Sospiri had his first car race win here at Alton Park uh, in the Good Friday meeting of 1988. Uh, Vincenzo pulled off his great move around the outside in, in wet conditions to take the lead of the Formula Ford uh, championship race and take his first win. And it was quite a move, uh, the car in the, the bright blue. John Village ran it in period. And... Uh, it was uh, successful all the way through the season. So we'll hear from our winning drivers in a few moments' time, but Richard Frey takes the race win uh, from Paul Mason. And the gap in the end, 1.7 seconds, which does give rise to thinking that Richard was um, teasing just a little. Jake Shortland, third, he wins Class C. Chris Stone's fourth, and he wins Class B ahead of Peter Daly, with Class D going the way of Oliver Buxton, sixth. Paul Britton, seventh, ahead of Vincent J. Stuart Jones and Ray Smith rounding out the top 10. 11th to Lorna Vickers, ahead of Neil Hunt. Chris Lindley next from Simon Sid Fraser. Ryman Fenn uh, was a lap down. Colin Williams struggling with his Van Diemen and Trevor Morgan's Reynard 88 FF, uh, a casualty into the pit lane. So well done, Richard Frey. Perfect day. I to say two holds, two wins, two fastest laps. The second of which you got on the last lap of that second race and uh, that helps him also in terms of uh, garnering more points within the championship. BMWs will take centre stage next because the uh, Nankang Tar BMW Compact Cup will be our next activity. But before that, we'll have a chance to hear from the uh, winning drivers from Formula Ford. Have a slightly familiar look to it as well after uh, what we had being uh, mirrored from race one into race two that the drivers for that as I say we will uh, hear from in uh, a few moments time perfect way though for Richard Frey to uh, continue his season and if you like start his season if you uh, take the champion of Alton element of this in isolation coming through on top so drivers come into uh, the Park Ferme area and uh, we'll have a chance to hear from the top three before we turn our attention then back to the uh, BMWs that were lively early on in the day. So the Super Classic pre-99 uh, Formula Ford Championship action done. The series uh, backed by Jeff Page Engineering for the season. Marshall's moving from one post to another. A different vantage point for the next race just to ring the changes. Uh, and uh, as soon as we've got winning drivers out of cars, Scott will be poised to have a word with Richard Frey after perfect day. Another race, another victory, uh, and points for both the Super Classic and the subsidiary Champion of Alton series going his way. So the road's starting to dry pretty quickly now. In the background, you can hear just how blustery it is on the cameras, but the wet road drying at a decent enough pace. Offline, it's still a bit greasy, and drivers. Uh, if they get onto the grass, we're going to find out how wet it is. But uh, at least the racing line isn't too bad. And uh, let's hear the thoughts of Richard Frey about all of this. As a double race winner today, he's with Scott Woodward. Well, I think you'll agree that was a typical Formula Ford race. Close, tight, exciting, but in the end, it's still the same top three, but it doesn't tell the whole story, of course. Let's bring Richard Frey in, of course, who uh, does the double here this afternoon. Well done. Um, Thank you. Thank you. So, a bit closer competition this time. David yeah. suspects you might have a maybe more of a wet setup on the, the compared to, to 
earlier on the day. Just uh, yeah. what would you think that uh, kept these guys a bit closer? Uh, I was taking it a bit careful, really. I recognised I was at the front of the grid. I could see where the damp was when we were going out. I just wanted to protect my position more than anything else, and so I was taking it a bit easy, trying to sort of feel where the grip was. And as the track was drying out, so I sort of got a bit more into my comfort zone. But it was a good fight out of the course. Paul kept you very honest up the front, as he yeah, uh, as he promised to try and do. So it was a good typical Formula Ford action. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, you know, Paul's a really experienced racer, to be fair, um, and absolutely, he, he was in my mirrors for about three quarters, if not ninety percent of that race, to be honest with you. So I sort of had the, the black Formula Ford sat behind me, the changing track in front of me, conscious that I didn't want to mess it up, but I still wanted to win. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it was it was a good effort, and definitely, I think the setup changes that the team made helped, to be honest with you, early doors. Yeah, and of course now, uh, of course that's two class wins for you two overall wins on top of that as well next up Mallory Park so uh, should be quite intriguing around that little uh, Leicestershire speedball massively so I love Mallory Park uh, I just love the whole atmosphere I love the way the kind of the crew sort of get together and last time I was there the sun was out the tunes were on um, so really enjoyed it thank you that's quickly getting your trophy from uh, championship coordinator Alan Bowles well done Alan and uh, well done Richard and Alan presents that one so congratulations two from two we'll see you for next time let's quickly rattle through second and third because the, the BMWs are going out onto the track so quickly second for Paul Mason um, well, you see to keep, I said to keep more honest, and you did that in race two. Yeah, yeah, I managed to keep him a, a bit more honest. He was, I think he was a bit precocious in the first couple of laps with the damp patches, but I could use him to judge. And then a few laps from the end, I got a bit closer, and then I went a bit wide at Cascades and lost some momentum down the straight, and so then he, he'd got it then from a couple of laps from the end. Excellent. Did you enjoy today? Yeah, yeah, very good. Very good. Be back at Mallory next time out. Excellent. Good stuff. Let's get you a trophy from Alan then, Championship Coordinator. Second place, of course, the specially made trophies courtesy of Jeff Page, engineer of the Championship Sponsors. Well done to Paul. Well done today. We'll see you next time on that one. Let's have a chat to Jake Short, shortening third place in this Lola. And uh, again, that was uh, just as fun as race one, if not a bit more, because you had a bit more competition there. Had a bit more competition, yeah. Not like not probably what I wanted but it just took me a while to get into into the groove of it and before by the time I got past him it was last lap so it was just that's just how it is and but I had a good race with him and yeah, yeah it's nice to finish third again so yeah look, look, look fun out there yeah it did yeah yeah it was good it was nice close racing and you know it's just what you want so it's um no it's it enjoyable that was excellent well done for third place we'll get you trophies off from Alan of course from again courtesy of Jeff Page Engineering who are the championship sponsors this year so well done to uh, Jake and gets his third place trophy from Alan and uh, well done to our super thanks to well done to Alan of course great days racing for him as well right that's the four and four done for today quick hand back to David now for our next race of the program which is the second race of the day for the Nankang Tire BMW Compact Cup Scott, thanks. We've got the cars already midway around their outlap for this second BMW race of the day. It was a lively one earlier on, and the grid based uh, on the results of that first race, which means that pole position goes the way of Joe Doble. Connor Grady with him at the front of the grid. The second row, Ross Stoner and uh, Gareth Clayton. And the third row, Mike Doble and Richard Sutherland. Row four, Peter Smith and Alex Reid, ahead of Max Noble and Rod Langham. Sixth row, Gordon McMillan, who had a penalty in race one for track limits. Mark Grady on his outside ahead of Adam Wright and uh, Xavier Ross. Row eight, Alistair Smith and Barney Lower. The ninth row, four Van Aston, one to watch this time. He had a 10 second delayed start for race one after being excluded from qualifying. Daniel Mountford's on his outside. Tenth row, Alex Corkwell and Tim Seaford. Matt Flowers, another man to watch because he was, after a bit of hip and shoulder, tipped off the road uh, in race one got stuck in the grass and uh, wasn't able to rejoin. Uh, the car had a bit of frontal damage. Assuming it is OK and he's on the grid, then that should make some progress then because uh, Matt, we know, is a, a quick driver. He finished uh, third in the championship last year behind uh, Gordon McMillan and uh, Gareth Clayton, who was the champion. So the grid forming, and then we'll be straight into the race. It's going to be 15 minutes, usual format, time not lap. So flag goes out first time the leader crosses the line after 15 minutes are done and we hope it's the full 15 minutes this time because it was a red flag uh, earlier Matt Flowers car again poor bloke wasn't his fault at all he got tipped off the road and then stuck on the mud uh, and the car was in a dangerous place and the race had to be stopped and if you're not running at the time of the stoppage you don't feature in the result so therefore he's at the back of the grid uh, rather than taking a place uh, from where he would have been on the road but is the car there I think it is Yes, that's Matt Flowers at the back in the white, blue and yellow swirly colours. And he's got somebody's front balance, if not his own, attached to the car now. So he'll be one to watch, making some progress up through the grid. The compact cup 
not to be confused with the Contact Cup, which was a championship of many years past, uh, is about to get underway then. Lively racing in race one. Expect more of the same as the lights change. And Mike Doble from the third row gets a decent enough start. Ross Stoner's orange car tries to squeeze between Connor Grady's white car on the outside and the pole man Joe Doble on the inside. And then a big send by Gareth Clayton, number one, the reigning champion up the inside line to go third. They all go into Old Hall. Do they all come out the other side? Yes, they do, but it could well be Conor Grady's white car in the lead of the race. Drops back, though. He's on the inside. He has another think about it. Can't do it. So it is going to be Doble that leads. Second is Grady. Third, it is Gareth Clayton. Ross Stoner is fourth. He was saying, Ross Stoner, after race one, that he definitely didn't want it wet. And uh, if it was, he was going to do pretty badly because he's lost his bottle and hates the wet. Well, a dry road might give him an opportunity. As Gareth Clayton goes second there, look on the inside line. He had a really pox qualifying, but he's rebuilt the day as they come up now towards Shell Oils. Stoner in the orange car to the outside line there, tries to go all the way around the outside of Connor Grady to no avail. Mike Doble is next, running a little bit wide there, putting a wheel onto the dirt as they bounce their way out of Shell was Max Noble. And another big lock-up. Conor Grady kind of drives this like he would a Ginetta Jr. Flicks the car through the chicane. More tar smoke. Who was that abusing? Oh, that was uh, Gordon McMillan, Rudy McMillan, uh, getting through. He had a penalty in race one, but he had good pace off the line then and in this race too. Somebody's knocked on the wipers as they drop over Hilltop down towards the Hislops chicane. More tar squeal as they scrabble their way through and now make the run uh, up through Nickerbrook Corner towards the water tower and then on towards Druids. The race leader, Joe Doble then, having asserted himself a little bit more over the course of this opening lap, trying to build the gap over the opposition as they come up towards Druids, and he's doing so. In second place, though, is the reigning champion. So uh, Gareth Clayton now becoming more and more of a driver to watch because we know how good he is uh, after his championship successes last year. Let's see what he can do now about hunting down the race leader. And he started the first race quite a long way back on the grid, something like ninth. So, uh, as I say, he's rebuilt the day into the braking zone further back there uh, another look at the inside big big dive by Alex Reed to go through and he gains a place as they turn out of Lodge Corner up towards the line then comes the leader it is Joseph Doble ahead a little bit of a gap back now to Gareth Clayton in second place Connor Grady third Ross Stoner fourth leading the Masters class ahead of Mike Doble and Alex Reed sixth ahead of their Max Noble and also uh, behind Gordon McMillan so lots of shuffling going on as the cars come over the line and still they battle lower down the order, heading in towards Old Hall Corner. So good, good racing, this. The uh, compact cup delivering good action. And there, look, Gordon McMillan, number 20, on the inside of Max Noble, tries to go through. This is all happening for seventh place on the run along Lakeside Straight. And McMillan, number 20, in that grey and yellow car on the inside line, ought to be able to make that move stick, I would have thought, by the time they get to the end of the straight. And he does, and he goes by. So with a big slide further back there from... Richard Sutherland's all black car with the blue wheels that puts him on the wrong line and it opens up the door possibly for Peter Smith to have a go Peter couldn't do it comes off the corner uh, what progress of Matt Flowers though because uh, after being at the back of the grid he's trying to make his way through the pack and I'm not sure he even came through at the end of the opening lap so is there a car stranded anywhere is there a yellow flag anywhere didn't seem to be on the timing page at the end of the opening lap so the leaders come over Hill top, tyre squeal as they get towards his locks. Oh, Matt Flowers is there, but I don't think his transponder is working. That's the problem. So uh, we can't necessarily work instantly out his race position. We'll do it from the eye in a second as the cars climb the hill. Matt Flowers goes through shot. So he is in the race, but he's got work to do. And his progress is going unnoticed with the transponder not uh, picking up. So out of Druids they come with their uh, Gordon Miller on the back look of Alex Reed, so that battle continues now for six and seventh places. The leading line, Joe Doble trying to make good his escape, and as they drop down towards Lodge Corner, he's still being kept on his toes. Alex Reed has got McMillan behind him. Then you've got Max Noble next up as they come through Lodge. Joe Doble leads the way then. In second spot, Gareth Clayton, and for third, Connor Grady. Ross Stoner is fourth, leading the Masters class from Mike Doble. Bit of a gap back to almost everybody else. That second wave of cars, Reed, McMillan, Noble, Sutherland, Smith to 10th, uh, all in a line. And I reckon 13th is where Matt Flowers is in number three, because he's gone by on the tail of Rod Langham, even if the transponder doesn't tell us that. Battle on here, look, coming down towards Cascades. At the head of it is Alex Reed in the blue car, but it's Gordon McMillan right on his tail. 
And then next in the queue, Max Noble as the field rounds along Lakeside Straight. Richard Sutherland in the black and blue, like a bruise almost that, uh, coloured car. Ninth place, Peter Smith 10th. So McMillan to not quite the outside line, coming towards Island Bend. He wants the inside for Shell, but there's no real opportunity, I don't think, to go launching up the inside there, unless Alex Reed makes a mistake and goes deep into the corner. He does go deep, but then V's off the exit, if you like. So he cuts back across Gordon McMillan and hangs on to position. Reed sixth, McMillan seventh, Max Noble in eighth, ninth place Sutherland, tenth is Peter Smith, way up onto two wheels as they wallop the high curb coming towards Britons. We've done the first third of the race then, just over nine more minutes on the clock, and Peter Smith there, number 31, lines up to have a go on the outside uh, of Richard Sutherland as they come down towards his lots. Gordon McMillan getting all feisty as well, trying to force a mistake out of Alex Reed as they go right and left and then right again, up now towards Nickerbrook. Max Noble, eighth, waiting for it to end in tears ahead of him possibly, and then he can make a move. They climb the hill, heading now up towards Druids, and McMillan is on the move because Heading up towards the water tower, he was just jinking out from behind Alex Reed's car. So for sixth place, is there a change? Not quite. Reed is still ahead of McMillan, and then right behind them is Max Noble as they come out of Druids. McMillan to the inside, runs out of real estate, has to cut across the road as he does so. Defence from Max Noble. McMillan on the outside line. Look as they dive down towards Lodge Corner. Still no way through. Out of the right, up Deer Leap, nose to tail. McMillan looking quicker than Reed. He was third on the road in the earlier race. Now he's got a run, but it's the outside line down towards Old Hall Corner. Gordon McMillan puts his nose in front. He's got the place, but whether he can hold it going into Old Hall remains to be seen because Alex Reed comes back at him. A big lock up from McMillan, who now tries to get the undercut coming out of the corner. Up the curb goes Reed. He still defends. Max Noble buys into this as well. And so now, as they drop down towards Cascades, to the outside line goes McMillan. On the inside line is Alex Reed. Great racing. McMillan is still alongside. He's still on the outside. And he still hasn't quite done it. It's like a rolling start. They run along Lakeside Straight. Alex Reed in the blue car on the inside line will have the shorter, tighter, quicker line going into Ireland. And he goes through, but he's sideways, and McMillan gets a little bit lent on. McMillan's all over the grass. Noble's got ahead of him. Smith's got ahead of him. Sutherland's got ahead of him. And McMillan is back on the road. He didn't bog down in quite the way that Matt Flowers did, but he's cost himself a whole load of places. And Alex Reed has still got this great gaggle of cars queued up behind him. Second place, Gareth Clayton just ahead of Connor Grady. The leader is escaping. If Joe Doble is in for the whole year, he's going to take some stopping on the evidence of today. And Gareth Clayton realising that this is going to be a tough season again. Third place is Connor Grady. Ross Stoner looking for another class win running. Fourth ahead of Mike Doble. And uh, it would have been Gordon McMillan next because he was sixth over the line. But he's going to be much, much lower and giving Alex Reed sixth place back then. But Joe Doble is showing you how you do this. You crack on, you don't mess about, you uh, build a gap. He was brave on cold tyres at the start of the race, and now continuing to push and push and push and build the lead. Ross Stoner in fourth place, Masters class leader, coming underneath the vehicle bridge, down now towards Lodge Corner. And ahead of him is Conor Grady, former Ginetta and Fiesta junior racer, giving the reigning champion a really tough time, but Gareth Clayton has just got the answer. There are six and a half minutes on the clock as the leader goes by. Ross Stoner through. Now behind him is Mike Doble, and the margin is about seven tenths of a second. Stoner's the orange livery, uh, Mike Doble the blue and white livery behind that, and they are arguing over the lead of the Masters class. But Mike Doble, despite being third in qualifying, has not found the missing pace as yet, so can't really latch on to the back of Stoner. Down through Cascades they turn. I like the fact that Ross has the orange helmet to go with the orange car. Wags the back of it as he comes over the kerb out of uh, Cascades. So there's second, third, fourth and fifth all in a line. Out of Shallow's corner they go. And all the time that Conor Grady is applying pressure to Gareth Clayden, it means Gareth is going to have to go slower and defend. And it's playing into the hands of the race leader, Joe Doble, who is escaping up the road. Out of Britons they come now. Over Hilltop, down to his lops. 
despite the rain we had earlier on, and Ross Stoner's wife was being on briefly there, uh, it is definitely brightening up, it is definitely drying, and so Gareth Clayton wriggles out of his lops. Tyres still squealing in protest. Goes now up through Nickerbrook and makes the climb up the hill once again. Joseph Doble having uh, won the earlier race, starting on pole again here, and another fastest lap, having a, a rather dominant start to his BMW Compact Cup career. Second place Clayton, third place Brady, fourth place Stoner, it was ever thus. And Mike Doble still looking for that missing couple of attempts or so before we can really think about getting back onto the back of Ross Stoner. Alex Reid is hanging on to his sixth place as the cars now come towards Lodge. But for Joe Doble, he's about to emerge from Deer Leap and put another lap in the book. He will go through, breaks the beam, and as he does so, has an advantage now of over four seconds from Gareth Clayton. But Ross Stoner, as the race wears on now, look, he's getting a little bit more toey in his efforts to get past Conor Grady, and maybe he needs to because uh, Mike Doble is looking a little bit nearer. Mike's son, remember, Mikey Doble, part of the Power Max Racing team within the British Touring Car Championship. Uh, Gordon McMillan, after his rally crossing, has gone through in 11th place, just ahead of Matt Flowers. And there, a little bit wide, Conor Grady, that's coming out of Cascade, small error. So he runs wide over the kerb. Trying to come back at him is Ross Stoner on that run along the straight. But not really close enough to take advantage. Gareth Clayton's escaping, finally. He's managed to shake off. Connor Grady, Stoner inching up under braking as they turn into the right-hander through the corner they will go now. And even with Stoner on the back of Grady, Doble still can't quite close. So Mike's car just hasn't looked as good in racing as it did in qualifying this morning. They close back up onto the tail of Gareth Clayton look as well as they come into Britain's. So second for fourth you're looking at, but the race leader, Joe Doble, is away and gone, building the gap as they head once again down towards the Hislops chicane Mike Doble possibly under braking a fraction nearer mm, arguable, arguable all of that and the car looks like it's got a bit of understeer in it as well as he goes through his lops but the leader his son away and gone up the hill Joe Doble clear still by over four seconds and how many more laps can he squeeze out of this a flying lap is a two minutes five two minutes six that might be two on the board yeah looking at the clock so as they come down towards Lodge Corner, Joe Doble, the leader, all on his own, got a wheel out of line. He has looked so, so impressive over the course of not just this race, but race one and indeed the qualifying session as well. So, uh, yeah, there's time enough for two more laps just as Joe Doble comes through. The motorcycle dealership family adorned on the side of the car. Second and third and fourth, then Gareth Clayton from Conor Grady, and again, look, Ross Stoner pulls out to have a look. That is Max Noble ahead of Peter Smith and on the back of Alex Reid and fending off Richard Sutherland. So this is sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, coming out of Deer Leap. It's one of the fiercest fights on the track at the moment. Peter Smith to the inside line, trim trailing, look as he does so, and gets right onto the back of Max Noble, the car squirming under braking, and Max Noble gets sideways, possibly with a little bit of help. I think Peter Smith's car is trying to fall apart around him. It's all it's a bit loose and wobbly, bits of that bodywork. And he's slow at Denton's, and that means that Richard Sutherland gets up on the outside line. But he's not going to be able to go all the way around the outside of Peter, I wouldn't have thought there. No, so Smith fends him off. And Alex Reed, sponge like, soaking up all of the pressure, hangs onto the place. Along Lakeside Straight they go. Ready to jink left at Island Bend. There is a uh, driving standards flag being fluttered in the direction of Conor Grady. That is for track limit. And Max Noble with a mega dive up the inside, clatters his way past Alex Reed, gets the place, lets Peter Smith through as well, and gets all sideways, and lets Richard Sutherland up alongside him. And Alex Reed was the one that was really dealt a bad hand in all of that, because if he hadn't got out of the way, he would have been absolutely harpooned. Anyway, Peter Smith it is, who is now at the head of this little battle pack, from Sutherland, from Noble, and McMillan has got past Reed as well. And I don't think they're done yet either with a lap to go. So it changes and changes again. Down towards his lops, Alex Reed looking all fired up, gets up the inside across the grass, forces McMillan across the grass in the middle of the triangle. McMillan toboggans his way back onto the road, and Alex Reed's car survives. Doesn't gain the place, quite rightly. And Matt Flowers is reeling them in, but it's all getting a bit leery. Late race, a lap to go at the end of this. 
And as they turn their way now up through Druids, uh, it's going to be a rather different order at the bottom end of the top six than it was a lap ago. Onto his last lap has gone the race leader with 10 seconds to spare. So Joe Doble from Gareth Clayton, Connor Grady, Ross Stoner, it was ever that. Mike Doble fifth and falling away. And then anybody want to be sixth? Because after the last lap, the survivors uh, come through in the new order of Peter Smith, sixth, seventh, Richard Sutherland, eighth, Max Noble, ninth, Gordon McMillan, 10th, Alex Reed, 11th is Matt Flowers, and overlapping for 12th as they went over the timing line there, we had Adam Wright and Xavier Ross. So it's all been very spectacular, very frenetic. And another lap still to complete as you look there at the fight for second. Gareth Clayton ahead of Conor Grady as they sweep out of Island Bend up towards the right at Shell. And Grady closing up. Matt Flowers, look, number three on the back of 148, Alex Reed. The transponder not working. And there you've got Stoner, who's done it. He's gone through for third place. That was brave. So Ross Stoner, what did he say about losing his bottle? Uh, far from it. That was a proper brave effort up the inside line. Elbows his way past Conor Grady, and all of a sudden Mike Doble is back at the races as well, thinking, I need to get on with this. Uh, does Conor have a problem? He's lost a bit of pace over the last couple of laps, that's for sure. And so now, as the cars come down towards his laps for the last time, Grady has to defend in the white car, number 25. And turning their way further back, you've got Sutherland ahead of Noble. This is for 7th and 8th and 9th is Gordon McMillan behind then as the cars uh, head over hilltop. Matt Flowers in the transponder free number 3 is running 11th. Hopefully that's where the result will confirm him at the end of the race. But you've got uh, Joe Doble having absolutely dominated these opening races of the championship. Coming out of Druids down towards Lodge Corner. Checkered flag awaits and a very dominant display indeed uh, by Joe Doble. Second, Gareth Clayton. Third could yet be up for grabs because Mike Doble out of nowhere has suddenly caught back up onto the back of Grady and he's trying to go around the outside. Ahead of the pair of them though is Ross Stoner. Checkered flag is at the ready. Joe Doble makes it two from two at Alton Park in the BMW Compact Cup. The uh, Nankang Tire sponsored championship from second Gareth Clayton and Ross Stoner third a great drive. Fourth Connor Grady, fifth Mike Doble. Right. The survivors for sixth, seventh and back come through. Max Noble being given a bit of a tap there by Gordon McMillan. They're going to be side by side coming up towards the line. And McMillan just gets his nose in front to go through. And further back, Alex Reed having to battle with Adam Wright as they come over the line. But Matt Flowers was in that battle pack as well. We need to try and get him into the result with that Gammy transponder somehow and confirm his result. So although Joe Doble made it look very easy, some proper racing behind him, some really good fighting there. And I know that there's a little bit of compact contact, but maybe in these conditions it was uh, perhaps inevitable on occasions, especially given that everybody's in the same base car. Uh, and one-mate racing always giving good entertaining racing, especially these sorts of cars with rear-wheel drive. A bit of damage on one or two others coming over the line. But Rod Langham's cars front right wheel didn't seem to be at quite the same angle that everybody else's front right wheel was at. But he's got to the end, that's the good news. So after uh, two lively races, a provisional result uh, would look something like this. Joe Doble, the race winner from uh, Gareth Clayton in second place. Third going the way of Ross Stoner, fourth Connor Grady and Mike Doble, fifth. Ross Stoner also winning, of course, the uh, Masters class. Sixth, Peter Smith after a, uh, a good race ahead of Richard Sutherland and then Gordon McMillan. Uh, then, somewhere around ninth, you're going to have to put Matt Flowers with Max Noble, Alex Reed, and Adam Wright also in the mix. Xavier Ross behind with Alistair Smith and then Paul Van Astin in 14th place. Mark Grady ahead of Tim Seaford and Rod Langham with Daniel Mountford, Alex Corkwell and Barney Lower rounding out the finishers. So one more race of the sprint race variety to come. That is for the uh, modified Fords. And then <coughs> attention turns to the uh, Fun Cup Enduro. But I've got to say, the BMWs have entertained royally today. Some really good racing. Uh, and uh, interesting to see that Joe Doble arriving on the scene has made last year's champion sit up and take notice. No question about that. So looks like it's going to be an interesting season, that is for sure, within the uh, Compact Cup. Nankang Tyre sponsoring the series, supplying the rubber, uh, which 
certainly been given a workover over the course of the uh, race, but good racing produced nonetheless and a good season in store. So the cars making their way to uh, pit in, then to Park Fairmate. Somewhere around the circuit, there's always a bit of mud, and uh, that needs to be swept, ready for our next race. The Fords got the worst of the weather on the first rotation of the uh, categories, so they're hoping for a drier circuit this time around. And I think they are going to be in luck as well. So there's 15 minutes of Fords, and then the uh, Fun Cup race will follow after that uh, with the mandatory pit stops and... Uh, a totally different type of race, of course, with the mandatory driver changes and refuelling to round out the day. So the BMWs head to Park Fairmate. Fords, in a moment, will head to the grid, and then they'll have their rolling start formation lap. So they'll uh, come to the grid, and then they'll have their one rolling start lap. And uh, it was a, a spectacular race first time around. One or two drivers failed to get to the end, so we'll see if there are any gaps on the grid. Uh, one thing we do know in Ford terms, I was getting all excited in race one about Darren Owen uh, coming up from the back of the grid. He then had to go and see the uh, clerk of the course and has been excluded for overtaking uh, under yellow flags. Uh, it didn't look as though he was necessarily the only culprit, but he anyway did get done for it. And so he's going to start uh, 29th on the grid for this race, assuming everybody ventures out. And it's going to be interesting to see what progress he can make from there. Pole position will go the way of Jim Hutchinson because it is a uh, grid based on the results of uh, race one and the Northern Irish driver with the Escort Mark 1 uh, which is the immaculately presented car was so so quick he's going to be hard to stop but again if it's a drier track uh, the story could be a little bit different. First though it's time to hear from the somewhat dominant Joe Doble. Two out of two in the BMW Compact Cup and he is with Scott Woodwiss. So, so another excellent race from start to finish for the Nankang Tai BMW Cup and there was no catching this man, Joe Dover of course and it's not a bad start to the season, sort of uh, two wins, two of them from pole position, I think you got fast slap I think in that one as well, pretty much leading from start to finish, I think that's what you call the Grand Slam. Yeah it was a perfect weekend, um, I'm really happy to get hit off from the ground running, um, get some points on the board, set the set standard. Um, and I'll see where it takes us. Yeah, you made quite a step forward compared to last year. Because last year was, you think, your first proper season in the championship. So you made lots of leaps forward. Of course, we talked about in the first race that you know Mikey and Mike and the sim racing has helped. Is it, where do you think is there still more pace to unlock, or do you think the car's pretty much where you want it now? Hopefully for the rest of the season. I, th I still think there's pace in the car um, and me. Obviously, no one's perfect, but um, <laughs> uh, yeah, pace in the car. I mean, it's pretty pretty good at the moment. So just got to keep playing around with it. Set up, set up. Um, from track to track and then yeah hopefully it all goes well keep this up you might people might talk to you about the championship at one point well that's the plan <laughs> it's every driver's plan but of course got to keep going now yeah you've got to try and at least match Mikey if you can I don't know what his record was but I'm try, I'll try and beat it <laughs> I think his record's winning two championships in one weekend with yeah. BMWs and Genettas you have to race two championships to be able to do that so but no, yeah let's try and keep it going Great stuff. Well, you've driven superbly all day. Well done. Good stuff. We'll see it on next on excellent stuff. Uh, let's bring over second place, Gareth Clayden, defending champion with the number one pride, the Umbador. Good, Good to see you. Good. Um, slightly character building uh, day, day of mixed fortunes. So yeah. Qualifying was a bit off the pace. Just yeah. first, talk us about what was the uh, what caused you back in ninth so in qualifying. We wasn't expecting the rain in qualifying, so we had a brand new set of tyres on the back, um, and yeah, it just it was just like driving on ice to be honest. So, um, but and then I made the mistake. I came in. I thought it's going to carry on raining, so we came in and softened up. And here it really cost you because it's two sec two minutes a lap. Yeah. So I mean that cost me three laps, and I didn't get the extra lap at the end where it seems like everybody put their best times in so yeah so it put us gave us some work to do for sure yeah. so uh but yeah i mean i knew that joe he was fast this weekend so p2 was what we was aiming for because that's the kind of pace we was on really struggled to get the power out of this car this weekend or getting a good setup on it so we're just uh, all squirrely out the corners so uh some work to do before we go to croft yeah so, so, so you you got some competition to defend that number one on the window haven't you yeah yeah i mean uh, a lot of the look got a lot of new faces i mean joe's come through obviously pedigree double family um so yeah it should be a good strong um challenge this year it should be good yeah so what do you think you need to do to get this car sorted a bit better for, for Croft? <laughs> Give me some more rear-end grip and a bit more grunt. So <laughs> Simple as that. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, so, but I'd like to say thank you to Master Mix for putting us here. Midland tyre, safe shaving. Um, 
yeah, so all of the so all of the team and everything. So even when we do have a struggling weekend like we had, we all pull together and get the result at the end. Do you think it's points on the board? Exactly, consistent points on the board. I mean, ninth to fourth was okay. So, but always putting it on the podium. That is always great stuff. So, good Thank to see you. you. Well done. We'll Thank see you across the next one. Yeah. And uh, let's bring Ross in for third place. Well, you wanted it to stay dry, and you got your wish. Yeah, thank God. <laughs> thank God. Yeah, it was nice that it was dry, and um, yeah, you know, just being a bit patient behind. I think it was Brady going into Ireland. He, he left a gap and stuck it down there. But uh, I think we had a little bit more pace, to be honest. We've got uh, some super duper brakes that my dad's been working on. Um, and Carl, obviously, the mechanic is. If Carl's not even a mechanic. Carl is like a master engineer, ex hill climb <laughs> champion. Once put a Formula One engine in his hill climb car. So so really lucky to have him supporting us uh, and obviously my daughter Daisy and my uh, wife Debs are at home so uh, yeah glad to not come home and be in a bad mood for the rest of the week so yeah good result. Looks like you made a really good step forward from compared to last year. Yeah, we had a lot of gremlins last year. I mean, we did the first round, we were sort of third or fourth on pace, and then we developed a gremlin, and it would just cut out sporadically, and uh, we took it to Carl, and he got it all sorted, and now it's it's great, you know, it's going really well, so nice weekend. Fingers crossed for Croft. Well done, good results, we'll see you there. Excellent stuff. So that's the BMW sorted. Next time they'll be out of Croft in a few weeks' time. One more sprint race left to go. It's the second modified Ford Series race. Thankfully, much drier conditions than they had in race one. So with the final sprint before our fun cup in Giro later on this afternoon, it's back to David in the the box for the grid. So the modified Fords head through the Fosters cut through round to the grid, ready for the rolling start. Uh, with as Scott rightly says, a much drier road for them. They had uh, a brief shower before their first race. The rolling start, we have Paul Neville spinning in a straight line, if that makes sense, as he came past the pits. And a lap later, Piers Grange from second place into the gravel, and that therefore caused a safety car. The results of that race are the grid for race two Jim Hutchinson and Tom Avenden's Mark Wire escorts at the front, ahead of James Allen's Focus, Oliver Bullion's very quick Fiesta. Might go backwards in the dry now, ahead of Todd Garner and the Mark II Cortina of Josh Payton. Seventh is Robert Lewis, ahead of Alex Bohm. Then you've got Mike Thurley's. Very smart escort and Alan Brex, very smart. Uh, Ford Capri, Wayne Crabtree, 29th on the grid for race one, up to 11th in the end, ahead of Mike Manning, who had a trip off the road. Matt McCarthy and Piers Warwick are on row seven. Row eight, Colin Claxton and Luke Bennett's Eurocar V8. Then you've got Dave Barrett and Malcolm Wise, Kevin Hadfield and Sean Hadfield, lockout row 10. Then it's Mick Head in the Martini liveried escort Cosworth, alongside Piers Grange. So one to watch out of the gravel. Jay Hinton and Chris Baker should be on the next row. Then the Matthias family, Scott and David, who retired their Sapphire Cosworth from race one. We lost Sam Shimwell with mechanical woes in the first. Paul Neville with damage. And Daz Owen put to the back, excluded from race one by dint of overtaking under yellows. And as they come up to the grid, I can't see Daz Owen's car, so I suspect he is a bit aggrieved and may not be playing second time around. So that car looks like it's absent, which is a shame because it was quick uh, and it would have been worth watching up from the uh, back of the grid. It finished fifth or sixth over the line, so I can't believe it's a mechanical problem that's kept it away. Uh, we've also not got Sam Shimwell's Fiesta, which from memory was another car that had to... I know Darren, Darren Owen is on his way. I can tell you a lie. He was late on parade, but he is there. Uh, so set, there it is. Number eight, the former Bangor racer turned hot rod racer turned circuit racer, Daz Owen, deadly Daz. Uh, green flag shown at the back. So Sam Shimwell's Fiesta is the only one that's not there. Piers Grange's car is there. Paul Neville's Escort looks Escort shape. Number 33, you can just see it to the left of the shot there. And the pace car as it is leads them away then. So we are ready to get the rolling start underway. Shows you a snapshot of what Ford has produced over the years in Europe. Some really interesting shapes and sizes. And then the engineer uh, in the driver shines through, being able to put bigger engines in and uh, find every bit of horsepower you can possibly get out of the car. So the formation lap, the rolling start lap underway. Malcolm Wise's escort, the yellow and white and blue car just going through shot. Malcolm's been racing Fords for a long, long time. Jim Hutchinson then making the trek from Northern Ireland worthwhile with a win earlier on. Not a championship this, as the name suggests, a series to encourage people out 
when they want, when they can. And Dave Cockle won the first race at Silverstone from Tommy Field and James Allen's two-wheel drive focus third. James went one better in race two. But uh, quite a few drivers that were there not making the trip to the northwest. But those that are here certainly gave a good account of themselves and good racing earlier on in the day and anticipate more of the same once we go racing. Rolling start, so the uh, pace car as it is, we'll get them all in order coming through Druids. The lights will go out, it will bail for the pits, we will go racing. And Jim Hutchinson and Tom Abenden at the front of the grid. Given the fact these cars are decidedly powerful uh, with the turbocharged engine uh, I can imagine that on a dry road they'll get away but the Fiesta of Oliver Bullion that was ideally suited to the wet conditions earlier on that might fall back in the queue so I think it's going to be an interesting race this with quite a lot of shuffling of the order uh, people rising and falling as they go so as the cars turn their way out of Britain's Jim Hutchinson's bewinged Mark 1 Escort on pole position very, very smart car. So is that, the Jägermeister Ford Capri, which is in the hands of Alan Breck. Mike Manning's Ford Sierra RS500, uh, dressed up to look like the Eggenberger World of European Touring Car Championship entries of 1987, 1988, and occasional British entry of 1988 as well. I want to say that's the ex-Jim McLaughlin car, but uh, Mike Manning behind the wheel of it. And now down towards his lops they come. Wayne Crabtree's pseudo golf with the Mark 1 Escort, very, very rapid in the first race. Had problems in qualifying, but they've cured that, and he charged his way up through the order. I might continue to charge in this as well, so that, that for the top six wouldn't be beyond the realms of possibility, I would have thought. So at the back of the grid, uh, Paul Neville and Darren Owen. They got themselves slightly out of sequence, but uh, they'll resolve that before they get to Druids, I'm sure. And the lights go out on top of the safety car. So now it's up to Jim Hutchinson and Tom Avender to get themselves at the front of the grid into that side-by-side -side formation. And then they will make the run down towards Lodge Corner. Uh, the little virginal white fiesta of Oliver Bullion on the outside line uh, looking a bit incongruous against the more modified escorts and just all round larger shapes as I say on a dry road I think that might struggle a little bit for grunt um, we will see that's the uh, ST150 2 litre engine Fiesta it'll be good through the corners but uh, the more powerful cars around it I suspect will now start to show it the way home as the second modified Ford series race of the day is set to get underway then the cars come now down towards Lodge Corner turn their way up Deer Leap. The lights on the gantry are red. They will change to get the race underway. And on a much drier and a much faster road, race two for the modified Ford Series is go. And a good getaway by Jim Hutchinson. Uh, James Allen's Ford Focus slots into third place. He's got Josh Painted on the outside line then as they dive down through Old Hall for the first time. Mike Manning has got a problem by the look of it because his Sierra has coasted through Old Hall from mid-grid and comes out of the corner last. So there's a problem, sadly, for the Texas Liberty Sierra and problems for James Allen, who gets tipped into a spin by Josh Payton. Payton is in the gravel. James Allen, minding his own business, tries to get himself out the other side, but that, I'm afraid, with the Mark II Cortina on the outside of the road at Cascades does not bode well, because it's well and truly ensnared in that. Wayne Crabtree's Mark I Escort looking very racy as well. They're the blue and orange car as they come up towards uh, Shell Oil. Safety car is on standby and the safety car is going to be deployed because of the dramas down at Cascades. Uh, that is Josh Payton in the gravel. He made a move on the inside of James Allen's focus, made contact, spun them both, and uh, his, as you can see, is the car that is going no further. So yet again, safety car and modified Fords go together. So everybody having to slow right down, everybody having to hold station, no overtaking permissible uh, while we are under safety car conditions like this. and the field turning its way up out of a Britain's right now. So the safety car will pick them up after Old Hall. There you can see Mike Manning's Sierra. So that was the car that had its woes at the start. Uh, and 
if it does get to the start line, I suspect we'll bail for the pit lane because clearly there is something not right with that car. So the uh, drivers then behind the safety car come towards his lops. Right, recovery vehicle is on the scene. So that's the good news. But quite a long way through the gravel has gone that Mark II Cortina of Josh Payton. Really good to have that sort of car, an unusual sort of car within the series. Adds welcome variety. Not docking escorts of different shapes or fiestas or capris, but it's just nice to have something different. The sapphires also, you don't see that many of those. Lots of Sierra shapes and sapphire shapes all disappeared to the open. So we to go on the road to the rods, but uh, those two Sierra Cosworths, good to have on the grid. Down towards uh, Lodge Corner they come. So uh, that is the Martini livery escort, as you can see, of Mick Head. Martini escorts rather more common in uh, rallying than racing. Uh, Mike Manning is as rather feared limping into the pit lane. There's Daz Owens, much modified Mark 1 escort. And the field then scooped up by the safety car now, as you can see. And how's the recovery doing at Cascades? Ooh, looking pretty good, like recovered. So the car's out of the gravel and onto the Foster's cut through. So as the field goes along Lakeside Straight, uh, James Allen also into the pit lane, yes. So the car that was the other one involved in that accident, getting tipped into its spin, that car has retired to the pit lane, possibly with damaged suspension, because it's quite a whack. Uh, bonnet off as well, so uh, James Allen with the team, but it's going to lap down now, so that our other fear is to all intents and purposes the end of the race. That's the race leader, though. That is the very, very smart Mark 1 escort of Jim Hutchinson. Coming now through Shell Oil's corner and waiting to see whether or not we can go racing this time. The usual format, of course, when the lights go out atop the safety car. That's the indication that it will peel to the pit lane. Piers Grange goes through. Another one trying to make some progress and had done so. A remarkable first lap to get himself up into eighth place. So, illustrating how quick a car that is. Uh, the good news of a safety car for him is that it keeps people bunched up. The bad news is it gives him fewer racing laps in which to do the attacking. So, out of Britain's they come. Over hill top. Uh, and then it'll be the run down into the right-hander of uh, Nickelbrook Corner. Lights are still on on the safety car. Uh, ten more minutes of the race to go. So, again, Jim Hutchinson thinking, come on, I want to get some racing laps in here. But the road, as far as we can tell, is clear. So hopefully in race control, uh, they'll be able to get the green flag shown at the end of this lap and we can go back to racing with the drivers having a frustrating time with that uh, lengthy safety car period earlier on in the day. Head weaving around left and right to try to keep the warmth in the tyres of the Escort as he comes down into his lops. On the back of the Puma, on the back of the Mark 1 Escort, on the back of the Mark 2 Escort, on the back of the two Sapphires and a Puma, illustrating the variety. Pace quickening then as they come up towards uh, Druids because the lights are out on top of the safety car. So good news, we can go back racing then at the end of the lap. Hutchinson versus Ovenden take two. Tom Ovenden, who started off in junior rallycross, came into circuit racing again in junior categories, but something rather different for him. And uh, then Alex Bohm, haven't really touched on this, has got himself up into third place, uh, starting on the eighth slot on the grid in number 24. So Alex keeping out of trouble in the uh, Boomerang racing mark, six Fiesta third. Fourth is Todd Garner. And Oliver Bullion is in that mix as well as the cars now make the run with eight and a half minutes on the clock up through Deer Leap. Pace car is in. 
lights will go green and the green flag is waved and Jim Hutchinson accelerates away. Oliver Bullion gets up on the inside line there, look of the uh, Fiesta in the hands of Todd Garner and goes up on the inside line to go fourth. Down to fifth is Garner. In sixth place, Robert Lewis and Wayne Crabtree seventh now in the escort, looking to try to gain ground as they come down the hill as well. Bearing in mind that Wayne Crabtree started race one last on the grid, this has been a good recovery. Piers Grange, though, is just ahead of him as they turn their way through. Grange looking the silver mark two right around the outside of Robert Lewis. Tick up the inside of Oliver Bullion. Tick. And the next target by the end of Lakeside Straight is going to be Todd Garner's Fiesta, which doesn't show on the timing tower. That's Crabtree getting himself up alongside Lewis and taking the omnipotent Capri of Alan Breck with him for good measure. So the Gulf Escort, or Gulf Liberian Escort, to the outside line of the Focus. Alan Breck, Grant and Go, Capri chased by Mike Furley and Colin Claxton with their Zaxby recreation uh, escorts. But the Focuses and Fiestas still holding their own, it must be said, despite the dry nature of the road now. Coming out of uh, the chicane at Britain's, race leaders are getting away a little bit. The other one to keep an eye to, of course, is going to be Darren Owen from the back of the grid. But his progress stymied a little bit by that safety car period and the relative uh, lack of laps that are going to be up to the end. Seven minutes trips over on the clock now as down towards the Hislop chicane comes the traffic and Daz Owen just can't really get through can he up the escape road goes one of the focuses one of the Matthias's has got something stuck to the front of the car so it's all happening lower down the order leaders come out of Druid then down towards Lodge and as they do so Jim Hutchinson is trying to escape and he's succeeding in so doing that's Todd Garner's transponder free fiesta you're looking at which doesn't appear in the uh, timing order but Jim Hutchinson and Tom Avondon have both gone through well clearing the lead of the race that is Wayne Crabtree, who is in eighth provisionally with these transponder glitches. Piers Grange goes through. Now, he's going to be third up at the expense of Alex Bohm. Now, Piers Grange, with six minutes to go, is absolutely flying. Jim Hutchinson has got the fastest lap of the race. But now that Piers has got a clear road ahead of him, let's see what he can do. Because we know that he is, and the car is, very, very quick indeed. So Hutchinson leads the way, and first to third, 8.4 seconds. That's the one to monitor now. Uh, as the race leaders come out of Cascades. Alan Brack powering his way past Wayne Crabtree then. Capri goes ahead of Escort. Uh, that's pure V8 horsepower for you. So Wayne Crabtree having pulled himself up from the back of the race one grid now just starting to lose out a little bit in terms of grunt to some of the bigger engine cars. You've got behind him uh, Mike Furley and then Chris Baker now he's up from 24th. Chris Baker was another one that retired from race one. That's the Mark III shaped escort. Look on the back of the Mark I uh, in the blue and white livery, the very back of the queue. So Chris Baker, another experienced Ford racer, charging along. And this has been a really good recovery after we saw the car had to be uh, brought back at the start of the day. The RS 1600i then with the bigger rear wing on the back comes to the outside line of Mike Furley, who's trying to find a way at the inside of Wayne Crabtree's Mark I as they drop down now into his lops again. In the background, you can see the stranded car of Josh Payton. But Wayne Crabtree's very, very smart Mark 1 Escort makes the run up the hill. Mike Furley's equally smart Mark 1 Escort looks for a way by. And have a look at the back of that queue, because the uh, white Sapphire Cosworth in the hands of David Matthias is also going very nicely and catching up after it was a long way back on the grid, like something 26th. Out of Druids they come. Down towards Lodge. Paul Neville's on his toes. It's like a handicap race, this, in a sense, because all the cars that were quick but near the back of the grid for the start now charging their way through. Leader goes through with an advantage of 2.8 seconds, and actually first to third has widened. So rather than Piers Grange being able to come back at the leader, uh, Jim Hutchinson is turning up the wick. Look to the inside line here. Paul Neville, 33, crashed out of race one. He's making progress. Behind him, it is... David Matthias' white Sapphire Cosworth, that too is making good progress. Trying to swat aside these pesky Mark 1 escorts. He's got past Mike Furley's car now, has uh, David Matthias, and now gets himself up past Wayne Crabtree's car as well, with the number 16 RS 1600i. That's Chris Baker's car, also trying to get in on the act on the outside line. The leaders are already making their way up over Hilltop. You can see uh, a 
equally that mark is still pouring their way over the timing line so cars all the way around this long lap at Alton Park great escort battle they're going on Mike Furley another man from the ovals keeping Chris Baker at bay that's a much modified much developed RS 1600i that if you go back to 1983 uh, came into the British Touring Car Championship Chris Hodgetts was one of the early masters of the RS 1600i flapping bonnet on Chris Baker's car looks like a pin has gone on the left hand side but it's not slowing him down any as they come into the braking zone for his lops to the right and into the left race leaders incidentally have just got over the line such is their prodigious pace and Tom Avenden has now set the fastest lap of the race in his efforts to get onto terms with Jim Hutchinson Piers Grange still running in third but this battle pack is certainly not done yet as now Scott Matars tries to get in on the act in the Black Sapphire Cosworth Alan Brex Capri under attack from the bewinged Sapphire of David Matars that picks him off easily on the run down towards Lodge Corner the black sapphire in the hands of Scott Matthias comes up to have a go at Mike Furley and will outbreak him, I think, on the inside line and go through. He does so, goes by. So plenty of shuffling still going on as these quick cars from a low grid position hustle forward. Uh, Wayne Crabtree's car sort of yo-yoing because it's quick in its own right. But then you've got other ones that are quicker still making progress forward. And at the back of that little wave of cars uh, coming up towards the line is Daz Owens, Mark 1, uh, escort which is also now starting to gain ground five laps in the book that is David Matars taking yet another place that puts him ahead of Robert Lewis and that puts him up into sixth place provisionally depending on what Paul Neville's done now he's gone through as well so Neville is sixth and seventh now is Matthias With a minute and a half to go, Jim Hutchinson is going to squeeze one more lap out of this when he gets to the line from Tom Avenden in second place. And that gap really not coming down much. Looking across there to the approach to Britons. Chris Baker gets himself ahead of Wayne Crabtree. So that's the change for 10th place. And there is Darren Owen, who's another car with a transponder not showing. He's running 12th on the road and hasn't done yet. That more modified sort of special saloon style Mark 1 Escort comes up to have a go at Wayne Crabtree's car. Daz Owen to the inside line, out brakes, goes through, job done. Wayne Crabtree chasing after him. Class leaders, as you can see, Jim Hutchinson, Piers Grange, Oliver Bullion, David Matthias, Sean Hadfield, and here Scott Matthias coming up to have a go at Alan Brecht's glorious sounding Capri. And the Jägermeister livery, just a great colour scheme as well. It works on any car, whether it's from a Formula One car to a club race car. Down towards the Lodge Corner, Matthias Jr. through on the inside line. We're on the last lap of the race, incidentally, as well now. Jim Hutchinson clear by four seconds. So he is just turning up the wick, getting faster and faster and faster all the time. Ovenden running second, Piers Grange third. And here, behind... Alex Bohm in fourth place, Paul Neville and David Matas fifth and sixth. That's the race leader. He's in and among the traffic. And Jim Hutchinson now just ticking off the corners, having made this look utterly dominant. It's been a hugely impressive display, not only by uh, Jim as a driver, but by the team to put together this uh, Millington engine tuned car so, so effectively. First visit to the series, first visit to Alton Park, and two wins. Going to be the perfect way to round out the day, aren't they? Down towards the vehicle bridge he comes underneath it sets the car up for lodge corner he will break he will go right uh, Jim Hutchinson has not put a wheel wrong all day there's no reason to think he will do it at the last corner just absolutely beautifully presented car well driven and it's two out of two in the modified Ford series then for Jim Hutchinson as he comes through to win Tom Avenden's Mark 1 Escort is a slightly distant second uh, but third Piers Grange ah oh, he's got a problem at lodge on the last lap as he had a spin Piers Grange is delayed and yes, he's had a rotation because dust is settling. There he is, and he's got caught up with that car. Mick Head is off the road as well at the top of Deer Leap. So back marker and third, by the look of it, have tangled. So that's going to put Alex Bohm fourth in the Fiesta. Wait for him to emerge. Goes through. The Boomerang racing car is fourth. But a yellow flag zone at Lodge means anybody that was lining up for a move on the last lap is going to be thwarted. Fifth across the line is just uh, the Fiesta of Todd Garner. 
in sixth place then uh, was Paul Neville. Seventh place, David Matthias. And eighth to Oliver Bullion. Ninth, Scott Matthias. And to round out the top ten, I would offer you uh, will be Robert Lewis ahead of Daz Owen. But with some transponders not playing ball, uh, then there's a little bit to unravel, I think, from the end of that to give us the accurate race result. Uh, sadly, Mick Head's car, one of the smartest, the Martini livery and escort cars, were then in the wars, in the war, no less. But Piers Grange, as I say, was delayed. Then we found that car, so I think they just got caught up together at the last knockings of the race. And Mick Head, the back marker, was the one that ended up in the barriers. So there'll be a little bit of uh, retrieval work before the Fun Cup race can get underway. That's due to start at 20 past two, and we're not even at two o'clock, so there is plenty of time in hand to recover cars and to make sure that the four-hour race uh, fits into the timetable in its entirety. So the chequered flag shown then by the marshals, some cars to be retrieved. Possibly a bit of barrier work today as well. <clears throat> yes. Certainly some barrier work to do as well, even if it's only the rector cell barriers. And uh, real shame that one of the smartest cars in the entry is the Martini liveried escort of uh, Mick Head. The Martini colour scheme more familiar from world rallies than circuit racing boards, but uh, nice to have it on the green. Piers Grange then, having started 22nd, taking third place. Really good drive up through the order for him. And provisional result looks thus. Jim Hutchinson is your race winner for the second time today in the Mark 1 Escort RSR from Tom Abenden and the Mark 2 of Piers Grange. Uh, Alex Bohm's Fiesta 4th ahead of David Matthias and then Paul Neville. Oliver Bullion 7th ahead of Scott Matthias and Robert Lewis. Uh, Daz Owen was there or thereabouts next, but his transponder wasn't joining in. Alan Breck was ahead of Chris Baker and Wayne Crabtree next. Then Mike Furley and Luke Bennett in 15th place. 16th, Malcolm Wise ahead of Piers Warwick and Matt McCarthy and Dave Barrett. Kevin Hadfield's Ford Puma ahead of Colin Claxton's Mark 1 Escort. Sean Hadfield, the last one across the line. We lost Mick Head and Jay Hinton, James Allen and Mike Manning. So all the drivers acknowledging the marshals as they turn their way back to uh, Park Ferme. And... Uh, Jim Hutchinson, I think, will be very pleased that he has made the effort to come from Northern Ireland. Mick Head's car will need a little bit of TLC before its next outing. The rest of the cars making their way into the Park Fairmate area. But uh, it's just so nice to have not only the variety, but also a, a series that looked like it had disappeared I said early on in the day. Go back to the 90s. The, what was it, the Vector Fast Forward Championship it was a really popular series of lots of different cars of the era uh, and it just seemed to lose support and wither away and then uh, a groundswell of Ford fans have got it back up and running and with even more potential cars and a sensible class structure uh, back many of them have come, really good to see so the uh, winning drivers are in Park Ferme, so too is Scott Woodward Well, he conquered the Fords in the wet, and he's conquered them in the dry. Two from two on his first time out. Jim Hutchinson, uh, a fine driver in the Escort. That one looked slightly easier, but how was it from your point of view? Just something similar, only a wee bit, a wee bit more pace. Yeah, I put new tyres on for the first race. Didn't really get breaking them in and using them much. But, yeah, the car has good potential there now. So just if I had a few more laps around it, I could, think I could really yeah. master it, yeah. I'd say for a test session, it was a heck of a test session. They get two wins in a race. That wasn't too bad. Yeah, it was good. I, well, it's sort of when you when you come across the water, there's something to do, something, and it's nice to come away with a yeah. bit of silverware. But yeah, yeah, yeah it was yeah. It was good. Now, yeah, enjoyed it. I think I know the answer to this, this next question. Do you fancy come back to do some more? Definitely. Yes. <laughs> yes. So. Yeah. That's that's the right answer. <laughs> yes, that yeah. Jim, you've been superb, brilliant, and, and also as well as what well, can we say? You've got this beautiful green and gold. Oh, well, it's got. It looks. Yeah. The Addison in the commentary box is being complimented to get inside so by beautiful car brilliant to have you well done much. great stuff so let's bring Tom over in for second place uh 
two second places for you. Uh, again, trying to catch Dan Jim was a bit sort of out of reach pace-wise, but the car looked good all, all the same. Yeah, the car was awesome. That race, really, really, really good fun. In the dry, um, it's going to take a while for the smiles to come off my face, honestly. That's <laughs> really, really good fun. Yeah, it's just a bit too fast on a straight line, this green one behind me. So we get on a straight and he just, he's gone. So it was, um, my, my really good lap, I could stay with him, but it was going to be hard to do the whole race. So no, we're, we're feeling a really good weekend and we're really pleased. What's really great to see, because you're a young driver, you've done a mini challenge, you've done a few things, now you're jumping into a historic Escort race. It's great to see young drivers like yourself jumping into classic and historic machinery like this to experience what these cars are like, essentially back in the heyday some 50, 60 years ago. Exactly, yeah, and it makes you appreciate it, definitely, but it's um, it's absolutely awesome to drive. And um, this, this circuit, I absolutely love it as well. And I think the car, the car, car... It's, this circuit is probably one of our best ones for how the car handles. So yeah, really, really good fun day. So re really enjoyed it. Are you going to be out for any more in this car, or is that it, just a, as a one-off? No, I think we're hoping to do Castle Coombe as well, uh, depending on how the how the racing stuff goes. Um, but yeah, no, we absolutely love to come back because absolutely love driving it. So yeah. You've been great entertainment. Well done. Okay. We'll see if the next one gets stuff. Right, we need to call um, Piers Grange over. Piers. Let's grab Piers over because um, there are two subjects that I need to talk to Piers about and I think David knows exactly what I'm going to talk about. First of all, Piers, well done. Okay. Um, first of all, I have to talk to you about uh, last lap scenario. No, let's talk about last lap. Out the final corner and there's a spinning martini escort. Uh, it, 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 as clean as possible, what was going through your head? I couldn't see. All I could see was just a wall of smoke. I hadn't a clue where he was. So I had to just come straight off it, virtually crawl until the smoke sort of cleared and then I just picked the way on the right-hand side and luckily it was the right way because you couldn't see anything yeah that must have been quite a, a dramatic end to what was in effect a fantastic drive through the field from deep through uh, you're really picking them off one by one in the in the dry this car's got great pace it by the looks of it yeah it's not bad for a steel body car i mean um i've got to thank like will for the engine and uh, a pip who's helped us out the last minute really with the with some problems we had yesterday um fuel pressure and uh, stuff um so thank them it's a great car it's great in the dry uh, not quite so good in the wet. <laughs> as, you, as you unfortunately found out in race one <laughs> that's it yeah we just the just weren't unfortunately warm enough um that is seriously quick mr hutchins was going so well in that first race i thought i'll try and stay with him I was quicker than him in a couple of places but staying with him down there and he just lifted the back wheels a little bit and that's just shot me around so fortunately lucky to get away with it though yeah yeah a good day's race nonetheless absolutely absolutely thank you we'll see you for next time well done Cheers. good stuff great drive to third place right that's enough for me on presenting i'm now going to jump and join david in the box for the main event this afternoon which is the first round round one of the 2024 fun cup endurance championship so i'm going to disappear the next person you see on this camera is jamie who's going to be rushing down towards assembly do a couple of chats and then we'll be back in for four hours of fun cup racing very very shortly in a few minutes time but for now back up to david in the box Thanks very much, Scott. Sterling work in the uh, Park Ferme area, and uh, now we're letting him get warm up here for four hours. So the Fun Cup is indeed next. The cars are in the assembly area. They will be brought round to the grid. The grid is based not on qualifying times. <laughs> no, far from it. That will be far too straightforward. Uh, but a balloted grid uh, to shuffle the order a bit, and then you put the reigning champions uh, for round one or subsequent events the previous race winner at the very back of the grid it all makes for plenty of overtaking and for lots of drama there are going to be five mandatory pit stops the first one coming after 40 minutes each window is about 10 minutes long uh, there's as you can see work to be done on barriers that's what happens when you get Ford escorts going off the road that uh, not only does the Rexicel need putting in place but the actual arm code just needs to be propped back up again and as uh, soon as the road is clear then we can get the cars out on track for the Fun Cup. So it means that the uh, car on pole position, based not, as I say, on uh, a time, but on the ballot, is going to be number 146, the Ben Pitch Neil Plimmer uh, car. And it will be Ben Pitch who goes first. And uh, on the outside of the front row is 22. And that will be Jack Constable, who uh, has been rapid in a variety of modern racing machines. Third on the grid, 249, started by Will Abraham, the MJ Tech Racing entry, and starting fourth for GMR Eco is going to be Gracie Mitchell, who's tested a variety of cars but has elected to uh, start her racing career really in Fun Cup. Fifth is going to be Mikey Porter for the Morpheus Racing Team. He was a winner here in GT4 a couple of weeks ago in the British GT Championship. And then Paul Ellis Smith will go first for Fueled Up Racing, uh, starting sixth on the grid. Seventh on the grid 
Paul Turner for Greenheath and starting eighth uh, the Red River Sport entry Gareth Williams uh, is going to go first uh, some cars with three drivers some with two but uh, that's a three driver entry to round out the top eight on the grid ninth on the grid is going to be 207 uh, Mark Burton quick historic Ford Mustang Lotus Cortina driver he will start and the top ten on the grid rounded out by Scott Mansell outright that record holder at many a venue Euro boss single seater gun uh, these days performance driving instructor uh, and his father in the car is going to be worth watching Kevin Mansell going back to the Halcyon days when we had classic touring cars the ICS historic touring car championship supporting the BTCC uh, Kevin Mansell in a Cortina was just a thing of beauty I don't think the thing was ever in a straight line even on a straight uh, he has a lot to live up to in a fun cup chassis to emulate that but um, he was always a highlight of any touring car event. I think even touring car drivers used to peer over the wall and watch him because he was just great value. Uh, 11th on the grid is going to be 99, the JPR Snug Investments car. Uh, Andy Bicknell will go first in that. And starting 12th on the grid for seed data will be Mike Devlin. For Team 3 Motorsport, the start driver is going to be Andy Bennett, 13th and 14th on the grid, the signature RV car started by John Whitehouse. 15th for High Peak Racing, uh, Guido Basile will go first, if you think that's a name I remember, with Formula 3 in the 1980s uh, and early 90s Formula 3000 British Formula 2, the Terrapol Promotions route Guido Basile used to uh, race. Uh, and alongside for Axiometrics, the start driver is going to be Chris Weatherall. The next row, Team Summers, He's going to be started by uh, Gary Summers. And then the uh, UVO Hoffman's motorsport car is going to be Scott Fitzgerald to go first. Then for Vape Club with EDF Motorsport, Simon Coles will be the start driver. And Race Logic's entry will be started by David Denyer. Two more rows to go. GCI Racing will be the next that's going to be Ian Wood to start and alongside him for Team Rassers Racing Peter Ratcliffe Ratcliffe Senior the back row 104 EDF Motorsport for hire Adam Cunnington starts and then the grid is going to be completed by Chris uh, Dovell uh, on the last rank on the grid as the reigning champion right the assembly area is emptying and that means that the uh, Fun Cup Endurance Championship is set to get underway for 2024. A new season of the Fun Cup Endurance Championship begins here at Alton Park. The car's being brought from the assembly area around to the grid. Four hours of racing to look forward to with these five uh, mandatory pit stops and a road that is still, I wouldn't say exactly bone dry, it's still a little bit damp and greasy uh, offline. Cars coming through the Foster's cut through round to the grid. Everybody, of course, in identical cars but operated by different teams, some with double driver entries, some with three drivers to a car. And the strategy, pit stop times, when you stop, how you cycle through the drivers and indeed how good you are in the pits, all part and parcel of a result proper endurance race this and it's going to be a really interesting one uh, once we get into the action itself a four-hour race all of which should fit perfectly before the Auckland Park curfew David Addison and Scott Wood with trackside Jamie Peter Dennis uh, will be down on the grid and then in the pit lane for us going to make him work pretty hard I think in four hours there'll be a lot to catch up on and this is how they're going to line up for uh, PLR Racing, Ben Pitch lines up alongside Jack Constable for Skull Club Racing. Will Abraham for MJ Tech Racing has Gracie Mitchell for GMR Eco alongside. Third row, Mikey Porter for the Morpheus Racing Team has Paul Ellis Smith out of the Fueled Up Racing Team for Company. Then Paul Turner's Green Heat Car and Gareth Williams for Red River Sport 8. Ninth is Mark Burton for Wave 9. And at Driver 61, Scott Mansell goes first. For the JPR Snug Investments Team, Andy Bicknell. And for seed data, uh, it is uh, going to be Mike Devlin who will go first. Uh, then for Team 3, Motorsport, Andy Bennett. For Signature RV, John Whitehead. 15th 
ex Formula 3 racer Guido Basile for High Peak Racing, and Chris Weatherall starts first for Axiometrics. In 158, the Team Summers car, Gary Summers will start, and alongside him, Scott Fitzgerald for the Team Fuvio Hoffman's Motorsport team. Uh, then on the 10th row, in 246, Simon Coles for Race Logic, David Denyer. GCI Racing put Ian Wood in first, and Team Ratters Racing is Ratcliffe Senior. Peter Ratcliffe. Uh, the back row of the grid, 104, that's the EDF Motorsport for Hire. Adam Cunnington started car, and the reigning champions, Team Olympian GRD, are going to put Chris Dovell in for the first and third stints. Grid now starting to form, and uh, Scott Woodwish, we're looking forward to this. It promises to be a fascinating race. The weather gods have tricked us a little bit over the course of the day. The, the lunchtime rain came earlier than anticipated, but... Yeah, it's drying, even if it's not completely bone dry, and it's a bit of a lottery, this race. There's no one clear favourite to win it. It gives us the one thing we love the most in motorsport, unpredictability, because it means it's, it means that li quite literally any team could win this, but usually the cars that start towards the back if they win the previous race, sometimes the form guys suggest they will go to the front. One team you should watch more definitely from deep in the field is that JPS-style livery car, mm -hmm. Uvia Hoffman's Lotus. That car might start quite far back on the, was it eighth or ninth row of the grid? But trust me, if you've been watching previous Fun Cup races, it ain't going to stay there very much longer. I think their record is getting from the back to the front of the field, regardless of grid size, in about 13 minutes. So they just pick their way through and just charge through. And the, the amazing thing is that those guys don't even do that much testing. They come into it purely as a fun <laughs> exercise. Um, and there's a great story about a previous race that I'll tell you later when we get to Uvia, which okay. is particularly amusing as to their character and what these characters are like in Fun Cup. But as they head off onto the formation lap, you've got quite a lot of unpredictability here. PLR Racing will be one of the strongest cars out front. Of course, that features Neil Plymouth, former champion team of Honeywell. But you've got cars like with this random grid draw, you've got race logic in the mix, you've got the defending champions right at the back, Uvio, GCI, other strong teams like the ones we've got with um, Mikey Port and Ted Bradbury, the car with Red River Sport, where you've got Johnny Molem in there, the JPR for higher car with Kevin and Scott Manson in the mix. This should prove to be quite fascinating. And some people, unfortunately, give Funk Up sometimes a bit of a thing in terms of it's four hours, I'm not quite sure. If, if you haven't watched the Fun Cup race before, it has a bit of an accordion effect to a good degree where everyone's bunched up at the beginning. They spread out a bit more during the pit stops and the pit windows will do that. But because there are pit windows, it will bring them all back together. You usually get very close finishes, nail biting finishes towards the end. So it genuinely is, as the title says, it's four hours of very fun endurance <laughs> racing in very evenly matched cars. And they produce, when they get down to it, some real proper wheel to wheel racing. And it's like proper modern endurance racing. It's not like the days of old where you have in Le Mans, the Jaguars would have one or two of the hairs and two, and two yeah. or three tortoises towards the back. This is like modern endurance racing. It's literally going to be four-hour sprint racing, basically. So last week at Paul Ricard, which was a piffling three hours, <laughs> um, although there were a couple of other long races to go with it, uh, we had an early safety car because there were track bollards all over the place. Then we had a safety car because the lighting gantry had fused and they needed to sort that. And then we had a car catch fire. That was all within the first hour. So you've got a bit to live up to. I'm not for a moment hoping that we have uh, lots of safety car interruptions, but you just never know in an endurance race what can be thrown at you. I think for the sake of Paul and Christian Rose, we hope none of that happens at all in this one <laughs> race. But um, it should provide plenty of entertainment. Some Sometimes you do get safety cars that bunch things up a little bit, but ultimately it's good fun. You do get some cars where they might lose a little bit of a, a front splitter here and there, but ultimately they kind of soldier on and if they have to make any repairs, they'll do it through pit windows and where they've got ability to do so. But it really is good back and forth stuff. And you might get the old team that will stay a bit longer, have different driving. That's, that could, that's another factor in it too, is that you've got different drivers, you might have one of the quicker drivers of some of the front running teams in for a first stint, then they'll switch over and different cars will be quicker at different points based on which drivers course, it is. Yeah. Sounds obvious, but it's yeah. kind of, you have two drivers that are equally quick, for example, Uvio, they have uh, Farkini and they have Fabio in the mix as well, both of them are equally quite as quick behind the wheel. You've then got teams that have a mixture of drivers, you've got Simon Rudd's very quick, he's jumped in alongside, uh, in place of Christian Rose in the defending champion car number one, he's along with Riley Phillips, whenever he gets in the car, watch out because he's utterly rapid in that car and then arguably Chris Devell, I've said this politely, is the least fastest of the three if I choose my words carefully but as I had to say it hasn't got pace but even he would admit that Simon and Riley are faster than him in that sense. So yeah. there's a good mix of skill levels here from pro drivers who've raced all around the world to those who are just doing it for a laugh. Mm -hmm. It genuinely is going to be quite a mixed bag and plenty of entertainment in store for the next four hours fingers crossed. Uh, you say if you've not seen a fun cut race before can I point out I did see the first ever I was ah. one of the very few people at Rockingham for the first one and I think there was a Donington one I did blah, 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 a few years after but I can't think I've ever seen more than those two so I'm looking forward to this because it has been 
a great success. Over 20 years, the category has now been going. Graham Butterworth, who is here, not racing, but he is here, his son's racing. Uh, he was the guy, along with Uniroyal support, that really got it off the ground. And I think for a season or two, a few people weren't really sure, but it has been a brilliant way of bringing people into motor racing, many of whom have gone on to international GT racing. You know, there are quite a few names that have come out of this. I'm thinking of Ian Dockerell, for example, as one who, with a bit of help from Nigel Greensill, came into this as a, an amateur, a club racer, a hobbyist, and rose up and up the ranks to go through into international uh, sports car racing. So you've got the cars ready then for the rolling start, coming now down towards Lodge Corner, then up towards Deer Leap. It is going to be Ben Pitch on pole position in the all-red car on his outside, Jack Constable. And as the lights are about to change, the first round of the Fun Cup Endurance Championship is underway then. The cars accelerate down towards Old Hall Corner. And who is it going to be then to uh, grab the advantage? It is going to be Ben Pitch, who from pole position then gets the race lead, turns through the corner just ahead of Jack Constable. And there, a little bit squirrely coming out of turn one, out of Old Hall, the uh, Uvio car with the pseudonymed uh, Farkini Diot to go first. Scott Fitzgerald, Chris Randall, his co-driver, uh, and experienced peddlers both. So Ben Pitch leading jinking left and right there to try to break the toe get away from the opposition as they make the run along lakeside straight for the first time but you've got three for the lead really because uh, they're not able to make a break the beauty of this of course with everybody having the same base car is that it's all down to driver ability and so running in third place then as they come uh, now out of Shell Oil's corner for the first time uh, Mikey Porter for the Morpheus racing team winner in an Aston Martin GT4 car here two weeks ago, just under two weeks ago, and adapting to something very different indeed as the cars now squirm their way out of the Britain chicane up towards Hilltop for the first time. Whoops, bit of contact there, one getting all sideways at the V-Box car, and uh, David Denyer, I think, with the wheel of it getting a bit sideways as the leaders drop down towards his lops, and not only is Ben Pitch not getting away, but the line of cars queued up behind him is getting greater and greater all the time. Uh, so it's uh, a long, long queue all to try to be in the lead of the race as they come now up through his locks, accelerating through Nickerbrook, then up Clay Hill. And who do we see? Is it still Ben Pitch? It is, but he can't get away at all here, Scott, can he? Because he's got the rest of them queued up behind him. And this is the great thing, it'll practically be like this. In fact, he's quite even lose the lead here, as up the inside he tries to make the move. Ben Pitch gets shuffled out wide, and now he's under threat from one, two, maybe three cars down towards the back straight. And now it's car 22 with Skull Club Racing. So that would be uh, Jack Constable at the wheel. Of course, XTCR racing, duck the inside, he goes to make the move. Ben Pitch is again shuffled out wide. In the mix there, two also, the 97 car. That's the front car, and at the end of literally lap number one, they're three wide already. And that's only for third place. Of course, the beauty of the grid is that you're not having the faster car ahead of the slower cars. You've got a whole jumble of them, and so three wide for third place, as you rightly say, side by side for the race lead. Mikey Porter goes right round the outside there from the third row, and the Morpheus racing car, that's the sort of black and yellow hued car, comes out in front. So that's three different leads in a lap and a bit uh, within second place then now uh, Jack Constable 97 goes through in the almost uh, Marlboro livery and that is Scott Mansell at the wheel of it and he's under attack as well now because for 249 Will Abraham who was on the second row of the grid dropped back and he's trying to push forward he comes up to have a go Mikey Porter leads the way and Scott Mansell look under attack to the inside line there goes Abraham but he can't find a way through although that said Mansell goes a little bit wide and Ben Pitch who led the opening lap has fallen back into fifth place and he's coming under attack as the cars now go up towards Britain's once again so this leading sex tech trying to get away a little bit really really hustling it over the curb and giving the tyres some grief there was uh, Scott Mansell GT tyres on which they run further back in the pack you can see number 98 there looking to try to make a bit of progress that is Andy Bennett going first for Team 3 Motorsport more tar squeal down at Hislop we've now kind of got two waves haven't we the top six then a gap and then everybody else for seventh yep and it's Vega and there is the Uvia Hoppers Lotus car as I expected picking its way through he's already on the back I think he's got past the Greenheath car just part back in that mix and he's now up to it's also past Signature RV and a few more cars looks like he's well inside the top ten as they head over the crest but now out in front, it is going to be car 195. So Morpheus Racing then, which Durant does currently have at the moment. Mikey Porter at the wheel, but he runs wide. This now gets the jump for Jack Constable to try and squeeze up along the inside. Now they go wheel to wheel, side by side, down towards the right-hander at Lodge. But look also at the damage on Porter's car already. That was before Druid. You can see the damage on the right front. So he's been wide somewhere and off the road. 
and that's taken half of the front of the, the splitter, if you like, off the car. It's not affecting him greatly, but he has got damage, hasn't he? Yeah, and by the way he's driving, he's trying to rip the other piece of the <laughs> better off he can, but and this is only barely five minutes into the race. This is exactly how it should be. Up the inside again goes Porter. Constable looks for the switch back on the exit, can't make that stick. For third, there was also a bit of a switch around between Abraham and Scott Mansell. There's also dual on for fifth now between PLR Racing Ben Pitch and the 14 car of Green. He's just behind, that's Paul Turner at the wheel. So these six have broken away initially, and that second group is headed by the 225 car, which is the Uwe Hoffman's Lotus car, which is already up to seventh position from where it started back in deep at eighth foot, ninth row of the grid. So I told you they picked their way through pretty quickly. The one at the back is Gary Summers, the team Summers, but he will uh, no doubt try to make progress. And again, you know, you put different pace of drivers into different cars, the order is going to shuffle. So Mikey Porter, complete with the damage, leads the way, but he's not escaping, is he, from Jack Constable. And then in third place is the car in the hands of Will Abraham. In fourth, you've got Scott Mansell then for... Uh, driver 61, even though the car's number is 97. So that leading quartet comes over hilltop, down towards the Hislop chicane. Mikey Porter not being able to get away here. The Morpheus racing car up front really squirms under braking, as also behind does Jack Constable. The car's absolutely on the edge of adhesion then as they flick into Hislops. But Mikey Porter with another young gun, Ted Bradbury, and two drivers, two quick drivers as well, which is arguably better than three with two quick and a slow because you can kind of match the pace all the way through the race. Yeah, Ted Bradbury, I was mentioned just before the before we got onto this race, very quick driver, debuted in the Mazda MX-5 Championship last year, had barely learned how to drive a car with a manual gearbox and was already sticking it on pole position for his first MX-5 Championship race ever at the beginning of last year at Silverstone in the damp conditions, got his first podium that day, and now he's charged through watching his uh, teammate Michael Porter one through. For second place, Will Abraham up the inside to make a move on Jack Constable, lets him have the place because he knows it's a long race, although how they're racing, I don't think they realise it's four hours rather than four minutes, but they're still going at it pretty hard, and Scott Mansell now, very experienced racing, all sorts of racing cars driven, but he did say, I think, on a social media post before, that the most exciting car he's ever driven was in Fun Cup, proving it now is up the inside, up the inside for third place. So Jack Constable leans on him over the curb on the exit. They somehow don't touch on the exit of uh, the, uh, the right-hander at uh, Old Hall. Down the hill they go again. They're still side by side. And I feel like what you're saying, that phrase probably constantly for the next four hours in between pit stops. Because again, oh. Mansell doesn't want to give it up. Over the curve, still side by side. The XR Cascade down Lakeside. Mansell's not going to give us them up easy. And why would he? They are still side by side yet again down towards Island Bend. Someone's got to give here because it's a very tight corner. And round the outside looks Mansell. They still haven't touched. They are still side by side. A little glance between each other. Lock up from somebody in front into Shalom's hairpin. They are now just about almost still side by side, but now finally <laughs> Constable capitulates, lets Mansell through up into third place eventually. They are now not officially side by side. <laughs> um, these cars are the right kind of size for Alton Park, aren't they? I don't think you could have done that with GT3 cars two weeks ago, but you can with a Fun Cup chassis. Uh, so yeah, great driving. Scott Mansell then goes through, putting him up into uh, then now third place and Will Abraham in second place, remind me what his background is, because he's done the fastest lap and he's staying with Mikey Porter, he's going very, very nicely. I can't remember 100% myself, but it's not, not definitely not his first radio in Fun Cup, he's definitely done right. quite a good thing. He's, uh, his co-driver Scott Jeffs, I believe, unless it was the other driver in the mix, but he, he was him or somebody else he drove with was a prominent uh, truck racer at one point, so he's, that car's been quite a regular front runner in recent seasons, so it's quite a, a fast pedal, it seems to be Will, so I'll let me double check exactly what his background is, I'll have a look on the old Wikipedia somewhere to figure out some of the... Okay. Uh, information but so uh, we'll go in second place and go with Mike at this point so yeah, it yeah. is literally two by two by two now for first third and fifth yes they're pairing off a little bit aren't they Scott Mansell's car again so so late on the brakes hustled into Lodge Corner coming up towards the line so Mikey Porter leads but I don't think he's going to lead for much longer because Will Abraham is all over him like a cheap suit now goes one side goes the other to the outside line there the orange and white car uh, of Will Abraham Mikey Porter has to stick out his elbows as they wriggle their way out of Old Hall Corner uh, and even though these two are squabbling they're not really being caught yet by Scott Mansell who is in third place in fourth place now for 22 Jack Constable that briefly led early on and uh, Mikey Porter, damage or no, still leads the way. Uh, what about those further back looking to try to make some progress? In fifth place now, Ben Pitch, in, and he was the man that led off the line. And in sixth place for Greenheath, uh, Paul Turner. The leaders are side by side on the outside line there, tries to go Will Abraham, 
but he can't level, can't get up alongside and has to slot back in as they turn their way now up towards the Sholaw's hairpin. But Mikey Porter goes a little bit deep into the corner, does he? Only fractionally deeper than Will Abraham. So they come out of the corner together. Do you know what? Lapry might not be that far away because as they come down to Britain's, you've still got a couple of cars only going into Old Hall Corner. But one of them is Guido Basile. And actually, having said that he's in penultimate place, he is coming under attack from Gary Summers. So you've got a battle not to be last. They'll be the first two to be lapped. It's not imminent, don't get me wrong, but they've dropped quite a long way off the tail of the rest of the pack. Right, here come the three pairs for the top six. Mikey Porter sideways, penduluming, hangs onto it. Now you can see why the drivers say they have great fun in these cars, because even if you go sideways, you can pull it back. It's almost like the Formula Ford of endurance racing, because they've got yeah. quite skinny tyres, yeah, yeah. all evenly matched cars, and they're all in the, in the mix, and they've probably come out with it, all of them. There's probably not one person I've seen, either interviewed or spoken to from Fun Cup, that hasn't got out one of these cars with a massive smile on their face. You can see driving like that is exactly why. Now through the right-hander at Druid, underneath the bridge, back towards Lodge Corner, and again, Porter's not comfortable on the race tonight. He has to go defence to force Abraham to go round the outside under brakes. They go wheel to wheel down towards the right hander at Lodge, turns in, and Porter still has that trap position, just lets him edge a little bit out wide, covers his line off on the exit and over the crest over Deer Leap, and now onto the bit straight. Abraham's now got the overlap on the inside line. This is the line he needs now. He's still side by side again, up towards the right hander at Old Hall. This surely has to be a lead change, unless Porter doesn't want to capitulate on the outside, which he does. And now that's Will Abrahams, that's another lead change through. Up into the front goes MJ Tech. As for the four cars behind, that's no, no longer two pairs for third. Because it's now one large group for third, headed by Scott Mansell in the Driver 61 car, followed by the 22 car for Skull Club Racing. That's Jack Constable, then Ben Pitch, and then the 14 car, which is of Paul Turner. So those four might start to work together here, because if these two find each other hard enough, the easier it's going to be for the four cars to start to catch up and make it a six-pack a six once again for first position in these early stages. So Mikey Porter then having dropped back into second spot, trying to fight back. So uh, Will Abraham, the new race leader, and having had some experience of driving in the uh, BMW 116 trophy in the past, is uh, now looking to try to escape, build the gap if he possibly can, as the cars Accelerate over hill top. Ben Pitch still coming under attack as well from Paul Turner. Paul Turner right on the tail of Ben Pitch. It's a sort of pitch inspection, so close is he? But Mikey Porter is not letting the leader get away, is he? Uh, although the margin was 26 thousandths over the line, they've stayed pretty much nose to tail for the lap. Done pretty well. And it's pretty evenly matched. And I think Scott Mansell's just trying to very slowly edge away if he can from that three three cars behind him he's going to wish that they start fighting amongst each other because easier it is for him to make a break if they do that and of course he's going to try and pull away but yes you can see the small gap building between himself and jack constable if anything jack constable is almost backing himself up inadvertently into the path of both ben pitch and paul turner for fourth and fifth that second now one car we should watch for is right in the back of the shot actually because as i predicted i've seen a few fun cut races to know exactly what these two are up to but it's uber hoffman's lotus car the black and Yet the black and gold, almost JPS livery inspired car, which currently has at the wheel of it Farkini. And he now is trying to charge along in seventh position and catch up. He's dropped that second group by several seconds. He's just at the top of the shot going through in black and gold and looking at his lap times to come through. His last lap was a personal best, two minutes, 1.728, and quite literally was faster than every single car in front of him by at least a tenth. So he is going to start picking his way up to the back of that group once these guys continue to start fighting a bit harder. It's a shame they hide under the pseudonyms, really, isn't it? But uh, they go well, nonetheless. And, as you say, chipping forward. They've not sort of blasted there in the space of a lap, but they've just quietly got on with the job. Scott Fitzgerald, uh, or Diot under his pseudonym, the man behind the wheel of the car. And again, it's a double driver entry, that. So it runs at a pretty consistent pace all the way through. Number 14, they're looking at in sixth place. Coming up now to the right of Shellwell's corner. That is Paul Turner, another double driver entry. 22 going through in fourth. The Skull Club Racing Jack Constable, who will hand over to Volkswagen Cup racer uh, and designer, uh, graphic designer Russell Joyce. So they bounce over the curb. Uh, Jack's had quite a varied career, all sorts of things, and oh so nearly racing the British Touring Car Championship. And then having qualified the car was poorly for race day and didn't get to race in the season when Power Max had a bit of a sort of revolving door. Uh, for penultimate place, by the way, they're side by side going into Old Hall. Tyres are squealing in protest over at Hislops and Nicker Brook. And up front, uh, Will Abraham then, 
whose dad used to race in this, Paul Abraham, and back in, what, 2012, was a class champion. Uh, he's the leader, Mikey Porter, there, just dropping back ever so fractionally. Yeah, and ever so fractionally, Scott Mounts were edging close to yeah, them yeah. for third place. So it's just ebbing and flowing, just fits and starts between them as they come through. So this sixth port, just keep an eye again, just keep an eye on that black and gold car in the background. There's Falkini in seventh place in the Uvio car. Of course, that car's been a, a four-time champion in the past, so they certainly do it. And as I mentioned, these guys don't take it, funny enough, as seriously as others. They simply just literally turn up without any testing, get in the car. The car don't, inter don't have to change anything on the setup. They're happy to have the car set up, get in it, drive, and somehow this seems to be quicker than anyone else on a, on a given day when they just know these cars inside out, which is f uh, fantastic, fantastic in many cases, but also fantastically annoying for the rest of the team that spend days and days testing and then say, well, these guys turn up and just do it for fun, don't even test, and they're beating us in qualifying times. How's that possible? Now, it wasn't on the electronic gantry, but there was a board being hung out a lap ago to a couple of cars, one of which looked like Mikey Porter's, so I rather fear that the track limit warnings are coming and over four hours you've got to be pretty vigilant about this is there like in long distance modern gt racing endurance racing a reset point or do you keep racking them up over the four hours uh i would need to consult the regulations on that one that's one i don't have in depth of myself personally but i can dive into the regulations that's all right no 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 and the, the sub question was and is it per car or per driver it leaps per car per car per okay percent. so yes if you're really good and your co-driver is really bad you can still cop a penalty because you're the man in the, behind the wheel at the wrong time yeah. uh, the top 10 being rounded out by ian wood another former championship winning team there the uh, gci car of graham craig and ian uh, graham butterworth who's stood down from racing but was on the original entry so his son craig butterworth and ian wood the drivers and as the leaders then are at the end of 15 minutes of racing the fastest lap by will abraham who's getting away And down towards his lots uh, come the battling 246 and 214. 246 uh, is started by Simon Coles, and you've got Mike Devlin uh, behind. So those cars a little bit further down, 8th and 9th, and on the back of them is Ian Wood in 111 up towards Druids. So just over a second between the top two last time through and to the eye it is greater still as they've just come across the timing line now yeah getting, getting sort of ever bigger now 1.7 seconds now in the lead and then this second group and again just slot man to find himself in a little bit of no man's land at this point in third place he's kind of trying to make progress on the cars in front but he's trying to gap the cars behind so he's finding himself in kind of a little bit now there has been a, a black and white flag gone out for it's on the board now 155 so 155 has had the warning it looks like for track limits by the look of it and 155's team Rat is racing back in 12 so they've had a warning to stop transgressing guys that the, the track limits otherwise they probably will start to cop a penalty so they'll have to keep an eye on if they get any more warnings on that side uh, as MJ Tech continues to lead by 1.7 seconds this battle going on here is between the 246 car which is EDF Motorsports this is for 8th position Seed Data having a look up the inside of the Cascades and as they go down Lakeside and up towards Island Bend once again it's GCI racing just tucking in behind them to round off the top 10. And just trying to catch up to them is the 11th place car, which is the 99 JPR Snug Investments car. That's 99, which currently has Andy Bicknell at the wheel, and he'll hand over to David Clark on the first pit stop. Now, the back of that little queue also looking rapid. Yes, Andy Bicknell, as you say, pressing on, and he's getting himself on the back of the top 10. Lead gap stretching ever so slightly, so... Again, as different drivers start to now find their rhythm and find their pace within the grid, yet now you've gone from that jumble at the start, haven't you, to a, a kind of pace uh, based on, on, on pure lap time and driver uh, real true performance. It's, it's starting to take a natural order. And just as it does so, you'll then get to the first round of pit stops and it's all bets off because everybody starts to shuffle once again. Exactly. Which is how it should be. Uh, right, the Uvio car is still trying to make progress. And, as you say, little by little, slowly but surely, chipping its way up the order. Oh, it's now gone past the Green Heat car, so that's the UVO car now put into fifth position. So he's caught the six-pack in front of him. He's picked off one of them. Next target is their old mate, Neil uh, Ben Pitch. Of course, when they hand that car over, it'll go to the captain, as he's known, Neil Plimmer. As Philip Platsky done from right insane, just about. I think if not, I think he's 
Either he has done every single Fun Cup race, or he's done bar one because he missed one due to illness of some kind. But so he's done just about, just about every Fun Cup race, and I think he's probably the most experienced driver on the grid that's driven a Fun Cup car. So anything yes. that Neil Kadema doesn't know about Fun Cup racing genuinely isn't worth knowing, I think. So yes. but he'll get into the car his first stop. But uh, he's going to hope that Ben Pitch can hold off the UVO car at this point, because that's their next target. And then after that, it'll be Jack Constable, uh, who is in the Skull uh, Club racing machine whilst the top two continue to pull away. And Morpheus Racing, that's Mikey Porter, just brought a couple of tenths back as a bit wide there for the UVO car. Now down the outside looks the 14 machine of Porto, looks down the outside into Shell Oils. Has a little look to try and get the undercut, but no, the UVO car park it night deeply on the apex and holds the place, but Porto's not done with this, is he? No, he's not, absolutely. So that UVO car's got a growing width, I think, to fend him off. And that's another experienced team, isn't it? The pseudonymed pair that drive it. Under these uh, regulations, as it were, Randaccio, uh, a successful driver, but under his real name, uh, successful in other things, not just in Fun Cup. So there's a versatility within that crew as well. Out of his lots, then they all run. And at the moment, the UVO car are trying to attack and defend because you've got the Ben Pitch ahead and the Green Heath car behind. But for the race lead, it's plateaued at about 1.2 seconds. Now, we've had. 20 minutes, the pit window, the first pit window this is, uh, will open after 40 minutes. So we've got a few laps uh, yet, and you've got to come in within that first window because they are regulation windows. You can't elect to do just one stop and sort of split it at, I don't know, the two hour mark. You've got to come in within that window. There's a ball that tells you it opens, you then do a lap and then you can come in. Uh, some breaking through as well. Out of Lodge Corner then comes the battle pack for fifth sixth seventh up towards the line and the leader is just a fraction closer but i tell you the number of numbers is increasing on the uh, neon display for track limit warnings so race control might get busy towards the end of four hours and that might be a, an extra element of all of this to just sort of factor in the element of penalties that would need to be applied mm. one car that has been given the warning is 225 the car on screen U the uvia hoppers motorsport car so got to be careful in doing that in front of the cameras that you're putting a wheel <laughs> onto the green it's not going to help it's, then, it's, it's not going to help their cause but uh, they've been given the warning so they've been, been given the light slap on the wrist if you can don't do it again but if you do your julian porter isn't one to uh, if, essentially, the computer porter has what's, what's called a race receiver system. So essentially, it's a one-way radio system to talk directly to the drivers. Yes. And the great thing is, when he announces that a driver has gone past track limits, it doesn't just go to one driver, it goes to everyone. So if someone's transgressed, everyone knows about it, and he tells everyone. So there's no trying to hide track limits, because you will get found out, because yeah, Julian yeah, yeah. will tell everybody else, and then everyone's going to look at you thinking, mm, you're getting a penalty soon, Sunshine. Uh, yeah, the race receiver has been a great addition, hasn't it, to all categories, whether it's oval racing or circuit racing. Uh, something similar in the Porsche Super Cup, for example. Peter Roberts, who's the race director for that. And it's fascinating over the weekend listening to his voice because he starts off quite calm and patient. And by the end of the race, when he's absolutely <laughs> lost his rag, the, the pitch in his voice is somewhat different. And Peter is not a, not a shouter, but uh, he does get a bit frustrated. Right now, though, the frustration, I suspect, for Will Abraham is that he can't quite clear Mikey Porter. That gap is just a second. Now, this little battle pack we're looking at here is for 8th and 9th and 10th and 11th, and pretty much everybody has got someone to squabble against. And as far as the leader is concerned, in a moment or two, he's going to have back markers because, look, there is penultimate and last, and then the top two have gone through. So 107, just crossing the line, is Guido Basile in the high peak racing entry. And there, look, he's 249 Will Abraham, your race leader, about to come up to uh, try to make a move on the car in last place, which is uh, Gary Summers. Done that. So we've got Lappery already. Yeah, and that's the great thing. And that's the extra element of that, of course, in any endurance race, trying to negotiate your way through the traffic and the time that you either gain or loss based on if people get held up or if you drivers make it purposely or not difficult to get through but uh, thankfully on this occasion the back marker does move out of the way that's smart driving from uh, 107 so that will be uh, Guido Basilek moving out neatly out of the way and he does so also up the inside into Shell Oils for Mikey Porter the lock up there I think from Mikey as he turns through Shell Oils again just trying to nurse that front section damage if they really have to they will change it but ultimately with these cars yeah. you can just about you can cope with it but at the same time it's if you lose one of those kind of front canals or sections of the front it is noticeable as you as you anticipate because these cars do generate a, a, a decent amount of downforce for what you get from these silhouette bodies from these cars and they do 
you do notice it. I heard people say you get the format, but then when you lock one, well, you can feel it under steer yeah. in terms of where it's free if you lose it. Jason Minshaw, who we'll get to in the second stint because he will take over the Wave 9 entry, racing one of these for the first time, said to me this morning, I like a GT car, but slower. He said because they've got all this down, you turn and they bite, and it's like a GT car, but just slower. Yeah, that's echoing what you say. Uh, that said, any good race team will have gaffer tape. That'll yes. sort it at the pit stop. Yes. Gaffer it, tape on the front. It's either that or they do have the, 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 the front nose sections come off ind independently so you can replace individual sections rather than the actual uh, full nose if you need to. So And they just simply just drill them on. So drill or yes or gaffer tape. Now, <laughs> following on, 225 haven't been listening because Uwe Hoffer's car has now copped itself a stop-go penalty. So They've, uh, and of course, again, Julian Thomas will be telling everyone on the radio that Uvia has to come into service. So, first penalty of the race, first transgression uh, where Julian's had to give him something. And uh, it means that their initial run through is now, uh, well, it's still continuing on, trying to go up the inside, but it's going to end quite prematurely. Will Julian Floyd not be telling them this over the radio, as opposed to Julian Thomas, who's going to do the second stint in the race logic car? Or are I being pedantic? Yeah, no, there's too many Julians that I'm trying to think of at once. <laughs> so you, you, you are right, it's Julian Floyd. Who is the, the clerk of the course for the Fun Cup. Yeah. Uh, but Julian. Thomas, and just to confuse things, he's race logic as opposed yes. to race <laughs> uh, and uh, he is very, very quick, and he'll get into his car 252 in the second stint. So, the point that Scott was making is that the Uvio uh, entry of our pseudonymed uh, pair will try and unravel why they insist on the pseudonyms in due course, uh, but they're going to get a stop go penalty of five seconds. Now, that has to be taken within three passings. You can't bolt that onto a pit stop, I'm assuming. No, and it has to be taken at the, t at the designated box, which is usually here at the top of the pit lane. Right, OK. Interesting that they've fallen foul of that, because, yeah, OK, you've identified the fact that they've been a little bit ragged, or at least uh, Dion has been a bit ragged, but, you know, they haven't gone charging through the field at the same time, have they? It's not like they've been off the road and gaining place after place. No, but that's I think that's just the UVA way. Then. So they just drive it in their own way. And then, mm. as I say, they're in this main to have fun, essentially, in terms of racing. And that's what they do. But they're happy just to win champions along the way, which is the funny thing. They're probably in it for the laugh and they happen to be multiple champions yes. alongside it, which is the ironic thing. So this is now a possible change on, well, it, it's it's in some cases it's elementary because they're going to get the, the stop go penalty anyway. Yes. So this is simply just for them just passing track at the moment. It's for position, but also kind of for the sake of it because he's attacking Scott Manson here down towards Drew. He has a look, puts himself into Scott's mirrors. Not going to make it through that way, and they sort of turn his way through at this time and holds on to the place. But I suspect that once he sees that penalty, he will have to come in the next couple of laps, of course. Well, the team should be on the radio to him, shouldn't they? Saying we've got this penalty, come and serve it. So the Uvio car. 225 has got past 22 of Jack Constable, but it's a Pyrrhic victory in a sense because he's in this time then. So uh, to pit in comes Diot, as he prefers to be called, and the stop go penalty will be served. And that therefore means Scott Mansell now is third and Jack Constable uh, runs fourth. And those two have got themselves together for a proper fight. Stop go penalty done. And uh, back into the race will go the Uvio Hoffman's car. Now that's going to drop that too. Where? Because there's another wave of cars just coming over the line. I don't think that's done him too much harm, you know. You'd be surprised how much he does or doesn't do in some cases. That mm. You can probably catch it pretty quickly. Uh, meanwhile, looking on the screen here, this is the battle that's been going on pretty much since the race started in this second group. It's been led now by Seed Data. So the Seed Data car currently has at the moment at the head of it, Seed Data, why can't I find it on this? There we go, uh, Mike Devlin. And he's now heading the 246 car, which is Vake Club and EDF. That's Simon Coles will hand over to Vlad Vasiliev. You've then got the 111 car, which is now driven by Ian Wood. Into the back of that queue now is the JPR Snug Investments car, and that's Andy Bicknell. So the four of them all together. Up the inside looks 246. We've seen this before, haven't we? Somewhere, somewhere further up the field, but the quartet all of them together through Island Bend. Braving it out around the outside in the 214 goes Devlin. Holds on the outside lineups. Just arriving behind them under brakes there was the 99 car. Just about getting stopped to Andy Bicknell. He's now up the inside of Ian Wood. I think, have they told him it's a four hour race? It's, like, it's like, it literally like one of the 15 minute sprints. You promised us it was going to be a four hour sprint, just interrupted by pit stops. And that is the modern endurance way, isn't it? You know, the, you, you're right. You can't just crawl around and hope that if you finish, you'll finish well. You've got to push. And these cars are normally very reliable indeed, aren't they? They are indeed, yeah. And they're pretty well suited. They've got the, the 1.8 litre sort of VW Audi VAG 
uh, derived 1.8 litre machine. It's a, a car that's pretty reliable. They last put up distance. It's very, very, very rare that you have any kind of mechanical fade. They are incredibly bulletproof cars for the most part. And uh, that means you get quite a lot of mileage out of them without having to do it. And usually at the end of the season, you'll get some cars that will go back to JPR and they will do a, a, a full on refresh and service of them. So they're, they're ready for the next season. So it's good customer care and service for JPR cars because most of them do get supplied by JPR. And also a fun fact as well, the numbers on the cars are not for personal preference. They are actually the chassis numbers. Oh, is that right? Yes. So the only difference is, is that the car is the champions take number one. But that's default for the champions. So, for example, car 22, for example, that is chassis number 22 of Funk Up UK spec. And so, so that's quite an old car. In, in relevant terms, yes. Of course, in the same time, you've got the triple one car, which was one of the cars which raced in the very first uh, Fun Cup endurance race back some 20 years ago. Of course, we went to win the championship in 2022, 20 years later. Um, now, different penalties have been caught by somebody else now. 214 have been given a drive-through penalty. So that's not a stop and go, a drive-through penalty. So a seed date have been given that. So Mike Devlin's going to have to drive all the way through the pit lane rather than stop and uh, serve it serve on that time. So this quartet continues on. This is for the scrap. This is back with our group going battling for. This is third, fourth, fifth, and sixth now. This is the Skull Club Racing Car 22, still with Jack Constable at the wheel. It's got Mansell fourth for driver 61. Fifth is still Ben Pitch for PLR Racing, as there's more squeal of tyres in the foreground. And uh, just behind them, Green Heath in car 14 with Paul Turner. So these four, again, have been all together. MJ Tech and Morpheus have escaped up the road by about nine seconds or so in front, and the gap is now gone out between them, and it's now Will Abraham in front of Mikey Porter by just over three seconds at this point. We're just about coming up just past the half-hour point in this four-hour race. Another car that looks a bit um, battered around the gills is Andy Bennett, number 98, who's at the wheel of the Team 3 motorsport car, as though that's been off the road. Is Jack Constable now starting to have a problem, or is the problem purely Scott Mansell? Because as he's having to defend, they're being caught again, as you say, by pitch and also by the Greenheath car of Paul Turner. So that bit of pace has dropped away. What this is doing is letting the top two absolutely escape. Now, Will Abram is away and gone. He's nearly four seconds clear of Mikey Porter, who led early on, don't forget. But then this battle pack for third, and there are four of them in it, comes up towards the line, going through now, just ahead, as you can see, is Jack Constable. But he has got Scott Mansell diving to the inside line, and Scott Mansell breathes in. He's got the shorter, tighter, quicker line. He forces Constable out wide over the kerb. Ben Pitch in the all-red car comes up to have a look, but there's no room on the inside, and he goes to the other side, and there's no room there either. So he's a little bit stuck in the wall. And then in sixth place, Paul Turner for Greenheath. Mansell has done it round the outside. That's a proper Mansell move, that. Any Mansell you care to mention. And uh, that side by side moment, I, I, I had a sense of deja vu because we've seen that before somewhere. I think that was several laps ago for about half a lap, and they're at it again because now here comes Jack Constable. He's got unfinished business. That's a brave move to make up the inside into Ireland Ben, but squeezes Mansell out wide and gets him to the edge of the circuit. Now Ben Pitch and Paul Turner want to get involved. All four of them line a stern through Shell Oars as, as one. So the Constable now leads back in front of this group for third position. But of course, pit window is imminent in the next roughly eight and a half minutes. And what, what you will see is a relevant flurry of activity. But what you will also see is some teams who will literally push their pit stop right to the end of yeah. the pit window. The rule essentially is, is that you can only pit once you pass the pit in board. Then you can come in. You can stay out for as long as passing the pit out window board once. Once you passed it, next time you come back around to the pit lane entrance, you have to pit. Otherwise, you will be pinged with a penalty. So although the window is 10 minutes long, in real terms here, it's about eight minutes. Because it, you pass the board, you've got to do a lap, which is two minutes plus. Yeah, essentially. And it kind of and that kind of goes in the same way in terms of that you get this kind of two minutes back from when you pass the pit at pit window closed board, because you can go past it once and then pit in next time you come up to the pit up the pit at pit entrance in a way. So it's it roughly sort of eight to ten minutes still, but as you, you're absolutely right, you have to go past both of those boards in succession. So it kind of shifts that ten minutes along by a couple of minutes when you eventually do make it into pit lane, if that makes sense. Well, right now, fast slap of the race, Will Abraham, who is the leader. By the way, that drive-through penalty for the 214 seat data, uh, Mike Devlin car has been served, and so also has the stop go for the Uvia Hoffman's entry. Jack Constable still hanging on to third place, having gone back ahead of Scott Mansell. And then now, look, Paul Turner comes up to have a go at Ben Pitch on the inside line. Paul Turner for Greenheath is going to break as late as he dares go down towards Old Hall, and job done. So number 14, another early chassis, therefore, uh, goes up into fifth place at the expense of Ben Pitch for PLR and the Uvio car I said I don't think had done it too much harm well that's just gone across the line as well and that is still in seventh place so they were sort of there anyway weren't they they were so far ahead of the next wave 
uh, it didn't really hurt. Yeah, and they're back to kind of almost where they started after they yeah. made their initial charge up through the pack. So essentially, it's kind of back to roughly square one once they've got those first couple of laps out of the way. Looking a bit gloomy over the uh, Shallow's corner, a big black cloud looming over the circuit. As there you can see, 246, that is Simon Coles, and he's coming under attack uh, from Ian Wood. Fun Cup Champions 2022, as it says on the rear wing of the GCI, Graham Craig and Ian Carr. Craig Butterworth, who was a very handy carter before he came into car racing, and uh, Ian Wood, the man behind the wheel at the moment. But again, first round of pit stops will be fascinating because you put different drivers in, different pace, different order. Uh, it's going to be nice and jumbled. And the race leader, uh, which is Will Abraham, will hand over to Scott Jeffs, and it'll be fascinating to see what kind of pace that car then runs at during that second stint, won't it? It will, and it's the, that's that's the fascination that you get once you get those pit stop windows going through. As I mentioned, you get different cars uh, at different paces at different times. If that really makes sense, that sentence in terms of, and you're right when you talked about the fact you've got two quick drivers like, for example, Ted Bradbury and Mikey Porter. That car could turn out to be consistently quick, whereas mm. of course you've got some cars which have a mix of different skill levels and quick drivers in them. I mean, for example, Johnny Molum's car the mix as well, which is the which is the 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 Red River Sport car, which is back in 17th place. So if you look at that car, that's got Gareth Williams at the wheel. And then Bonnie Grimes, who's been a regular co-driver in Brick Car with, John, with um, Johnny Merlin in previous times. But you can almost guarantee, in a way, that once Johnny gets in for that first stint number three, that he's going to be the quicker of the three, and that car's going to start lapping quicker to make up a couple of spots. It just, it's, the, it, yeah. it, it, it's the natural way of how a fun cut race progresses, that cars will ebb and flow, and it's that accordion effect. Everyone's close at the beginning, pit stops string everything out with different driver levels at different times. Then usually they set it so you can have the quickest driver where you can at the end of the stint and it starts to close back up again so you have those close finishes that are so typical in fun cut. Meanwhile, that is 252 date that's the uh, race logic car of David Daniel squeezing up the inside. And that was the C data car being sort of no the snug investments car being sort of edged out a little bit sideways as it comes across the line. Yeah, all just going back to Scott's point, always you'll find teams say we want our fastest driver in for the very last stint because if there's a late race safety car and we bunch up that's when we need to gain places no point having somebody slow in because they can't repel the challenge uh, they're going through this really good little battle still between uh, Simon Coles and Ian Wood they are currently eighth and ninth those two as they come across the uh, curb on the outside of Cascades down towards Island Bend and we are only about four minutes away from our first pit window board uh, going out so currently, I'm slightly intrigued to, as to how this has all happened, really. Will Abraham has suddenly shot away to the tune of 6.4 seconds. Uh, he's making life look relatively easy up front, and therefore Mikey Porter unable to go with him. How much of that do you think is down to the damage on the front, or is that irrelevant? It will play an element, as I mentioned, because some drivers do say when you lose a front section on that, on that front, but... Um, front bumper, that front splitter, you do feel it, you do sense it. I'll pause that point for a second because they're still going at it for third position <laughs> behind them, so we'll pause that point and come back to it because, again, we've seen this before, it's still Jack Constable again looking up the inside of Scott Mantle, they're again side by side, oh look, it's two by two like like um, Noah's Ark down towards Rock Lodge Corner, and that's the uh, Paul Turner at Greenheath car, in fact, actually Scott Mantle left the door way too open that Paul Turner think, well, if you're going to give me the invitation, I'll just take it every single time up the inside. But Mansell fights back on the inside line. Here comes Ben Pitts to make it practically three abreast down towards Old Hall. And as Jack Constable tries to pull away, now there's also damage. I think you're just about to spot on a 97 car. I saw that flapping a couple of laps ago. That's starting to fold in. And again, that will have an effect as well because, of course, either they'll have to try and uh, take it off or try and fix it in some cases on the pit stop while they can. But the thing with fun cut pit stops is there's no minimum pit stop time. You can be as mm. quick as you like. Mm. And so speed in a pit stop is everything when it comes to these pit windows. That would be pretty key. Um, another warning's gone out this time to 214, by the way. Seed data will be given a, a slap on the wrist by... Uh, Julian Floyd, which means that uh, I guess one more time and they'll get some kind of a penalty. They've already had a drive through, ah, so okay. it's not going their way. Oh dear. Uh, so, yes, don't forget that drive through was served. It's dropped them down the order. Who is at the wheel of the seed data car? It's Mike Devlin, isn't it, doing the opening stint? So uh, he's incurring the wrath of race control. And of course, here, uh, some of it's done by the human eye for track limits, and other parts of the circuit have got the uh, sort of pressure pads that takes a photograph of the car for being off the road. Right, the pit window is about two minutes away from opening. Uh, there are still plenty of battles happening, as you can see. Uh, this fight between Jack Constable and Scott Mansell has been an intriguing one. They run now uh, still third and fourth. Ben Pitch fifth. And then in sixth place uh, is Paul Turner, although he's been sort of yo-yoing fifth and sixth, fifth and sixth all the way through thus far. 
the front of Mikey Porter's car is getting less, isn't it? More and more of that crumpled bodywork. It's kind of being chewed underneath. Yeah, I imagine that uh, that will be something which uh, Jamie will go and have a chat to him about when we hand down to him one of the first few times after he gets out of the car. I'm sure there'll be a question is how much was that damage hindering him in this first dig? Because you're right, he has dropped back that far. Uh, nothing's hindering MJ Tech though. New fastest lap of the race. Two minutes, 0 0.610 that the uh, 249 with Will Abraham has pumped in. A little bit of info from Jamie also. So Will has raced in this championship for about two years and his, his father Paul also has pedigree in this championship because he was a former champion in this championship with uh, Eco Racing. So he's certainly, and that was a, a, a prominent team in Fun Cup seasons gone by when they raced before. Less than a minute to go. As they, oh, that, that green heat there in the background was wiggling around for some reason. Either just was trying to either send a message to the pit wall or was something was not right with that 14 car. But either way, that car was squirming around on the pit straight in a very old and very strange manner. And has dropped back. Now the pit window is open. We've not quite had 40 minutes, have we? We've had sort of 39 and a bit. But anyway, the pit window banner was there. Mm. But it's not... And it's on the timing screen. Anyway, um, pit window has been opened. I'm, just, I'm looking for the accommodating <laughs> board. I can't... I think the board is... Yeah, the board is being held out. So, yeah. it's, so you are right. Pit window is open. It's a smidge early, but anyway. Um, you're still going to do your lap before you come in. So uh, maybe the board goes out here a fraction earlier because it's a long lap. So you put it out before the window, and then by the time you've done your lap, you are into that 40 minutes of the race having elapsed, if you're with me. Mm. Either way, uh, Will Abraham is going to have to hand over the car to, uh, on the pit stops, Scott Jeffs, former Mini Challenge racer, Euro NASCAR racer, uh, and again, a quick driver. So it'd be interesting to see whether that preserves its race lead. And for third and fourth and fifth, and six, here they are, still absolutely as one, this sort of uh, huge 16-wheel Fun Cup chassis, so <laughs> close are they? And Paul Turner, despite what he was doing on the pit straight, has caught back up again. That's the Fun Cup way. That's exactly how they do it pretty much every single time. It's good that we've got such a nice, competitive group of cars in this initial season over because it kind of hopefully sets the tone for the rest of the year in terms of this could be the kind of race that we're going to get, even just the initial first stint. If they're going to carry this on for the rest of the year, it's going to make it quite a Fun Cup season and store, I'm pretty sure. Um, I don't know how many teams these... The, the, the one centrepiece of the year used to be, and I'm sure there's still some teams that do still go over to compete in it, was uh, quite, a, quite a few UK teams would go over to Spa to do the 25 hours. I think I remember the story of that, why was it 25 hours? And the man who, who was Irish um, who said it was simply because just wanted to do 25 hours and be different. That was simply what it was, so um, that's why they did it. But you have had quite a few teams on mask on across that race and won it a few times. Of course, we've had uh, Paul Rose and Steve Harris have, have won that race before. And according to the very amusing promo video, Paul doesn't mention the fact he's won the Spa 25 hours once at all, at all whatsoever. He, he, he says with a tongue firm in cheek. Oh, I see, right. Uh, first pit stop has, first sort of routine stop, scheduled stop, uh, is being served, and that is the EDF Motorsports car. So Simon Coles to morph into Vlad Vasiliev, and other teams are getting ready as well. And Scott says there's no minimum pit stop time, so they're as quick as you like. And the task wheel comes out of Shell Oil's corner. I still get the feeling as well that, that we, we might have another shower before the end of this race. I'm not willing one, but I'm just a, a bit concerned about clouds. There's something about local knowledge here as well. So uh, <laughs> it's looking a bit gloomy in certain parts of, of, uh, of the circuit. Right, more and more pit stops are cycling through, but none of that leading gaggle as yet. I think one of the key elements of pit stops is going to be sticky tape, isn't it? Uh, possibly, if they've got the time and they feel they can fix it quick enough, I'd imagine. Yeah. Uh, interesting pit stop for Red River, uh, just looking out of the window. Gareth Williams out, Bonamy Grimes in, but Gareth went out through one door, co-driver in through the other. Yep, they'll do that. Yep. They'll do that in Fun Cup. What they will also do is they'll do what I call the... Uh, I'm going to dub it the Cinchura Technique. If you think back to British GT 999, that kit that went out, where you will literally get some teams, their quickest way is to open the door, quite literally grab the driver and throw them yes, out throw them, and have yeah. a second driver come in. So I'm, I'm, I'm dubbing that now the Cinchura uh, method because that's exactly what uh, Richard Dean and Kurt, Kurt, Luby. Kurt Luby, that was that's it, they yeah. used to do back in the day, nice, 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 nice British GT. And it's a, a method that if it's required, they will use it and have done in, in Fun Cup for several years now. Oh, it works, so it don't does, knock yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right, the Morpheus car has pitted and I think I'm right in saying it's still in. So this is Mikey Porter, who has come in in 195 to give way to Ted Bradbury. And they put some fuel in. 
We'll have a look when the car rejoins us to the front of it. That's 158 serving the stop. So that now becomes Mike Dewhurst in for Gary Summers. That had dropped quite a long way back anyway in its battle with Guido Basile. And Guido Basile in turn uh, will now hand over the high peak car to uh, Paul Calladine. Meantime, Constable Mansell. Sorry, there was a pause there. Constable, comma, Mansell, not Constable Mansell. He was, though, wasn't he? He was, he was a special was, constable he was, on the yes. other man. You're right. Uh, Nigel Mansell. Gosh. Uh, how, uh, the funny was, terrible. that was the first thing I thought when you said Constable Mansell. <laughs> I, I knew he was going to say that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, Constable, comma, Mansell, comma, Pitch and Turner. That's the sentence I was aiming for in the first instance. They're still together. Uh, they haven't pitted, so they're going to come in en masse, I rather fear, and it's going to get really, really busy in the pit lane. Yeah. But again, that's the fun cut way there. We'll do that. And <laughs> yeah. uh, I think that's probably the that answer to several questions about is they going to do this? Just the fun cut way, that's it. Um, well, apparently, Rat is racing in second gear by the sound of his uh, going back. I got the hint, yes. I think we got the hint, yes. Yeah, so Rat is racing in for their stop. Uh, a few more pit calls also. Uh, Wave 9 are in as well. They're in 15th place, also in the second further down a couple more teams. So yeah, the only two cars we have in now is, I think, Wave 9 is left. But you're right, I think the second half of the pit winner is going to see quite a lot of cars descending en masse. They're, one car we haven't talked about, which is quite ironic, is defending champions, because car number one mm. on screen there, I, I almost forget where it was, because one of the key changes for that car this year, not only just is Simon Rudd in that car, but it's a different colour. Built it last year, it was bright green. This year right. they've got a new sponsor, uh, possibly think due to Simon Rudd coming on board. So that car here, here's the defending champion, start at the back of the grid. It's now uh, roughly the same colours, I think, that the Axiometrics car was in last year, primarily because Simon Rudd was in that car, so hence a sponsor that has jumped from one car to another. And they currently sit at the moment in 17th place. Now, my looking at that car, uh, yeah, Chris Devell is in that, so the two faster drivers, I haven't got into that car yet. It's Chris Devell doing his stint for the first part in 17th. And again, that will be strategy to have the faster drivers in, particularly for them it will be. If it's the same cycle, which it, uh, yes, will be. So the last two stints are going to be taken up by Simon Rudd and Riley Phillips. And arguably, Simon's quick, but I would say if someone puts a gun to my head, Riley Phillips is the quicker of the three guys. And he can do things with a fun cup car that very rarely anyone else can. He, okay. can. he can put some pretty fast laps when he needs to and close some pretty close gaps. So one to watch, I think. All right, interesting as well, seeing how many teams actually are stretching this to the end of the window. They've not bailed at the very start of it. There, 2.52. Uh, that should now be Julian Thomas. Uh, let me double check that it's made a pit stop because that car started by David Denyer and Julian Thomas to take it over. Uh, it has... Not yet made a pit stop, apologies. So David Denyer still behind the wheel of it, and on his tail is Chris Weatherall in 103. So waiting for the race leader to come in. It's going to be a busy pit lane nonetheless. Alton's pit lane isn't the big biggest. Uh, it'll get quite crowded pretty soon. The reigning champions have just gone across the line. We've got more cars coming for the pit lane. And because the Morpheus racing car pitted, the lead gap of... Don't forget, cars that haven't stopped is over half a minute. That shows you how much time Jack Constable has lost by having to defend and squabble with Scott Mansell. Half a minute lost. Yeah, but depending on who its drivers will get in, and again, with different stints and different drivers, that stint may well get a bit brought back together again at some point. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. Um, but I just find it fascinating because Constable and Mansell are not slow. No, absolutely not. And uh, again, case in point, here they are on the screen. So it's still together. There's practically, practically almost like Siamese fun cup cars. Yeah. They've not left each other for the whole for the whole stint whatsoever, which is which is fascinating. Um, uh, I, I think I heard somebody say that's the fun cup way. Yes, indeed it is. Indeed it is. Right, Mansell to the pits. And still, race leader uh, Will Abram has carried on from... Now, Jack Constable in second place. Right, Scott Mansell has just pitted. I can see all this out of the window in the kind of fag packet livery. And he is dragged out of one side in the Centura way. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and his dad's waiting to get on board because they now refuel. So the car's got to be empty while the refueling goes on. Uh, well, we, in the meantime, are looking at 99. That is the Andy Bicknell, David Clark car. Mm. And whilst that's been happening, Mikey, uh, the... Uh Ted Bradbury has just gone through into uh, past the 97 cars. He's gone back through to what is now effectively sort of second place at that point, net, in many cases. There is the uh, 196 car, the 195 car, as he turns in. And I think what they've done on the pit stop is just get rid of yeah. the damaged bodywork. They've not tried to change it or repair it, they've just got rid of it. Yeah, so Morpheus Motorsport then continues on. Ted Bradbury, the world, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, made quite an impact on his first season last year racing in the MX5 Championship. He barely uh, learnt how to uh, 
user manual gearbox, turned up for his first round at MX5 Championship in the damp of Silverstone Grand Prix circuit, sticks the damn thing on pole. As you do. G gets his first podium in that week, basically in that same weekend, got his first win in the wet at Snetterton and ended up third in the points and unofficially in, in my own personal Rookie of the Year because he was fantastic. Mm. And then the great story about this one is that he also did two rounds of Fun Cup Endurance last year. He actually took place in the Darlington one and then at the season finale in the one-hour sprint, he raced with Mikey Porter and another Jetta Jimmy graduate, Risa Sawerthen. Now, there's the prize on offer for any new teams that come in if you win first time out for three drivers that have never ever won a race in front cup before, and you win your first race, Paul Rose at Oakley's checkbook will give you ten thousand pounds. Didn't quite happen. Sorry, for what? What? It's it's Lord. in the regulations. So Paul, if, if you get pre it's essentially for bringing new cars and drivers in. Yeah. The only thing is, there's one proviso, one small thing that matter that saw those three drivers miss out on that, is that Ted had done one race already, and that was his second race, not his first. Oh. Whereas it was Mikey and Reese's first one. So that was the only proviso. So literally, it t Ted made his, his debut in Fun Cup, one race too early, because <laughs> otherwise he could have got 10 grand. Pit window was closed. Now look, after the pit window closed, Legend has gone out, in comes the Hoffman's car. The leader has not come in yet either. The, the, the pit window uh, opening was a bit early, and it's closed a bit early. And this is going to catch out quite a few, because Will Abraham, for example, is coming in now, mm. but that's after we've had the pit window closed Legend. But, he, but remember, they, they are allowed to pass the board once and they can come back in on the next time by. Even if it's closed? Yes. So, okay. so the pit, pit window board will go open, will, will go out, and then once that's out, cars can pass it once. But once they've passed okay. it, next time they come back up to here, out, exit out of Lodge towards Dearly, they must pit in, otherwise it will be a penalty. Let's go to the pit lane. Jamie Peters Ennis. He's on his toes and he's got news. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm down with Mikey Porto. Um, we had a very busy first stint. Damage to the splitter, Mikey. Um, and also, uh, you saying you're struggling a little bit on downshifts? Yeah, just a problem, a slight problem with the car. But uh, we think we can sort it with a change of the brake bias. But um, yeah, damage to the splitter already, you know, just uh, finding the limits. But yeah, uh, been a good race so far. Boys, Ted and P2. Uh, I'm not sure where we are now. But uh, yeah, I'm hoping for uh, him to a good stint and I'm getting back in. And we've seen several teams already being warned about track limits how mindful are you of that yeah i got a warning pretty early on and then i was just being very conscious didn't get another track limit uh yeah trying to save it because obviously the drive through panel will be detrimental to your race you know it's another 20 seconds you lose so uh yeah just being really mindful of it and uh hopefully not to get any more all right thanks a lot mikey back to david and scott thanks jamie yeah so good stint by mikey porter his car damaged that's another one that's a bit battle scarred. I mentioned this earlier on. Andy Bennett started in '98, and that now is in the hands of David Postins. I'm not quite sure what that's hit. It looks rather more like it's gone off the road, doesn't it? To uh, sort of uh, uh, turn back the bodywork at the front of the car. Either that, or he's whacked the curb, and it's bent the yeah. on the front canal yeah. thing. 22 is in. Jack Constable in, so he's going to hand over now on the 22 car to Russell Joyce. So he will now jump in. And they are refueling. That's a key thing to watch out for also, whether teams refuel on pit stops or not. Sometimes fuel loads can be a matter also, because some teams might fuel on their first stop or might not, depending on what fuel load they put in. And some teams can choose to put either half a churn in or one churn or even two full churns if they're going to do a stop without pit, without making any fuel. Sometimes they will do that as the 98 car gets a little sideways and the entrance into the lodge. That was David Poston's exploring the grip limits of his Fun Cup car through an over deer leap. That's the Fun Cup way, I understand. <laughs> uh, so, now that the first stops have cycled through, we'll give it another lap and then we might have a, uh, a proper look at the order because it will have jumbled a little. And of course, all the cars now will have a different driver on board. Nobody has stayed in. You can't do a sort of double stint, as it were. You've got to uh, rotate. Even if you're only a double driver, you've got to hand over. Uh, so change on each pit stop. But 225, which will now be uh, Fabio Randaccio slash Chris Randall, that car trying to recover some of its lost time after the uh, stop-go penalty and he's currently in the top six but uh, I hesitate to say that because we've still got a couple of cars serving their first round of stops. Yeah and quite intriguingly as Skull Club who were showing a second have just exited their pit stop the leaders MJ Tech have just come in to make theirs and they're also refueling on their first stop so that's the key thing to watch out for and uh, as we go through this, as we go through how much fuel they take, well, it's only one churn of fuel, so they're not going for a massively long stop uh, and trying to put on more fuel where they can. 
And there's the UVO car just coming up to the back of David Poston's number 98. And as they shake out, they're currently sat at the moment in sixth position on the screen. But we've still got the these to finish their stop. We're just exiting pit lane any second now. Also coming out was another car that was in pit. That was fueled up racing in, in car 210. They're also exiting out of the pits two. And they came in from tw what was 12th position. So they're going to come back out somewhere still around the mid-pack as we now tick towards the end of the first hour in this opening Fun Cup Endurance Championship race at Alton Park. And uh, I think it certainly has lived up to that first word. It certainly has been quite fun all the way from start to finish. Now, this is intriguing here because Uwe Hoffman's motorsport have now got GCR Racing chasing after them. And this is not only two former champions now, nose to tail, but it is four position because now yeah. in sixth position, is Uwe Hoffers Motorsport. GCR currently sat in seventh place. That car now has 111 with Craig Butterworth, Craig Butterworth at the wheel. So Craig now chasing after the incumbents in 225. Why did they go for pseudonyms? Personal choice, I'm, 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 I'm certain, I think. But uh, again, it's. <laughs> There's, there's a four letter phrase. You always say, say the phrase, don't you? It's, it's, it's the fun cup way. So uh, thank you. There, there you go. go. That's, there a, you go. There that's you go. a good announcer as any. <laughs> You're waiting yeah. for that. Right. Um, it's car 249. Four, uh, oh, that's, that's the race leaders. Race leaders, MJ Tech will be given a five second stop and go penalty. So, race leaders, which is they've just, 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 just made their pit stop. It's a five second stop go now for MJ Tech. Now, they had something like half a minute in hand, didn't they, before the window opened? Yeah. But. It's not just five seconds because it's drive in slowly, it's stop, it's drive out slowly. Yeah. That's going to probably take a good 15, 20 seconds. They'll probably still keep the lead, but it will be reduced. As here, look, 111 of Craig Butterworth has got himself up ahead of the uh, UVO car, Team UVO Motorsport. So Craig Butterworth going great guns here. That car didn't seem to sparkle with respect in the first stint, but all of a sudden it's found itself in sixth place. But the mighty gap that... Uh, Will Abraham had pulled now is likely to shrink a little bit and it is going to be Scott Jeffs behind the wheel back up a place look goes the UVO car then so uh, pseudonym Randaccio goes ahead of the unpseudonymed Craig Butterworth and having lost the place and gained it back now tries to stretch the margin on the climb up the hill I've asked Jamie to go and find out why our leaders have a five second penalty. He is on the case and he's just finding out for us now. So we'll be able to get an answer as to why they have a penalty. We know they have one, but the reason we know not. Um, whether it's probably track limits, I think that. Possibly, but then again, we've seen other penalties for a, a stop go penalty and a drive through. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, True. It's, it's various different things. So we'll see exactly why those penalties have come up and we'll get the news in a second once he has uh, either checked in with race control or found out from MJ Tech as to why they've been given that penalty. Uh, meanwhile, the battle for sixth continues up there for fifth place now between Uvia Hoffman's Motorsport and GCI pushes on. And they've still also got the team Olympian GRD car not too far back. So getting their pit stop, they've not done too badly in that pit sequence. Moved up to seventh now, they've made their stop. That's now got the uh, its uh, new driver for this season, Simon Rudd, of course, has moved across from Axiometrics. He's now in that car. And Simon Rudd in previous years has done plenty of experience. He's particularly raced in Focus Cup and a few other different championships on top of that VW Racing Cup on top. So he's certainly got plenty of experience in front-wheel drive machinery, but last year was plying his car mostly in the Axiometrics car. As I jumped across to the defending champions, and of course with it, I think with his sponsor is there's a change of colour. I think you can, if you open the door um, on the number one cars I saw in assembly area, you can still see the green underneath it. So they've just simply just uh, liveried over it when they've redone it. If your third offence for track limits during a race is committed, you get a drive-through penalty. Right. Okay. If it's your fourth, you get a five-second stop-go penalty. But you'd have thought that the people that are getting these five-second stop-goes would have had a drive-through first, wouldn't you? Yeah. So I'm assuming, therefore, that the drive-through is for something else or the stop goes but th th there are all sorts of things you can do to incur a stop go like speeding in the pit lane overtaking under a yellow flag contact causing a collision so th there's a whole um, page of different things on the penalty chart mm. but yes um, the drive-through that we've seen for 214 as an example uh, which was the Mike Devlin and Matt Hogcar Mike Devlin at the wheel that one assumes is for track limits but the, the, the five second stop go in theory, would come after a drive through Yeah, that, I, I can see your logic in that. Yeah, I can definitely see that logic in terms of how that could have worked. But uh, I'm sure Jamie's, uh, in, in, Inspector Jamie's on the case down in pit lane to find out with this from the team as to why they've been given this five seconds. Constable Jamie. <laughs> Constable Jamie. Yes. <laughs> oh, I see. Right. Jamie Constable. Okay. Got it. 
So, uh, which is Jack's dad. Uh, there, yes. with a problem, possibly, is 210, because that car's pace has sort of ebbed away a little bit. Now, that uh, is Jamie Price at the wheel. I thought it had a problem. It's still going, but maybe just being terribly kind and getting out of the way. So, at the moment, it is 249 in the lead by 14 seconds. So that means that Scott Jeffs in the car that was leading before the stops is still leading, but he owes us a, a stop-go penalty pit stop. And he's going to lose the lead, I would suggest, on that to 195, the Morpheus racing car, which is now Ted Bradbury at the wheel of it. Yeah, so I figured that he'll probably come back out, if not just in front, or maybe just behind, I think, or somewhere around, he's still in third, he might just lose out to Greenview. But he'll at least drop to, I think, at least second, if not third place. Uh, so he'll want to try and pick his way through as quick as he can. And we've got this second phase of drivers into this one, into their second stint. Now, how many more laps can they squeeze in before they need to serve the stop-go penalty? Because the MJ Tech team are, for the moment, not to be found heading to the pits. And therefore, the team will continue. What they need to try and do, I suppose, is try and stretch that margin a little bit, but they can't stay out indefinitely, can they? And they're in this time, in fact. So, looking out of the window, you're looking at what's going on down towards Lodge. Uh, the leader is in, serves the stop go, and that means that we're going to have, possibly, the Morpheus racing car now to take the race lead, because out of Deer Leap over the line, yes, 195 goes through, so the gap had been coming down, it was at about 10 seconds. 2.49's on the move again. But it's lost its lead. And now the question is whether it's going to be able to stay ahead of number 14, which is the Greenheath car, which has just gone across the line. Just. And it will come out ahead, but it's going to be close, as you rightly say, Scott. Yeah. Yeah. Greenheath just going through Old Hall now, whereas they go through it. And just out of shot you saw going down the hill there, that was 2.49. So that's how close it was. So... As I estimated, it is just about ahead of Greenheath, and so it'll start to build that lead up all over again. So it only loses one place. That's the fortunate part. The only less fortunate part is that now it's the task of the man ahead of two in 249 now, which is uh, Scott Jess, to try and pick his way to close that gap back up again. We only know that until we get to the next time, time, line, next time around. I just wonder as well whether that tells us anything about. Um, Scott Jeff's pace because clearly what was half a minute or so before the pit stops mm. was about 15 seconds and was then much reduced anyway now mm. okay Ted Bradbury you've been telling us he's a quick young driver but maybe a combination of him being quick and Scott Jeff's not being quite as quick as Will Abraham is why that gap was coming down anyway yeah correct I think that probably would be the case um, we can solve the question of why 2 one I got the penalty Jamie says it's for track limits so it was a track limits penalty that's copped in the stop go in that sense right. you know what my question is going to be on. Why didn't he get a drive through for his third if there was a fourth? Because if there was a fourth offence for a stop go, there must have been a third. Potentially, but uh, okay. I think only Julian Floyd will know that, I think, but uh, maybe it's possibly another thing for Jamie to find out. I think, possibly. <laughs> um, I, know, I know he's listened to us on our sort of Discord comp thing, so he can hear me via my laptop. So, any people that are getting, so if he's able to find that out, then uh, I'm sure he can, uh, he can give us that information. It's all fascinating how uh, penalties come, but race control, one forgets, is an incredibly busy place. Uh, and they're trying to juggle the safety of the race, along with all the regulations on pit stops, along with track limits, and uh, on it goes. Right, now there's another car, look, with damage, and that's the Greenheath car. Now, number 14 has been taken over by Gary Bate. And it's uh, the bollard that he hit coming out of his locks that did for the front right corner. So. It's a clever little trick, this. They're determined to make the cars lighter as the race goes on. It's a bit like catering racing, where they shed wheel arches over the course of half an hour. You know, when they think no one's looking, just wallop a bollard, <laughs> clip a curb, <laughs> knock a bit of bodywork off, and then have an insouciant, innocent fate when you get to the scrutineering at the end. But the new GT3 Ford Mustang... Yeah. I'm going off on a tangent, forgive me, there'll be lots no, of these. Please, um, go ahead. Paul Ricard last week, we noticed it had lost its, its boot lid. Well, apparently it's done that in all its other races, whether it's been in WEC mm. or the IMSA Sebring you, 12 hours. You're right. It's, it's a thing. Uh, somebody has spent a lot of time designing it, and somebody else has spent a lot of time <laughs> working out how to jettison it. And a fun cup car would appear to be the same. How can we make them lighter without affecting the pace? I know, let's just rip the front of the car back a bit. <laughs> anyway, back to the plot. Uh, we have uh, 195 in the lead, and it's Ted Bradbury at the wheel of it. 
And now we need to have a look at what's going on for second and third, because if Scott Jeffs is going to lose time relative to Gary Bate there in third, that's going to be a gap worth looking at, isn't it? It is, yeah. See if that gap comes down a little bit further. That's fourth, fifth and sixth. The scrap is going to be quite intriguing as well, because if you look on the track where they are, it's a PLR racing or listen tree. So three technical former champion teams are now only separated by about 2.7 seconds. So if Mr. Director is listening, it might be worth having a look at that scrap for fourth, I think, because Greenheath the third, and they're at about, about 20 seconds behind Greenheath at the moment. So they'll probably appear into this part of the circuit, not in quite quick fashion in the next 10, 20 seconds or so. So PLR racing, which has now Neil Plover, the captain on board of that car. And now we've got the 225 Ubio car in fifth position, and now we've got in sixth position 111, which is Trey Buckler. So they're now between a couple of seconds. The race leader has just gone by and that means that we have now done 31 laps of the race and 249 has just gone through and is still in second place despite that stop go and he's getting away now from uh, Gary Bate there in what's left of the Greenheath car so the lead gap is eight and a half seconds now that last lap by Ted Bradbury was a two minutes 1.8 and a two minutes 0.9 for number 249, which is Scott Jeff. So in other words, the lead gap is coming back down. And I'd take it all back if I was suggesting that Scott Jeff's pace wasn't good. Well, he's trying to prove me a lie by going quicker and he's whittling away that lead gap. So uh, we're looking good for a good battle here now. I think so. And even in the second stint, which is looking pretty strong. There's Ted Bradbury. The 195 Morpheus Motorsport car. Um, I, just for, for, for anyone confused on the screen, it's changed from Morpheus Racing to Morpheus Motorsport. I was well, like, informed by Jamie before, um, earlier on in the day. So there has been a, an ever so slight name change. I think it's, it hasn't caught up with TSL, but it, apparently they are known as, you can see on the side of the car, Morpheus Motorsport rather than Morpheus Racing. Um, so that's, a, I think, a slight type on TSL. But even so, Ted Bradbury continues on, and he's going to keep on setting that decent pace, as you say. The last lap, faster than anyone else in that. No, it was the Scott Jeffs lap wasn't faster than anyone else. Two minutes point. 963 compared to the 2018 from Ted Bradbury and again maybe the damage on the front of that car could be playing a factor given the fact he is missing a, a front uh, aero canard shall we say on the front of that bumper um, certainly helping on if he's going through I think left hand corners rather than right but it, unfortunately it's a it's a clockwise circuit rather than anti-clockwise so the advantage of having more on the left and the right is not going to help you too much on this circuit. I wonder also how much because uh, Alton doesn't have masses of long straights or that fast corners you know like a Silverstone or a Donington it might make less of an impact but it's going to have some effect isn't it yeah uh, definitely there's the Morpheus motorsport car then through and the car behind it is a lap at least adrift that's 207 now that's got Jason Minshaw at the wheel and that'll be worth watching I would have thought Jason we know is hugely quick started his racing here uh, a good few years ago but has starred whether it's been in modern one mate racing or in historic racing hugely versatile hugely quick is Jason never raced one of these before did a bit of testing yesterday uh, and he managed to wipe the front balance off the car he's quite proud about that <laughs> he said he managed to achieve that so uh, exploring the limits yeah correct if I'm wrong he's uh, the driver who when he's not doing too much with even tweaks he likes to go and have a play in a, 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 an ex was it Rydell S Volvo S40 Super Tourer? he did have one of those yes did have quite one. right, right. Yes, okay. yes and the Minshaw Demon Tweaks dynasty which yes. is based just down the road um, they used to have a, a paddock shop in days of old when I first came <laughs> to Alton Park they used to be the Chater and Scott bookshop Demon Tweaks shop at the paddock gate yes uh, and uh, yeah uh, it's, it's now John Minshaw that runs it Alan is uh, uh, not in the best of health but uh, uh, the family business I mean it's a hugely successful yeah. enterprise as anybody will attest from uh, the old days of the Autosport International show and that enormous Demon Tweaks facility that used to be there. Yeah. But uh, yeah, uh, Jason, John, Guy, the, the, the three sons of Alan Minshaw, all very, very accomplished drivers. And I think Jason's going to be one to watch. His lap times, I would not be surprised if we didn't get a faster snap of the race out of him. Yeah, I'll give a small shout out to um, a series which is Demon Tweaks related. It's Demon Tweaks related, but it's a series racing at Brands Hatch. Shout out to Demon Tweaks because they are the headline spots this year for the what's proven to be ever popular Audi TT Cup Racing Championship which is racing ranks first races as a championship this weekend okay. at Brands Hatch and uh, if you look at all the Audi TT Cup cars on 
the uh, on track. You'll see a door in the windscreen strip. Demon tweaks on top of it. So on this stream at least thank you to Demon Tweaks for their support of that and of course for continuing to support motorsport like they do uh, small little tangent to go off on quickly 155 which is uh, the TR racing car Team Rass is racing they've been given a, a, black, a black and white flag looks like possibly four track limits um, I did also get a message from Jamie through as to about the 249 stop go his message was simply it's the decision of the clerk as to why 249 has to have a stop go didn't elaborate on that but that's all the info we have to go on that one so it's simply just the it decision of the clerk and that's that by the sound. Fair enough. OK. So we are heading towards the end. Uh, sorry, we've gone past the end of the first hour. Uh, so we're into the second of the four hours of the race. And it is 195 Morpheus Racing leading by only nine seconds. That gap is coming down uh, over 249 now with Scott Jeffs, the wheel for MJ Tech Racing. And third is the Green Heath car, which we put into it, Gary Bate. Fourth is the Uvio Hoffman's motorsport car. So that has um, slowly, slowly catchy monkey sort of chipped its way into the mix. In fifth place is 111, which is Craig Butterworth. Uh, and the cars you're looking at there look on the inside line 107. In 23rd place overall. Now that is Paul Caladine, who's taken over from Guido, Guido Basile and he's on a bit of a charge, uh, working his way through the traffic. So, yes, it's a different order, that's for certain. Now, what's happened to the Skull Club racing car that Russell Joyce has taken over. That's fallen back into 15th place. Hmm. I think that may well be the pace difference possibly between Russell Joyce and Jake and Jack Constable and possibly yeah. something through pit stops. Because as I say, as you mentioned before, there's no minimum time on pit stops. So some teams are slightly more well versed on pit stops than others. Hmm. So ultimately there could be some teams like Skull Club, for example, that might not be as well versed on pit stops, done many pit stops before. You compare yeah. that to teams like PLR Racing, uh, Olympian, Uvio, etc., who have done this championship for several years, and for them, pit stops are like clockwork. They can turn around a regular driver change in eight, nine, ten seconds, sure, or even just over that. Yeah, Russell Joyce lost four seconds on his last lap to the best that was being done by Jack Constable. Uh, a good little battle you're looking at here. I just want to touch on it's way, way down the order, it's sort of outside the top 20 as the cars were going up Clay Hill, but pretty much everybody finding a playmate at the moment and overlapping as well. 104 is now the EDF Motorsports Matador car and that is Victor Cara at the wheel of it and 157 that he's trying to find a way past is now Rob Croydon. Now Rob Croydon has been around the block a fair few times hasn't he? Experienced racer of radicals amongst other things and uh, it's going to be an interesting battle to look for that as through the traffic comes the Uvia Hoffman's car on the inside line that's still chipping away from fourth place next target is going to be the Greenheath car. Now, Greenheath, I reckon, are struggling. I know they've got a bit of frontal damage, but uh, Gary Bate is losing nearly two seconds a lap, not only to those ahead, but to this car behind. So he's falling away from the top two. And whoops, big, big spin ahead Ooh. of just avoiding it, the Uvia Hoffman's car. That was Paul Caladine, wasn't it? In 107, the high-peak racing car that went around. Oh, that was a bit touch and go. Thankfully, more going than touching. Yes, definitely. And going again now. As yes. To let the couple of faster cars through. And that was right in front of, as you say, the battle that was going on between... Well, there's the uh, number one car, the winning champ, is now with um, Simon Rudd at the wheel. But that was right in front of that scrap that was going on in fourth place between yeah. Uvia and GCI. They thankfully managed to come away from that with pretty much unscathed, with no issues there. And there's the 104 car, one of the... Uh, EDF Motorsport Machines, EDF Motorsport, Eddie Farrow's team, who's been quite well versed in this. They've also got a couple of cars in other series like Brick Car, and they've been running a, a Cooper and TCR this weekend as well. So they've been quite well versed as Eddie, and quite a popular uh, figure up and down the paddock himself, and runs quite a couple of handy, handy uh, cars in the mix. So you can see that car's running up there at the moment in, well, 19th at the moment for that EDF car. The Vape Club car also is not too far away from the cars either. Vape Club actually, they are currently sat in 8th at the moment, the 246 car. That's currently got that facility at the wheel. So different fortunes for both cars, but the, uh, at least one car in the top 10 which is running well. This one, in fact, is having a battle with 154. Uh, so 155, no, 157, which is the Gracie Mitchell Rob Croydon car. There's Rob Croydon scraps happen with him. Gracie Mitchell, one of, another one of the young drivers coming into the championship. She's gone through from karting, but now she's kind of jumped in like Mikey Fortin, like Ted Brown. But good to see quite a few young drivers who maybe go in the endurance and sports car GT route in the future using Fun Cup as a really good cost-effective way to get themselves some good track time in endurance star racing, well it is an endurance race, early in their careers, some 16, 17, 18 years old, even the Genetta drivers like Porter and Risa Suwerdi who came in last year using it as a bit of, and that was them, their first senior race, fresh off 
dropping their junior licenses again into seniors, straight into a, a two endurance races. So it's great stuff. But a day of this, you know, four hour race or longer, you'll get far more track time. Whoops, 104 being squeezed on the grass there uh, than you would in four or five race meetings for some other category. So uh, bang for your buck, it makes sense. 104 being edged onto the grass, that was Victor Cara. And that was by, I want to say Rob Croydon, am I right in saying that? 157, yes, it was Rob Croydon who um, doesn't normally do things like that. But anyway, shows how close this is. Rob has been, as I said earlier on, a very experienced campaigner, but he's struggling to get away here and make too much progress. And we've got one car coming into the pit lane, and it's not a scheduled stop, is it? We don't, got, we don't have an open window. No, car that's coming in on the time screen appears to be the 107. High, peak, yeah, high peak racing car. That was the car that had the spin it exiting was. Old Hall. So yes. I wonder if that's a legacy, and that's that's not even a look or a feel of it. It is definitely into the box. That's a problem. Yeah, so I think that's an underwear change. So <laughs> after Paul Caladar nearly got collected, that, just, yes. that was that was a code brown moment. I think that's being attended to. <laughs> Possibly. Yes. So uh, you're right. It's gone straight to the garage, but that suggests it's going to be a longish stop. And I can see Jamie is heading in that general direction. Yeah, so he's our roving reporter down on the ground, so he will go and find out what the issue is and either report back on camera or drop us a message to let us know what the, what the status quo with that car is as it continues on. We're coming up towards the end of the second stint, the beginning of the second pit window, and so the current gap at the moment then, Morpheus Racing leading by, Morpheus Motorsport, I'll correct myself, leading by, we'll see when they come across the line in the second, which they do now. What's the gap between the top two? It is now a fraction under eight seconds, so it's now... Eight seconds practically between the top two. So the MJ Tech car, which currently does now have Scott Jeffs back at the wheel of it, is trying to cl plug plug away and close that gap down to the Morpheus Racing car. Morpheus Motorsport. I keep, I keep looking at the timing screen and saying Morpheus Racing, when I know it should we be Should we just Motorsport. go Morpheus? Yes, Morpheus, yes. yes. Uh, Morpheus in the lead, that's better, with Ted Bradbury. <laughs> Meanwhile, Green Heath now continue on, and they now have the signature RV car behind, which is sporting another classic retro racing livery, the... The, the blue and orange of Gulf, so that's now pushing on. But also, that Green Heath car is losing chunks of time, isn't it? Remember when the 249 MJ Tech racing car came out after its stop go? They were close, and now that margin is about 20 and a half seconds, so it's certainly stretched out. So this uh, is Gary Bate at the wheel of the Green Heath car. I tell you what, almost every time I look at a different car now, it has got some front bodywork. So the, the more and more curb hopping and bollard collecting is growing, and the, and the, the front of the cars are looking decidedly dog eared. Uh, more sideways at Cascades. Yeah, that, was, that was the EDF car that was going sideways again after he got squeezed onto the grass a couple of laps ago. Right. So I think that was him just pushing the limits a little too much. Right, that's the leader that uh, was, if you like, 249. And now, aboard it, is Scott Jeffs, who is trying to catch back up to the race leader after that stop-go penalty. So the margin is 7.9 seconds, and last time the Morpheus Racing slash Motorsport car was two tenths quicker. So there's not much to choose between these two. That means that Ted Bradbury leading Scott Jeffs, it's going to be back markers, I think, that are going to affect it up until you get to the next pit stop, which ain't far away. Yeah, definitely. Uh, message from Jamie down in pit lane, 107 had an issue with the right, rear, right, right rear, but it was just a precaution check, all okay, so he's rejoining shortly. As we say that, 107 we can see down in pit lane is actually being pushed out. He's now back out once again, so simply a precautionary check for what the, what the driver thought was an issue on the right rear, but all good now, and away he goes. Yeah, back into the race. Uh, lead gap, 7.7 .7 seconds. Last time around, MJ Tech Racing in second place, quicker than the leader. So the gap down by Nat Crotchet. Uh, third and fourth, though, Greenheath to Hoffman's. Now, what was that margin? Uh, it was 16.3 seconds. Greenheath have just gone across the line. And 195 is being given a five-second stop-go penalty. 195 being the lead car. So that's the second time the leader has had a five second. It's a different leader, but the leader, as an entity, a stop-go penalty. Yeah, and, and Jamie, straight on it, you can tell you that's for track limits as well. So that's a track limits five second stop-go for him as well. So he'll be stopping at the top of the pit lane, which is practically just underneath us in the uh, in the media yeah. centre, race admin centre. And they'll stop for five seconds and where they go at pit lane speed. That's going to lose them the lead unquestionably because, as we've been saying, the gap's only 7.7 .7 seconds and it's more than just five seconds worth uh, of a penalty because there's the drive time, if you like, pit in to the to the box, stop, pit out to the line. So there it is. It's a slightly dog-eared car, the Morpheus Motorsport entry with what's left of the front. And uh, Ted Bradbury at the wheel of it then has copped this track limit penalty and he's going to lose the lead. 
he should be able to hang on to second place over the Greenheath car, but it's going to put MJ Tech Racing back up front there. In fifth is 111 Craig Butterworth at the wheel of it. He's dropped back a bit from the Hoffman's car, the Uvio Hoffman's car. And that in turn is all up the curve, as you can see, bouncing through Britons. The one behind is a lap of drift, isn't it? 157, the car of uh, Rob Croydon. So as the leaders come down now towards the Hislop chicane, Craig Butterworth in 111 trying to get through the traffic. Ooh dear, Rob Croydon has to turn in and Craig Butterworth, in fairness to him, didn't force the issue there, realised that that was going to be a bit marginal and backed out of it. So in has come the Morpheus car. So the five second stop goes served, it has lost its lead. It's on its way down the pit lane. And will rejoin, I'm still convinced, in second place. There, 111, the GCI racing car is fifth, and Morpheus will rejoin, yes, and keep second ahead of Greenheath. Yeah, so similar situation, pretty much exactly the same situation as MJ Tech when they came in from the lead, had enough of a gap not yeah. to be affected by Greenheath in third, but probably still losing time considering that they've got past their front section missing. Uh, Second pit window is imminent, so as they come onto the pit straight now, this is still GCI racing ahead of running on, kind of on its own a little bit in, in terms of the position on the timing screen it is because it's got quite a gap of about uh, seven seconds or so, seven or eight seconds on the Team Olympian car. That's risen nicely from where it was at the beginning, at the end of the first pit window in 17th. It's now up to sixth courtesy of Simon Rudd. And I expect that car to go a bit further up the order now with Riley Phillips at the wheel when he jumps in for this pit window. Closest battles on track. We're, yeah, we're in that sort of part of the race now. The closest battle on track is arguably the fourth and fifth. Pit window two is now open, so it means the car can start to come in again. Have to pass the pit window board once, and I wonder if that's gone maybe ever so slightly earlier because it allows teams to pass it once and then essentially pit kind of within that sort of ten minutes to give them a tiny extra yeah, bit of time. I wonder. That's what I was suggesting earlier on. That it means that by the time you come back round, you've got a ten-minute window. Yeah, exactly. Um, I don't quite understand the pit lane close board giving you a lapse grace. However, if that's the regulation, that's the regulation. So now we'll see who's on their toes. Because if your driver is quick, you'll want to keep him out for as long as you can. I know you've only got uh, 10 minutes, which is probably to be on the safe side, four laps. But even so, you'd want to maximise those four laps. So at the moment, no takers. Yeah. Just uh, as we go into this pit window, it's, it's a key thing to mention in terms of the growth of the championship. One thing I should mention is that uh, Fun Cup have actually got a brand new website which they've been developing over the winter. And if you want to find out more about the cars, about the championship, you can see cars for sale whilst you're on the website. You can actually watch the action from Alton Park here via literally the Fun Cup front page. It's a great big sort of uh, video uh, embed into the live stream of the website. And you can go and check it out. It's funcup.co.uk. And just see why this championship has had such great growth. If you give an example of some numbers that uh, Christian Rose has given this morning. The championship, compared to last year, its grids have grown by about a third, about 34%. So it's got okay. a third from last year. So a lot of hard work's been done in the back by Christian and Peter, and, and, and Peter, Paul and, um, and, and Liz and everyone else within Fun Cup to really grow the grids, keep getting these top drivers and get younger drivers into the mix, more teams involved, more cars to get. There's still more to come throughout the season, a few more cars. There's teams that I noticed are not here like uh, another regular front-running car, which is the Viking Ursus Capital team. Who are not here this weekend, unfortunately, but hopefully they will be for the rest of the season or throughout most of next year, uh, this year, sorry. And it should be, I think, a very a good, entertaining season all round for Fun Cup. There's a lot of buzz, a lot of hype around it, a lot of work been done to promote the championship over the winter, lots of interest, lots of test drives, and people getting into these cars. And it is one of those cars where, no matter who, anyone that's driven one has, has, has got out with a smile on their face and absolutely enjoyed it. But the pit window opens, 98 diving in, he was holding to the right hand side because he knew he was going to come in and make that stop. In comes Vape Club. So two, four, six are in from his eighth position. Also in his seat day to 214. So the second pit window begins in earnest. And again, no touch in the car unless you're refueling it. And they are going to double refuel. So two churns going in for the Vape Club cars. So they, that would suggest that when they come through with their next stop, it'll be driver only rather than fuel yeah. again because they're going in on a fuel tank now, so it'll be quite heavy, but it means they can go longer and save time with their next stop. Yeah, so a long stop now, but a short stop, relatively speaking, next time. What you want, I suppose, also, is your last pit stop to be a short one. Yes. So you're buying places into the last stint. Yeah, well, the very least, if you're going to make a fuel stop, it's only one churn or half a churn rather than yeah. two. Two, four, six, hits the stops, and away it goes. Also, the grass is racing. 
couple of others who've been going for a flurry of activity. Also, it has been the Driver 61 car, which is uh, Scott Man uh, Manson and Kevin Manson. So, Kevin handing that car back mm. to Scott. So that's another one that's dropped a long way back, though, isn't it? Kevin Mansell uh, took it over, as you say, but it's fallen down the order, quite markedly, to 14th place when he hit it. Mm. That was close. That was close. That was 107 coming in as uh, Rattus Racing came out. And uh, apologies if you heard any uh, reaction from that on the, on the, on the camera. Uh, the camera as they were leaving um pretty language there but uh, that was rather close to 107 and i'm sure julian floyd will have uh, an opinion on that i'm sure that said camera angles always sort of foreshorten things mm. so it might not have been quite so uh, dramatic but even so there'll be a, a look at it i'm sure to remind teams about an unsafe release right so Camino basile gets back in not many cars you see in motor racing with azerbaijan Labels on them, but we've got one there. IP racing entry. Pushing back, game on the go. Now that's already had one pit stop, hasn't it, because of this wheel uh, issue, for want of a better phrase, and it rather looks like it's going back into the garage. So uh, Paul Caladine has brought it back in, and clearly he's still not happy. So although they've done the driver change, Guido has never had the wheel, it's going to go and have another uh, inspection. The PLR car which was Neil Plimmer and will now go back to Ben Pitch. That is in the pit lane. It's pitched up, dare one suggest. <laughs> uh, also in it's the uh, car 21st position has also jumped in as well, which is the JPR Slug, Invest uh, Slug Investments car. That's also in car 99. I like Slug Investments. <laughs> the slip of the tongue. They take a, take a long time to grow, is that what you're <laughs> suggesting? Isn't is, is that compound interest? Right? Something like that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, so snug investments. Is what oh, yes, meant to say. yes. Uh, but they're all um, tucked up nicely. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, that car's in from 21st position. Uh, so, side by side action down the pit straight. It's not for position, but it is our uh, second place car, the Morpheus car, which now has, well, it still has Tev Bradbury at the wheel. He hasn't made his second pit stop yet. The highest no. place car that hasn't yet is indeed um, that one. Um, now, I think we might get a replay of what happened just there in the pit lane. So, I want to get a closer look at that. As you say, camera angles can be deceptive as Greenlee comes in. This is the exit from Rast Racing. So, when you get released, 107 comes in. Yeah, like, a little bit. Yeah, I think actually when the team elected to release the Ratcliffe car, it didn't look too bad. The problem was that their 107 had to slow mm. to come into its box, and therefore the gap that you had suddenly halved. I think it was probably not as bad when they had the idea to release it, but then circumstances overtook to give them the benefit of the doubt. But yes, um, it was a little bit uh, close. Yeah. And as we've been saying, Alton's not a very big pit lane, and when you've got fuel down there as well, you certainly want everything to be safe, don't you? Do indeed. There is the, a group of three cars which have all been dispatched by Ted Bradbury, who is, uh, of course, the slight confusing, about, confusing thing on the TSL is it'll show pit stops, but it includes all uh, visits to the pits, including the two penalties that the two leads have yes, served. Right, yes. So Alton says they've done two pit stops on the, on the uh, timing screen, on our timing screen, but it, we know in fact they've only made one mandatory stop because the level was they're stopping for their stop go. So they do have to make a pit stop, as do few, some, some of the other leaders. Axiometrics are in from eighth position. Also in is the GMR Eco car. So that would be Gracie Mitchell handing the car back. Uh, no, that Gracie Mitchell, get, Gracie Mitchell getting back in and taking back over from Rob Croydon. So of course, vastly experienced driver. That second stint did seem to be considerably shorter, didn't it? Because uh, it was a 30 minute window closed to window open rather than the 40 minutes at the start of the race that 10 minute difference just seems to be quite markedly mm. i think there's a there's a bit of an overlap with the stints in terms of, i think how they kind of change over that 10 minute pit window kind of goes into the second stint in many cases so mm. there's, a, there's, a, there's a there's a there's a almost a purposeful overlap in terms of the 10 minutes of that second stint is essentially that is effectively the start of the second stint that kind of when that pit window opens yeah, so, yeah, yeah, I guess so. they're just uh, working their way through Axiometric leaves as also in the pit lane to make their stop has been wave nine in car 207 and they've pitted from just outside the top 10 and that's benefited the 246 bait club car but there it is just on track ahead of the 98 team 3 motorsport car which now into its third stint and has john perrett at the wheel so here, yet to stop for the second time, Ted Bradbury, and in second place. Now, last time was slightly slower than the leading MJ Tech racing car, and the lap before had been slightly quicker. So I think this is partly really the traffic that we can blame for the fluctuations in the gap. Mm. Uh, in third place, 
just sort of getting on with the job really going to a degree under the radar is the Uvio Hoffman's car and for fourth place the CGI entry I think there's been a change of stints I think here so ah so Axiometrics 103 looks like it was Jonathan Relton that started the car I understand because there was a one put that put next to that one from one of our producers it might be that we're going to hear from ah. one of them actually so Jonathan Railton I think uh, has done or yes he's just done his second stint so uh, there you can see 107 that is the high peak racing car that's gone back out but is still a little bit troubled and uh, as the cars head up the hill 22 which is now back to Jack Constable It'll be interesting to see what progress that can make it's, uh, we've just had the leader go over the line more pit stops are imminent and two and a half hours of the race remains so we're not quite at the halfway point and it's a race that, despite having plenty of shuffling of the order, has been, dare one say, incident free. We've not had even a spin, have we? We've had a few cars clipping curbs, we've had a few sideways cars. Whoops, it's all kicking off, having said that, at Lodge Corner. 98, still sort of losing bodywork as it goes. That's the Andy Bennett, David Postins, John Parrott entry. Mm. Second place team are in, so Morpheus are in for their second stop. So that'll be Ted Bradbury handing back over to Mikey Porter. Right. Let's go to the pit lane and rejoin Jamie. John, you just jumped out of the 103 car with the biggest smile on your face. That was your first ever Fun Cup stint. How was that? Uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, like you say, coming from a bike background and a few C1 endurance races, my first race stint in the Fun Cup, and I uh, really enjoyed it. I got in a good battle with the Race Logic car. We were to and fro in a bit and trying to work together. But, um, no, I really enjoyed it, and, um, and yeah, it got, got, uh, got a bit sweaty towards the end there. And you've got seasoned teammates, Greg Evans and Chris Weatherall with you. They've also been doing a lot of data with you and giving you loads of tips. But when you're out there, you're on your own, and you've got to learn so quickly haven't you yeah no exactly it's, it's, it's so competitive out there um, you can't give an inch and um, and yeah Chris and Greg have been, been really helpful with their experience and passing that on all right thanks a lot John uh, we've just had 195 in for a single fuel stop that'd be Mikey Porter back in back to David and Scott in the commentary box thanks Jamie so uh, battle on for the race leaders and pit stop still cycling through so 195 the Morpheus motorsport team has done its two plus one pit stops and a second regulation pit stop is imminent from 249. Now in fairness Scott they left it late on the first window didn't they so it wouldn't be a surprise to see them leave it late again on this. Uh, the wheel of 249 now uh, is Scott Jeffs and the gap will have grown again because of the Morpheus Motorsport car serving its second mandatory stop so the margin between the two will be a, a slightly misleading one and this is about the only car I think that's on its own doesn't have a playmate at the moment at the moment yeah it seems to be pretty much as I say in what I like to call no man's land it's not kind of battling with anyone it's kind of just running its own race in, in completely clear air which is certainly going to be a benefit in this particular part of the race I'm certain for current store behind the wheel of the car is uh, Scott Jeffs of course the team will I think will uh, to make a have to make a stop this time by because if he's past the the, the the pit window closed board so this should be mandatory stop for him and I can also see that uh, the EVO squad are also I think limbering up down there to welcome their drivers in this late part of the late part of the stint through past the pits goes Morpheus racing car chased down by the 97 car which now has Scott Mansell back at the wheel rather than Kevin as an increased level of damage on the front 104 has also gone for the uh, Vogue front right bodywork missing style. Uh, Adam Cunnington back into 104 on the start of the third stint. Six stints in total. And more teams are getting ready for more pit stops. So there is the race leader from the Uvio Hoffman's car. Now, how many stops has that made? That has also made one plus one. So. I'm talking about the Uvia Hoffman's car because that had an early penalty, didn't it? And it's made one regulation stop. So that, like the leader, owes us a pit stop. Yeah, and I can see that uh, I can see um, Farkini's down there waiting to receive it, as is also, of course, our race leaders. So in the pit lane, as I mentioned, yeah.
Yep, two fire in, two ten fueled up racing are just finished being fueled up while their drivers jump in. So both are our race leader and essentially the top two because Uvia Hoffman's motorsport are also up into second place now. So they've now but again steadily made that progress. Yeah, but they're second pro ten, because I think when the Morpheus motorsport car goes through, it will retake its place, won't it? Because they kind of jumped up into second on the pit stops, if you like, by staying out late. That's what's catapulted them up the order. But it's really towards the end of the race that we'll get a proper idea of who is exactly where. Another one with damage has just gone across the line, which is 214, the seed data car uh, that Matt Hogg has been behind the wheel of most recently. So MJ Tech leading. Uh, and have rejoined, and the Uvia Hoffman's car is now in, so it's going to lose its second place, presumably. As the driver change happens. Relatively short on fuel, that car. Now, is that a bit of smoke coming out of the back of somebody down towards Island Bend? And is, if it is smoke, is it mechanical or is it bodywork on the tyre? And there, we'll look, damage to the front. Catching this trend is the Fun Cup way. Uh, that's the UVO Hopkins car, which accelerates back into the race. It's incredibly blustery, isn't it? You look at the flags flying, there's an uh, SO crawling in front of us that's flapping away in the, in the wind. But uh, blue flag being waved there by the marshals to say to the cars leaving the pits, there are quick cars coming up behind you. So the UVO Hopkins car is back on track. Again, at the end of the next lap, we'll get an idea of the order. The incoming driver has to be absolutely on it, and that is going to put them just back ahead of 1-1-1, which will be Ian Wood at the wheel. And that car was looking pretty quick early on in the race, but uh, Craig Butterworth's efforts have kept it in the mix. So another couple of laps into the third stint, and we'll get, a, as I say, the true indication of the race order. They're going through the Uvia Hoffman's car, which was second when it came in but should by now drop back behind the Morpheus Motorsport car. There's not much left at the front of the Mansells. Uh, they're in fourth place. This is for third and fourth, I would offer you. So uh, Team Uvio Motorsport versus GCI Racing. It's really CI Racing, isn't it? If G is not racing, <laughs> then we just need to abbreviate that. It's CI. Just just for this race only. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, Graham's still there, of course, I'm sure, in, in spirit in terms of he's managing the team. But, uh, it, yes, he is here, and I'm sure has a, a, a view. So up the hill go GCI and Uvio now. And this is essentially, again, four position between the two of them. So, because I imagine that Morpheus... Motorsport will have gone through into second place now yeah. after his pit stops at the pit finish. So this is now, again, four position. It's nice that we've got a battle four position this high up in the field yeah, yeah, yeah. at this point in the race, which is good to see. So it's good these two cars, again, two former champion teams. They've done this before, as the phrase goes. It's been they've done that and got the T-shirt at least once. So they've done what it's like to be champions. Uh, they are third and fourth then. So you've got MJ Tech for Morpheus here, Team Uvio. Hoffman's Motorsport and then uh, CI Racing, as we're now dubbing it. Over the line goes Ian Wood. Yeah, Graham Butterworth, who would have been the third driver of that car. I think we've touched on the fact earlier on. He was the driving force behind bringing the Fun Cup initiative to the UK, having had huge success many years ago with what was the Slick 50 Road Saloon Championship. And one of the multiple champions of that was a bloke called Paul Rose, who is now, of course, the mastermind behind this. Uh, out of Cascades they come, having overlapped on the way in. Uh, still Wood can't uh, quite find a way through, but he lines up now on the inside line, heading down towards Island Bend. He's got the better line, but actually backs out of it, doesn't he? Going into the corner, doesn't force the issue. If that were the last lap, he might have done, but not worth it with two hours and change on the clock. Yep, Farkini certainly doing his best to is uh, again almost looks like they almost like locking up a little bit into shell oars the car just wiggling a little bit on that slightly banked apex of shell oars they come through the right hander and up towards the uh, britain chicane once again just that laps we've covered we've covered these covered 46 laps so on that 47 in this first race of the season coming up towards the half hour of the halfway point with some two hours and 23 minutes on the clock still to run now, the leader, MJ Tech Racing, has done its second regulation stop. So everybody now is on the same uh, kind of strategy, as it were, the same stint. And it's just gone across the line. So this gives you an idea. This is the third place battle at Nickerbrook. There's the leader at Old Hall. That's a big, big lead. Indeed. So that's a huge lead they've got there. And uh, they're going to try and 
extend that even further they can. There is now the battle going on side by side, 1 3 and 2 4 9 is. And the tech squeezes its way through to put a lap on the car in number 103, which that one was uh, the Axiometrics car, which again is Axiometrics, but again, because the her sponsor changed a different colour now, it was the colour which essentially number one is now, but it's now changed from orange as these two are still at it, and that's now a change of position again. That's now GCI back up the inside to make the moves. That's not, not for not, long. Not for long. Here comes Farkini <laughs> down the outside. Oh, oh now, five, eight. that's a proper off, isn't it? Team Summers, so that would be, that is Gary Summers at the wheel, yeah, and, and that's on the entrance to Britons. It is, and he's been off the road, he damaged the car, he's brought muck and bullets onto the racetrack, as it were. You can see people threading their way through behind the timing graphic. There's quite a lot of grass on the road after his big lose. Yeah. That green flag is coming out of uh, the Britain chicane saying, road's clear, but if that car can't get going, the safety car is on standby. I can see its lights are flashing, and that's going to throw things upside down, potentially, uh, if the safety car has to be used. There is 155. That car is for stint three. David Ratcliffe at the wheel. But we need to see whether the Summers Racing car has been able to get going again. Safety car's not moved. There it is. You can see it's it's getting ready. Race directors will tend. No, it has got going. So problem solved. It's going to say normally a race director will give a sort of 30 second, uh, if you like, heat cycle to let the car cool down and try and restart it. But that's shed quite a lot of bodywork hasn't it 158 limping towards us look it's peeling off on the right hand side so the safety car is no longer on standby the road is clear the race continues but uh, that will have got one or two teams on their toes i think getting a bit worried for a moment there yeah so sort of prime just in case i mean it, we, we're not we're kind of halfway through this pit window so there wouldn't be any preparation for pit stops of course but they would have been kind of anticipating to get the drivers to back off a little bit save a tiny bit of fuel if they need to and just be prepared many cases but of course any communication to any safety car of course will come through over the race receiver continues on shedding bodywork as it goes flapping in the breeze so I told you they were like Catrums shedding bodywork that's possibly due a pit stop because at some point given how breezy a day it is if you were a scrutineer you'd say you need that in to put some tank tape on it or rip the bodywork off but if that flies it could go anywhere yeah. Uh, it might be that Gary Summers comes in anyway after his moment because he might want the car checking out and uh, evidence of that comes. Yes, he has. Yeah. Meantime, uh, we've got the Hoffman CGI battle going over the line. We've got Scott Mansell there coming under attack from the opposition heading down towards Cascades. So there's still a lot going on in this race, even if MJ Tech Racing has got quite a healthy lead at the moment. Indeed so. That race, and that race continues on. So there is, you can see on the inset, you can see they're actually changing the entire front section by the look of it. So there is a switch around of front bodywork. So they've got a new no section primed and ready to go. And whilst that's going on, we're still looking at this scrap that's going on for third position between GCI and Uvio. Uvio now back in front, so Barkini has now re-passed uh, Ian Wood at this point. As they now make their way up the hill towards uh, what should be quite an interesting part of this uh, race. And down here they go. So 158 looks as though it's ready to go once again. Out, out it goes. Now it's had the repair. Now Uvia has a bit more traffic to deal with here. One of them being the signature RV car. And the other one, I think, is that 107 again. I think it might well be. And he's getting boxed in here between the two of them. He's going to have to pick which car side to go. He goes with the signature RV car that's going past the other car in this uh, two-car lappery. And now to come over the crest and now up towards the right-hander. It's going to be very intriguing to see how this one plays out. Over the... Oh down towards Lodge once again. They've cleared one of the lapped cars. They are just trying to prime up the next one and hopefully get around it without too much drama. As they come back through, this should be very interesting to see. So, it's coming up to two hours and 17 minutes left in this race. So we're approaching half distance in this opening round of the Fun Cup Endurance Championship. And in terms of laps, it's 20, a 27-second lead now for MJ Tech 
Number 249 with Scott Will Abraham at the wheel. Morpheus racing in second place from 28 seconds back. And then in third place it is Ubi Hoffman's Motorsport who are in that battle with GCI racing for third and fourth. Then a further 15 seconds back is Green here. Still soldiering on with that front damage but still carrying on in fifth position. The defending champions P6 which is Team Olympian are be keen to look at their lap times because Riley Phillips should be at the wheel of that car now in car number one. He's doing a 2 minute 5.629. And so pace wise, he's not maybe as quick. Let's look at uh, where he's, if that is him at the wheel of that car. Um, no, it isn't. It's actually Chris Devell at the wheel of that car. So they're actually saving Riley Phillips for the fourth and sixth in. So Chris Devell will, might drop back a little bit here, but he's holding on as best he can to hold on to P6. I think the efforts of uh, Simon Rudd have really helped to get him as high as possible in the order before he then. Uh, decides to hand over to the two drivers who he may well argue are more better suited to get into that part of the stint than he was, than he would be. So he carries on. And no real change there. Just to call David in when he comes back. The car that stopped for its uh, new front nose section is now back out, drama free. So it's back going once again. And no real change in the order, but a change of third, sure, I think. Uh, yes, Ubi have got past GCI now and they're trying to pull away. There was a bit of a box in between two lap, lap cars at one point, but they managed to get around it without too much drama and now they've gone to uh, carry on the lead. The car ahead on the road, not on position, but the signature RV car in the Gulf Colours has got Harry Mayle at the wheel, who's a very quick Genetta Junior driver, isn't he? And that yes. car you can tell because it's kind of picked its way past this battle and he's pulling away. So it's sort of illustrating Harry Mayle's pace a little bit now that he's able to uh, clear the traffic and then make further progress. We are on two now, uh, lap 51, quarter of an hour or so away from the halfway mark. There is the aforementioned Harry Mailer in 49, and the fastest lap of the race still claimed by Will Abraham from earlier on, coming towards the end of that first stint when the fuel was coming down, but that's still the fastest car that we've had in the race. Now, people getting into a rhythm. Number one, the reigning champion's car has just got over the timing line. It's in sixth, as you look here, at what's left of Scott Mansell's car. And 97, the driver 61 is in 14th place overall right now. So that's another one that's lost quite a chunk of time from where it was early on in the race for no really discernible reason. Whether yeah. it was a long pit stop, um, I can largely put it down to that. Yeah, I, I figured out the Olympian car because they're actually up into sixth position, but I look at their running order. So Christabel's actually got back into that car for their third stint, so they're saving yeah. Riley Phillips for stints four and six when he'll be the most useful in that exactly. second half of the race. So Chris is plugging away, but I think it's actually credit to the efforts of Simon Rudd to get that car up to where it was in sixth position, because yeah. credit to Chris, because he hasn't dropped back or not made as much progress as he wanted to in that first stint, like maybe like in that first stint but he has managed to at least maintain that pace and stay in P6. He's not dropping, I don't think, no. too much right. pace to EDF and cars behind. So credit to Chris for maintaining the gap that they've got to carry on, staying where they are to give it to give Riley a car in a good enough position so that he can do his thing. Uh, one of the other elements to its relative pace, of course, is that it's got all its front bodywork intact, so it's heavier than other cars. It's yes. one of the few that's <laughs> yes. not falling apart on the right front corner, which is where most people are attacking curbs or bollards or both. But uh, yes, you're quite right, Chris Dovell back in the car. Simon Rudd will do stint five. So the next one is Riley Phillips, then it goes to Simon Rudd, then it goes back to Riley Phillips. So uh, it's kind of like using your bronze driver early on, isn't it, in international yeah. GT racing. It's uh, well thought out, that. So there is number one, the reigning champion team, but with Christian Rose standing down, Simon Rudd, Ginetta and Volkswagen Cup racer joins the uh, Team Olympian GRD team for this year and uh, Christo Bell, the man behind the wheel of the car at the moment and as Scott was saying, it's running in a good sixth place at the moment. So 13 minutes before we get to the halfway mark. Pit lane for the moment is calm and serene. Honest. But can't calm before the storm. Yeah, absolutely. The next round of stops is a coming. Safety car crew watching on from the pit lane, having thought they were about to do something a, a lap or two ago, but uh, Gary Sanders getting going again, thwarted their efforts to join the circuit. So where's our next battle going to come from? Well, as far as the lead is concerned, the MJ Tech racing car, which has gone back to Will Abraham, uh, is lapping faster than 
195, the Morpheus Motorsport car. Not by much, admittedly, but the gap is widening. There, in third place now, is the Uvio Hoffman's car. That is falling away from the top two, and it's trading tenths a lap with the uh, GCI Racing car in the hands of Craig Butterworth behind. So that's a proper fight for third place. There they are, and they've been together ever since we had the last pit stop. So these two, very, very evenly matched. Champions both, as Scott's made the point. Uh, in fifth place is the Greenheath car, which has kind of been there or thereabouts. It's, it's lost a bit of ground and it's gained a bit of ground back, but it's always been in the top six, whereas others, like the Mansells, for example, or the uh, car of Jack Constable and Russell Joyce, the Skull Club racing car, that's really dropped back. But the, the, the Greenheath car has always been there or thereabouts, to use that dreadful phrase. But it's... It's true, it's always stayed in the top six. Fairly consistent. It's yeah. solid, solid running from the two guys, Gary Bate and Paul Turner. And they are one of those teams that, you're right in the sense that they do stick around and they're in prime place to benefit if other teams have dramas, they drop yeah. out, they have issues, and they have done. They've had some great podium finishes. I've tried to think of actually won a race so far in their Fun Cup career, but they've definitely had podium finishes and lots of top fives. And it is just through solid consistently, two drivers who, I say it's the nicest way possible. They might not be the absolute fastest car drives in the field, but they are consistent and they run a good solid pace that means they can keep up there whilst other paces might fluctuate. Yeah, exactly. Quick yeah. drives in one stint, slower drivers in another. So it means that it's the point you're making earlier on, having two relatively quick and solid drivers can benefit you more than having a mixture of different skill levels in whether it's three or four if you're sharing the drive. But again, different drivers and teams have different ambitions. So Green Heath for them, I guess, will have two good solid drivers, but even they will always think it's just a good laugh and way to go racing. And just also thinking about the number of double driver uh, teams, which is now becoming the norm rather than the exception. Yeah. I seem to remember in the early days of Fun Cup, you know, you could have four, maybe on occasions five, depending on the length of the race. But has there been a shift now towards two driver crews rather than multiple drivers, or is it just... A, a, a quirk of the season. I think it's maybe more case by case in terms right, of if you look yeah. at a case for example things like you know you, you, a case point is Olympia because they were the champions they had it with three drivers and Chris is again as the three he, Chris would admit that um, he, he again he may well openly admit that he's the, the two drivers he's got alongside him Simon and Riley are faster than him but he still does a solid job but he knows that when he hands over to Riley and Simon that they'll get the job done and now two quick drivers that can get him back up there and Riley Phillips has been able to they've been set their strategies in such a way in that when they do manage to hand over to Riley he's in a position where he has like a 20 25 second gap he can just start chopping it down by a good few tenths or about a second or so per lap and bring that gap down from what was 15 20 seconds down to anything and he's made a couple of very late kind of with minutes literally minutes mm. to go moves to the lead what he's managed to make that fast to work and that's that work alongside this last year with Christian when he was at the wheel and Chris and now of course Simon doing his thing is what makes them uh, now a two-time champion team and other teams who just find that they have a pair that works or a trio that works. Mm. Because yeah, one of the, the pluses of this is the more drivers, the more you can split the costs between you. Yeah. Uh, but maybe as it's got more competitive, um, I'm not saying the fun has gone out of it, far from it. But you know, if you want to win, you need competitive drivers. You don't want anybody that's going to be four or five seconds a lap slower, do you? Because that yeah. compromises you for that 40-minute uh, window times two times three that you're going to have to put them into the car. So here, looking at traffic coming down towards his lot, 103 is for the third stint, Greg Evans. And behind, heading up the hill. Oh, off the road, look, has got oh. 99. Now that is in stint three, Andy Bicknell. And he's done barrier damage. And I would think that would be a safety car because it's going to take some moving and that tyre barrier needs work. Yeah. So I'm now to keep an eye on the end of the pit lane to watch this, the lights at the top of the uh, runyourfeet.com Jaguar safety car. That's going nowhere. You see the rear wheels were spinning a second or two ago. Driver's OK, yeah. but he's absolutely stuck. Driver's briefings were being held in the same room that we're broadcasting from this morning. And all the clerks for the different races were saying, keep off the grass. It is so wet, so muddy, so boggy. The lights are on on the safety car. That said, it's been given a shove. Fair play to the marshals. They've done a really, really good job there of getting that car mobile. But it's the barrier damage that would yeah. be the concern, I would have thought. The car is almost, almost, almost having to reverse back onto the racetrack, which isn't great. That's about heart in mouth. But the yellow flags, if the drivers are respecting them, will do the job. You can see yeah. the witness marks. He's just lost it coming out of Cascades. Yeah, there'll be barrier damage, but also the clear up of the mud and dirt and the turf that he's brought up onto the circuit as well as a result of it being pushed back. So that is going to take a bit of clear up to get it sort of race worthy again and you're right I think the concern is going to be the safety car purely for the barriers now what's also intriguing is that 
looking at the time left, yes. there's two hours, seven minutes and 37 seconds to go. This may well go into the next pit window, which yes. means that, if, and essentially, ipso facto, when it comes to pit, safety cars going into a pit window, what everyone typically tends to have is the same idea of thinking, well, I'll make a free pit stop. So I think Jamie's about to get uh, Armageddon, Armageddon in pit lane, I think, because yes. I mean, he's going to have about 23 front cup cars, all with teams and busy. That relatively quiet pit lane right now is probably going to be very well populated about roughly about seven, eight minutes' time. Yeah, <laughs> Armageddon, read Carmageddon. Oh. Now, there's another one with damage here, with now lots then. of bodywork falling underneath it. That is 210. That bodywork's going to fly if it's not careful, and that is Paul Taylor at the wheel. And that's mm. been off somewhere. Mm. Yeah, plenty of mud, mud and dirt there as well. Not much bodywork left. Uh, safety car lights are off. So we're not going to get the safety car, but we are going to get 210 into the pit lane. So again, the race looks like it's going to be OK to carry on unaffected, despite the dramas to the barriers. So uh, six and a half minutes away from the window opening. There is 210 in the pit lane with all of its damage. I did see where that went off, but it's done a proper number on that, hasn't it? Certainly has. So the good box we're going to go through and they probably will have a new front section they can put onto that car as well. On the exception should be a couple of the front section, which is a big mansion. The front section. It's going to go to its garage, of course, that's going to take a oh, mirrors hanging off. That's, yeah, that's had a proper moment, isn't it? That yeah, certainly has. That car goes backwards. I think they're going to stop the tap there. I did, I, I did initially in my head. Me, left, 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 left. For some reason, there was a connection left, 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 left. between 99 and 210, whether they possibly got together, but um, not having seen it on camera, it's more, it's more one of those, we'll let Jimmy and Floyd deal with it, if, if there was anything to deal with. Um, my suspicion possibly with, considering that the barrier possibly does maybe need some repairs, that if that's going to take place, I know that Jimmy and Floyd's going to see a bit required, it's 99, to the the awesome evidence of its excursion. Sometimes Junior Floyd likes to get a pit window out of the way so there's no one trying to take it from him. That's oh, okay. Then he'll be safe to so get allowed the barrier to be properly prepared. Oh, really? He okay. will do that sometimes to kind of to, to, to negate the whole thing of teams getting a free pit stop and kind of jumbling it and keeping it kind of predictable if everyone's going to do yeah. the same thing to keep it as competitive as possible under green flag conditions. Keep it as level as you can, yeah. yeah. So 25 seconds is the gap at the moment between MJ Tech and Morpheus. Which is coming down a fraction. Uvio Hoffmans are still third, CGI Racing fourth, Green Heath a fifth, and then Olympian GRD uh, in sixth. But actually, to get to nearly two hours of racing without any drama, I think that, that was, I preempted it slightly by saying it had been more <laughs> plain sailing, and then something happens, but that's not bad. Now, there's another car look that's looking decidedly second hand. It's the PLR. Ben Pitch car, isn't it? He's back at the wheel of it. Whoops, and another one, is that Morpheus going wide in the background? It was, coming out of Druids. So we put back into the Morpheus car, Mikey Porter, and he's trying to pick his way through the traffic in order to catch the race leader, who has gone by. But right now, the uh, car in second place, 195 Morpheus racing, 25 and a half seconds, that margin, and he's stuck in the traffic, he just can't find a way through. No, he's, he's boxed in between the uh, PLR car that was in front of him, the other piece of lap, bit of lap traffic, and unfortunately Morpheus can't find his way through. He's managed to try and go through if he can. He hasn't made it stick, well, for some particular reason. Uh, right, he's got past the PLR machine, so that's worked for him, so he's needs to put a lap on there. The other car's the Seed Data car, which has also had its own adventures at some point throughout this race. See all the dirt and turf that's been pulled up after the incident or the excursion that the 99 car had at that point. Come now for oh, the wiggle there for looks like that was for the uh, Michael Porter there. Nice to keep it on straight and narrow, and that's the 146 car skating off the race, keeps it off the barriers. Uh, and that must have been due to the reduction of any kind of front downforce they had. Of course, that it's got it's it's remnants oh, of what was a front bit. And go on, squeeze go it on, out, go push. on, you can do it, you can do it. Go on, no, you, you slow down to avoid the barrier, but then you lose the momentum yeah. and it's stuck fast. Yeah. It, spinning its wheels and as he gets a push that ain't going anywhere anytime soon oh right you know where we're heading again in the sentence <laughs> we've tried it a couple of times and we're thwarted uh, but ben pitch 
the safety car crew actually are talking to another official at the moment, but uh, race control with the bank of uh, track cameras as well as our feed downstairs will be having a look at this, right? So the teams, again, if they're on their toes, will have recognised that. Let's quickly, though, go to the pit lane. Jamie is uh, outside the 210 garage uh, in his role as a damage assessor, I think. Yeah, we've got um, Paul Taylor. He's just brought the fueled up racing car in. He's just talking to um, Paul Ellis Smith. Um, what happened, mate? Got away to Jamie. Okay, he he's, says he doesn't want to talk, which is um, completely understandable. He's not happy at all. They're currently just changing the front uh, radiator on the car. There's a lot of front end damage uh, on it. So, um, yeah, apologies. And um, I've got Paul Ellis Smith with me. Um, not, not ideal, this, is it? Uh, it's not the best start to the day, is it? Has he said what's happened? I'll let, let him calm down and we'll see. But uh, it, it happens, doesn't it? We'll see how far they can take it and see if we can get back out again for the last hour. OK, thanks a lot, Paul. Back to Scott and David. You know that. We could still win. The, uh, the, the elevated temper of said driver in that car suggests that potentially my sort of initial hunch that it wasn't something he did by himself could well be have some kind of credence to it. I, I, I hope not, but... Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's almost his, his, his kind of attitude was it wasn't something he did by himself. He was, he didn't, he, he didn't jump. He was pushed. Possibly, possibly, and waiting for something to come up to say, you know, incident between cars, X and Y under investigation. Now, you've seen Ben Pitch get out of his car. The safety car is still not on standby, if that makes any sense. Uh, so we're not suggesting the race is going to be neutralised. But you can also see uh, it was difficult for the couple of marshals at Shell to get that car off that grass with cars streaming past, so to move it, I do still feel the race would need to be neutralised. We are a gnat crotchet away from the halfway mark as race control opens the third pit window. So we're going to have a window that opens. Uh, we were discussing barrier damage a moment ago. We're now going safety car, so bang on, window three. The safety car is being deployed. There it is. So the safety car is going to venture out onto the circuit and this is where it's got to try and find a leader because if 249 pits then it's going to be a right old mess yeah it's going to be quite intriguing it's uh, but i think we i think jamie's gonna to have to prepare for uh, um he's gonna have lots of new friends in a minute because he's gonna have 23 rather big well mostly 20 22 i think front cup cars. well he's just lost one friend i think <laughs> yes. after after that um at, let's say at least 20 yes there's a, there's three or four that are scattered around in various guises so the uh, runyourfleet.com Jaguar safety car has made its way onto the circuit. And it will now um, try and find a leader. Try and find yes. a leader, which of course at the moment is MJ Tech. As I say, the window is open. And uh, we'll see how many are incumbents in terms of... Right, it's not got the leader. Get in. So, I mean, technically, you don't have to pick up the race leader. It is a nicety to try and, you know, preserve the flow of the race. Um, so it may wave by the cars that it doesn't need and pick up the leader because at the moment the one that it has picked up which is the david denier driven race logic car uh, is ninth so everybody ninth and back are being compromised because they're at the moment set to lose a lap aren't they so that needs addressing ideally yeah the car that's picked up is the race logic car so that was the car that had david denier at the wheel yeah ninth as i say yeah yeah and he will hand over to julian thomas pit stop well, the problem again here that you've got is that other people are going to come into the pits for the window but the whole order has been distorted by these cars now being badly delayed and being stacked up in, in into 249 now it could be that after the pit stops the wave by happens to get the race leader behind ready for the restart but at the moment we've got the wrong car if you like the non-leading car behind the safety car yeah, and one and one cart's in there. Right there is 195. So 195 Morpheus Motorbike in the middle of that group of cars. So they are in this initial group of cars behind the safety car. So they're the ones that at this reduced pace are possibly losing out. Right, pit pit calls are in, the leader including is in. MJ Tech. This so is going to be... That's got a free pit stop. Yeah, at least, because they're going to come back out. And then th they will go at their kind of whatever designated pace they can go at to catch up to the back of the train again. So there it is. Scott Jeffs to get back we'll in. We'll be gone, we'll be gone, don't worry. In fairness, I don't think that car would ever have caught no, the safety go, 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 car, go. would it? Because even 
the safety car hadn't picked up who it picked up. That car was so far back around the lap, it could still have come in anyway. Yeah. Um, so it kind of would need now the safety car to pick this one up for the restart. So that's Jeff's getting back go, go, in then. Slight little stumble. Yes, yes. There he goes. Give it a good refire and shove it away it goes. Uh, Rats is racing also in as well. But I imagine that this queue of cars, when it comes around, is going to make its way in. A major, uh, 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 quite a few of these cars are going to make it in pretty quickly. You can see now that there's a lot more uh, orange uh, vests and drivers suited up with helmets that are waiting for cars to come in. The Rast Racing car also heads out as the recovery vehicle goes down to, I think, also uh, recover the PLR racing car. It's a shame for PLR because they have sometimes mixed fortunes. Races where they have really good fortune, pick that steadily pick their way through, and others where they just don't have the luck and fall backwards. And that can happen to anyone, but sometimes PLR racing, they're even in contention with the championship last year, and I think a mechanical issue put them out right to the death. Uh, with some kind of a loose, loose chance, but through that last three hour race, I think the literal order of the championship changed about 4,700 times before we through those three hours because it was so so varied in how the positions changed yeah. and things like that. All right, I, I think James is about to be invaded in pit lane in a second because here they come. They've got the first three fours, including the, the leader of that group, and the next, well, practically everyone, there's the next seven, eight, nine, ten cars. They make quite a sight coming in, yes. and as you'll see in pit lane now, they make quite a sight stopping and being worked on. And the <laughs> race logic car leads the way. In. In. Yeah. And, uh, it's like Black Friday, the sales, isn't it? Everybody <laughs> st stampedes into the pit lane. Absolutely. Right, so there's 104. So we can probably just reel off the cars we're in. So GCR Racing are in, Cubio are in, Green Heat are in, Race Logic in, Axiometric, Red River Sports, Seagate, Signature RV, uh, Driver 61, Skull Cub, Wave 19.3, GM, um, EDF Motorsports, Matador. Team Summers, and then the others probably that even after uh, the two cars that are in there any anyway, which are people that are racing the Stoke Investment. So, over half the field in pit lane right now, making their uh, next man of stops to go to stick them before. Again, different mixture strategies. Some will be going for fuel at this point in time, some won't. So, some cars will be just the in, driver out, new driver in belt up, close the doors and away they go. Others will be on different fuel strategies. GCI have gone out from jump three. So that's seven gets the windscreen clean. Wave nine car. Wave nine, Mark Burton and Jason Minshaw. This will be... Put Jason back in, isn't it? Yeah. Step four. Yeah, so Mark Burton's jumped out of that one. Jason Minshaw back in. And I think I've just seen uh, Ben Pitch go past the window. Ah. So it's circulating again. So now, it's not so much the cleanup that's going to be the cause of the safety car, it's finding the, the correct race order. Indeed. If indeed that's what race control wish to do. So Gillian Floyd will uh, have a look and see what he, uh, and see what uh, he decides to do. There goes 97 cast. That's now Kevin Mansell back at the wheel. Scott's now handed over. Small task for Jamie, of course, if he's getting interviews. It might be good to hear from Scott, see how he's found his uh, first two stints back in a Fun Cup car since he last drove one at the 25 hours all those years ago. And, of course, to get uh, his uh, view of what it's like driving with his dad, because I think that's for him a, a lifelong ambition. He wants to drive in drive, the same car yeah. with his dad. Uh, I said, I remember there was a, a nice social media post he put out, which was a nice picture, I think, of him as a young kid being kind of, you know, kind of with his dad holding his hands above his head, uh, like walking whilst he's still learning to walk. And it was a nice sentimental message about he's done all sorts of motorsport, but one thing he's never, ever done, which implied he'd never had raced with his father. Third or fourth in the queue is the Morpheus Motorsport car. Mm. And that's second place. And their look coming towards us, not that one, not that one, not that one. There, the orange and white, that's the race leader. Mm. So if the order is not restored before we go racing, then the MJ Tech are going to be hard to stop because they've gained nearly a lap on everybody else under this safety car period. Mm. Essentially. But, uh, but crazy things have happened in endurance racing and fun cup racing, and they usually do. So uh, things definitely change quite a bit. But you're absolutely right. It is essentially a free pit stop and sub for MJ Tech yeah. on the safety car. And I think it's one of those situations where because there's some time, a couple of um, cars to recover, the car over and barriers to repair, that Julian Floyd was in a position where he, he kind of had no choice but to put the safety car out. But in ideal situations, as I mentioned, he prefers to do it, as far as I understand, outside of pit windows. So it means that there's not so much of a busy pit lane. It means that he keeps the race as simple as possible and it keeps it as competitive as possible. Because as, as you say, MJ Tech has got quite a large advantage now unless something happens to them touch wood which kind of eradicates that all as the race goes back underway under green flag conditions yeah i mean you've got others 
peeling off, including the Morpheus Motorsport car now. I think, in fairness to MJ Tech, they were in exactly the right place at the right time, weren't they? Because they hadn't even caught the train for the safety car. They were able to bail in as the window opened, so they really were given an, a very, very easy ride. They are going to be over a lap up, potentially, on Morpheus after this. Could end up with only that one car on the lead lap. <laughs> I can't remember the last... I don't, I'm not sure if I can remember, remember a time when we had that. What, what we really need is, uh, is Mr. Andy McEwen's vast uh, kind of annual of Fun Cup stats and statistics which he has, which is quite extensive and quite, and quite fascinating. Right, uh, to the pits while all this is going on under the safety car because uh, Jamie has been able to track down more drivers. Let's head to him right now. Yeah, we're down with Jack Constable. He's just finished his second ever stint in a Fun Cup car. Um, it's been busy, hasn't it? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've had... Well, that stint was actually slightly quieter than the first stint. The first stint, I felt like I was in a sprint race for 50 minutes. So, uh, yeah, a nice, calm, uh, get myself together and uh, enjoy it a bit more, that last stint. And it's been a while since you've done anything rear-wheel drive. Um, did you have to sort of get your head around it all again? Um, to be honest, I've been pretty happy with the car since we've we've had it. Um, it's more getting Russ up to speed and so we're not losing as much time when he's out on tracks. But, I mean, the amount that he's learned over the last couple of test days has been a, a lot. So, yeah, all good. And, of course, um, you and Russell had the bounty that if you win, you get a £10,000 prize. Um, I'm guessing probably during that stint it wasn't on your mind at all, but it's, an, uh, it's a nice thing to come into as a new team, isn't it? Oh, yeah, 100%. I mean, it looks likely that it's not going to happen now. Uh, after the first stint, it was looking a bit tasty, but, uh, yeah, it's all uh, starting to wither away a little bit. <laughs> and um, plan for the, for the rest of the race is just going to be stay out of trouble. We've seen a lot of track limit infringements. There's some, you know, cars that are going off circuit. I mean, it's so wet offline and, and, and on the grass as well. I mean, you've literally just got to get it home to the finish now, haven't you? Yeah, I mean, that was our objective for this weekend, was to come in and, and get the thing to finish. And uh, so far, it's, uh, it's holding its own. So, yeah, all good. Excellent stuff. Thanks a lot, Jack. That's uh, Jack Constable from the Skull Club Racing Team. Right, if I've got time, let's go to the other end of the pit lane and have a word with Scott Mansell. Um, because as we heard earlier, he's doing his first race uh, with his dad, um, Kevin Mansell, who's just uh, jumped in the Driver 61 car. We thought we'd give a Scott and Dave it a, a little bit of a, a bit of a break because it's been a very very busy first half of the um, opening round of the 2024 Fun Cup Endurance Championship race. So let's uh, just make our way. Of course, as usual, I'm always at the wrong end of the pit lane. So we're just uh, coming up to the garage now, and we'll see. Hopefully, if there is a driver here, uh, which sadly is is not. So let's. Um, See if I can find uh, another driver. That's a shame. Scott Mansell's nowhere to be seen. And it looks like, um, David and Scott, that all the drivers that I wanted to talk to during this uh, pit stop went, ah, Scott Mansell is here. And uh, <laughs> you're getting a cup of tea. <laughs> That was a, a busy, oh. busy stint for you. Um, the splitter is gradually, gradually disappearing now. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, it, my excuse, I haven't been in one of these cars for six years, right? So uh, my accuracy might have just gone off a little bit, tagged, uh, tagged one of the tire stacks. But um, as ever, always good fun. Lots of good battles out on track. So uh, yeah, good time. And as we said earlier, it's so lovely to have your dad out there as well. It must be a, a lovely moment seeing him driving away for the first stint. Yeah, exactly. That's what this weekend's all about to be honest I'm, I'm just happy to be here with him and and uh with the team here so yeah we're having a great time and just enjoying the weekend and as you said at the minute it's just a one-off but do you want to come back and do some more oh yeah i always want to come and back and come back and do some more i mean the racing's great isn't it the uh the atmosphere in the paddock's great and it's just a, a great weekend fantastic thanks a lot scott back to david and scott Cheers, jamie. jamie thanks very much we're still behind the safety car here at alton park with an hour and 48 minutes to go in our first Fun Cup race of the season. And as the cars turn their way out of uh, Island Bend, yellow flags fly, safety car remains on track. So the uh, cars turn up towards Britons.
Now, the safety car, am I right, is letting people go? It is. So we are going to get the race leader, at least. Uh, so the safety car crew have been told which car you need. So hopefully this will now orchestrate perfectly. No, you let him go. Let him go. Go on. Oh. That's it. Go on. And there's the race leader behind. So I think now we've got the right car behind the safety car in terms of at least the race leader. And now up into second place after that race, recent round of pit stops will be Greenheath. But depending on where that car is in the queue, I think it's going to be on the lead lap, but you're not going to have many on the lead lap. I think the one that's lost out most here, you know, is Morpheus. Because look, that's still behind the safety car. That's that's lost a lap. So it is going to be uh, MJ Tech Racing in the lead. Greenheath second, with a lot of traffic between. Third is going to be UVO Hoffman. Fourth is going to be the Olympian, Team Olympian GRD. And fifth will be 111 CGI Racing. And sixth, uh, 248, the EDF Motorsports car. Do I mean that? So that's now going to be for the fourth stint, Vlad Vasiliev. And then in seventh place will be Team Ratters. And down to eighth, Morpheus. And off the lead lap. So it's only the top six on the lead lap now. So quite a task ahead of them to try and get something back from this race, Morpheus. But again, still an hour and 45 minutes or so to go. And as we both know, anything can happen in motorsport. To use it to slightly amend an old Murray Walker quote, anything can happen in motorsport, and it usually does. So certain stranger things have happened in endurance racing. So, so there's the Morpheus car, the black and yellow car, just peeking out of shot. That's got to clear this traffic. We've got another lap under the safety car yet, though. We're not good to go racing just yet. So the safety car at a very, very slow speed, I've got to say, crawls over the line. Presumably it is going slowly in order to give the marshals more time to work on whatever they need to be doing around the circuit. But uh, as we saw for the, uh, the formation lap for the first modified Ford race earlier on in the day, it's a slow pace. So in terms of the faster cars in the mix, essentially it's one of those situations where the faster cars, to use the term, the cream has literally risen to the top throughout this first half of the race because you have got MJ Tech, who were one of the teams that I was loosely looking out for, but it seems as though that in terms of playing strategy and having that good two-driver combo, that well, here we have Scott Jeffs in the mix as well. Um, I think... We are going to get a replay just to recap what happened as to one of the reasons originally as to why we have the safety car. And that was the off that we had for the 147 PLR car. So it was heading down here towards Shellor's hairpin and just trying to get the car stopped. It's offline on the outside and just skated off the road. It managed to track its way through the gravel and it just got to a point here where on the very boggy and muddy grass it tried to kind of push its way through and got to a point where it literally did get bogged down and then essentially to a stage where just try and spin the wheels, as you'll probably see in the second, and Ben Pitch was going absolutely no further without assistance. And there was also some barrier here, which I think has now been completed by the looks of it. We well, looks though like it's relatively close to being completed, uh, if not has been, around that sort of area of, Br of Britain. Although it was on the entrance rather than the exit, so I was looking at a different part of the circuit, so pardon me. But the safety car continues to bring the pack around. Cars in the top ten that have done well. Red River Sport have done well. That's the Johnny Molan, Bonnie Grimes, and Gareth Williams car. It's Gareth Williams back at the wheel. So Johnny Molan has just actually done his first stint in the car, and that has now been sorted out. In terms of the barrier pair, it looks pretty clear now in terms of what was down there before. So it looks as though we could possibly, hopefully, in the next lap or two, get ourselves back underway to green flag conditions. Yeah, Bonnie Grimes, an example of somebody who's, you know, the the. the perfect model of what Fun Cup is about. You know, an enthusiast, successful businessman, interested in motor racing, finds a quick pro, comes and learns in this, and has raced at them all. You know, Ian Dockerell, I mentioned earlier on, another example. Uh, one of Bonamy's um, credits is that he was the or one of the producers on the Andrew Marriott, Steve McQueen, Le Mans documentary. Oh, yes. If you've not seen it, I would commend it to you. 
because uh, it's got some good stories and some good footage in it. And uh, Bonnie Grimes is one of the uh, producers of that. But yes, race, was it 2020 with Johnny Merlin at Le Mans? Uh, closed doors here, admittedly, but you know, ambition realised. And to go from this to La Sarthe in not that many years of racing is quite something. It is quite something. And it's quite an astronomic rise in certain different palettes. One minute you find yourself at Ormond Park, the next you're in the pit lane at, uh, at Le Mans. Now, there's a sight we wanted to see. Safety car lights are off, which means we are going back racing once again. We're getting chastised by our producers that we, I said La Sarfa, not Le Mans. It's like, but um, it is in the La Sarfa region. So it is the Circuit de La Sarfa. Yeah, Circuit de La Sarfa. Yeah. Theref therefore, the producer is wrong. Um, he anyway. Does, he does eSports. He never <laughs> sees a real track. This is a, this is a day out for him. <laughs> right, green flag is ready on the start line, Scott. We're about to go racing again. Indeed so. So, now, this is the task of Scott Jeffs to pull the pin and get back out going again. So, essentially, now, he's got to try and keep his momentum and essentially to use a, uh, a, a, a old ancient term, don't screw this up, essentially. Yes, exactly front. <laughs> uh, so Ulti's got an hour and 41 minutes to hold on and a couple more pit windows to hold on to this one. So there's about another 20 minutes until we get to the next pit window. As Rat is racing, making move up the inside of uh, another one of the back markers. And there is the Morpheus Motorsport car trying to pick its way through. Yeah. The first target to get past on track is the 97 Driver 61 car, which is now got Kevin Mansell at the wheel. And I think that's Ted Bradwick the world because he's uh, not doing anything by halves. He was picking his way around the outside. Absolutely. He's absolutely flying. And who do we who have we got in the lead car at the moment? In 2.49, it is going to be Scott Jeffs, isn't it? Yes. So Bradbury really has got to try and catch and pass that lead car to put himself back on the lead lap. If he's on the lead lap, suddenly it's a different race. And you can see Ted Bradbury almost being squeezed onto the dirt there. He's on a mission. Doesn't care who's ahead of him. He's just got to get past, go after the race leader. Squeezes up the inside there. Look of 1.55 as he tries to get past Peter Ratcliffe and he can't and Ratcliffe is now delaying him now frustratingly this is for position but it's frustrating for Morpheus because they're kind of out of sequence if they can clear Ratcliffe who's doing nothing wrong he's defending his place as he's perfectly entitled to be but that Morpheus car wants to get on with the program and unlap itself and now to the inside line goes Ted Bradbury down towards his lops I think he's going to do it because there was a gap yes Peter Ratcliffe didn't make life overly difficult so the Morpheus car goes through Ted Bradbury is on a mission with a capital M and underlined in bold red ink. Indeed. And the next car in front of him, ironically, is an EDF car, but it's not the one he wants. It's the other car in the mix. It's the uh, 104 EDF Motorsport for hire car, but it's not the 246 machine, which he needs to get past to get another point. There is the other EDF car in front. There is Morpheus. There is Rass's Racing. And then the Seed Data car, which is only a couple of cars back, it's there in ninth position ahead of Red River Sport now. Now that it's had its stint from Johnny Moe at the wheel of that car which has been put in and now Gareth Williams is back behind it once again for his second run in this stint. So Scott Jeffs has just gone through as the race leader and Ted Bradbury comes in the Morpheus car across the line. You can see him in the background look trying to pick his way through the traffic. Comes up alongside 104 Victor Cara. Good battle going on ahead. And they managed to do that side by side without any contact at all. Bradbury is a man inspired at the moment, isn't he? he as I say, he was a sensation in Mazda McSize last year. And of course, even his first stint when he raced in a Fun Cup car last year at Donington Park, he was absolutely on it. He's a genuine find in club racing yeah, yeah, in terms of young yeah. talents. He's come up, he's come up through karting. And again, the fact that that story came through is he powers his way past a car which he was battling, his car was battling for the lead in the first stint of the race, the Skull Cup car. And Look Ooh, at that. And that was forced well, that that's was elbows out against Axiometrics. But, but no contact. That's take no prisoners, hard racing, trust in the people you're racing with to give you the room. And he knows what he's got to do and he's just doing it. This yeah. is a really, really impressive stint. And the key thing as well, in many cases, in order to get himself back into the place he wants to be as best as possible, he has to go for moves like that. Yeah, Obviously absolutely. calculated, but he has to keep going and be oh. forceful. You can tell the way he's just thumping the curves in that one. Up still in seventh position. And he's got to try and make him as much a gap as he can on EDF Motorsport in front. So he's just picking off cars left, right and centre because he knows he has to get his head down for the rest of this stint while he hands it over to Mikey Porter, who, as we know, isn't a slow driver. Um, but in terms of that, Mikey will do his bit. But he wants to do his part in the partnership in that side to be in the car best possible position. We've had a change for third place. Sorry to interrupt you, Scott. But number one, have a look, uh, has now, that's Riley Phillips, yes. for the first time, jumped ahead of the Uvio Hoffman's car. So... Had a change there. We've not seen Riley Phillips in the race thus far. He's been saved to the end, and you can understand why because he also now 
is in a big, big hurry, and he's closing up onto the Greenheath car, uh, which has gone back to Gary Bate. There it is, the sort of brawn Formula One livery of the white and yellow. Uh, so you've got that battle building up quite nicely. The leader comes over the line, so through has just gone Scott Jeffs, and that last lap uh, was a two minutes 1.9. Where's a Morpheus lap? Uh, across the line has just gone Ted Bradbury, and he's done a two minutes 1.4. So he's lapping quicker than the leader, but not demonstrably, not enough to, to e easily put him on the lead lap. Yeah, but he's certainly making a point that uh, had the race kind of gone more in his favour, that he would certainly be in the mix there to trouble. MJ Tech and Co. Uh, this lot might not necessarily all be fighting for position as that was Jig Greenheath into the side of driver 61. Kevin Mansell gets a shove from the 14 car. The defending champions now in the mix and now they've got, uh, well that's Riley Phillips now with, that will be Fabio behind them. Yeah, Fabio back behind the wheel now. He might get the push but now Greenheath's again, lost out two places haven't they? They have. They've been shuffled down from second down to, yes, it's now Olympian into second place and of course that now with Ryan now in the second half of the race as I mentioned, he's now kind of their, their, their ace in the hole of that squad. Again, as I said before, a couple of drives he's put in, he just puts his foot down, it's just literally grip, grip and go, and he's absolutely on it. And he's doing it again and even from this stint. And he's just like Bradbury. He will pick his way through and find and just put in lap times. So you look at it, you think, how much? Yeah. Like, that's just, he puts in some fantastic stints as he did do last year. And he's carrying on as, as he meant to pick up from in 2023. He's the kind of gun for hire, isn't he? Uh, comes up on the inside then, working his way through the traffic. So number one there, Riley Phillips goes through. So he's up into second place in the race. And not only, of course, is he carving his way through these back markers, but as soon as he gets clear real estate, his lap times may well mm. be quicker than the race leader. So we've, uh, we may have lost Morpheus from the lead battle, but we've got a different lead battle shaping up. Ooh, that was, uh, I think that's the, the, the PLR car, which is trying to pick its way through, uh, back past and unlap itself from several cars in the mix. I think that was the, it was Greenheath in Driver 61 going wheel to wheel again and possibly bumping fenders. And then the PLR race knock on the door saying, hello, can I come and get a lap back please? And kind of it, make itself a nuisance when it doesn't mean to be and just on the pace. There is one back marker only between the lead car and Morpheus Motorsport. The way that Ted Bradbury is going, I still think he can get his, his lap back here. Uh, you're looking at what's going on for now second place. Number one goes through. So the lead gap is 15 and a half seconds. That's the one to monitor. The two behind are a lap down. So third is the Uvia Hoffman's motorsport car, the black and gold car. In fourth place then is Greenheath. In fifth is CGI. And up into sixth place, 246, which we've got Vlad Vasiliev behind the wheel of. So Morpheus is your first one that's a lap down. In other words, the first one that's not on the lead lap, but is... Uh, attacking and its last lap time just by way of a guide uh, was a two minutes 1.4 another three tenths pull back so little by little by little he is creeping up onto the tail of the leader to try to unwrap himself yeah and all it takes is another safety car to bring him right back into it because of course if he's on the same lap as MJ he gets lucky with the safety car brings him right back into contention as long as he's unlapped himself. Yes. yes. If the yes. safety car comes while he's still behind, he's <laughs> yes, snooker. Yeah. And he's kind of got to get this done before the next pit window opens. So that's the pressure, yeah. because when the pit stops happen, uh, you can get yourself shuffled out of the order. Depending on whether you go for a long or a short stop, they'd be advised, really, Oops. if they can, to do a short stop to make sure they're on the lead lap. Yeah, just quickly, there was PLR running a little deep there in the exit of Britain chicane. As you see there, the exit, that was uh, Olympian squeezing past Gold Club. So that will be him getting past Russell Joyce, who's Kind of getting stuck in between amongst two champion cars now. Fabio Randacci wants to try and pick his way past Uvio Hoffman's motorsport, or pick his way past also in the Uvio Hoffman's car, I should mention. And the 97 car also in there too. He's still scrapping. And again, every bunch together, in, it might be for position or not, they're all going off into little packs of two and three, which is quite fun. Now, that is a significant sight because that is Bradbury, who's passed the back marker, who's his next target now, is to try and catch up to the MJ Tech car. We can compare lap times here. So MJ Tech's last lap going across the line just now was a 2.01.557. Morpheus does a 2.01.547. So they're literally on exactly the same pace. But some of the time lost there because of traffic. So now, yes. clear road ahead. This is going to be a better indication, I think, of Ted Bradbury's pace. And if the team are on the radio saying, that car ahead of you is the one you're chasing to get your lap back. That's even more motivation. I've got to say, given how much traffic he's had to get through, I think this has been a ripper job by Ted Bradbury because, you know, he, he could have just faded away, if you like. He could have just yeah. got stuck, but he hasn't. He's worked his way through and actually gives a toe to the traffic here, but he is certainly chasing after 
uh, Scott Jeffs, isn't it? We've put back into the lead car. Mm. I think I'm right in saying. Uh, and he's certainly not giving up. So another few more laps, and he's going to be a bit closer still. It's been a really good recovery. I hope you'll agree with me. But if he keeps up this rate, I would like to see what he can do if he progresses that far in a GT car. Yeah. In the future, because if this is what he can do in Fun Cup, in spec endurance racing, yeah, yeah, yeah. give him a good, let's say, GT4 at least to start off with. And I reckon he could be, again, to use Otto, he could be Ripper when he gets to that point, in particular if he goes to British GT or European level. Well, Mikey Porter, we got excited about justifiably two weeks ago for winning in GT4. Yeah. And here's somebody that's as quick, if not quicker. So, yes, there's no reason to suggest that he wouldn't be an asset. Comes down through the Hislop chicane. Now, the race leader, we've been talking about doing two minute ones. The car that's chasing was two minute two last time. Uh, there were two chases going on. There's this chase from Morpheus to unlap itself. There's the leader. It's coming down, isn't it? Even to the eye, it's coming down that gap. Uh, but the second place in the race car uh, is not catching quite as rapidly. No. Now, the gap between the actual first and second place cars, so that's Olympian back in second, even though Riley ain't a slow driver, but again, I think you're right. He's probably getting caught up in one or two bits of, one or two bits of traffic that's going on. Uh, him to try and pick his way through if he can. But Olympian possibly getting, Riley I think probably getting caught up in too much traffic to his liking that's yeah. affecting his pace at this point. Whereas Bradbury, of course, doesn't have that issue and he's now got plenty of clear track. Let's look at lap time quickly. And Morpheus is a, he's four tenths quicker on that lap. It was yeah. MJ Tech 20203 compared to Morpheus 201.6. So four tenths up or, uh, made up on him in terms of on track position. He's still got a way to go to pick up and he's got just over 10 minutes and a bit of change before they make their stops to close that gap in to be able to unlap himself. But in many cases as well, thinking about it, if you're MG Tech, you get, yes, yes, it's a, a lapped car, but are you going to let him through that easy? No, no. probably not. But equally, you don't want to get involved in an accident. If you've got somebody like Scrappy Do trying to find a way past you, uh, then you'd be advised to let him go and not delay yourself, wouldn't you, really? It, I, it wouldn't surprise me if maybe MJ Tech, even though it might be a bit naughty, if they make it a little more difficult to get past, mm. not sort of holding them up, but kind of just make it a little more kind of, of a headache to get through than the normal, but ultimately we'll see. But Ted Bradbury's racecraft suggests he'll just take that in his stride and <laughs> say, oh, that was you being difficult, was it? Because he's, he's made short work of everybody else. He's been brought up in the world of Master MX-5s, don't you know? He's been kind of just... Uh, getting used to racecraft in that sense. So he's kind of applying his Master MX-5 yeah. racecraft skills that he's learnt there to pick his way through Fun Cup Endurance Packs. Now here's second and third with traffic between the two. Second is number one. Third is the black and gold car there working its way through the traffic. So this is for second in the race. And at the moment, Riley Phillips, having worked his way through the traffic, is sort of being caught back up again, isn't he, by the uh, Uvio Hoffman's car. They're going up towards Druids, looking out of the window, ready for the race leaders to come by, because in a moment, past the pits, is going to come the leader, Scott Jeffs. And he's still being chased by Morpheus Motorsport. So the leader goes over the timing line, down towards Old Hall Corner, as you look at the fight for second place. And on the road, 6.36 seconds is what separates the leader from the car that's chasing it to get its lap back. Yeah, and on that lap, it was MJ Tech were better by two tenths, so they've actually lost a couple. Of, Ted's lost a couple of tenths to MJ Tech rather than the other way around. So it looks as though, in terms of pace, he's kind of meeting his match at the moment, and that was even with yeah. a lap he had in, in clear air, essentially. So it's both of them have a clear air now, and they're lapping relatively at the same sort of pace. It's what, what he needs is for Scott Jeffs to start getting held up by traffic that might be ahead, ahead of him a few cars up the road to try and lose him a bit more time. But at the moment, you yeah. need to kind of see on the track or exactly when he comes through who he's got ahead of him and how much of a headache they're going to prove. The thing is, though, after a safety car period, everybody's caught back up. So you've got one long line. It's going to take a long time for that to spread out again. Uh, it might depend a little bit on when they do the pit stops. To a degree, you think, well, would Morpheus be advised to come in early at the start of the window when the pit lane is quiet and then buy places as everybody else pits or leave it to the end, let everybody else pit, get a clear road and try and put in some qualifying laps that's the, that's the dilemma. And maximise Ted's stint behind exactly. the middle top of that yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's th that's, that's the dilemma that uh, Morpheus <laughs> Racing now has. That's why we're not team managers. <laughs> yeah, <you see? laughs> I've, I've, I don't know what the answer is. I've played my fair show Grand Prix World on the PC, thank you Oh, much. sorry, I'll do you, an, I'll do you a disservice. <laughs> I'll do you a disservice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, more important matters. Race leaders still continue on, and they're, they're in turn pulling away from 
Riley Phillips, yeah. who's got his own... He's got past the 103 car on that, and he's got Uvia behind to keep one eye on at least as well. Their gap is 1.2 seconds at this point. Do you think a call has gone to Scott Jeffs to say, if you can up your pace, do it? Partly because of Riley Phillips in second place, possibly also because of Morpheus, but it just seems, and you were touching on this, over the last couple of laps, that car's looking a bit racier, looking a bit quicker. Mm. Yeah. I wonder whether he's been given the hurry up. Yeah. See what my gap is again between him and the back markers. Yeah, you've got the it's 6.3, 6.8. I, it's, it's a very unofficial effort to time it out of the window, I promise you. But uh, I, I just think that the lead car is just picking up its pace a little bit. That last lap was a 2 minutes 1.4. Morpheus, 2 minutes 1.7. Yeah, it's, it's advantage race leader again, isn't it? Yeah, and then maybe you're right. Maybe on the radio they have gone to him. Right, here's the situation. The car behind you is someone who's trying to unlap you hmm. that you are racing. Just if you wouldn't mind, just give us a bit more pace and try and imp yeah, yeah, push yeah. it a little bit. And Scott Jeffs, of course, experienced hand himself. He's got obviously a ton more experience of what he's raced compared to Ted Bradley having only a year in cards. But even so, it's, it's, it's youthful exuberance against the experience. And at the moment, the experience is winning at the moment. But of course, it means that Ted could probably pull a, a storming lap out of the bag somewhere. But uh, I imagine in terms of trying to get a lap back, get themselves in that best possible position, there's mm. probably some calculations going on down at Morpheus thinking, what do we do? True enough, as you look at the Greenheath car there in the middle of that uh, trio, trying to unlap its, or sorry, trying to lap 155, the car of Peter Ratcliffe. For Greenheath at the moment, it's uh, Gary Bate. And he's a bit stuck as the car's come out of Shell Oil's corner. Down to the chicane. And race leader currently on lap 72, still with over an hour and a half to go. Uh, we've got two more stints still to come. So one more round of pit stops. Down towards his locks comes Gary Bates in the Greenheath car, wriggles up on the inside line. So again, we've got a sort of calm before the storm situation now. The pit lane is quite uh, quiet, quite quiet. Bodywork lying on the road. And the race leader is about to emerge from Deer Leap once more. So through, you're looking admittedly at uh, Nicker Brook, but over the timing line now, Druids, you're looking at over the timing line has just gone the race leader. The Morpheus entry is chasing on behind. I've not put the watch on it this time. Uh, but to the eye, Morpheus looking closer on the road. What does the lap time suggest? H half a second better. Ah, OK. Two minutes, 2.0 for MJ Tech. Two minutes, 1.5 for Morpheus, so Bradbury's turned the wick up a little bit. I'm not sure what we're causing to be a little bit slower, because we didn't think that was any traffic, so he was just pushing a tiny bit and making a mishap or two, but it was advantage Bradbury and Morpheus on that lap in terms of in terms of gaps. That's probably come down okay. to about roughly six and a bit seconds. And if the team six. then say to Ted Bradbury, right, you're on it, you're half a second quicker, that inspires him to be six turns quicker on the next lap, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, incentive. Know? Whoa, that was a wiggle. That was, I think that was 246, I think, next team. That was going, if I get my identification right, he was, 246 on the exit of Old Hall. Let's keep it straight in line. If I'm rather bemused Rass is racing watching that happen. Um, I'm also going to keep an eye on that battle for second place, current se current battle for second place, which is between Olympia and Uvia. It's still within about a second or so between the two of them. So that hasn't changed. Um, How's CGI getting on? Because they were up with Uvio in that previous stint, but haven't been able to claw back lost time, have they? And in the car at the moment is Craig Butterworth, who yeah. was quick in his first stint. The last lap time for him was a 2.03.2, .2, and that's compared to a 2.021 for Olympian, that was a Riley Phillips, and a 2.016 for Randaccio. So at the moment, out of those trios, it's out of the battle for second, it's more pace-wise advantage UVO. And GCI racing is sort of just steadily falling, dropping back a little bit further and further. The gap between them and Uvio in second, third position is now currently about eight seconds, and that's kind of going out by a bit more lap by lap and losing a bit of time. So, of course, as Morpheus is closing on the leader to try to unlap itself, it's also closing on EDF for sixth place, isn't it? Uh, it is. The leader is coming over the line. And I didn't have my stopwatch in my hand, so I shall find a different timing point. It, it looks closer. That looks like there. that. It does look closer, you're right. Three seconds, four seconds, not by Oof. much. Right, so a 2.0.9. So a 2.0.1.4 for MJ Tech, but I think Bradbury has been given the hurry out. He pumps in a 2.0.1.1. So right. another three tenths taken out of the on track gap between the two of them. You can see visibly there yeah. as 2.4.6 went out of shot, Bradbury came.
climbing over the hill down down through Cascades. And 246, which is the car for position that he's chasing, has just gone down towards Old Hall, trying to get through the traffic, but also 246 is on the back of number 14, the Greenheath entry. So there's quite a lot still to look for in this, isn't there? Yeah, there is. And of course, that's also a, another odd track position battle for fifth. So that's now fifth yeah, and sixth right. there scrapping, yeah. as, as, as you're right for the same. So there are on-track stuff going on for second and third. GCI in a bit of no man's land in fourth. There's that battle we just mentioned of fifth. And then behind that, we'll wait and see if there's any more battles in terms of that are quite close. The cars that are a lap down, one of the closest battles could well be Seed Data versus Ratters racing for eighth and ninth. There's only about just under two seconds between them. So Seed Data 214 in this fourth stick currently has Matt Hogg. And 155 Ratters racing currently has... Peter Ratcliffe at the wheel. So at the moment, pace-wise, it is advantage to Rass's racing. So Peter Ratcliffe uh, is doing the business to try and close that gap into eighth position. So again, it's like the accordion effect. They all spread out a little bit, but now through that pit stop window, we'll start just to close back up together again until we get some battles are forming. We've still got an hour and 20 minutes to go as we go towards that fourth of that penultimate pit window. Still two more to go. So heading up the hill, the second and third place cars go through and another driving standards flag is being fluttered in the general direction of Jason Minshaw, 207. Lead car has just come up towards the line, so we'll have a look at the lap time in a second. We'll have a look at the stopwatch as well, as in towards Old Hall Corner goes the leader. And again, to the eye, you've got to say the Morpheus car is looking much, much closer. Yep. I reckon that's another three or four tenths pullback. Make it six. Really? Six tenths. It okay. Was 202.1 for MJ Tech, 201.5 for Bradbury. There's your fight for second. Riley Phillips aboard number one. The UVO Hoffman's car behind. And they in turn are clear of 111 Craig Butterworth. And in fifth place is Greenheath, which is the Gary Bate entry. And then sixth is 246, currently being hustled along by Vlad Vasiliev. And there, for second place, the side-by-side. -side. So the fourth pit window has just opened. And up the inside line goes the Hoffman's motorsport car. And that's for second place, and that's the job done. Right, now we need to see what the leader does relative to Morpheus and whether on the pit stops they can get themselves back on the lead lap. Yeah. Classy move from Rabio. <laughs> Riley's not done. He's going back on the inside on the exit from Shell Oils and now tucked underneath the rear wing of the... Give you a half motorsport car. They're going to filter down towards Britain chicane here, nose to tail, in front of uh, I think that's the Wave Nine car that they're just in front of, which has been given, I think, the uh, track limits warning car, uh, but flag, I should say. There's GCI back in fourth position. It's still some uh, 11 seconds back now, so they've lost a bit more time during this stint. The gap was only about eight or nine, but they've lost about two or three seconds in the space of two or three laps. I thought there was either something like a piece of rubber, a bit of body that was coming off the 103 car, but I might have been seeing things. There's Greenheath, and they're on track battle for position. Fifth and sixth between yeah. themselves and EDF. And we've got the top six who are all on the lead lap together, which is fascinating. And they're all second and third, and fifth and sixth are battling amongst each other. So really, the anomalies here are first and fourth because they're so far far reaching from the cars that are around them. It's still not over for second place because Phillips now has the good run exiting through Druids. Keeps the pressure on down towards Lodge Corner. And still trying to make his way through as uh, David gets to stop watch out again. I'll go through that time in a second. OK, so coming out of Old Hall, I would offer you 5.3 seconds between the top two. It's coming down still a little, but not, not enough, I don't think. Yeah. Second and third there across the line. And Riley Phillips in number one. He's going to make a late send. Is he up the inside? No, thinks better of it. Just applying the pressure to the Uvio Hoffman's car. And one in trouble is 157, which has slowed down coming out of... Nick and Brooke, I reckon that's been up the escape road at his locks looking at it, and that would be Rob Croydon at the wheel, would it not? Has that got some damage? Is it a bit, a bit crab-like? Uh, Maybe it's the old eyes. I, it did look a little bit. I'm sure there was one or two cars I saw. It was just the angle of how oh. they were going down the straight where they looked they were grabbing a tiny bit. It might have been the suspension stuff, but it looked, it looked okay there. That's sort of less so. That's the 98 car that's, again, sort of the latest car to start trying to undress itself. Frayed, I think, is, <laughs> is a word. Fraught, there could be another one. So. On the frayed side, yes. <laughs> uh, right, so the fourth of our five pit windows is open, and we've got cars bailing, but Morpheus didn't. I wonder whether they are going to hold it to the very, very end of the window and hope that they can do a short stop and, 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 and undercut 249 and get back onto the lead lap. 
we shall see. This is for second place. They, they're holding each other up in doing this, aren't they? They are. But uh, because the, it's interesting, the more time they spend finding each other, the easier it is for MJ Tech to carry on making a break, <laughs> but also for uh, for uh, the cars behind. I'm just laughing because there's some skullduggery going on between David and one of our producers in the back, and just making me giggle. So, uh, uh, but. Um, but <laughs> whilst well, that goes on. Uh, yes. <laughs> so 20 and a half seconds, but the, the longer these two squabble, mm. the, the slower the lap time's going to be, and the more that's playing into the hands of MJ Tech. I'm not suggesting they can work together, because they both want to be second, they both want to be in the box seat. The leader has just come across the line, and Morpheus has just come across the line as well. Back to the stopwatch then. 5.3 last time. Should be down by another three tenths because it was 2.0.1.6 for MJ Tech, 2.0.1.3 for Morpheus. Yeah, go along with that. It's backed up by the stopwatch, so yeah. And here's second and third. So 20 and a half seconds was the gap first and second last time, and the gap now is 21 seconds. So they're, they're losing time to the race leaders, largely by squabbling. In fourth place, still the CGI car. Sorry, GCI wrong way around <laughs> it's not a simulated car is it uh, GCI then Greenheath then EDF and Uvio Hoffman's having a look it's rather hard I wonder if the regulations have a, a prize for a car that's intact by the end because there aren't many there are a few but there aren't that many uh, that have the front as the car constructors intended them so second and third uh, coming out of Island Bend this current pit window is open we just had 104 come in which is Victor Cara to give back to Adam Cunnington and also in at the Mansell so that's dad to lad they've just come in second and third you're looking at then coming out of Britain's and a little bit ragged there was Riley Phillips then as he just ran a touch wide towards the curb in fourth place there is the GCI car and fifth, not that far behind, look, it's Greenheath, and they're taking EDF with them. So fourth, fifth, sixth, they're bunching up quite nicely. Seems to be. With an hour and a quarter to go, yeah. There's GCI. But yeah, this is the GCI have been losing a lot of time in these last few laps because they were some seven or eight seconds. They lost about three mm. seconds in a handful of laps, and now they've lost even more to the point where they are, you're right, falling into the clutches of Greenheath, yeah. who, even with the damage, are quite on it in this fourth stint. And Craig Butterworth was good in his earlier stint, which makes me wonder what's going on. The lead car is across the line, as you look at second and third. The Morpheus car is across the line, so the leader has done a 2 minutes 1.7, Morpheus has done a 2 minutes 1.6. Not much of a gain on that lap. Second and third, though, still absolutely together. So Riley Phillips hanging on to his place. The Team Olympian GRD car with Uvio Hoffman's right up behind. Pit boards going out to teams to say in, in, in. These cars central seat, which makes the pit stops, of course, that little bit easier. Out one side, in the other. And absolutely nose to tail after 77 laps of racing. Good advert for Fun Cut, this. Indeed. I was going to actually mention as well, if you're... Happy to be watching via the new Fun Cup website, funcup.co.uk. You can be watching the race on the front page, but you can also go ahead and uh, go ahead and uh, also uh, check out cars for sale and information about teams, etc., and everything else on top of that. And uh, do get do get that. You can see why this champion's had quite a bit of growth. As that was Riley Phillips getting around the 158 car and risking life and limb to do so, around the outside and almost touching the rather wet grass, which would have probably sent him spinning like a top if he'd done so, but <laughs> yeah. uh, carries on, still with Uvio and Radaccio right behind him as they head on towards Britons and then Hilltop, still as it was as we come towards already into the pit window, and it's not as frantic as it was the last one, everyone's kind of trickling in bit by bit in this pit window rather than the mass uh, invasion yes. of pit lane from everyone in the safety car. But I think now they're trying to work out, they're trying to reverse engineer the last two stints, aren't they? So if we want to be good at the end, what do we do in that stop? And this, as for second and third, the dog-eared number one of Riley Phillips fends off the <coughs> dog-eared 225 of Uvio Hoffman's Motorsport. We have the race leader, therefore, coming towards Lodge Corner up towards the end of another lap as second and third charge on. They're not losing that much, you know, despite the battle that they're having. Looking out of our window, I'm waiting to see if the leader is due in. Well, not this time. They leave it late, don't they, normally? MJ Tech Racing to the end of a window. They so do. Through the car has gone, and it will be uh, back to Will Abram for stint five. Right, interesting. A couple of um, messages have had through from 
Ah, this is interesting. I've got two messages from Jamie. One for an issue for a car that's had, and also explain something as to why Morpheus might be behind. So, the 14 car, which is Greenheath, have had an issue connecting the fuel churn, I think, on their most recent stop, which means that they just, they just made a pit stop, which I think they have. They've had an issue connecting the fuel churn on that one, so that's the reason why they've gone out a little bit. The two leaders are coming out, out of Old Hall just as they've got a, one of the back markers coming out of the pit lane just in front of them, and it immediately jumps out of the way, getting the fright of his life, thinking there's two faster cars. And it's the Skull Club car, ironically, so that is uh, Jack Constable getting out of the way of the two leading cars, positions in which he would have been fighting for right at the beginning of the race. Um, but the other one which is interesting is that he says that Jamie Pitlay says that 195 Morpheus has had radio issues which is what cost them a lap so in, what, in terms of pitting when they wanted to pit when they should have done and maybe the miscommunication meant that they couldn't for some reason which is interesting As the, so that probably explains why Morpheus is back down in 7th where it is when it is on literally leader pace at this point um, well now interesting look at the gaps now Last lap time for the two cars that we're focusing on in terms of on track, MJ Tech and Morpheus. So MJ Tech did a 2 minute 1.407. You can tell that Tip Bradby really is pushing, particularly at the end of this pit window. He's now onto a 2 minutes 0.819. Took another six tenths out of the leader. As off the road's got 158, so that's not the first time they've been in strife, but that's the uh, 158 car off the road and trying to pick its way, and literally spin its way through the boggy, gra boggy grass. And that's off that, I think, off the EU Island Bend by the looks of things. I think so. It's uh, a good yes. Favourite place, hasn't it? Yes. And Boggy Grass, well known local folk band, didn't they? <laughs> I lie. For credit where credit's due, he didn't sort of do the whole tactic of spin the. No, no, no. He got all spin the wheels. He gently just caressed it back onto the circuit, and away it goes. So, Olympian then still holding onto this gap between itself and Ubi as they come down towards the end of the pit window. Still the Skull Club, Skull Club car just behind it. And we're now back into the pit window. Uh, no movement from any of the leaders just yet. Uh, again, waiting for MJ Tech and for Morpheus to come through and see what they can do lap time-wise. Yeah, they were 400s down on the leader last time, Morpheus. Uh, what they could do with now is uh, making sure that when the leader pits, it's quite busy around it and people are in the way, you know, because just a handful of seconds lost there is enough to trip you back onto the lead lap. They somehow desperately need to get that undercut on the pit stop now, don't they? Uh, so the, the gap was coming down and down. Now pit window four is closed and first, second, third have not been in mm. and Morpheus has not been in, has it? So no. they, they're all going to have to come in on this next lap. Yes, or at least after they've passed the pit board once to be mentioned. Mm. So they'll pass it once and then once they've done that, they can carry on, but they must pit it at the end of that lap after they pass the pit window board. Otherwise they will incur a rather severe slap on the wrist from Julian Floyd and get a penalty. That's back the second, making its way past 157 again. That's the Deep Grace GMR Eco car, which currently has at the moment Rob Croydon at the wheel. So he'll hand back over to Grace Mitchell for her last stint of the day. And the next car they're going to try and put a lap on now. I was trying to figure it out. That, oh, that's the Red River Sport car. That's the Johnny Molan, Bonamy Grimes, and Gareth Williams car. And that will be, for this current stint, uh, Gareth Williams at the wheel which means that he'll be handing over to Bonamy Grimes for his second stint. There is the 200 car, Red River Sport. I was trying to work out what kind of retro livery that was maybe kind of inspired by. It's got like a retro kind of like a... It's, it's not really golf colours, but it's something si similar or something else. But maybe I'm sort of thinking about something else and thinking about other things. <laughs> uh, one moment. He's thinking one moment just I've to calculate, just calculate something. No, no, I've got, uh, no, I've got an idea about the livery. Ah, he's got an idea about the livery. He's going to have a hunt for that one. Uh, right, into the pit lane comes Morpheus. This is the key one then. So Morpheus in for their uh, second to last stop. Bradbury then is going to hand back over to Mikey Porter. So let's see what they do and if they've got fuel or not waiting. Look, there is a fuel churn in one of the mechanics' hands, which suggests they are going to fuel. I wonder if they're going to fuel possibly to make sure they can maybe get to the end of the race. Or if so <laughs> Ted Bradbury literally gets. He gets the Centura treatment, literally gets, <laughs> we're not throwing, he was literally dragged out of the car. I watched it happen, one side. Mikey Porter is waiting imminently to get in, so that he will get in to uh, get in, and it does so. I think they only took one churn of fuel, I think. I'm sure as Jamie's listening on our sort of uh, comms system to, from comms down to him, he went to check it, but it looked like it was only one churn of fuel. So, whether it's enough for them to get through, and he just also told me that Greenheath have double fueled. And that could be crucial, particularly in their fight for fifth and sixth position. If they want to get also gather any time on the, the fourth place car of GCI racing in front of them as well. So that could be an interesting development if they're now essentially going to go to the end on fuel 
and all we need to do is a quick driver change for the last one. Uh, now, 207 has been given a five second stop and going penalty. Possibly track, I would suggest for track limits. They were the team that got this morning earlier on, which was wave nine. So that is currently the moment. Jason Minshaw, who was uh, given wave nine, his team, team a five second penalty. So, slap on the wrist for Jason for that one. Hour and seven minutes to go. So, we're back to the seven and a half minutes or so until the pit window closes here. And this has already closed, in fact. So, of course, the cars that should be coming in, who have we offered to come in, should be coming, if not, they have done already, and we've missed it. But, um, so, let's see. There is the race leaders. 22.7 seconds to the good for them. And I think we can now hand down to Jamie, who's got another interview for a standing pit lane. What have we got, Jamie? Oh, I was getting the signal to what the bike throw down, but... Uh, no, I, was, I, I, I missed it, the hand signals for some reason. Leader in, <clears throat> so 249 down the pit road. Uh, this is the Scott Jeffs about to become Will Abraham again lead car. And what Morpheus needs is for this to be a, a slow pit stop. So you can just about see the white car in the pit lane as the uh, signature RV entry sets off down the pit lane. Uvio are in as well. Great hates, this what we said. Right, well, Abram is in. Door is closed. Driver's trapped in. Give the car a shove, and away they go. So that's the leader back into the race. And number one, the Team Olympian car has stayed second on the pit stops ahead of the Uvio Hoffman's car. So, looks as though in that sense, in terms of the pit stops, that Olympian have gained a bit of time. And of course, now this mm. is Riley Phillips out and Simon Rudd in for his second stop. So it's now been simply these last three stints. It's Riley, then Simon, then Riley again. So Riley's only going to get a, uh, a brief rest. And other teams where they have three drivers it's usually the same sequence first second third, third fourth fifth sixth Ronnie is, kind of gets a, a quick breather of this kind of 30 40 minutes and he has to get back in and finish the job and in theory what they would probably be advised to do is make this next stint a short one so they can get him back in the car sooner yes and um, it might only be three or four laps but that's three or four laps that you need his pace for yeah as it pits him right at the beginning of that final pit yeah. so you maximize his drive time yeah absolutely Indeed. right yeah 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 right so <clears throat> mtech lead and Morpheus, we still need to double check, but I haven't yet worked out that they've got the lap back. I don't think they were able to do it on the pit stops, but we'll see next time they come across the line. There's Uvio going past. That's fueled up racing, I think. Still with some of the uh, the sort of indicators of it's off earlier on. With it's still got a uh, rather muddy left hand side of the car. It's 210 going past. That's right. And there is. Oh dear, damage suspension there. Ooh, yeah, that, that definitely is crabbing. 104 it is that you can see, uh, which has now got Adam Cunnington at the wheel. Yeah. I, I, not that it's the time to give praise, but fair play to him for driving it how he is and not falling foul of anything because he's certainly getting there. That. It's a bit like watching a drift car, really, in a sense, but without the smoke. But yeah. I, I rather fear that's done for the day. How yeah. that has happened, discuss. Mm. I think the big question I ask is did he jump or was he pushed? Did he do it by himself or did he get some help? And, Using content like that, not to be churlish too much, but that's uh, that's usually not something that's done, done on your own. I unless he's there's only a bit some going against the barrier somewhere because he would have had dirt and mud alongside his car on the side of it. So if that's been contact with somebody, and if it is contact, it's a fairly hefty wacky circuit to damage the left left wrist suspension to that extent, so that it's been damaged that way. So again, there might be another investigation for uh, Mr. Peter Dennis down towards. Uh, pit lane to find out why the 104 car has such damage it's now yeah, yeah. opened the clamshell on the back <laughs> of the car as well so that's obviously to get access to the rear suspension so they can possibly they can try and get it fixed as best they can but yeah that's um, a mystery that i think we need jamie if you can go down there to try and solve if the drivers are moving talking yeah it's as you say either contact with another car or a massive curb strike which is possible given the way they've been launching themselves through britons but it would be on the could it be on that side of the car? Could be on that side of the car if it were Britons, yes. So might be a, a big, big curb whack. Right, so at the moment, we've got MJ Tech Racing 15 seconds to the good. That lead gap's come down a bit, so it's been a slow stop for the leaders. 
uh, because the gap has come down net between the top two. In third place, it is the Uvio Hoffman's car. In fourth, it is uh, GCI Racing, which has gone back to I, in other words, Ian Wood. And in uh, fifth place, it is Greenheath. Sixth is EDF Motorsports uh, still. So there's not much change of that order after the most recent round of pit stops. You can just see the uh, car of the Mansells going through. Scott Mansell is back at the wheel. That car never really recovered from losing time in the second stint. Uh, and the race leader is about to emerge from Deer Leaf. I'm keeping an eye just before we go to Jamie in the pits on the Morpheus car because I just want to see if it's got its lap back. And I don't think it has because the leader has gone through. So, yes, Morpheus still a lap down and actually by a bigger margin, if you like, of being uh, a lap off the leader. Right, Jamie, I think, was uh, poised in the pit lane with people to talk to. And assuming they've not left him, uh, we'll head down and uh, catch up on more news from the pits. Yeah, thanks, David. We're down with Craig Butterworth. That was a bit of an up and down stint for you. You sort of lost some time in in the middle of your stint there. Is the car all right? Uh, yeah, I thought it was a good stint. I thought you were going to say, what a great stint. Like, you were at the back of the pack. You fought your way through the pack, got up to fourth again. It was a great stint, Jamie. A tough, tough crowd. We're always proud, Craig. You know that. Um, no, we saw, I think there was one lap you sort of lost sort of three seconds. Was it just purely traffic? Just traffic. It was just traffic. It was so much traffic. Um, it was probably the busiest stint I've had in years just fighting through all the traffic but but actually made it really enjoyable as well and just um yeah the wind though is really interesting it feels like the wind keeps changing direction as well as getting windier so you get places where you suddenly think hang on is the engine not pulling properly but i think it's just the wind i hope it is just the wind anyway but we'll find out soon and last year it was two rounds the year before you weren't going to do them all you did them all and won it what's this year's plan it's some rounds it's definitely some rounds um uh look we'd love to do all of it if we had the, the, the time to do it but um, I think it will probably be a partial season I suspect um, but definitely here definitely Croft definitely another race or two later in the year so um, yeah it's great to be back and back, back racing again uh, absolutely it's great to have you back Craig thanks a lot um, let's uh, pop down to EDF and find out what's happened to Adam Cunnington's uh, 104 car so we're just um, quickly running down thankfully it's only a couple of garage doors down so we'll stick the head uh, stick my head into the into the car now they are working on the uh, left rear now uh, Adam's just sat in in the car now um, not ideal mate what happened I uh, don't know just bro broke the, felt the suspension break in the back I presume it's the back <laughs> uh, yeah just managed to get it back to the pits so it wasn't wasn't contact or anything it's just let no, go is it it just let go at the back end okay thanks a lot Adam back to David and Scott Thanks, Jamie. Bit of a fright in that, isn't it? It's the suspension just lets go. I suspect that might be after three hours of um, hard racing, but even so, it's a bit of a scare. Now, before we went to the pits, I was getting worried about Morpheus. I reckon they've lost time on the pit stops. They're further back in terms of track position than they were before that most recent pit stop. And lap, lap time-wise as well, they're not on the... They're not the all great respect to Michael Porter, he's not currently on the same pace as Will Abraham appears to be because Will's right. now got back into the car. His lap time last time I was at 201.6. Compare that to a 202.5 for Michael Porter. So it looks as though at this point in time, just in terms of driver advantage, Scott Jeffs and Ted Bradbury were evenly matched. But at the moment, at least in this early part of the stint, it looks as though that MJ Tech has that pace advantage again. Interesting, isn't it? Because you'd have thought Mikey Porter would be, with his experience, the gun in the car. Uh, maybe it's slightly unfair because you're putting him up against an equally quick driver, but uh, you know, Mikey has a very understandably big reputation. So <clears throat> we've got one hour to go into the last hour of the race. There's another pit stop view, and then it's fully boots to the end. Yeah, and then it's back to the wall. See how this see how this all plays out. As we go down the cat towards Cascades. And there's the 246 car. Now that car in sixth position. Because it's quite far, it's way ahead of the Morpheus guy away in seventh place. But even so, you know, ideally, would not like to be losing time. But you could find two worse cars to race than two uh, former champion teams. Race Logic, which currently has at the moment at the wheel David Denyer back again. So Julian Thomas has done his two four stints. Race Logic, meanwhile, they've, they've been silently moving up the grid. They're currently sat in ninth at the moment, and they are the kind of third best of the cars which are a lap down on the leaders, which is not too bad. And they are. Actually, this is the positioning back actually between these two. So, Race Logic 
are battling with Rattus Racing, who are literally just in front of them, and the separate se separator is the 246 car. So this battle here is another on-track scrap, because when they came across the line last time, it was only half a tenth between them. There's Rattus. And they're just behind the 246 car there in blue and white. There it is. There's Race Logic. And this is another on track fight, which again is still going on on the same lead lap this close mm -hmm. after three hours of racing, which is brilliant. Absolutely. And as we've been saying, just about everybody has had somebody to race with uh, all the way through. About the only lonely car just gone past us at the moment on track uh, over the line, which is 111 uh, back in the hands of Ian Wood. But uh, even that car is still well placed fourth overall. So there is 246 in 6th place and so the best of those off the lead lap is effectively Morpheus isn't it in 7th place overall and needing to do something clever on the next round of pit stops or it needs the lead car to have a moment but so far Will Abraham and Scott Jeffs have proved to be pretty bulletproof apart from that early penalty yeah apart from the early penalty which is what scuffed it before those, uh, those dark clouds are rolling in towards them. There's, there's, there's a little peak of blue in the sky, but it's mostly grey and overcast, and it's held off for the time being. There was of that small sprinkling of rain we had earlier on, but it's thankfully any potential rain has abated itself, and it's kept pretty much dry for the whole race, which is a bonus because it means we get to see proper competitive racing at that point. Now, race logic are not sailing up to the back of Rass's racing as I thought as, as they would do, partly because they've got PLR racing who are. Uh, uh, some laps down after Ben Pitch's excursion off the road at Island Bend. I think that's another reiteration of the five second stop go penalty for Wave 9. I don't think it is. Uh, that's appeared a couple of times on the square. That's not a big stack penalty. That's just them probably just could be the last straw in terms of you have a five second penalty, you need to come and serve it. And you see there that the PLR racing guy, in fact, actually has got some new bodywork since it was retrieved back to the circuit, back to the pit. So it has now got a new front splitter and he's back to essentially full health. Now it has. Ben pitched back at the wheel of it, so Neil Plimmer will finish the stint, finish the, the race in the last stint. The gap between second and third is extended. Bearing in mind they were trading places before that last pit stop, it's about five seconds, four and a half seconds of a gap, second to third. So who did we put back into number one? For stint five, Simon, Simon Rudd. Radigan, isn't he? Yeah. He has made good his escape uh, over the OVO Hoffman's car. So uh, the leaders currently are working lap 87. And there in 103, heading down towards Lodge Corner, is uh, Jonathan Railton. 14 in its pseudo brawn colour scheme. That is Paul Turner, who was good at the start of the race and is currently in fifth place. But he's quite a long way back from the opposition. Uh, yes, that stop go penalty you were talking about for 207 is now. Uh, for Mark Burson, Jason Minshaw, Mark Burson at the wheel, flashing vigorously on the uh, neon display. Like, you need to respond to this, otherwise you'll be in real problems, real hot water. There's the Morpheus car, still trying to get up through the traffic, get its lap back, but it's a hard, hard call. Hmm. Morpheus, all they can do is carry on pushing on and just see what result they can get. Anything, anything can and sometimes does happen within the last hour of a Fun Cup race, and there's been crazy things and crazy changes of championship leads and anything else so just have to keep pushing and hope that results possibly or fortunes go their way but they haven't taken the time to fix the front end at all they've just, just cracked on whatever they've tried to get on with the race this is red river sport this is bonnaby grimes at the wheel of the 200 car and that itself is battling away with the 49 car which is the signature rv machine the golf colored literal golf colored car in the livery steve rustin at the wheel he'll hand over to harry mailer for its final stint, he's also quite a r rather rapid peddler as Harry. And there's a change for 11th place then, so Bonamy Grimes goes through on the inside line, takes over the place. Uh, yeah, my, my earlier thought was it was the livery in which they ran at Le Mans, but it wasn't. That was more of an AF Corsa uh, red Ferrari livery. It was a tricolori, but it wasn't those three colours, so uh, I can't offer you any further wisdom on why <laughs> they've chosen the livery. Now, the gap third to fourth, sorry, try again, second to third, he's going up. He's up to about seven seconds, give or take now. So uh, Simon Rudd getting away from the Uvio Hoffman's car. And with 53 minutes and change on the clock, Bonamy Grimes working his way through traffic, getting past 158, which is now back in the hands of Gary Summers, isn't it? Yes, indeed. So 
18.9 seconds is the lead margin. Way up onto two wheels there uh, was the signature RV car. Steve Ruston getting very spectacular. 2.52, you can see David Denyer pressing on. So that is eighth and ninth. He's chasing after 155. Uh, which is the Ratcliffe family car, John Ratcliffe now at the wheel of it. I think that's one of the closest fights on track at the moment as the uh, leaders have gone by. So 52 minutes, but we can't really start counting down yet because we've got another round of pit stops before the uh, end of the race. And the last round are at the 200 to 210 minute uh, mark out of the four hours. Yeah, and uh, I think 207, I think, continues to circulate. And uh, I think his, I think uh, Julian Floyd's blood pressure is probably going further up and up and up, thinking why they're not listening to me and coming yes. to their pit for their five second stop. Because it's on the timing screen, it's on the display. Yeah. Um, yes. If he had a rag, he's probably lost it <laughs> now. <laughs> lost it. Uh, All right. The, the, there it is. The, the, there is the miscreant. 207 wave nine. Into the pit lane, please. Come in number 207. Your time is almost up. You have five seconds to serve. Well, I mean, that's a message that has been there for, I would say, a good 10 minutes, if not more now. Mm. So, yeah. yes, yeah, so you can understand the race director being uh, less than amused. Lead gap's going up. Look, 20 seconds. It's crept back up again to uh, MJ Tech versus Olympian GRD. Down towards his box they come. Bit of a slide as he clips the curve. David Denyer in the V-Box car, 252. So with 51 minutes and change remaining and more pit stops due. It's really after that that we'll start to get a better idea, a final idea of what might change. Indeed so. So we wait with fascination to see how this one plays out. I have to say, in terms of competition between the races, I think maybe just because it's the, the, some of the teams coming back in and drivers, this is genuinely, um, Hold one point in a second, because here comes the race logic car. The inside goes David Denyer. Nice and simple pass into Lodge Corner, and up he goes into eighth position. But this has genuinely been, in terms of cars on the lead lap and battling for positions, it's been one of the most, and it's generally competitive in it anyway, but this has been a, an especially competitive fun cut race to, mm. to start the season. There have been some good ones in the previous few years and good closing battles. I think the, the closing stages of last year's season finale here, we had about four or five cars on the lead group scrap amongst each other, was great. but. There's still six cars on the lead lap, lots of battles going on. It's quite fitting. Um, I can hear the cars possibly come in. Now, pray do tell us that 207. Uh, yes, it is. So 207 has finally heeded the, heed the call of its five-second pit stop, but I, I fear that its reticence to do so, maybe not on purpose, I, I, I'll, I'll offer some sympathy, uh, might well incur a, 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 the particular wrath of Julian Floyd, I think, after the race. And you might want to go and have a conversation with them afterwards. Yeah, I mean, normally you've got to serve it within three passings of the message appearing. He's done more than that, but the penalty has not become ever, a, a, any more draconian. So maybe uh, it'll be a conversation afterwards rather than anything more serious. But um, yeah, normally you get three strikes, don't you? You go past the, the line three times once the message is there. Uh, 155, having lost out to the race logic car, now coming under attack on the road at any rate from the PLR entry, Ben Pitch at the wheel but they're on different laps, so it's, it's not really a uh, representative battle. Ah, here's, here, we can shed some light on this, and I wasn't sure if it was another penalty or not. Jamie should shed some light on it. That was a second stop go penalty. Ah, OK. So, because he, he says here, they already served one, but then sped in the pit lane and copped another ah, immediate stop go, which is the one he's just served. Right. So, kind of ignore everything that I've just said, which is all complete rubbish, because Jamie just verified that there was a second penalty. So they've had two five-second stop penalties, and uh, we can proceed as normal. And possibly that was why the second one took longer to serve, because they were thinking, well, I've already done that, yeah. if the message hadn't got through about why. Uh, there, look, to the inside line goes 146, which is the PLR racing car, Ben Pitch back through on the inside, and then goes a little bit wide up the kerb. He's another one trying to buy back those lost laps, of course. They're in 19th place after being marooned on the grass for a while. Break hard, going to Old Hall Corner, and back on the inside line goes 155 then. So that puts uh, John Ratcliffe back into place. Uh, as I said, they're on different laps, but neither wants to be behind the other. Lead gap's going up. 
all the while. Uh, so when he gets into the lead of the second place car, Riley Phillips, he's going to have to work his absolute magic, isn't he, to get that car into contention again. Yeah. Just a, a very quick check in on one of the matters we were looking at quite a lot before the last pit stop window, which was the fortunes of MJ Tech in the comparison mm. to Morpheus. Uh, at the moment, it's still MJ Tech with the pace advantage. Last time around, MJ Tech was eight tenths quicker than Morpheus. So I fear that unless there is an extreme change in fortunes, that it might well be seventh might will be all she wrote for Morpheus and that yeah. might not be any higher that they're going to go I'm afraid. Yeah and it's not even that they're catching anybody else either are they? They're not catching 246. I mean we've been focusing on getting the lead, get, getting back onto the lead lap. That in, its, in itself doesn't get them any more places. Yeah. Um, you know they might be able to get onto terms with EDF for sixth. What's the gap there? What are the lap times like there? Um, well it looks like uh, uh, I don't think EDF have crossed the line yet because of course we've got 90 laps to go but either they are roughly on the same, no they've gone through already but uh, it said the gap was 53. I don't know, they are on the same lap. So it's 53 points, 53.89. So they're on the same lap. But even mm, so, lap times is, and lap yeah. time was identical last time, right? It was 203.6. So at this point in time, it looks as though, again, all, all they can do is hand it over to, to Ted in the final stint. Let him work his match. You can see where he ends up. Ian Wood in fourth place has been given a driving standards flag. So the track limit warnings are coming. Uh, and he is. The loneliest of the lot, I think, in fourth place, but nobody to fight against. Uh, in fifth place, it is Greenheath, and in sixth place, it remains EDF Motorsports as the race leaders then come through once again. So the race is now on to uh, lap 91, and maybe I'm getting ahead of myself in saying this, but for MJ Tech as the leaders, it's almost a case now of just ticking off the laps. There is the fifth place car, that's the Greenheath. Uh, Braun liveried yellow and white car trying to get through the traffic 103 is just up the road ahead that is Jonathan Railton once more driving for the Axiometrics team Squeal of tires coming out of Shell Oil's corner but the leader has just come across the line so Will Abraham clearly funk up uh, success is in the genes with his dad having won his class in the championship a good few years ago but uh, Will Abraham doing a good job another battle scarred car you can see is 103 Jonathan Railton's left rear corner looking uh, not as intended and the race leader as I say has gone by 22.7 seconds over Olympian GRD nine seconds in turn ahead of the Uvia Hoffman's car. That's fading, late race. This stint, which is going to put um, Diot behind the wheel, is not an impressive one compared to what they were doing early on because they've lost time relative to the Olympian GRD car in second place. Uh, it's not necessarily down to just a pit stop because the lap times haven't uh, been bringing the car back into contention. And when it goes back to Riley Phillips in second place, uh, then that's going to potentially stretch the margin again. We understand that there is light rain at Shell. Uh, so possibly just to spice the last 44 minutes of the race up a touch, it's going to be a little inclement. We'll see whether it comes to anything. Uh, I've been a bit fearful about these black clouds all afternoon, but um, it apparently is just starting to sprinkle with rain over at shell although looking in that direction it's a little bit brighter further uh, across in that direction again so the uh, very blustery conditions have been blowing the clouds in and as you've heard from Craig Butterworth the wind has been changing direction so just when you think a cloud might miss it can suddenly get blown back into the direction of the circuit so this is where if there is any rain it is light rain but I say it doesn't look on the camera lens as though it's too bad and drivers not struggling with track conditions. I suspect, of course, because the tyres are nice and warm, even if there is a, a slight sprinkling, sprinkling of rain, uh, the tyres with the temperature can still cut through that and work quite nicely. So 43 minutes to go, and pit window imminent. This will be our last pit window of the day. And... MJ Tech looking stronger and stronger. There, going into his locks, is... A, now, isn't that 104 that has had its suspension dramas and he's back out again? It is, so fair play to the 
uh, EDF Motorsport squad because they've got the Adam Cunnings and Victor Cara entry back out, even if it's at a reduced pace, but that's not lost them that much time to repair the suspension and put the car back on track. Yeah, these Fun Cup teams can get down to it and they can really, and the interesting, interesting is they can really turn some repairs around pretty quickly. Now, the rain that we reported down at Shell Oil, as we're hearing now, is in getting increasingly heavier. So that's interesting. It's also part of I think, so microclimate. Yeah. Th thinking it's Spa-Francorchamps for a second. <laughs> well, it's got hills. It is not far. <laughs> so this is that part of the circuit. It's not caught anybody out yet, as far as we know. And as I say, warm tyres will still be able to work. And these are a treaded tyre anyway. It's an all-purpose tyre, if you like. So uh, not had the rain blow anywhere else. But um, I think this is probably just a cameraman's plea for sympathy um, over at Shell. Getting wet. <laughs> Can I come in? I've been out here all day. No, 42 minutes. <laughs> Man up. Right, into the pit lane has come 104 again, uh, which is the EDF Motorsport car, Cunnington and Cara, after the suspension dramas. Uh, an exploratory lap served, and they're going to have another look at the car. But bit by bit, the leader is getting away, isn't he, now? So uh, another lap has just been put in the book by Will Abraham, and they're looking increasingly solid in the lead of the race. They are indeed and uh, just hope they can survive this last pit window and not have any more further dramas, touch wood. It will be, hopefully for them, plain sailing all the way to the chequered flag, and it'll be a great way for them to start the season. Um, yeah, look at the, the teams that I've sort of offered up in any, any pre-race notes that were going to be pre-season favourites or want to look for. Uh, not on purpose, I should I should, I should instill, but I, I knew that MJ Tech were a pretty strong decent enough team whenever they turned out in those particular races but having looked at the calibre of some of the teams and the former champion teams that we've got including of course Team Olympian and Uvio and GCI and other ones in the mix Race Logic back of course as well to do possibly hopefully a full season if they are here for the, for the full year that uh, MJ Tech were there but this seems to be one of the seasons where they're evolving into a true front running squad now and you've also got in there Tom Morpheus Racing who have always been on the pace it's nice to see we've got some new teams that are going taking a step forward and getting a bit more pace in terms of their their lineups and that lineup of Will Abraham and Scott Jeff. So it's pretty pretty solid because it's putting in two good stuff. And I think if they have better luck in the second race onwards, Morpheus will be up there as well once they get some better fortune to do so. But I've seen some teams where they probably win one race all season, but they'll still go ahead and be championship contenders because they are just consistent. They're solid. They don't make any mistakes too much. They can bank the points they need to. On the days when they can't win, they still get second, third, fourth, fifth, wherever they can, and just to keep on racking up the points whilst others sit back and have issues. You've got to go down to 10th place before you find a triple driver entry. Uh, going back to an earlier point about needing two drivers and two evenly matched drivers. I would offer up second place. Chris Sorry, you're quite right. <laughs> you're quite right. You're quite right. You're quite right. Yeah. Forgive me. Yes. T -t -t Team Olympian uh, yeah, Christabel. Yeah, no, you're right. Christabel did earlier on, didn't he? Yes. Sorry, you're quite right. Uh, and fourth would have been three. Uh, had Graham Butterworth not had to stand down. But, uh, yeah, the, the, the bulk of the leading group, you're quite right, are um, two drivers, bar the second place car, which is going to put its gun for hire back in. Riley Phillips will do the final stint. And we're not far away then from getting the final stops done. Leaders are currently then uh, on lap 95, so we're going to break the 100 lap barrier, that's for sure. There in 252 is the race logic car David Denyer drives, and that's in eighth place. That has had a, a, a pretty untroubled afternoon. It might not have been the absolute fastest car, but it's just got quietly on with the job. It's gone round and round and round, uh, and is on for a decent result. It's being chased by seed data there which is now being driven uh, by Mike Devlin who's the start driver so that gap has come down to a manageable level I think for David Denyer but he's going to be mindful before that last round of stops as to where the seed data car is and that in turn has got 155 tucked up behind it 155 now being driven by John Ratcliffe 246 is the car in sixth place and a spin around goes the summer's entry and 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 thankfully is avoided but it's off the road not for the first time not for the second time and now it's got to get off the wet grass so 158 fires up they were able to do it earlier on Gary Summers has had a pretty checkered day remember they had to pit for new front bodywork with that car and getting off wet grass at Druids it's going to be a challenge but he's done it he's got going 
and keeps to one side, lets the quicker cars go. So, a bit of late race drama with 38 minutes on the clock. Adam Cunnington has come back in in 104, so clearly he is not happy. And they're going through his 146, that car now with Ben Pitch at the wheel. Driver's getting ready for the last round of stops. Fuel churns are ready, incoming drivers are ready. And Morpheus is in. We're looking down the pit lane, but it's uh, looking out of our window. I can see the Morpheus car. You can see how much rubbish has been blown into the pit lane. This is incredibly windy here on the car. Uh, and uh, leaves and all sorts of general gut has been blown towards the pit lane. There's the Morpheus car down the pit road to give it back then to uh, Tom Bradbury. Sorry, Ted Bradbury, he's been one of the stars of the day. So. Last driver change for that. I don't think they're going to get back on the lead lap, but not for the one to try. And MJ Tech leading. The Olympian entry is in, as predicted, right at the start of the window. The second place car in early to give way to Riley Phillips. So he's got the maximum time behind the wheel of that car to try to go after the race leader. And the Yuvio Hoffman's car, I can see the next driver, Randaccio, in quotes, getting ready. So that's imminent from third. But about further down the pit lane, Craig Butterworth ready to take over the fourth place car. So now we're going to see whether the teams are able to do a short pit stop because they've got lots of fuel on board or they need to do a long one because that last stint was the shorter one. This is where you need your quick driver in and you don't need to muck about in the pit lane. You've got to be in and out as quick as you can. 36 minutes on the clock now as the leaders again accelerate towards the line. That's David Denyer who will give the car to the last stint to Julian Thomas, very proficient historic racer with things like Cobras and E-Types and Sierra Cosworths and, 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 and. It's a long list of cars that he's got in the stable. Another, uh, like many out of Fun Cup racing, graduate of the Nigel Greensall School of Tutelage. But uh, Julian, a, a, a very good racer in his own right these days. Nigel Greensall is another one that we're missing from the good. He's a fun cut regular. Not yeah. easy. Raced a bit for several seasons, but also he runs his own team. In fact, he has actually got to the point where he has been on track racing against his own team car, which is a bit more ironic for him. But uh, Rass is racing with a squeal of tyres, gets underway from what was when they came into the pit lane now in 10th. But yeah, Nigel Greensall is another school water championship. And I think there's, you probably reel off a list of cars, Nigel Greensall. There's probably just a tick of the ones that he hasn't raced rather than yeah. ones that he has, because everything from F1 cars to, well, anything, literally anything he's raced. There's probably very little in most he hasn't raced or discipline he hasn't raced in at some point. Um, so and rallied. And rallied, at least, yes. yes. Yeah. So all sorts for him. Uh, on track battle between 246 and 49. That's simply just in in uh, in in 246 eyes. 49 making it some bit of a nuisance, but just having a bit of fun racing now with 35 yes. minutes yeah, to go. Yeah, different laps, that's right, yeah. 246 is currently being hustled along by Simon Coles. Right. Ted Bradbury has just gone across the line for Morpheus. And a big, big send up the inside from the uh, Signature RV car. So through Steve Rust and charges to gain track position. Oh. And <laughs> even though he's on an in lap, not taking it lying down. Uh, was Simon Coles. Didn't like that. He, he put he was that's to make a point or just to keep on racing until the last possible second and think, right, I'm going in now, I'm good. Or either he pitted in protest, right, I've had enough now, I'm going to the pit lane and give it to somebody else. Uh. <laughs> so, right, so he now does the jump out. The, uh, one out, one in, yeah. Yeah, the uh, David Hill throwing the one S helmet on uh, 246. So uh, Simon Coles sort of back to the end to jump in for the Local Club Media Portable Car. Also in at Axi Metrics in 103 and 107 are in two as well. So a few more pit callers as we go towards the end of this pit, pit, pit window. Uh, an Olympian, I think, I think, as you rightly predicted, have made all five of their stops and have put Riley Phillips in there. I think Rostov was taking a very yeah. momentary step away there. They've obviously made their early stop, got Riley in, and away exactly. he goes. Yeah, right at the start of the window, put him in, maximise the available time. 
as we were suggesting they would really need to do. And in contrast, MJ Tech Racing, and I know I've said this for the previous four pit stops, but they're leaving it to the end of the window, that the Uvio Hoffman's car has just gone across the line, staying out for another lap, but it just doesn't look as quick as it did. Maybe some of the damage might be could be a factor in that potentially. Uh, again, some cars have just been soldiering on. I think there are some teams and some cars with setups where if they have a bit of damage on the front, they seem to cope with it better than others. And maybe Uber just on, on, on this day is not coping as well. But its last lap was a two minutes four. Mm. The last lap of the leader was a two minutes one. And those around, if they've not been pitting, are doing two minutes twos, two minutes three. So it's, it's losing pace somewhere. That is Ian Wood morphing into uh, Craig Butterworth. So, driver in. Make a decent stop. There's a gear in there somewhere, Craig. He's found it. Accelerates down the pit road. Yeah, and that would have been on their pit cycle, ideally for their last stop, to get you, it looks like with their fuel cycle. You ideally want it so that, like Green are doing right now, I think with that double fuel stop they've had, it's cycled out exactly how they planned, which is their last stop is simply just, as you said, driver out, new driver in, belt up. Switch on and away you go. That's exactly what Garth, that's exactly what Green is. Now, driver there wants 14 to go, but he's got an uninterrupted uh, swing in for his car, which is imminent. So, away goes number 14. That's the Green Heath entry that puts Gary Bate back at the wheel of it. The leader has gone by for yet another lap, so the MJ Tech racing car continues. But it's the Riley Phillips pace we need to be looking at in number one to see whether he can close with 31 minutes remaining. And as you were predicting, Scott, it's cutting up nicely now as all the different strategies try to align, at least for those leaders that are uh, within the same lap. Yep, it's that accord here effect that we talked about, the fact that he all got bunched up at the beginning, lots of close tight racing, good back and went through, but spreads out a little bit more. And all the pits, it was with mandatory pit windows, all things like the same. Everyone has to pit at the same time, and it's the same around, around the same sort of time. Um, all these different stops and then it gets to the last half an hour 40 minutes and everyone's just closed back up together again it gives you that nice close e even finish or competitive finish towards uh, what's been so far a pretty decent and strong race so there is your currently fourth place car it's about to get third in real terms it is second because this is your best placed five stop car what we need to see is what the gap is it's 59 and a half seconds first to third so overall leader to this car through goes number one then, so that is Riley Phillips, uh, who, as Scott was rightly saying earlier on, is very, very quick. Uh, that lap that he's just done is a 2 minutes 2.7, it's not as good as the leader. So the pit window is now closed, you've got that lap to see the board and then the in-lap. Uh, but as far as this car is concerned, it ain't quick enough at the moment to reduce the gap to the race leader. Mm. So the, the key thing's going to be is when Scott Jeff gets, gets into that car, what his pace is like compared to, to Riley's. And Riley usually, when you put him in the last stint, when the car's running down, it's got a lighter fuel load on it, etc. And he's on that point, the circuit's been nicely rubbered in, unless it's been, unless it's been rainy, etc. This is kind of the path of race where this is kind of Riley Phillips territory. He will put his foot down, he will start putting in banker lap after banker lap in terms of fast laps, and he will start to really close that gap down. I've seen him close down quite substantial gaps and take last minute victories on more than one occasion. It's the tour last to close down about a minute. Of course, the 246 has to come in and make its final stop. But yeah, it's, uh, gonna, it's gonna be about half that, isn't it? Mm. If not more. Uh, there he is. I mean, in fairness, Riley Phillips is leaving nothing on the table. That is a car that's almost whimpering in protest. It's being given such a hard time. But yes, we, we, we can't necessarily say what a pit stop is gonna be because we don't know how much fuel they're gonna take on the lead car. And also the uh, rain apparently disappeared from the moment Charlotte was born. So it never came to much anyway, did it? But we now don't have to fret about that too much. The leader is yet to make the last stop. And also, Uvio Hoffman's still to make a last stop. And that car's just gone through again. The resurfacing that's been done at all the park doesn't trick you a little bit because bits of the circuit have that sheen, don't they? And, and, and it looks like it's still greasy or damp when actually it's absolutely bone dry. There's the second place car. Quick look at the lap time. The last time it was a two minutes one for the leader and that lap is a two minutes 1.7. It's still about a tenth shy. Yeah, just back onto that point with the resurfacing. It's quite interesting that I think 
and some parts light on the run down to a wash. They haven't painted the white lines yet, so it looks like a, an old school Oton mm, Park yeah. before they had the white lines on it. I got was transported back to 70s at one point, looking back at that uh, piece of tarmac. But um, yeah, it's quite fascinating, and it seems as though that uh, in terms of offering up new bits of grip, it's because there was a, a Christian was suspecting with some of the new resurfacing that we could see a new, could see that record for in terms of now. I'm, I'm resident to actually find out what that record was, but um, speaking of rain, it hasn't completely gone apparently. It's now moved from Shellors to Pit Lane apparently. Oh, okay. on area, so windscreen wipers are going also just down a lot at uh, Druid, so and down towards Lodge. So maybe there's the that rain which was stuck at Shell Oils has now stopped raining there. And it's that cloud cell has moved across to this kind of part of the circuit down here where it's Lodge, Druids, and Pit Lane. This must mean that my wife's put the washing out. <laughs> home, home is nine miles away, so it's probably the wrong time of the day to do it. That'll be why it's raining. Right, leader is in, wipers on, and traffic chases him down the pit lane. So crucial last stop for MJ Tech Racing. Uh, into the pits they come, and no. the last pit stop. No fuel, can't see any fuel chain. No, I can see fuel chain. There's a fuel chain in, that's important. Oh, no, that's the captain. Right. There's the leader, no fuel chain evidence at the front. So it should be a short stop to preserve the lead. Abram out, Jeff's in. Hands on the back. Mechanics ready to give the car a shove if it needs to get going. Wipers are going still. Yes, the rain is on our window too. And without any fuel needed, away goes the MJ Tech Racing entry. That was a really good, slick stop. And the last significant one I think is about to be undertaken. It's the Uvio Hoffman's car that has just come in. You'll see it in the background in a moment. I think there it is, peeking into shot. And the driver change is underway. Yeah, just like that. I've watched these guys do pit stops before. I I think it was last year, year before, when the season began at Silverstone. It's fascinating to watch them practice. So they take it semi-serious in terms of practicing pit stops, and they're quite well versed in those. Uh, but um, the reason why I got confused with the fuel things, for some reason, I, I read my uh, our, our fuel guy as being the <laughs> our camera guy as being the fuel guy because the, the brake cover on the camera. Ah, so, oh, so, so right. it gave a similar grey sheen to that of a, a fuel cam. But uh, that's just that's just my eyes going. Um, One of those foolish things. Yes. <laughs> yes. You forgive it's, uh, it's been a long day, Scott. It has. Long very day. long day. But yes. an enjoyable day nonetheless. It's been fantastic. Um, 25 minutes or so to go then. MJ Tech now. And there's the gap essentially. So Olympia still effectively a minute behind at this point in time. So even with those pit stops and everything in the mix. Although, oh, well. But, but that hasn't taken the pit stop into account. So right. it's the next lap where we'll see the true gap. But it's probably not come down by a massive amount because it was, as we were saying, a short stop without the need for any fuel. So there is 2.49, Scott Jeffs at the wheel, leading the way. Uh, although the timing tower says that the Uvio Hoffman's car was second, forget that because, as we know, uh, it has pitted and therefore fallen away a little bit more. So number one will be back up into second place. Question is, what's the margin? And part B of the question is, can it do anything about bringing down the gap to an inspired Scott Jeffs? But the MJ Tech car, has led pretty much since the first round of stops, hasn't it? You know, once it got itself into the lead, it stayed there. Yeah, and, and that's worked out. And of course, the the whole sequence with the pits with the safety car worked out yeah. in its favour. Of course, and as a factor there, but it does beg the question: of course, what if? What if that safety car period hadn't played its part? How different would the race be? Would Morpheus be in the mix a bit more? Would Olympian be in there? Well, Olympia would still be in that position anyway, but the, the, the bigger factor would be Morpheus, who's back in seventh and currently showing us a lap, if not two laps down by off, it's because they probably haven't crossed the line yet. Um, and with Ted Bradbury at the wheel. But it's intriguing to figure out how they would, how and where they would have placed. There's the Ratters racing car going past 214, and that's for position, that's for eighth place. Yeah. So which of the Ratcliffs have we got into 155 for the last stint? This is David Ratcliffe. And he has just, as you say, put himself up past uh, Matt Hogg. And then also, also puts a lap on the 103 car, which is Axiometrics, which now has Greg Evans at the wheel. So 24 and a half minutes on the clock, as you can see, and 21.9 seconds is the lead margin. So it's come ah. down by about 40. So it was a, a, a decent enough game, coupled with Riley Phillips' quick laps, but he's got to be taking two, three seconds a lap out, hasn't he, to stand a realistic chance of winning. It can't be tense, otherwise he's not going to get there in time. Yeah, and in all fairness to Riley with the pace that he's got at the Samtel, we know that it's not going to be two or three seconds a lap that the 246 car's going to lose because... Uh, yeah, sorry, 249 is going to lose because Scott Jeffs is quick enough to hold him off based on the splits we've seen before. Um, we're hearing here is now that the rain now is quite heavy at Turn 1, we're hearing now, so it's 
but it's now dry its shell. So it's that, that sort of rain cell is moving over that last half an hour yeah. or so, kind of from one part of the circuit to another. And yet there's no rain on our window. We're not far <laughs> from turn one at Old Hall Corner. Uh, so, yes, it's, it's, it's another challenge for the drivers because you, know, you get to a corner and it's not as grippy. You get to the next one and the grip's back. So what does that make you think? That you can press on, that you need to be a bit more mindful of weather conditions? Either way, of course, these blustery conditions, when it does stop raining, should dry the road pretty quickly. But there is the Uvio Hoffman's car going down through Nickerbrook. Looks over there as though it's raining, doesn't it? A little bit. Yeah. I, thought, I, I, I thought for a second there, which is the angle of the car was turning through the chicane, but it looked for a second like that car was a bit wavered, but it's probably just how the weight's moving on the car going through the chicane. I was, running, I was running where that point of the circuit that was, but you just crossed it out quite eloquently. So um, there goes 225 then. Uvio continuing on. They are on course then to pick up a podium to start off Best for another cut the title. Uh, had a couple more slap wrists from race control. Those being for one for track limits. One was 195, Ted Bradbury. So not so much surprise given that he's obviously hustling along to try yeah. and uh, get as much time as he can in this last stint. The other one being 49, which is the Golf Livery Signature RV car. So that's one to keep an eye on to, again, if they not careful, they might get another penalty. More wipers on, certainly. And more spots of rain. Little teeny weeny spots of rain on our window over here now as well. So, uh, if it does become properly inclement for the end, then uh, it's going to be a, a real test for the drivers because some want to push and others just want to hang on in there. The leader, there he is, coming out of his lot, uh, I mean, again, coming out of Britain's towards his lots, uh, is uh, being mindful of the conditions. And on the one hand, with 22 seconds in hand, doesn't have to push absolutely flat chat, but equally can't back off so much that he becomes caught. No, I mean, if you look at lap times, just to get checking with those, I mean, even go through that traffic part right to the previous lap, but MJ Tech was eight tenths better, so two minutes 1.5 compared to a 2.02.3. So it looks as though, that, again, we know Riley's quick, he's an established quick driver in this championship, one of the quickest arguably in this championship, but just on this day at the moment, MJ Tech and Scott Jeffs have got the measure of him so far. Just keep it clean for yeah. the last 21 and a half minutes, and touch wood, essentially, it really is his to lose. What about Hoffman's versus. GCI. The last lap for Ikeep Sudamin was 2 minutes 3.6, 2 minutes 3.4 uh, for Craig Butterwood. So it's come down fractionally, but with 11 seconds, it's going to be, again, big chunks of time found, isn't it? Yeah, he needs a mistake to move you in order to make any yeah. inroads on that. So ultimately, I think GCI will do well to do so. I think look at some other teams that have done okay. I might have a quick glimpse at just where they started and kind of give some comparisons to where they're currently ending up at the moment. So I mean, one of the biggest kind of movers in the race, obviously the cars towards the back, given Kim Olympia come back from 24th to second at the moment. Uvio started back in 18th and they're currently third. GCI Racing were back in 21st, they're currently fourth at the moment. And Green he started back in seventh up to fifth. So there's big gains for some of the cars that you'd expect in this championship, the established cars, that are expected to move up, the, up towards the front anyway. Like I said, the cream in this championship really does rise to the top eventually in terms of, those, in terms of that pace. Um, I'm quite impressed by that Ratter's race as well. I think they came in first time last year, and I think ever since then, every single time they've been in a race weekend in Fun Cup, they get out, and e each of them have just got this massive beaming smile on their face, because they absolutely love it, it's fantastic. Which is reminding me, there was that um, that small story about Uber I was going to uh, oh, yes, say yes, 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 yes. before. So three, pitch, the picture three years ago, I think it was, um, hopefully nothing happens between them, so I can go through the whole story, because it's worth it, hopefully. So, Uvio are battling PLR for the lead. Uh, towards the end of the race, and they make contact. In fact, speaking of Uvio, there they are. And, oh, that's GCI. So that's your change for third place. So Uvio has lost about 11 seconds in a lap, which is either a spin or it's a problem. I think it's a spin. So they've had a spin and they've cost themselves third place. So now uh, they've got to try and fight back, but I think Craig Butterworth is going to hang on to them, uh, hang on to the place rather, because he's broken away by two or three lengths, 19 and a half minutes to go. Uvio story, take three. Yes, so whilst that's going on, ironically, quite physically, they made a mistake there. So it was a battle for the lead between themselves and PLR. The, the, the TLDR of it was that they made contact at the final chicane. Now, obviously, there's contact. Extend, they were kind of fighting for the championship in the mix, or it would have been settled in many cases. They, in any case, the driver would be upset or frustrated, but as a Farkini watching on, his reaction, laughing out loud to himself on the pit wall, watching it happen. You think your car's just been had an incident, and it's rather than kind of being out of your upset, just finds it funny. So, that, again, that's the characters that you have in this pit lane yeah. in front cup, and the kind of the 
the level of seriousness they don't take with this championship in terms of you can't just want an incident and it's rather amusing rather than frustrating which is the, the, the cracking stuff but they are two brilliant characters all the same as, as I much loved in Fun Cup and everyone down the pit lane adores them in terms of personalities now this isn't over between these no, two because no, no. now Brandaccio is going to come back at them and of course Fabio is just as quick if not arguing in some cases on some days slightly quicker than Farquhar they are at the very least as quick as each other and I think that um, in triple one Craig Butterworth knows that as Fabio looks down the outside to try and make the move. But again, parked on the apex, not offering any sympathy at all. You had the spin. You want to come and get it? Come get it the hard way in the last 18 and a half minutes. And I'd offer up this is probably going to be the, the, the battle to watch between these two. It won't be for the win, but it will be the final spot on the outright podium. Absolutely right. Craig Butterworth is a champion, and the UVA Hoffman's team have been champions, so they know what they're doing in these cars. Although Craig Butterworth has got away, hasn't he? Look, coming out of Old Hall, he was under massive attack going into Lodge, but broke away a little bit coming out of Old Hall, but the gap narrows once more, heading down towards Cascades. Still the wipers are on. Uh, the rain that we had on the pit straight has kind of come to nothing again, so it's, it's teasing all the while here. Lead gap's going up, isn't it? Despite the best efforts of Riley Phillips, uh, Scott Jeffs is being able to stretch the margin, and Craig Butterworth can't quite get away from the UVO Hoffman's car. You, you can never get away from the UVO car when it's on, on good form, and Fabio will certainly keep pushing as hard as he dares all the way through. Obviously, even with a spin, whether he's I'm not saying he's getting any more hesitant, but uh, he's certainly pushing on as much as he can to uh, keep him in sight. But it looks like Craig now he's got the incentive to get in front. His tail's up now, and he's trying to pull away as much as he can. Also, the fact that he has a full splitter's worth of aero available to him, whereas uh, whereas uh, UVO has that little sort of part of it. And again, yeah. look. Craig's not comfortable. He's not comfortable staying on the racing line because he darted one way, then the other to kind of just kind of put Fabio off a little bit. As uh, we've got, a, I think, it sounds like an incoming pit call, a 104 back again. In the pits again. Yes, that was the suspension weakened car of earlier. So that's right. Uh, it's I think it's got a, a loyalty card of the pits. It's been in that often. I've lost count <laughs> of how many pit stops it's had now, but it's probably not far off double figures. Uh, eight pit stops it's had. Yeah. Right. This is 103 versus 155, but they're on different laps. But everybody pushing. 16 and a half minutes of the race to go. And it's certainly given us drama, hasn't it, all the way through. Always some battles to talk about. And we're not entirely done yet. There are still places to be resolved. This is the third place. As again, uh, Randaccio to the outside line tries to find a way past Craig Butterworth. And behind them <laughs> is not a car that's going to catch them in terms of position, but Harry Mailer, Ginetta Junior ah, star, yes. uh, is here to say, I'm even quicker than you two. So get on with it. Yeah, either that or just a question. I know you're battling for third place, but can I come and play? Possibly? Yeah, exactly. Question mark. Yeah. With uprising inflection, just kind of, can I just maybe get involved and have some fun? Because I'm back down the order in where I am down in, was it 12th position and not fighting for anything. So, But if he gets stuck in against the UVO Hoffman's car, he could really scupper their chances of taking third place because uh, on the one hand, they don't want to let him go because then there's a car between Uvio and uh, GCI. But for as long as they defend, then they're putting themselves in jeopardy and delaying themselves. So it's a dilemma here. If if the Uvio Hoffman's car lets Harry Mailer go, they've got to hope that Craig Butterworth does as well. Yeah. Oh, well, the other solution is, as kind of as easy as it sounds to say, is to get back past GCI and then hope that the GCI gets caught up with yeah. with Harry Mailer trying to unlap himself, and that allows them to get away and make a break. So. Ultimately, there's a bit of a catch-22 situation here. Is that yes, it's a back marker, but he's on the same sort of pace. Mm. But at the same time, he's got to keep on pushing and attacking. And again, these on different parts of the circuit, they've got different strengths here. Because at least on corner X there through the chicanes, Fiabe seems to be a bit more on pace than Craig is. He has a little look to the outside line, puts himself again on the ideal racing line. Four to go wide. That's how hard he's pushing. Then massive thump of the curb on the first part of uh, his slots now through Nicker Brook, and again looking for that switch back on the exit. Now back on the power again, up through Clayhill. You can see how he race he is. He's all over the back of him now, and all oh, that's not that's usually brave. passing. What that is brave. He's certainly got some some uh, some bravery here that he's taken this morning. He's going down the outside to make, uh, to make the inside outside run for Druids. So it's all right. I can't speak. Down the outside goes. But actually can't make a stick. And Mailer's not going away. He's thinking, yeah, I'm that down, but this looks fun. I want a part of this. He's 12th overall. And of course, he wants to push on. He wants to get past these and see if he can catch anybody else. To the outside line, then Uvia Hoffman's on the inside line for GCI's Craig Butterworth. And the Uvia Hoffman's car given a bit of hip and shoulder, I think, there. And it was roughed up. So Mailer has gone by. But that puts Randaccio, in quotes, off the road. And a driving standards flag has just gone out to 214. 
uh, which is the Matt Hogg, Mike Devlin car. So Mailer, look, has quickly cleared both of them. So he's caught, he's passed, he's away. And now the Uvio Hoffman's entry, you can see the back of it there, tries to catch up once again to Craig Butterworth for third place. That battle is not over with 13 minutes on the clock. Whereas for MJ Tech Racing, Scott Jeffs is, is looking a bit more serene for the race lead. Just looking at some of the timing screens, I can probably have a small idea as to probably why Harry Mailer, for that reason to get past, wasn't just for fun or for kind of entertainment. Looking at the timing screens, he was probably chased, trying to chase down uh, Johnny Molan in yes. the Red River Sport car because yeah. he was battling for 11th place. So uh, ultimately, whilst he was ironically lost time from cars that were ahead of him in the order, which is slightly, slightly sort of a, a strange sounding when you think about it, but ultimately, Harry's getting his head down, and also, of course the gap is 14 seconds to try and make up, but in sort of 13 minutes, again, unless there's a Uvio-esque mistake that loses them a lot of time, it's not going to happen. This is Kevin Mounts will probably get in the fright of his life here with three rather rapid drivers, thinking I want no part of this. Oh, and Fabio chooses that point in time to try and go down the outside. It's two by two, like Noah's Ark down towards the Hislop, the Hislop chicane, and then it's Fabio going down the outside, oh. but straight off goes the Harry Mailer car. Again, he loses one half of his front splitter. So it's like join the club here. Back around the outside goes Craig Butterworth. Fabio shows the edge of the road. Don't think so. Out you go to the outside of Nickerbrook. That's one all. You did it to me at Lodge. I'll do it to you. <laughs> so we'll call that quits, right? Okay, move on. So now the Uvio Hoffman's car is stuck in the traffic. And Harry Mailer goes back through on the inside of uh, Kevin Mansell's car. And Craig Butterworth's got a little bit stuck. So third place back in the sway of Uvio Hoffman's then. The black and gold coloured car has the place, but now that Craig Butterworth clears the traffic, let's see what he can do. He's not given up yet. Harry Mailer having outbraked himself, then going down towards his lops. And you're right, of course, because he is, even though he's on a, a different lap from those around him, his focus somehow is on trying to catch Johnny Mola. Now, that's not going to happen, I don't think, because he's a long, long way behind. But you know, Harry isn't here to drive around at 80%. He's here to go flat out, and that's exactly what he's doing. Now Randall is on his tail as they come out of the corner. And Craig Butter were thinking, that's it, you hold him up because then I can catch up and then I can have another go for third place. Yeah, essentially what he's waiting for is the rubber match basically between those two because they'll have one all, it's now the decider. Yeah, Arguably, yeah. Fabio leans against Harry Mailer and Harry won't appreciate that, of course, but neither will Fabio thinking, you're an apt car, what, what are you doing? And now Craig's thinking, which one do I push? Do I push Fabio? Do I push Harry Mailer to kind of annoy him further? What do I do? In terms of eventually he decides to give Fabio the push and they're back in front of them. And so ultimately there's ironically the only car that really isn't frustrated here is Trey Butterworth he's thinking I'm loving this because Fabio's getting caught up with, with Harry Harry's getting frustrated because he won't let him go so Craig's thinking right I'll just sit here wait for them to the fireworks to happen and I'll take full advantage but now they've cleared Harry Mailer once again it's the pressure on Butterworth to do the job big curb strike by the UVO Hoffman's car which just unsettles it slightly Craig Butterworth on the tail then as they come up over hill top down to his lot goes to the outside line it was here a lap ago that we saw the Uvio Hoffman's entry get a little bit squirrely, but this time comes in a bit deep. Does the door open for Butterworth? Not quite. More tyre squeal. Don't forget, they've done the whole four hours on these tyres. Nobody's had a, a tyre change because they're a good, durable GT tyre, so they can certainly stand the uh, abuse that four hours of hard racing gives them. And Uvio Hoffman's then keeping GCI at bay. Butterworth lines up for a go on the inside line as uh, Ted Bradbury has just done the fastest lap of the race. So he's certainly not giving up. And not only that, I think it's the only car in the actual entire race to dip sub two minutes. Impressive stuff. 159, 912. Boy, he's got pace underneath him. So he's got Fossil Move here. Craig Butterworth up the inside. Gets shoved onto the curb. They make contact into the right-hander at Lodge. And I thought for a second Craig Butterworth was going to give him a bit of afterstop. Thinking, right, you think you should close the door on me, have some of this. Now Mayler comes back into the mix. I think for those, if, it wasn't, if this wasn't for position, just a hard race, and just a, and for any points or anything, this is just good hard racing between the three. Butterworth sends it back down the outside again. Randacha doesn't want to give it up on the outside, gets squeezed out onto the curb. Here comes Mayler again, a little spit of flame from the upshift. And this is probably amusing Kevin Mounts here, watching thinking, this is great. I'll just sit here and get the popcorn out for the next 10 minutes and watch this all happen. Well, the best seat in the house, isn't it? Absolutely. Uh, through Cascades they come then. So it is Butterworth back up into third for GCI. But they're so evenly matched, those cars, you can never really get away. What he needs is Mailer to get past, he's almost bump drafting the <laughs> Uvio Hoffman's car there. He needs Mailer to get between the two and get in the way, then uh, he can possibly escape. But now I think the Uvio Hoffman's car, they, they've learned, haven't they, that Mailer is a force to be reckoned with. So you've got to defend, you can't let him have a sniff of all of this. So tough call, really, for 225. They're trying to attack, they're trying to defend, but they're defending from a back marker yeah. who's quicker. Yeah.
And this, and this is for, of course, the most important thing. It's for the final step on the podium. So this is really for the out-and-out -out battle between these two. Of course, in terms of the top two, which we've almost not properly slightly forgotten as we keep watching this battle, MJ Tech still lead. It's still a 25 second gap to second place. They go side by side for third again. Randacci wants to go down the outside once more, but again, late on the brakes of Butterworth. Really went uh, late on the, bre the brakes. I thought he wasn't going to stop for a second, but he manages to get it anchored up in time. Takes the racing line. Uh, uh, Fabio's looking for that undercut through the corner. Mailer sits back and just keeps his powder dry for a second. And, and we've got heavy rain coming from Lodge Corner. Oh, look at the oh, other side. The, the rain is now very heavy indeed. So it's very wet at Druids. It is very wet down at Lodge. And this might might throw another spanner in the proverbial as they paddle their way out of the corner and way out wide onto the grass goes the Uvio Hoffman's car. That's going to cost it time, but it stays in the right direction. So Craig Butterworth stays ahead as the cars now come down towards Lodge Corner, but it's much more slippery, much more treacherous than ever it was. Yeah, that's rain at a 45 degree angle now. That is properly coming down with the wind on top of it. So this is really a dramatic change of conditions. And of course, not to kind of jinx anything, but is this also going to change the complexion in terms of how the top two deal with the conditions as well? Because, of course, MJ Tech has a 25-second lead, mm. but it only takes one slip in these instantly changeable conditions, and it could throw it all away. But it's not consistent. Look, it's much drier on the avenue compared to what it's like on the start line. So here they think, right, I can press on again. Uh, and then, whoa! Oh! If you Craig Butterworth, you can't because he's lost traction and he's in the gravel. All of a sudden, the car snaps away. Oh, and Uvia's off as well. Absolutely. Now, is that more than just rain? It's almost as though there was some liquid on the road. But the pair of them have gone off the road. Butterworth in the gravel. The Uvia Hoffman's car has a charm life and goes out the other side. But the road greasy enough to catch out two of the top drivers in the race. And Craig Butterworth's efforts have come to naught because he's stuck in the gravel bed. Seven minutes on the clock. And now we get to the point of wondering whether or not the race has to be neutralised to get Craig Butterworth out of the way. And if it's going to be neutralised, it would be more than six and three quarter minutes, which might mean game over. Either way, the race leader there with the orange uh, chevron on the front of the car goes through just over six and a half minutes on the clock and they paddle their way out of Old Hall Corner. Right, so MJ Tech leading the way, and the margin, uh, there's the yellow flag zone. Look, Marshall's busily working down at Cascades. Uh, that car's going nowhere. That's, that's going to need more than a, a push. So the margin is 26 seconds, and it's decidedly horrible now. Yeah, it is uh, really coming down on the pits right now, but the winds are coming as well. The Fun Cup flags are also fluttering at uh, quite a gale. And I think the key thing I'm bearing in mind is that if that can happen to GCI and Uvio, it can happen to a leader. It can happen to anyone. So, But it didn't look that wet, that part of the road. It was weird, wasn't it? Almost as though uh, Craig Butterworth you know, came across some liquid. Not just rain, but yeah. you know, like a spillage from a car. Clearly he hasn't because others have got through without drama. But the fact that all of a sudden both of them went off, just uh, slightly surprising. Anyway, there's the race leader who is now wetter than a mermaid's flannel as he comes out of Britain's, and that uh, is Scott Jeffs heading up towards the hilltop section of the circuit, then down towards his lops, and as long as he kicks it in the right direction, he's home and wet. <laughs> took me a split second to think about that. Um, yeah, it's... Um I th it, the going back to that incident, it almost seemed as though that it was GCI had the incident. It almost seemed like Uvio went off in, in sympathy. Yeah. It was like, kind of like it sort of happened and went, oh, okay, when they're trying to avoid it and got distracted. Almost like he, he was measuring his pace yeah. on the car ahead, saying, so I'll break where you break. And as Butterworth got it wrong, he got it wrong, yeah. Look at that. Just, yeah. It, it, not to tempt, not to not obviously predict anything, but the rate's coming down. It, it would not surprise in the slightest if even five to go, but there's, that they, that they call it, because there's, there's wet and then there's conditions where the drivers will think this is getting too much and it is properly pelting down. Look at the, yeah, the amount but, of water. But, but, but you drive to the conditions. People on the road have got to drive in this at the moment. They, they, they can slow down. They can the drivers. They're on a track. I'm, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm no, just no. playing devil's advocate because I hate yeah. seeing races stopped. Yeah. Uh, I still have this belief that even if it's wet, the drivers on a treaded tar can drive to the conditions. And, and so, yes, the lap times are going up. But now you see that the race has got a different dimension. Now we're seeing who the wet weather maestros are mm. and who is brave in the conditions, who is sensible in the conditions. I know it's not much fun for everybody being out in it, uh, but can, for example, Riley Phillips 
press on enough to bring down the gap. You know, the race, could, oh, the chequered flag, I think he's being ready. There's another car off at Lodge Corner. Ooh. We might be heading for an early checker here. Yeah, PLR was very all over the place, kind of wiggling all over the place. The car that went off in the gravel was the Morpheus car that went off the road in seventh place. I don't think we're heading for a red, but I think we are heading for an early checkered flag because the marshal on the gantry in front of me has it in his hand, so we yeah. might be a minute or two early. Uh, MJ Tech is through on to lap number 110. And there it went through Ireland Ben just as 210 oh. tries to recover. And we've got two cars off at Old Hall Corner. Uh, and then Morpheus, oh. and now a red flag is being shown, I'm afraid, because we've got more cars off in more places. So now um, it, it's not the condition so much as cars in dangerous places. So Morpheus is off the road, and there's another one which might be PLR, I can't quite see out of the window, but three and a half minutes on the clock, red flag, the race is being stopped. We've got two off at Old Hall. Uh, in the rain, if you're careful, you can drive around, but not with cars in dangerous places. And like I say, there are two off and barrier damage. And that's it. Red flag, checkered flag, race done, job done, MJ Tech win. And a real shame that it had to end that way. But, mm. you know, with two or three cars in dangerous places, you've got no choice. Yeah, absolutely. But, so, so, of course, everything will go back on that. But, of course, cars that were, that were not running at the time of the red flag will not be... They'll still be classified, of course, in an endurance race, you, everyone's classified, but they... I don't know why they will be classified. No, so. because you're, you're not running at the time of the stoppage. So. Uh, out you go. Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, what this means is that we can now gloat, because Jamie's going to get soaked uh, talking to them in Park Ferme. Not to uh, not to add to that, but as we see, that was the Morpheus car off the road. But he did send me a message, I think, about five, ten minutes ago, but literally just said in capital letters, raining hard. So, <laughs> uh, it certainly was accurate in terms of uh, the conditions but yes. uh, well I'll check my sympathy app um, <laughs> and uh, and I'll get back to him on that yes so there's your winning team and an absolutely impeccable job I know they have the early stop go penalty for track limit offences but Scott Jeffs and Will Abraham have just been exemplary and the, an excellent pit work as well that's a win deserved I would say yeah definitely they've certainly been pretty impressive they're one of the teams compared to the last couple of seasons that have really taken a step forward and really done a, a fantastic job all the same uh, Olympian did pretty well to go for the back of the grid to second eventually, and Rye did pretty well. In the end, it's a 25, 8.5 second gap. And despite the late battle that initially saw both of them off into the gravel, and there's the unfortunate sight of the triple one car off the road after it uh, lost it on the run down towards Cascades. It, uh, it's th it's, it's, it will be third place for Team Movie Hoffman's Motorsport, which is um, a little bit of a, a get out of jail for a feed car for yeah. them in some cases, given the fact they went yeah. off the road in sympathy for the car that's in front. Um, it's also a position game for Morphe as well. No. Uh, no, it's not. It's going to be not going to Morpheus. Because <laughs> um, they're not running either. Yeah. No, that's very true. Uh, so other cars will move up. So I think one of the biggest benefactors, that's probably going to be Team Ratters Racing. Because, of course, there's two cars in front that weren't running. So obviously, I think they might go they might go up a little bit. So which is going to be intriguing to see. Um, this is one of those ones where it's almost you have to wait for the TSL sheet to come out and see what order it brings out. But I think at least the top three, at least, is pretty much a uh, um, guaranteed in yeah. terms of what we've got. It's maybe some of the positions backwards that need to be shuffled around once you figure out the cars that were off and, and who benefits from what once they'll get moved up if, if they get shuffled around. Yeah, there's a red car in the gravel. I'm trying to work out if it's PLR or Rassers because that's going to have an effect on what you've just been talking about. Yeah. Uh, but uh, all will be revealed in a few moments' time. Uh, there's also a... a emergency vehicle down at Old Hall, so hopefully the uh, impact that the um, Ted Bradbury Morpheus racing car took against the barriers, because it was probably at pretty high speed, aquaplaning off the road, hasn't uh, knocked the driver about too much, but if there is a, an impact, of course, the driver will go to the medical centre just for a checkup in any incident these days, large or small, so uh, it's probably just uh, there for a precaution. So we'll have, as I say, the drivers to park fair mate will be a little bit of head scratching but first of all let's have a look at the provisional results we've been saying if you weren't running at the time of the stoppage you drop out of that so it's a win for mj tech racing from team olympian grd and then team uvio hoffman's motorsport green heat fourth ahead of edf motorsports and then six provisionally will be team rassers seventh race logic eighth seed data ninth red river sport and into the top 10 signature rv Axia metric got to the end as did driver 61 uh, and after that you had the uh, confusion over which cars we lost into the gravel at Old Hall. Anyway, uh, next over the line would have been wave nine ahead of Skull Club Racing that really did lose out and it led early on four laps down. Team 3 Motorsport from GMR, possibly PLR depending on as I say which red car 
is in the gravel over at Old Hall. And many of the others we lost with myriad dramas. Mainly damage, whether it was bodywork or suspension. So, a shame that the red flag had to end the fun, but good racing all the way through. And the winning teams now make their way uh, to the Park Ferme area, where Jamie Peters Ennis will go and track down our winning drivers. And of course, it's Murphy's Law, but now that all the uh, red flags have flown and cars are in the gravel, the rain has virtually stopped, so it's eased right off now. So we'll, as I say, uh, with uh, the cars being retrieved, um, head to Park Ferme from Scott Woodruff and David Addison. Thanks for your company on the BRSEC uh, and Fun Cup live stream and to talk more about the last four hours. Far a few minutes. Let's go to Jamie Peters, Ennis. Okay. Well, what a, a crazy end to the first round of the Fun Cup Endurance Championship for 2024. And I've got Mark Jeffs with me from MJ Tech, Scott's father. Mark, it's taken you four years, but you've got your first ever win. You must be so pleased. Pleased. I, I can't really spit, say the words that I need to say, really, about the, the win, really, for us. Worked hard all winter, uh, trying to put the car together, a few problems, and... Uh, it's all come together today. I think they've, both boys have performed absolutely brilliantly. And uh, for the whole team, it's, it's, it's fantastic. And I think after four years of, of trying hard, it's finally paid off. So, you know, that, that's, that's how it is. And, and hopefully, fingers crossed, we all go through scrutineering OK and, and we, we end up having the win. Absolutely. And I mean, you've been there, you know, at the, at the sharp end all day. And that was the key, wasn't it? To stay out of trouble. And it's um, and we know this year with the stellar entry that we've got, it's going to be one of the toughest Fun Cup seasons we, we've had in a long, long time. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I mean, looking at the good drivers, that, I mean, there's a lot, a lot of good drivers out there. And uh, I can't believe our performance, really. I mean, you know, we've got to try again next time, you know, work hard at it. But I think there's going to be a lot of different winners this year you know it is going to be hard work and uh, unfortunately for us we start last next time yeah. so yeah but there you go at Crofts we'll be we'll be there and, and, and have another go all right fantastic congratulations Mark we'll let you go and celebrate thank you very much thank you all right so that was Mark Jeffs uh, Scott Jeffs father from MJ Tech on what was an absolute thriller of a first round of the 2024 Funk Cup Endurance Championship my thanks to David Addison and Scott Woodwiss for all their tremendously hard work up in the commentary box and from down here in the pit lane I've been Jamie Peters Ennis and we'll see you at Croft in three weeks time thank you so much for watching and it's good night from me